Well, we've managed to get it in the right time of the year. Close to where we are expecting to see the annual pilgrimage to the Eiffel Mountains with the formation lap almost complete with rain not just in the air but falling on the circuit with the vast majority of the grid on dry weather tyres with the Land Audi, the number 29 car, former winners of this fantastic event in pit lane having decided to leave it to the last one it's very clever actually because if they'd gone out onto the grid they're stuck on the tires that they are uh, on with five minutes to go before they are flagged out they stay in the pit lane they can make that decision right up to the moment that they roll down to the end of the pit lane hello to david drinkwater who's in the number 231 bmw 240i in the cup five category we know he's listening in he's been tweeting to us from the grid at rsl underscore studio hashtag rsl in 24 on the dottiger her the audi pace car taking the field towards a green flag much weaving in the marshes or much much weaving in the eiffel actually trying to get some heat into tires that would suggest to me that they're on slicks and it's slicks for the lads audi they've waited peter as long as possible and it would seem that they've gone with your idea that it is slick weather also down there the number 84 porsche cayman uh, has waited to make that decision uh, very late as well just watching Nicky Katzberg there, but as well, not just weaving side to side, but actually in a straight line, just accelerating hard and stopping hard, getting heat into those rear tyres on that rear-wheel drive M6 BMW, last year's winning car, and of course then standing on the brakes really hard to get heat into the discs as well. The heat into the discs in the front, soaked into the hub, gets into the tyre, it's another way of getting heat through into those tyres. Ready for, we say the start, but of course the next important bit is the first corner, having first, to brake. Absolutely, getting it stopped, and it's going to be damp. Now, slick tyres on a damp track may be not so much problem if you've got heat in them. If exactly. you've got heat, it will be less of an issue. Uh, this is all relative to people who have zero driving uh, talent like me. I might hold a racing licence, but I'm living on my nerves just walking to the car and bolting myself into it. Never mind getting around the first corner. But this is what these drivers live for. A circuit that challenges every single fibre of their being, every nerve ending, their concentration, their bravery, and then add in that you don't know where the grip is going to be on this first lap because it's 10 minutes since you were last around this circuit and the weather will have changed. The grip level will have changed. The surface will have changed. And there's already people diving into the pit lane. They've been around the circuit, so they're coming off when it's a point longer than we green flag for the 2021 49th running of the Total NEAC Nürburgring 24 hours live on the RSL network. And it is the pole man, the Rover Racing BMW, who leads away smashing room Moved around the outside by the Bilstein Mercedes AMG KTM crossbow right in the middle of all the action. They're under the Grand Prix circuit for the first time. And there's a try for the lead down the inside. The Lance Audi, remember, going out on Michelin slick tyres, gets the green light. Now, the uh, Porsche that was there will be starting at the back of the next group as it's 84th position. It's the 132 uh, Porsche that is also sitting uh, in pit lane and uh, that is the Mathol Racing AV Porsche Cayman S, the Wolfgang Weber uh, machine. So they'll start, I think, at the back of the next group. Conrad Lamborghini down to fourth place, which puts the Schubert Motorsport M6 up into third place. So uh, the, the Lamborghini there just, I thought that would get a great start, that Lamborghini, and it did, did to begin with, but uh, just lost out after turn one and just couldn't hold it down to the Grand Prix circuit, dropping down to oh. uh, fourth place. Falcon Motorsport BMW's uh, Porsche is running all over the curbing on turn three of yeah. a 24-hour race. Unbelievable stuff. Both of them going past Sven Muller uh, and making up positions that did not qualify well. Perhaps Peter Mackay, uh, one of the surprises was the pace 
of the Falcon Porsches in the qualifying sessions, but they did not turn that into good grid positions. But what we're seeing, even before we've left the Grand Prix circuit on the first lap, is they've lost none of the speed that we saw early in the week in the 33 and 44 car. No, it's as if they put it in the locker and brought it back out again for the race. Those cars were the fastest of the Vysak built machines in the dry conditions. In the wet, not so much. So the Falcon team will really be hoping that this stays dry for as long as possible throughout the 24 hours. And you could just see the grip advantage those two Falcon cars had as they drove past the number two Audi like it was sitting still. Yeah, and the Freisinger Porsche and Mercedes having a side-by-side -side moment going down to Hatzenbach on, as we've just said, uh, John and Peter, the first lap of a 24-hour race. We know it's 10-minute laps, let's call it that. But uh, uh, already side-by-side, -side, duking it out and uh, not giving anybody any or near respect, but uh, there's certainly elbows out. So we're, you know, not a dozen corners, half a dozen corners into a 24-hour race. Quite extraordinary uh, scenes on that opening lap ready wipers starting to be applied already as they go down through hats and back now there's a bit of spray coming up that's this the bit where it is it is slightly damp up over the top there and down through bag work we saw but by the time they got to carousel on the opening lap sort of the formation lap that was when it already dried out again so second group are going to come up through tier garden in a second and the second group will be starting very shortly john and this is headed by the two hundes the uh, elantra and the TCR i20N and the performance brand for uh, i30N, excuse me, Luca Engsler will come to the line 8.30 and 8.31 oh, and Engsler absolutely mobbed at the start by Caymans, one, two, three cars, he's got a Cooper right up his tailpipes as well as they head down to their start, the Mathol Racing EV 132, Porsche Cayman will join on the back of this. One, two, three, four across the start line. No spray being kicked up there. Engsler battling for his position through the first of the S's, not taking the full how hook here. It's the only bit of the Grand Prix circuit they don't use in the 24 hour layout because it's actually being used in the early part of the week. There's extra paddock space for what was a fairly expensive young time, a three hour race when the rain hit about an hour and 17 minutes into that race and as a fan of old Porsches I had to look away it was it's not pleasant so it is the Elantra that leads the second group meantime Rover Racing at still out no not out front because the AMG has stormed through it the lead and pulled away and pulled away by a decent margin everybody else is bottled up so it's HRT in the SP9 class. That's the Adam Christodoulou, Mauro Engel, Manuel Metzger and Lucas Stoltz car, the number four in the yellow and blue colours. Uh, Nicky Katzberg looks like he might have lost out round the outside at Arnberg. Oh my goodness, at the top of the foxhole. In the damp, down through the foxhole, Nicky Katzberg for Rover Racing in the BMW. That's where he lost the lead. And it's Katzberg... Uh, driving, as I say, for Rover Racing. Frank, Mac uh, Frank, Fred McAvicky up seven places as well for Porsche in the Frigatelli Racing Team. I think it's Lucas Stoltz that started the HRT machine. Yes, it is Lucas Stoltz. He's the man that leads, and he's gone. And I mean gone. He's cleared off. Extraordinary stuff just absolutely mugged Nicky Katzberg and that, that's last year's winner that's that's no mean personal feat to mug as you said where it was as well but Arenberg just going out to the foxhole that is extraordinary and it's the distance he's put on him already that surprises me John that's the start of where the track is getting wet it's where the weather comes from the distinctive yellow and light blue colours then of the Bilstein shock absorber livery Meantime, at the green flag, we saw a couple of cars jump into the pit lane. Peter Mack was watching that. Yeah, we've seen the BMW Junior Team car driven by Augusto Farfus coming in at the green flag, as did Maro Engel and Henry Walkenhorst in the Pro-Am class number 100 BMW. So there is, I'm trying to look through the, the uh, regulations because the SP9 cars do have a five lap minimum stint time. 
So without serving that, I wonder if we'll be in for a penalty, but I'm uh, uh, hold collar. I'm trying to find out. Force majeure. I'm sure it'll be spoken about already by the guys uh, on the pit wall. Kevin Estra in the 911, number 911, 911 uh, for Manti Racing, very much a local team. Their workshop is just the other side of the Dottigahoe at Moist Path. Been there for many years, Olaf. Almost has this in his back garden, as a, I suppose, as a test track, the Nürburgring Nordschleife and Kevin Estra starting that car. There's a huge group of cars, including both the Fricadelli Porsches, that are having a cracking scrap down towards Brunchen. Through goes the Rutronic Silver Porsche as well. So three Porsches chasing two BMWs in that battle. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, the third on down, actually. Maybe a little bit further back. Might have been much yellow in the AMG team get speed. Have to get used to that car being in uh, different colours. No, definitely two BMWs there at the head of that. BWT sponsored Mercedes in there. Then the first of the Lamborghinis is the Hankook Tyres Triple F racing team. And that's Mara Mapelli started that car. Frank Stippers in there as well. Kevin Estra has flown up through and trying to follow him through. It's Robin Thrange, and this is all battles in the middle to the bottom of the top 10 as they begin to pick up speed on a drying part. We've got almost thirds of the track, Peter Snowden, uh, up to about Arenberg, then the middle section, and then it's dry again towards the end. Well, Kevin Astra there in the Manti Grello car. Uh, he's uh, he started. I mean, he's come up through the field. He's a tenth, but he's. I would say he's now on the on the boot lid of uh, the 31 uh, Frank Mcavitzi Fricadelli Porsche. Indeed, he is on the dotting of her. It is exactly that, and uh, getting that drag that draft. It is two equal cars, but of course in the slipstream there, Kevin Estra, and we saw this in the uh, NLS uh, round or the six-hour one where he used a. A little bit of the grass and a tiny bit more uh, to get through at the end of the first lap. Not he's shy, is he? He's not shy. No, but, uh, uh, Johnny, Johnny Parr and I contested how much of the how much of the tyres were actually on the grass, but it was a uh, uh, more than I'd have liked put it that way at the end of the first lap. But he, Kevin Nash has done it again. He's now ahead of uh, the Frigidelli number 31 car. So that, in my uh, surmise, is going to put him uh, P4 at the end of this first lap, John. Through there, go then to complete the first racing lap. Somewhat of a a lap of discovery with conditions changing all the time. Just 7.3 7. second lead for, uh, for our, our, our leading car. Unbelievable already in one lap. Wow. Uh, and that is an amazing thing. I'm, I'm hesitating because I was double checking. I was reading the yeah, right I figure there. Sorry, I was just wasn't doubting. Well, I was doubting myself. I was like, seriously? 7.3 seconds on the opening lap of the 24-hour race. And Kevin Estra has come up, Peter Mackay, from outside the top 10 in the third position at the end of the first lap. Yeah, Revan Kevin Estra, the lap record holder in the NLS, don't forget, has never won the 24-hour, though. He's won pretty much How everything else. Be? But I know, I know, it's, it's scary. I mean, he's regarded as one of the very best in the world at this particular circuit. But 11th to third. However, Kevin is known for his pass on the grass uh, specials, but I don't know if he'll be trying that today because that grass will be soaking wet and those pass on the grass has become a little bit more risky given the conditions we've had over the last two days. That's absolutely right, and it's it's fourth actually because our timing screen hadn't quite updated. We had Nicky Katzberg at number one. Uh, it wasn't. It's, it's Luke Stoltz. Stoltz was so Stoltz. far ahead. Exactly. Exactly. It so, it's it's, so it's Stoltz, Katzberg, Klingman, and Estra in fourth. So it's Mercedes. BMW in the middle there, but two different teams, Rover Racing and Schubert, and then the Manti, Grello, Fricadelli, and Rutronic Racing Porsches in fourth, fifth, and sixth. So it's a, it's a classic. Oh, there's a little bit of contact we've just seen on uh, something going on there between them and the Falcon Porsches and, yeah, and, and AMGs. And this, uh, I think Dennis Marshall is struggling with a puncture, uh, trying to get back to the pits, which will slow things down for him. Oh, no, it was... Uh, it was the Conrad, L Lamborghini. Conrad Lamborghini right into the side of Fred Makovecki at Armberg the first time uh, around. So uh, I saw a punctured tyre, but uh, whether Ooh. that was... Well, that's also close contact as well uh, from the 5 Audi and the uh, SPX Glickenhaus as well. Well, they don't want to be uh, involved in bumping and boring 
uh, so far. What we did say, actually, was the uh, Le Mans hybrid car going around. It may have done so, but uh, didn't uh, notice that going out the pit, if I'm honest, uh, before the race. All right, take a deep breath. I, I won't say it's starting to settle down, because even if I did, you wouldn't believe me. But at the front of the field, Lucas Stoltz leads for AMG Team HRT, heading out onto the business part of the Nordschleife for the second lap. 159 laps is the distance record. And at the moment, it's seven and a half seconds, the gap to second being disputed by Rover Racing, Schubert Motorsport, Manti Racing and Frickadelli Racing Team. Julian Andlau right there for Rutronic Racing and down towards the bottom end of the top 10, and they're all close together. The Hancock Triple F Lamborghini, Team Get Speed, Phoenix Racing in the shape of Frank Stittler in the Audi, and then that Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini Huracan. And interestingly, Nico Muller has brought in the car collection Team Audi Sport into the pits as well. So that's, um, I'm surprised that's coming. So is that a tyre change? Oh, we've got a big fire, a big conflagration, uh, and that is uh, one of the Porsche Cup cars. I th I think it's the 689 car, the Click Verscherung team, and that car is well alight. The driver taking a fire extinguisher to the left rear, but that car is, I'm, I'm not sure that's saveable. It's certainly not coming back in the race. That's a huge fire from the engine compartment. Marshall's getting in there as well now, and... So hats and back, isn't it? Just going on to the Nord slide. Correct. Yeah. Early part of the hats and back, just where you come from the middle of the road to break into that serpentine section. And the driver is out of the car. But this is drama early on in the 49th running of the ADSC 24 hours of the Nürburgring. And that will have a slow zone immediately at that point. Don't ex If this is your first time, we will not be talking about safety cars they, they don't come out on this circuit unless we're bringing everybody back in the pit lane and even then it tends to be done under a red flag so hats and back accord 60 zone slow zone before it and those are absolute drivers must must respect that they can be pulled out of the race if they aren't they've not got that out yet peter that's still burning underneath all that extinguishing that's been put on there we've got an intervention uh, and one of the Dodge pickup trucks out there, which has got some dry powder in it as well. They'll try and get that. And I think that might be one of the fire tenders, actually, that has turned up there, one of the DMSB. But that car, that's severe damage. I doubt we'll see that one again. 100%. Uh, utter despair for the team and drive everybody involved in that. And the mechanics will be uh, looking at that car, thinking that's that's just weeks and weeks of clearing all that foam and extinguishers off that car. Like you, though, John, that first sight of that, it was so well alight. It was... It, I mean, it's kind of like the barbecue I do, uh, as in far too many flames and burn everything. But it's uh, it's just seemed to have caught itself left-hand side. It's almost as if there's an oil union or something Correct. gone. And just gone onto the exhaust. It's it's self-combusted. Uh, so that's the, a lap. They've done a lap of the uh, of yeah. the race. One lap. And, and actually, the car must have been going quite slowly because they were already being caught by the leading cars. And you've got a feel for Click Versaikerung team. Uh, Robin Chernowski, Kirsten... Uh, Jordanex, Peter Schamach and Max Koch because their race, their weekend is now over. The only good news is that the driver is out of that car. Take a wee while to get that one cleared out of the way because that might not tour. We might need a, a lift for that. Meantime, at the head of the field, still seven seconds, Stoltz from Klatsburg, Mercedes from BMW. Team HRT number four from Rover Racing number one. Number one because they won this race last year. Kevin Estra is right up with Jens Klingmann for third position. Schubert BMW from Manti Porsche as they head down to Brunschen. And there's still slippery surface flags out there. Now, I wonder then if that Porsche has been dropping oil all the way around and finally it's got onto the exhaust or is that just the remnants of the rain shower from early on. We've had some more pit stoppers uh, as well. Uh, just a few moments ago, the number two car was in and out of the pits for Audi Sport Team Car Collection, Nico Muller. Now that was one of the cars, Peter Mack, that started on wet weather tires. Uh, there was a number of them. Uh, 
uh, also I've noticed uh, a few mores that have come into the pits. So have you been able to clarify that five lap stint ruling? I wish I could, no. Uh, I've, I've looked the, the regulations upside down and inside out. We will keep looking and keep uh, keep trying to find out. It might be that you have to serve a longer pit stop. Of course, the pit stop times are controlled here at the Nürburgring um, by, uh, you know, each depending on the number of laps you've done, you have a certain set time that you have to spend in the pit lane. And to be honest, you need it with the uh, uh, Tesco Club Card uh, fill filling station pumps that they have here. There's no... Um, no, uh, shall we say, defying the laws of gravity uh, fueling here at uh, at the Nürburgring. It's very much the same pace you would have when you're filling your car up at the supermarket. Yeah, and that is something that, again, if you're not used to this, you, you won't believe it. There's only one pump between two pits, up to eight cars per pit, and it is just a pistol grip. So people having to work their way through it uh, and... There's an element of working together, Peter Snowden, that has to happen in the pit lane. Get back to that in a moment because Estra is right up the rear aerofoil of. Uh, 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 of uh, uh, the other way around, it's. it's uh, yeah, sorry, it's right, Estra, my apologies. Yes. Right with Katzberg, he's yes. got past Klingman, I think, now. Indeed, he has. He's back for second place as he goes across the line there. Another worthy mention is, of course, uh, the eighth, sorry, eighth, seventh place, but eighth place Carl now is from 18 up, uh, is the. Uh, Hancock Lamborghini of Mauro Maffielli. Great first uh, opening lap there for him as well. Yeah, he's come up uh, from 18 for that. Uh, for that, and Peter, Peter Mack, you've uh, you've got clarification on the calling into the pits early rule. That is uh, my apologies, rookie error for me. Um, only the, only to do with refueling, so you can come in for tyres as much as you want within that opening five laps, but you can't touch the fuel pump. So uh, those cars were allowed uh, allowed to make those stops, and it seems that those cars, particularly the number two Audi, which was the only pro class car that went out on wet, by our knowledge, it looks like those tyres are turning to chewing gum on the mostly dry circuit. So. The tyres are either on completely dry slick tyre or perhaps maybe an intermediate, but I think it was much more likely to be full slicks for all the drivers and they'll just have to manage it when they get to the wet patches. It's not often I'm right. <laughs> well, you were spot on there. Soon, but I, it was can, can we just I'm make a note? When I am. Yeah, I, I'm writing that. I've literally got a piece he of paper. He has, he has. Well, time, he's date stamping it as well. How kind uh, is that? I, but, but how clever then, Snowy, that... Lan thought we could be very right or very wrong here. What are we going to lose by sitting in the pits and watching? From uh, that's using the technology, their driver in that number 29 car, which all right, it's dropped way down, um, but it's still in the game and it hasn't had to make another pit stop. If they'd put wets on for Chris Meese, then he would have had to make another pit stop, he would have been another 30 seconds, 40 seconds, a minute down. The road and Chris Meats was watching an onboard feed on his phone belted into the car. Brilliant use of the technology, uh, absolutely. Just on an iPhone, uh, that's just the way to do it. The um, uh, other brands are available, of course. Um, it might have been a Samsung Galaxy, um, but, um, Black uh, yes. Um, but the, the, the point is, as you say, uh, it was always a bit of an anomaly for me when, when we did 24 hour races. Of, You've got all this pressure of qualifying and stuff, and you know, British GT is one thing, it's a sprint and it's how long's the race, an hour, an hour and a half, whatever it may be, at the time you're doing it. It's a 24 hour race, and I always found it interesting, apart from bragging rights, you've got the Rover Racing BMW at the front today, Nicky Katzberg, the winning car, the defending car from last year. Yes, but what a way to go into the 2021 edition of this, being the winning car from last year, pole position car of this year. Yeah, it's great. But in reality, do you need to be up at the front there? It's a 24-hour race. We've been talking now a few minutes. There's been lots of excitement. Typical Nürburgring weather. We've had a car on fire already. And we've got 23 hours and 39 minutes to go still. And just let that sink in for a minute. So what's the problem with starting in the pit lane? If, if it worked, it'd have been great. If it hadn't, it doesn't matter. What have you lost? What you have gained, as you said quite rightly, John, is, of course, a slightly different pit stop strategy because now they don't have to do that quite as early and that could make all the difference. Later foundations now. So that was Peter Snowden, Peter Mackay with us as well in the RSL Global Broadcast Centre. Kevin Estra still unable to get by 
the second place BMW Rover Racing of Nicky Katzberg. Adnar Force, the leader, just being dragged back a little bit. Luther Stoltz is settling into his uh, settling into his rhythm as a side-by-side -side battle. BMW versus Porsche and Estra goes around the outside, coming out of Adnar Force, past the Dacia Logan, which is in the race. Over the top of the hill and heading down towards Callenhardt. Worst job in the world, by the way, other than being technical delegate and having to do BOP in any series, is when you turn up at the Nürburgring Nordschleife and you say, um, and you're marshalling, and uh, you say, which post am I on? I'll tell you what post you're on. And what job you do? Blue flag, mate. Oh, thanks. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. The Dacia is in the race, for those that were asking. They, they, well, Shaunas did not qualify. They had some issues. Uh, but they're out in SP4 from memory. memory. Uh, and a problem for Lamborghini. Lamborghini. Lambo. That's that the a Conrad, Conrad car. Conrad car, yeah. That was Adnar Forst pulling off onto the left-hand side right at the top of Adnar Forst. That was a moment or two ago. And Klaus Backler has already gone through. And following on, David Pittard off as well in the Valkenhorst BMW. That's an unusual mistake from David. He just slid off. Now, has he got damage as well? He certainly clipped the inside barrier there. I'm just looking at the right rear of that uh, Conrad. Uh, Has the like, bayonet coming together? It, it, an odd angle, so let, let's not uh, let's not speculate too much. But it just just looks a bit rather like the number 72 uh, BMW we've just spotted now. That's got a broken tow link and is going out with uh, it's the number 240 car. That's uh, one of the Cup Five machines. Yeah, yeah the uh, Merlini-driven car. Uh, with a massive right rear toe out. That's a tow link uh, failure on that, so he's obviously tapped a barrier It's raining there. again, Peter. It, it is. I think that's exactly what's catching people out, John. Nico Muller just understeering off at the end of the Foxhall. Again, I'll say it again, that's where you tend to get the first signs of bad weather. Uh, Nico can't keep the car in a straight line, so there may be more damage there. Super piece of driving in that number two. 4-0 to keep that car uh, on the road. That's the one with the right rear tolling problem that Snowy was mentioning. Uh, it's uh, Francesco Merlini, the man from Dresden Saint Jean, -Jean in uh, France. But he'd get that car back to the pits. Meantime, seemingly unaffected by what's going on to so many of the others. We've still got a cracking battle going on. The lead is about still around about six and a half seven seconds from Lucas Stoltz to Nicky Kasberg with uh, with sorry Kevin Estra who's gone through in the second now just waiting for the timing to catch up so Estra, Estra back into into second in the 911 then in fourth Jens Klingman, Makovecki, Jalen Andler, Marco Mappelli and they are in one long line and in traffic down at Brunschen at the moment, where there's a few hardy souls gathered, nowhere near the hundreds of thousands that would normally be allowed in the forest, but there are a few spectator areas that have been allowed to be open, and of course down the front street as well, in the grandstands with allocated seating, I believe, this year. Frickadelli Porsche on the back of that long train of cars, which is uh, Matty Campbell uh, in... 15th position so effectively you've got from what fourth or fifth down over there Peter Mackay all the way down to Campbell in 15th and in fact the uh, Sven Muller for the motorsports car is not that far uh, behind that either so pretty much the whole of the top 20 still line astern with uh, Stoltz in the HRT AMG out in front by seven and a half seconds yeah, it looks like the, the gap might just be coming down a fraction and now it looks like Kevin Estra is really on the move in the, the number 911 Manti Porsche, but horrid conditions here for the drivers on slick tyres with no tread at all and going through some real damp patches we saw at Adenauer Force where there's issues there as well for a number of drivers spearing off onto the grass, thankfully without too much damage, um, but Oh, this is this is as hard as you'll possibly get doing slick tyres 
and you, you don't know where there's going to be little spurts of rain and the thing is these little flash showers they can come up at any point and they can come and go in two or three minutes and that's the problem peter you don't know mm. where they're going to be and no. at the front of the field at nine minutes and 11 seconds the time well over 10 minutes for most of the other classes and snowy as a driver you've got to expect the unexpected you've got to expect it to be different i said to bruce jones yesterday it's almost like driving a rally car on a forest road because it's 10 11 minutes since you were last at that part of the track and everything that you knew about that part of the track may well have changed it's a movable feast to say that the, the only winner on this uh, this nobo ring for this circuit this venue this this edition every year is the weather and uh, it's, it's uh, Crowded House got it absolutely right in 1991 with their hit of uh, Weather With You. Uh, that's, that's what you need to follow with this, this race. i tell you who is on the move as well, John, is the uh, Phoenix Audi. Uh, Robbie Friends in uh, the 10th. He's, uh, he's got a couple of purple sectors starting to show up for him. He's been some great times there. Uh, so keep an eye on that car. He's, of course, behind uh, his teammate, uh, Frank Stippler, uh, in the uh, uh, number 11 car. Uh, in terms of position on track the uh into the pit lane the foxtail kissling manta with the uh venerable volta strychek behind the wheel the man who used to head up the opal performance center and, uh, many long sensible chats for that and another car with overheating problems is it worse than that it's the number eight the amg that's, that's the fabian schiller Mercedes and he's out of the car he's having a good look around that's not good news at all well this is extraordinary stuff been running very well at the front of the field for AMG team get speed he was having a look around the right hand side towards where the exhaust was uh, there and there's what could be oil smoke it could be steam I, I think it's the former he'll have smelt that Peter Snowden as much as felt the heat from that and he's got that car off the circuit as quickly as possible well he has but he, he leapt out of it as you say uh, very animatedly dynamically and athletically i have to say leapt round to the right hand side it was as if it is definitely smoke not steam you're right john uh, but he's then got jump back into it again with his equal haste as if he was about to start moving it i oh, get some air through it uh, so i'm not quite sure what that's all about there's an intervention vehicle's now arrived at that but we've got uh, still uh, the clear up going on on the hats and back on the, the, the 69 car yeah slow zone is still there for the uh, slightly medium rare porsche um and by the way that was at the uh down at uh, dunlop for at the bottom of the grand prix circuit for fabian schiller kevin estra still having a go and estra is with luca stoltz now as the number 69 porsche but it looks bad from the outside. It's going to be even worse in the engine compartment now. Fabian Schiller reinstalls himself to the team Get Speed number eight car. There is a little service road where he is. He'll drive around there, a bit of rally crossing. Well, you said, you said rally. He's gone and proven it. Well, he, he has. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, he was in a close battle with uh, one of the Rover Racing BMWs a little while before that but I didn't see any coming together there meantime battle for the lead let's get back to that now this is remember only lap three down of potentially 150 odd 160 laps and Kevin Estra is right on the tail now of the leader Lucas Stoltz they're coming to the end of the Fox Hall down one gear brake down another gear brake down a third gear at the top of Adenar Forest and into the pit lane with uh, a, this is one of the Falcon Horse BMWs it is the 101 car and that car's coming that's been off the track huge amount of grass debris on the front and it's going into the garage on the dollies doesn't necessarily mean massive trouble now that was David Pittard who we saw off at the top of Adenar Forest a lap ago and I think he clipped the arm core on the left hand side with the left front of that car he's certainly been one of the most expensive and potentially quickest grass cutting machines in the world but he's got the car back Peter Snowden and, and that's the important thing uh, absolutely I think just picked up there's a lot of debris it depends what it's done underneath the, that, the debris we can see there is the the visual part is in the air intake it depends what damage has gone underneath how much it's bounced over curbs we saw it in qualifying one of the 
I think one of the M4s that had a, a little rotation then damaged the diffuser that's then dragged onto the track at the front end of the diffuser that came loose. It just, as you say, it was always collateral. What's interesting, John, is we're half an hour in now, so now we've got, we've got, we've had this much excitement in half an hour, we've got another 47 half-hour seconds to go if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> it's a different way of looking at it, I know, but get your caught right now. <laughs> Uh, you're absolutely right. What we're going to do, as in previous years, uh, we will do an hourly updates for you, uh, and we'll do the hourly updates on the clock hour. So it's just after four o'clock in Germany now. So in the next hour, on the next hour, we'll do you an hourly update. And what we're going to do is, as we've done in previous years, Joe Bradley has split the field into roughly two halves of the 20 classes or thereabouts and we'll do one half on the odd hour so four uh, four o'clock or three o'clock in the uk and one half on the other but they will just rotate through the lamborghini, Jeffrey, that, lamborghini, current lamborghini. that was that a, another car, car that was stopped at the top of exactly yeah, and together. now forced and that car is moving again for now with the battle for the lead still going on uh, Lucas Dalt still leads. SPX is Glickenhaus in 21st overall. Cup X is the True Racing Crossport in uh, 23rd overall. It's the 36 Black Falcon Mercedes in 26th overall. Giorgio Piana at the wheel of that, leading SPAT. SP Pro, I, I foresee a big battle in uh, SP Pro actually. Black Falcon. Uh, ha, uh, at the head of that, it was the 315 32nd. Chris Meeks for Huber Motorsport lead SP7 in the GT3 Cup car. That's number 18, 34th position. The AT alternatively fuel fueled leader is in 38th. That's the 320 Porsche Cup car from Four Motors Bio Concept. SP10 offer racing by Bok BMW M4 GT4. They are in 40th position for the number 70th. The GT Tire Motorsport number 53. It's the all-female driver crew, Christina Nielsen and Pitman Mann in that car. They're leading SP8 up against the might of the Lexus uh, RCF. It's not an RCF. Yes, it's an RCF, isn't it, on that? Uh, and we've got SP8 then leading that class in 45th. Uh, it's the Milner Motorsport Porsche Cayman in 51st position, leading Cup 3 in 309. Mark Bessing leads for Hyundai in the Elantra in the TCR class in the 830. Schubert leads Cup 5, which is the M240 class. That's a, the number 890 in 68th position. Peter Kate leads his class in the late starting, but meant we got to see it and now know what it looks like. Thank you, Peter. 718 Cayman GTS in 71st position. It is V3T, the next leader in 72nd. That's the 1618 Mathol Racing 718 Cayman S. Max Kreuzer Racing leads in the SP3T with a Golf GTI TCR. They're in 73rd in that triple three category. 159 leads V2T for FX Performance GBR in a 330i BMW. 81st position for the 159. In 90th, the 240i class leader is the number 230 for Avia Zorg Rennsport in their BMW. 91st, 165 is the leader in the SP2T Hyundai Motorsport i20N V6 Team Mathol Racing Porsche Cayman S in the 132 they lead that class in 96 in 100th position SP3 leader is the 121 Royal Auto Motor Club uh, GT86 Cup car that is the SP3 class that's the class that has the uh, the uh, Foxtail Manta as we've had a change of lead Peter Mackay yeah, Kevin Esther getting a brilliant run there along the Dottinger Hole on Lucas Stoltz. Nothing Stoltz could do really as well. It's just one three kilometers long the Dottinger Hole, so able to make it move. But also, Nikki Katzberg in the number one, the pole setting rover racing BMW has rallied as well and is now a three car breakaway. It'd be interesting to see if Katzberg also goes by Stoltz and if Estra breaks away at the front. Also, a car on the move, the Hankook Lamborghini of Marco Mapelli up into the top five. Brilliant run from that car. Uh, and I'll finish off the last couple of uh, class leaders. Uh, Adrenaline Motorsport with a Porsche Cayman 981 lead V5 in 104th position in the 141 car. 
Uh, the Thomas Muskins entered BMW 325i leads V4 in 110th position. That's the 153 car. It is the Kroll family outing Hoffa Racing in the BMW M3 CSL that leads SP6. I think that car is literally in a class of its own. I don't think there's any other SP6 cars from memory. The 81 car is in 111th position. And in 112th position, the number 325 is leading SP4, and that is a BMW 325i, uh, and that is one of the E90 cars. And now you know why we're going to split them up into two halves when we do that again in just under an hour's time. John, as you were running down through that class order, um, as you said, uh, the change of lead there, but it was one, two, three, one and a half seconds splitting the top three cars across the line. Estra, Stoltz and Katzberg, uh, that was all it was across there. Uh, Stoltz not content with that. Kevin Estra, uh, Peter Mack very kindly suggested that uh, today wasn't the day for Kevin Estra to do one of his pass on the grass. Well, he didn't quite, but he certainly, he went beyond the white line. Let's just say he, he kissed it, shall we say. In the meantime, uh, Stoltz is having a comeback at that there. We've had a quick look at the Conrad Lamborghini and it's the left rear that's completely loose. It looks almost as if the wheel nuts come loose, the wheels almost moving on the hub rather than a tail link damage. That's just my uneducated, non-mechanic technician eye looking at it. See, so if it wasn't a pass on the grass, could that have been streaming for winning? As soon as he was edge up okay, Don't peak it, don't peak so early. No. Keep, keep, him, keep him for 2 a.m. We'll hold that. We'll hold that <laughs> for pass on the paint. Pass on the paint, possibly. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's going to be 24 hours of cliches, isn't it? <laughs> We're bound to have the odd one. Get your bingo cards ready, everybody. It's a radio show limited network of audio and video channels, visual channels, uh, with two Peters, Mackay and Snowden, and me, John Heindorf, in the Global Broadcast Centre. Robin Frynch a minute or two ago, going down into the first corner, right up behind the Rudetronic Porsche, just giving it a little nudge. And the number nine car, just about... Uh, hanging on to its position, sitting right in behind the Fricadelli uh, Porsche as well. Great battles just outside the top 10, I have to say. Rutronic, Maury Krantz behind the wheel uh, of... Uh, no, excuse, excuse me, that's the uh, wrong line I'm looking at there. Um, Rutronic at the moment uh, sitting right in that line of cars that uh, has been battling all the way through since the start of the race. It, Remember what all the drivers, it's Fabian Schiller, isn't it? Uh, no, it's still not. It. Who's behind the Rootronic? Uh, I'm not sure for that moment, but just very quickly, John, uh, as they're at Flugplatz, the, the leading cars, it is now properly wet again up there. Foxhall. Yeah, at Foxhall. Foxhall now, yeah, yeah. yeah. a few moments ago, there were when I started it. Yeah, it, it's, it's always the top of the hill, you know, so Schwedenkreuz, Swiss Cross area, that's where it comes in. So from the Arnberg corner inwards, uh, I remember a Porsche World Cup race there when we had 90 Porsche Cup cars descending into chaos and carnage when the heavy rain hit there a few years ago. And we must have lost 15 cars, I kid you not. Uh, ex Muller Approach has got a slow zone as well. That's Marshall Post 116. So somebody's in trouble there. That tends to mean normally that someone's at the side of the road. Oh, big, big wiggle for the Mantai Porsche. Real struggle to find grip out there for Kevin Estra, who is leading the motor race and everybody struggling. How did Fred McAvetti stay away from the Hankook Triple F 63 machine a little while ago as this all hit the water and started to check up? They are living on their wits at the moment. Robin French passing a handful of cars by picking the right-hand side of the road, and the Conrad car has made it back to the pit lane. That's uh, Leighton House March coloured machine getting push, pushed back into the garage, and Franz Conrad uh, will be working on that hit. I think it was Bruce Jones that said, yes, they're always quick, but they don't always finish. Well, I'm not sure it was their fault this time. I think they may have been a wee bit of contact, perhaps with one of the BMWs, the David Pittard car but that was not seen, so I have no evidence for that. But remember, my father was a detective and I did live with him for quite a long time. So I'm looking at probability and evidence. Well, let's not go there. Um, it's, uh, you, you mentioned the, the Leighton House Mars clones. I totally agree with that. I tell you what it always reminds me of is the, is the Vitaphone Maserati MC12s. Uh, that, that sort of that's the, but that's, that's my kind of era, so uh, I'm, I'm just showing my age again. You raced against that? I did, yeah. I did.
Big slide from the KDM Crossport. It's more uh, than a slide. It's I all think the way it's going off. It's, yeah, rears are into the gravel. That's going to be difficult to get out. That's the 114 KTM, and that's because the rain is and absolutely it's, tipping it's it down there. Down. Somebody's turned the tap on at the Nürburgring. And that means people are going to be on the grass all over the place. That was the Auto Motorsport, Motor Unsport uh, machine, that number 75. Uh, and that's at the top of the foxhole. And the car sport team, uh, car, car collection off as well. Number two Audi, that's just... Only and, that was, and that, by the way, was Christian Mensel driving yeah. that car. Uh, and off as well for one of the GT tyre-sponsored uh, Caymans. 308. Which is the 308 Peter Mackay. And that's the same spot. This is all at the top of the foxhole. And, and it's just impossible to get turned in through the left-hander at Schwedenkreuz. It's a little bit off camber there, and the the water runs down the hill. And even at relatively slow speed, these cars, which are almost always all still on slick tyres, the Aviasorg Red Sport BMW, wheels turning left and right, totally locked up. Oh, and another KTM, I'm thinking now, is that an Audi? It might be one of the Audis. This is carnage, absolute carnage. It it is three, four, five, six cars, and this is all at Schwedenkreuz where the weather has hit, it's slicker than a slick thing that's had oil poured on top of it. The 350 Identi car Porsche is in there. Uh, not and that's one, of the, that's yeah. one of the new uh, shaped cup cars, actually, the 350 car. Yeah, engine running still, and he's sitting there too. It's en engine's running, lights are on, it's wipers going, it's, it's facing the wrong way at the moment. Oh, it's only just been missed by one of the Mercedes GT fours I think it was just went past it and it's stranded in the middle of the track there not where you want to be absolutely prone the number 350 car there John yeah that's that's a that's the uh, black fault teen identic uh, Porsche that's stuck and the problem is he's over the top of the brow there you can't see it and yes there's yellow flags and you'll slow down it is walking pace now walking place only uh, I have to say, John, I also, I also never thought, given my advancing years, I'd ever see a car racing in this, and I don't mean the Manta for Bruce Jones, never thought I'd see a car racing in this that I've actually raced, as in a Viper. Yeah, Viper. I still. thought they'd long gone. I thought all the photographs that we had that were in sepia still. Yeah, well, much faster in black and white, Yeah, yeah. in fairness. Uh, that uh, Tim Falcon car is still there, and it's in a very precarious position at the moment. The edges of the track around... The exit of Schwedenkreuz are muddy and very wet indeed. And this is exactly what happened in the young timer race, Peter Mackay, on Friday. About an hour and 17 minutes in. We haven't quite got that far. We're just over 45 minutes in. With appropriate flagging, we're OK now because we can get the car's advance warning there. But we've still got the, on the, that's the left-hand part of Schwedenkreuz. In the right-hand part, we've got that KTM that we saw first there, John, that just swapped ends and we thought, he went round ever so majestically. We thought he'd catch it. He just couldn't quite and drop the rears into the gravel. So that's still there. So we've got that Falcon Porsche on the entry and the KTM on the exit. So two cars there, John. I think there's somebody off in the Fox Hall as well because the Code 60 has been extended down into there. Peter Cates in the leading SP4 T Porsche Cayman has come into the pits. Well, if Peter thinks it's bad enough for Wex, then it's bad enough for Wex completing five laps at the front of the field and everybody at the front coming in. Estra, Kasberg, Stoltz coming in. Now, Peter Mackay, you can get wet tyres and you can top the fuel up. Right on time. This is just actually for the SP9 guys. The, uh, the rain, if the rain was going to come, it held on for them because now they can fuel up. If that had happened eight minutes before, that would have had, the drivers would have had to come in, put wet tyres on, and then come back in for their fuel because, of course, they're not allowed to fuel up in the first uh, five laps. So the SP9 guys all in the same place. So this should actually not shake up the order as much as we possibly thought because, of course, it's a common, uh, with another cliche for you, it's the same for everybody. Except it's not at the Nürburgring ring sometimes. I, I know what you're saying, but how many times have we heard drivers and teams uh, even this week, week, PMAC, saying, if you catch an incident and the people in front of you haven't, um, then you're going to lose a load of time. So it, it does slightly change. Now, first set of racing pit stops that we're seeing at the moment, if you're coming to this new and you're not sure about Nürburgring racing, you 
probably heard the air guns going and now it's all gone quiet fuel is going in it's been pumped in by a pistol grip from a fuel pump which is split between the two garages and that could be up to eight cars that it, that single fuel pump has to service but there is a minimum pit stop time which right now in the race don't confuse you any further is uh, governed by how many laps you've been out uh, and there is a table peter mac uh p mac that uh, tells all the teams how long they've got to be in the pit lane for how many numbers of laps they have completed since their last stop so if this for those sp9 cars the leaders that are coming in right now their minimum pit stop time is two minutes and 18 seconds however course we had a couple of teams that have already had one pit stop that means that for them they're slightly shorter minimum time they're 129 seconds so they can get a little bit of that time back but not too much and i think we're going to have this code 60 at arenberg and schwedenkreuz for quite some time because there is wreckage everywhere and actually they're going to have to clear because quite a lot of mud on the road as well and that is just as dangerous as the water itself I, I, and i can't decide whether it is a um, a course vehicle that is right at the top of the foxhole very very unlucky indeed for the number 308 porsche which i thought had got through it this is the black falcon of team textile so two black falcon cars at the same area of the track the cayman and the 911 manti racing car the, the Audi. Audi had the big impact on the right hand side of the spot, all the damage. And, and the TCRs right that's behind That's the Hyundai. It. Yeah, right that's the Hyundai it. i30. The, the Golf. Was that a Golf? It's a Golf, yeah. Right, it's I think it's maybe mic. one of the SP. Oh, it's, it's not ah. TCR, I don't think. And I've just one got my three cars. SP3 my apologies. I've just got the answer yes. to the 350 Porsche as well, boys. Is that the. I've uh, just seen the, the incident there. What's actually happened is that the left rear has taken an impact and that's what's broken that's why that car couldn't move it the angle we saw it was uh, it was possible the 24 round you though severe that's the uh, car that went yeah, exactly that's severe speed. damage on the front right we saw this as a bit of qualifying smoking coming back at a quite a pace as well on the dry part of the circuit now i think he's coming up to tear going back into our view very shortly but it's, there's a lot of damage there on the front right of that audi this is one John. of two lion speed cars in that bright orange color i was just trying to work out which one it was from the uh, speeding blurry number but this is indeed the 24 as peter mentioned so there uh well it's been driven back at pace with bodywork damage to the front uh some tire rope there are some radiators uh and ancillary bits and bobs under that front valance on the right hand side it's a, it's a brave pace to bring a damaged car back i would say uh, just just watching that it's uh, smoking heavily and that's just from the sheer pace that it's being brought back at but if it gets back and gets away with it all, all well and good but that's the car you say it's fallen off at uh, straight boys and did the hit the barriers hard on the right hand side hence the uh, front right damage to that car so that's the number 24 lion speed audi that's going to have to have a uh, uh, quite some time in its pit box john yoda's uncle's just tweeted hell spells 17 zones of code 60. yep that's what happens when it starts to rain out of nowhere we've not done an hour's worth of racing yet still 10 minutes to go uh, before that happens coming up a bit later on Bruce jones with joe bradley and they'll uh, be taking over as we go for a lie down in a darkened room i think still the cleanup continues at schweden kreutz but that's not the only incident out there the the, the beautiful thing is that because it's such a long circuit we're still racing and fred mcavecki is making up positions and just getting a little hip and shoulder from the audi that he's battling with that's frank stippler that he's having a go at in the phoenix racing number 11 and frank was i'm afraid deciding he wasn't going to go by there it was an outside maneuver but further around the track it is incredibly wet with standing water making it look like the cars the first and second place cars have got bow waves now they are still struggling i believe peter mckay i believe 
that the leading cars have not yet stopped. So they're still on slicks. No, according to our information, the number seven of Raffaele Marciello uh, has gone straight through. He now leads the race in the number seven Mercedes. The number nine gets speed Mercedes. That's the Pro-Am car. That's the Janine Schaffner entered car driven by Moritz Krantz at this moment in time. It's gone straight through. And also Tobias Muller in the number 44 uh, Falcon Motorsports Porsche, interestingly. So, uh, sorry, Sven Muller. I've done that twice now this weekend. Sven Muller. 29 year old from Mainz. So, will that be genius or will it be foolish? Uh, I wouldn't want to call which one. <laughs> it's, it's brave. The other car, by the way, that was sitting at the top of Arnberg, at the top of the foxhole, um, was the Aviazog Rennsport BMW that almost but not quite got away with it. And that's requiring some attention as well. There's slow zones and yellow flags so far and Schwed Kreutz is now showing us all clear uh, at Marshall's post 82 to 86 so the Marshalls God bless every one of them wherever you work wherever you are in the world whether you call yourself a Marshall or a corner worker or a flagger or whatever thank you and thank you to all of our volunteer officials as well without simply whom we can't go motor racing I'm not sure it is clear at Schwed Kreutz actually it's still showing us yellow as Maro Engel goes through there it's that 350 uh, Porsche to remove isn't it John they've got to get rid of there. And, the, and, and the, the Abiesorg the... Rennsport machine Correct, yeah, yeah. Uh, you said about various names for marshals track workers corner workers whatever I think without overselling it heroes heroes what spot on orange oh. army orange army yeah white in the states uh, at the moment trying to stay as dry and as warm uh, as enough, possible the, uh, the, the uh, the change of surface flag out now to when I, when I first started racing it was called the oil flag that soon got changed to a, a slippery surface flag is now regarded as a change of surface flag because it might be that somebody's brought gravel debris grass etc and so it's a change so it's a change of surface as you I think you identified yesterday at one point in your qualifying report yeah John, but it's uh, it's just it's to warn a driver that the surface has changed yeah. it might be something totally different fluids etc etc but it's a change of surface flag now which is Probably one of those few things I'd say it's a, 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 a good update. Yeah, and it can't, as you say, it can be debris. It was once described to me by a rather senior at Marshall, and a hello to everybody in the uh, British Motor Racing Marshalls Club, uh, of which I am honoured to be an ambassador, uh, as a CRAP on the track flag. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> yes. We, 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 we all like a new monarch. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. Don't start me. I've got to go back I to army training. I think we can probably see it. It was crap on the I track. I think you can. Yeah. Well, I have now, twice. Yes, exactly. Uh, if I get slapped on the back of the head by the responsible adult, it'll be uh, any seconds now. Pe start Peter Mack, down. just Good. listen and learn from our great leader. <laughs> <laughs> hardly, <laughs> hardly that. Raffaele Marcello then leading by 5.2 seconds in the Team Get Speed AMG Mercedes from Falkland Motorsport uh, in second position. That's number 44. Then Molly Kratz for Get Speed in the Mercedes AMG GT3. That's the number nine. Mantai, Kevin Estra in the 911 is the first car that's been into the pits and presumably then gone on to wet weather tyres because I can't imagine they put a, um, a, a new set of uh, wets on. I'm also hearing the S, uh, the Glickenhaus uh, didn't leave from the pits, it entered from the paddock, paddock gates. Uh, is uh, what I'm hearing. I'm not sure quite how long ago that was, but that car, the 704, is in 22nd position. Leads SPX at the moment. Thomas Much at the the wheel of that. Through goes the 110. This is the black, uh, glorious-looking KTM crossbow from Teichmann Racing. Crossbow GT4, and the still with that signature lift up front where you climb in it's not doors as such rather a big clam shell Luca Engsler is on perfectly dry roads coming through to the first part of the Flans Garden uh, for the number 8831 Hyundai i30 N uh, and in fan favourite news uh, Peter Mac P Mac Tell us about two of the fan favourites. 
Well, this is in the, let's be honest, the most important class on the field, the SP3 Dolly Mixture class, which of course has the two fan favourites, the Dacia Logan and the Opal Manta. And at the moment, the Dacia Logan is beating the Opal Manta at the moment. Fourth in class plays fifth in class with their SP3 rivals a little bit further up the road. Leading an SP3 in the Dolly Mixture class right now is the Toyota GT86, which I can imagine is a whole load of fun in these connect- these conditions with its skinny tyres. Well, our man in the pit lane, Lucas, who can feel the weather uh, much better than we can in the Global Broadcast Centre. It's raining again uh, in the pit lane. So whoever went on to wet weather tyres, including the 911, up into fourth position, Kevin Estra and Lucas Stoltz uh, in his wheel tracks at the moment as they head towards the second of the carousels, the Kleiner carousel. Minimum pit stop time not complied with for the number 34. So that will be... Literal Realm GT4 Mercedes. Yeah. That Ooh. is that is going to cost them. That is the uh, Marcel Markovic's car. And they are going to get a time penalty of 35 seconds. Now, that will be served the next time it comes into pit lane. There's a penalty box on the way into the pits. He does not have to make a specific trip into the pit lane. Estra dragging up behind the number four Mercedes, having just been passed by Stoltz takes him back again these two swapping places around the lap and that is the battle for fourth position that Porsche has some speed and particularly works well Peter Snowden in the draft in the slipstream it certainly does it certainly works well in the uh, in the wet it's got some legs on that Mercedes it's not not many a car I would say give an AMG GT3 Mercedes a run uh, but it certainly can uh, but it just they do seem to swap back again a bit later. So uh, I say we were looking through qualifying. If you go back to the last couple of days, I think so many reports, John, uh, that you and Peter Macca were covering and Bruce, that, that the Mercedes were just outside of it for a long time. And all of a sudden, it, when it rained, they seemed to come to the fore again and, and the Porsche is back up there again. So that just seems to be the case at the moment. What have we got at the front of the field there? Marciella, uh, Muller and Krantz in the pits now. So uh, uh, Mercedes, Porsche and two, two Mercedes. That's the uh, uh, get speeds. Falcon and uh, AMG. Uh, sorry, yeah, they get to the second get speed car as well. I'm getting tongue tied. My apologies. Uh, lead car is now Kevin Estra, uh, the, the anti Porsche at the head of the field with Schultz in second place. As we've got another uh, car going off. I think that's into Hudson back. It's uh, the very early yeah, part. It's so another one of the. Back. It's one of the KTM. KTMs. Isn't it? It's the that's 60. rattled itself down the barriers. That's a number 60 car, isn't it? Yeah, that's another Teichmann racing car. That's the. Carl Heiss Teichmann driven machine with Erkan Kader Usman Lauda Kreiheimer, who's very, very quick. Uh, the Salzburg based driver and Stefan uh, Brod Merkel. And that did have some. Uh, 309, one of the Caymans off the That's twice well. for that car. Well, losing it, somebody else behind having to avoid him doing it. That's but what's Prince, extraordinary sir. to see, though, John, is that some in some of these images, we're just getting quick clips off here, is that the. Uh, the standing water uh, at apexes is one thing, but it's on downhill parts of the circuit. So it's running down the hill. So your driver wants to naturally go for the apex there, and you can't because it's standing water. It just flicks the car around. You've got aquaplaning and uh, uh, all sorts of issues uh, come into play. So um, it's still catching out. Quite often, John, uh, I'm sure you're asked by people that are outside of motorsport, you know, what it is that we do and try and describe what it is about uh, the Nürburgring, what is it about 24-hour racing? Well, we've literally just a few seconds ago dipped under uh, the first hour of this race. You could show this first hour and say, this is a highlight of a 24-hour race. And then say, by the way, it's not. It's the first hour. That's the excitement level already. One hour, John. 60 minutes is completed then. we give you a rundown of the top times. Kevin Estra now goes to the lead. The brave three who stayed out have pitted. It's the 911 Manti Racing Porsche by about a second from in second place Lucas Stoltz in the Mercedes from Team HRT. Then the two Rover Racing, the Rover Oil sponsored BMWs. Nicky Katzberg in the defending champion car from last year from this race. And then 
Martin Tomchik to 1 and 98, third and fourth. Julian Anlav, a Rootronic Porsche. The number three car is next up. In fifth and sixth is Robin Frange for Audi Sport Team Phoenix. And seventh is Josh Burton for KCMG. Porsche number 18. Eighth, Frank Stippler still having a cracking battle in his Phoenix Audi with the Fricadelli number 31 of Fred Makovicki. Robin Frange fist in the wrong direction for a moment or two, but now he's pointing back in the right direction. May have lost that sixth position I've just mentioned. Top 10 made up by Falcon Motorsports, number 33. Klaus uh, Backler. And that's your top 10 when Joe and Bruce take over in about half an hour's time. They'll give you the hourly update with the, the top 10 overall again and half of the classes. But the next hour of racing here on the RSL network of channels starts right now. Da haben wir endlich mal wieder ein Rennen mit Zuschauern. Ihr könnt ja mal winken. Macht euch warme Gedanken. Ja, hallo, wir sind hier oben. Take a deep breath, everybody. We've still got plenty to go. Hope you've stocked up on snacks. Don't forget, if you've got a nip out and go to the supermarket, you can take us with you. RS1, unblocked, without any ads, and all still free. Player.radiolamons.co and select channel RS1. And you'll get the audio from what's going on. Take a wee bit of the Nürburgring Nordschleife and the 24 hour race is with you. Long recovery for the Avia. So, uh, Rennsport BMW, that's still going on. Robert Frank's now pointing in the right direction. And joining me in the Global Broadcast Centre, Peter Snowden and Peter Mackay. Peter Mackay, your first experience of racing on the Nordschleife for the last uh, 90 minutes or last hour should I say uh, or so uh, what do you make of it so far in, in, in one paragraph one paragraph well I, I, my uh, English teacher always said my paragraphs were too long so hopefully I'll try and keep them I mean I, again we, we saw it we said it in, in qualifying last night in similar conditions these guys here they are the very best in the world at what they do and you can include F1 drivers and that as well. This is just incredible. You look at the bravery at the front from Kevin Estra, Lucas Stoltz, Nicky Katzberg in, you know, 500 horsepower machines on slick tires coming through wet patches. Now they're on the full wet tires, but you can see just how much standing water there is. There's only these Michelin wets and in Hankooks and Falcons. They're very, very impressive tires, but there is a limit. Once those tread blocks fill up, oh, you're a passenger and we've seen well, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of damaged machinery so far. But uh, sum it up in a word: crazy, crazy but beautiful in some yes. respect. Yes, uh, that was a great song, actually, wasn't that beautiful? Crazy. Uh, go and look it up, kids. It's country music, so probably not. Uh -huh. But I can play it. I'll get the guitar out in a minute. I just I love the reference to kids. Go look it up, kids. Well, you know it's. <laughs> uh, Volk Strychek uh, in fifth position, 117th overall, fifth in his class, in the Manta. Not sure how much of that Manta is uh, now original. I described it as Trigger's broom earlier on. There was one year when it was so badly damaged that other teams chipped in to help them out. They had all kinds of implements including what looked to be a 25 pound sledgehammer on the rear valance of that car hammering it back out it's got a five-speed gearbox now it's had its suspension change but it's still the foxtail manta as they say in the classic motor, motor motoring world isn't it it's only original once but in this case the concept is still alive yes that's very true that is very true penny for your thoughts now if you're in one of those big high-powered cars whilst luca engstler is enjoying the relative sheer footedness of front wheel drive in his Hyundai i30 N TCR heading down towards the uh, bridge at the very bottom of the circuit, one of the lowest points uh, of the track. Problem is there of course, all the water's running down the hill to the bridge where the uh, halfway point is for tourist laps. She used to be able to drive on there, not sure he still can now and do the half lap. Klaus Backler now having a scrap with Fred Makovecki 
Six, seventh and eighth. There is another car ahead of them. That's Frank Stippler. Not that Klaus Backler can barely see the Porsche ahead of him. Just about see the rain light with the wiper on full speed. Toyota Altis, uh, Corolla Altis uh, in third in that SP3 category. This is the man they call Mad Cow, Nadavudi Charansuka Watana, man from Thailand. Big rallying background, so he'll be loving this. Nadavudi, an absolute megastar in his home country. Problem for one of the BMWs in Cup 5. It is the 240. Yeah. Now, it's not the first time we've seen this car off for Adrenaline Motorsport. Team Alsner Automotive, Yannick Fubrek, Francesco Malini, Marcel Fugel and Roland Froza. And John, that is well and well and truly beached is uh, absolutely the definitive definition of beaching a car. That's what that one is, well into the gravel. Meanwhile, the Teichmann Crossport has been sort of recovered on the hats and back. The well, that's where the uh, 240 car's off as well. This is on the, on the, the left-hand side of the hats and back. Was it? Well. Yeah. Right. Right, OK. Uh, it's going to the tracker, it is. In incident vehicles out on the circuits. All for Quattro now. All the Audi drivers will be thinking. Mauro Engel has to try and get past the uh, SP3T Golf GTI, who's out dragging him at the moment with just front wheel drive. Engel can't find the grip to get by him. Uh, actually, in, that, that, in fairness, sorry, it's still yellows. It's still yellows, so it just wasn't the code 60, it was just a slow zone. Now they're back into code 60. Fred McAvecki is driving into a wall of water, so he must be driving on muscle memory alone because I'm looking to the side, heading up through. At Mooch Curve now, Kesselshin area, all climbing uphill towards eventually the Caracciola carousel. Fred McAvecki is slightly losing touch with Frank Stittler. Josh Bird is a little bit further up the road as well. Right behind him, he's got uh, Klaus Backler for company. I'm going to throw in a curveball here, John. You mentioned about four wheel drive, drivers wanting uh, Quattro. Uh, equipment underneath you now. I'd say what you need in this is a big straight six or V8 up front, rear wheel drive, Nürburgring, rain, standing water, poor visibility. What's what's not to love? Driving through the side window. This. Get, hey, if you can see if you if you can see out of the rear window, as Roger Clark used to say, you can get it back. Uh, <laughs> RS31 Capri, anybody? Uh, car well, I think that it was marked two escorts of RAC rally, rally days, but uh, that was always his view. If you could see out the rear side window, he could get it back. But I, he was a legend. I, I think a rear drive RS31 Capri round here with the uh, the old V6. That would be uh, that would be very nice. That made one of my where I started, you mean? Well, well, <laughs> I, I, and I've, 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 I've raced one. Uh, all of the, all of the first cars I I raced happened to be Fords, which was odd because I've only ever owned one uh, Ford, uh, and I, I raced a Ford Fiesta, and then I raced a, a Capri about three or four times in the uh, in the GT Master Series. Had a lot of fun with that. Problem for the number three eleven at the first corner. He's going to get all the way to the. Yokohama barriers as well. That's the FK performance. Well, that's, a very, that's a very interesting off there, to say the least, John, because that's it's unabated speed. And you you know, it's the pit straight, turn one, you know exactly what's coming up, and it's uh, it's almost as if it's a uh, it's aquaplane. He's got it mercifully, it's turned around 180 degrees and kissed the barrier. At that point, you've got tires and conveyor belting in front. Kissed with the back of it. There's barely any there's barely any marks on it, and he's it, rejoined, but it it's was very almost lovely. as if it either throttle stuck open and or brakes failed, or it just quite simply just, just aquaplaned and he Correct. just couldn't do anything with it. But um, it's Nico Otto behind the wheel there who gets away with it. It's now getting visibility, it's becoming an issue out on the Nordschleife, the low cloud as much as anything else uh, towards the end of the lap. Here comes Kevin Estra towards just the end of another lap uh, and will complete his got about a second of a lead but even accelerating over the surface change Peter from the Nordschleife where the Nordschleife turns right if you're on a tourist lap that little piece of, of road the link road if you will up at the end of the Grand Prix circuit that change of surface there unsettled the Manti Porsche 
Exactly, and even into this turn one here, 34, uh, one of the GT4 Mercedes there having a real moment, uh, even just, just under braking there. Uh, quite literally, to use a cliche for, for Peter Mack, uh, snaking under braking, before I get that in before Peter did. Uh, oh, but Will the, also. <laughs> but uh, Will now, now the 98 me. Rover uh, run BMW having the same issue, out braking himself for turn one there, just very, very quickly, Mark Todd, Chick, that was. when we do, saw the... Um, the KTM offered uh, hats and back. I don't really realize, but Kevin Estra had to go over the curbs really hard to miss that. And I just, you just naturally think, has that put anything damage into that car underneath as it went over those curbs just to, to miss that uh, KTM a little bit earlier on? The Mercedes that was having trouble at turn one uh, was one of the Schnitzelarm Racing GmbH uh, cars and really did not look like the driver was in control. And that driver, by the way, is Marcel Markovic. So not as if he doesn't know what he's doing. Martin Tomczyk following that line that we saw earlier from Nico Otto. And there's so much standing water, PMAC, that if you go off, you're going to struggle to get back on again. And this is a game of inches. Take that one off your bingo card. Uh, as to where the water is, is running at the moment, Nicky Katzberg's had enough. And we still haven't managed to get that stranded number 60 Teichmann Racing uh, crossbow back to the pits. Who's that in there? Is that... It's definitely not Laura Cryhammer. I'll say that. Um, it might have, might have been her Teichmann himself. It's, it's, of course, a lot of the, when all the SP9 cars being an FIA GT3 specification, they do have uh, traction control and anti-lock braking systems, as do the GT4 cars. But I don't actually know if it's if it's helping or hindering Scott. the drivers right now. Because do you, turn it you can down, see the brake, the brake just goes in and then it goes, oh, no, lock up, oh, no. And it's actually not slowing the car down. It's gliding over the top. So... <laughs> The, I like to say, we said it once, we'll say it again. These guys are running the cross. Two Porsches touching Fred Makovecki, getting very sideways with the Fulton, uh, with the uh, Fulton Motorsports car with which he was, was battling. And uh, that was inside the top 10. That would have been uh, Klaus Backler, who was making the outside manoeuvre there. Um, ABS in the wet, extreme wet, with racing tyres, it's often better to turn it right down, Peter, otherwise you hit hit the pedal and actually nothing happens. I've, I've heard drivers call it icing before, that the pedal actually has no feel whatsoever and you can't tell whether the wheels are locking or not locking, but what you're not doing is slowing down. Exactly, and I would say a feel is the operative word there, that uh, I think without without being, uh, being rude, but I think for the... Uh, the, the more amateur driver, shall we say, it can be an advantage, it can be an aid, uh, as can TC, the opposite way around in these conditions. But for the, the top class pro drivers there that, uh, that Peter Max has been talking about, you, you need that feel. And I'll tell you, tell you what this brings into play for me now, thinking of one particular car in this field, I think it's the 125 car, which is the uh, Space Drive Mercedes with Darren Turner uh, as part of the team, with this fly-by-wire steering. Uh, on that car and I did have a bit of a chat with him on Friday about that car and it was very interesting, was a bit more of that a bit later but I just wonder how that would feel in the wet there because there's no no physical uh, direct connection between uh, the steering wheel and the, the, the road wheels of that car. It's the number 25 actually 25, my and it's Phil Ellis who's driving that car at the moment, he's in 58th position, uh, only two cars in the SPX class, the other one being... Oh, was only one out then. Uh, the, uh, the, yes a factor of 100. <laughs> Just nip next door and tell them. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the Glickenhaus is the car in that category. I, I, I'm not sure about that. You, you're absolutely right. I, I don't mind driving in the wet and driving on a wet circuit, uh, but you need to know what's going on because you've got to find the right pace for you in the car. And it's not about being brave. It's not about being clever. It's just about saying to yourself, right, I, I can feel that I have some connection with the steering, with the wheels on the front of the car, with the track. But I'll tell you what it is about, uber, uber concentration. Yeah. Because every, every millisecond, nanosecond, you've got to feel what it's doing and it's changing all the time and there is no respite. And that's why these drivers need to be fit because tired drivers make mistakes. Klaus Backler's just gone straight on at turn one a couple of moments ago. So having made the pass on Fred Makovecki, 
33 Falcon car drops behind the number 31 red and white Fricadelli car again. So all of that hard work undone in the braking area turn one, which does seem to be one of the major action areas at the moment. 15 minutes before five in Central Europe, the Nürburgring throwing its usual curve ball. It's very wet, it's very slippery all around the circuit. And at the moment, Kevin Estra holds a 2.2 second lead from Lucas Stoltz in second place for Mercedes Team's HRT, the number four. Then it's the two Rover Oils sponsored Rover BMWs, Nicky Katzberg, Mark Tomczyk, Tomczyk in the 98 and Katzberg in the one. That's three and four, one and 98. Then Julian Ander and Lau for Rootronic Racing Porsche, the number three car in fifth position. He's some 27 seconds off the leader uh, and a little bit further back, three seconds further back, KCMG, Josh Burden, then Backler, then Stittler, seventh and eighth. We talked about those two having their scrap. Then Makovecki dropped down into ninth position ahead of Jens Klingmann for Schubert in tenth. Very difficult conditions. Uh, Peter Mackay, ABS. What do you know? Well, I remember it just, it just came back to me. A couple of months ago, I was chatting to Porsche factory driver Patrick Long, um, who uh, races in IMSA, as many will know. And I was chatting to him about the new Porsche 992 GT3 Cup car and talking about the uh, pluses and minuses of those cars being fitted with ABS or not. And he told me that in the 911 GT3 R, the same car that all of the SP9 Porsches are driving uh, in this race, he said that it's fitted with ABS, as all GT3 cars are, but it's designed around it having the ABS on all the time. He, says, I said, he said he's driven it with the ABS off and the car is just horrible to drive with it off. So they're designed in with that technology, which is I found interesting. So it's not like a GTE car. Well, GTE car doesn't have it at all, but it's not adjustable. It's either kind of on or off. And if you have it off, the car really doesn't like it, apparently. Witchcraft, I would say. Uh, it's in, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> interesting. I, I, I agree with what Snowy said earlier on in terms of, and I've only driven a GT4 with fairly, and a, quite an old GT4 at that, with fairly rudimentary ear, ABS. Um, I, I've, I've driven a GT3 car, but not raced one. I drove an Aston Martin uh, GT3 car. And the thing that it gave to me was as somebody who hadn't driven the car and indeed hadn't driven the circuit that we were on, it gave me immense confidence straight away to brake hard and very, very late and trail brake all the way up to the apex of the corner, which as a, a driver who drives very intermittently and wasn't used to the car, it gave me immense uh, confidence in the braking areas on a dry track. Now, albeit on, on 50 lap old tyres, somebody else's tyres, but even so, I felt I could have that confidence to do that left foot braking obviously into the into the apices of the corner and that to me is where the big advantage is that a, that a, 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 an applied and concentrating am driver in a gt3 car peter snowden um, can get should be able to get pretty close almost the last three four five percent it's just going to be the hardest thing to ring out of any car whatever its specification i think i got within about 1.2 seconds of Johnny Adams' time on the, on the track within four or five laps, which I was quite pleased about. But I said at the time, that's not because I'm a lost racing talent. That's how confidence inspiring the systems on the car are. And, and that's the point. It, it, it can do that. And it's, uh, you yeah, know, that close to Johnny Adams' time is pretty impressive by anybody's standards, John. Um, it's that, it's that extra Somebody who kindly said half of that was the fact that I weigh more than him. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. That's easily resolvable then. So it's even, even more credit to the talent then. Uh, but it, it is that extra bit. And it's, I think that's that's where the, you just said, the, the pro drivers uh, get the experience from. And that's where they can then apply it. Um, I mean, going back even further, I mean, some of the, some of the GT1s and Group C cars have never had of these type of things at all. Uh, so it wasn't applicable then. Quite, quite, quite different beasts. Um, it's interesting to see what Peter Match said about having uh, the, the Porsche that you mentioned being designed around it, uh, which is uh, incredible how things have just moved on. But yet we look at uh, uh, these GT3 cars now uh, are doing the times that GT1 cars were 20 years ago. 
And that, that's progress, it's development, it's evolution. It, it's going to happen. Um, it's, I, I find it extraordinary. Personally, I, I, did a, I did quite a bit of testing on a, uh, Ascari, the KZR1 uh, traction control system. Uh, not, never didn't have to race the car eventually, but uh, I did do a lot of the testing on the on that system. And the the amount of settings and bits that were variable was uh, was quite extraordinary. Uh, and you could just check. And that's that's going back 15 years ago now. Coming up at the top of the hour, we'll be running down the leading cars in SP9, SPX, Cup X, SP Pro, SP8T. SP7, TCR, BMW 240i, Cup 3 and SP3. That's the uh, even hours for those of you in the UK. The odds, then that'll be AT, SP10, SP8, SP3T, SP4, V4, 5 and 6, V2, T and Cup S. So find out where your favourites are and work out uh, where that is on that list. That's about uh, eight minutes away. At the moment, the vagaries of the Eiffel Mountain weather playing that card at the moment. The weather card has already been played. <laughs> Extraordinary stuff. And Kevin Estra has, at the moment, played that hand the best from Lucas Stoltz in second. Estra getting caught in behind it. Uh, Crossport just a few moments ago and one of the fastest circuits parts of the circuit coming up to the first part of the Flanscar and uh, dealt with that wipers now on intermittent but then you get onto the Donegar Hoa and it's virtually a paddling for, uh, uh, how do you know you're on the Donegar Hoa though? that's the problem the visibility is so poor isn't it John yeah it's, uh, it's, it's shocking but uh, here over on the right-hand side, doesn't seem to bother uh, Kevin Astro. He's getting back to his, uh, close to his favourite part of the circuit there, which is I, the grass uh, on the right-hand side. And uh, he, do, he does seem to favour that, doesn't he, over the right-hand side? He loves that bit. I, I'm, I'm in awe. Uh, David Pittard, by the way, back out in the 101 BMW. That had a close encounter of the Armco kind when the rain first hit at the top of the Foxhall Adnar Forest area. He's got the car back. It is uh, refettled. It went into the box for a little while. Refettled and now on its way. Nicky Katzberg fighting his way through to fourth position and very carefully changing down through the gearbox at the end of the tear guard into the final chicane. Oh, still getting a huge slide on there and he's barely using any throttle tries to stay off the white lines but even the outside of the Grand Prix circuit that the very thin white line as he went over there the rear tires breaking traction and all the way down the start line of course has got the grid hash marks on it and that's causing problems as well and, and issues all the way down the field Peter Mackay including for one of the cars that we were keeping a very close eye on at the start of the week, the Hankook Triple F racing team. Yeah, the Hankook Triple F number 63 Lamborghini Huracan. Remember on Thursday night, Mirko Bertolotti pulling an extraordinary lap time out of the locker. In fact, quicker than any other car's ideal sector by sector. That was how impressive it was. And... I wonder if maybe uh, Marco Mapelli was running up in the top five, but I wonder if he caught, caught out when the rain hit and uh, he's been in the pits for quite some time, now classified 95th place. Um, but he's not alone. There's quite a lot of SP9 cars right down the order. Axel Jeffries, of course, we saw. He's back running again in the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini, albeit in 114th uh, overall. So some, yeah, some quite... Uh, also the Octane 126 Ferrari, uh, it's still in the pits and nearly stone last at the moment. It's stone last in SP9. So that's a real shame because Luca Ludwig, particularly in that Octane 126 Ferrari, has been fantastic. Yeah, and, and it was quick earlier on. Hank Cook is uh, well known for its wet weather tyres. Ah, good news. Uh, it was Kara Osman. Uh, 
behind the wheel of the number 60. That's the Erkan car at Osman. Uh, and that car, the Taikman Racing Crossblow, is moving again. That was one of the cars that was caught out uh, in the first rain shower, but it's moving and it's moving under its uh, own steam. Uh, and uh, a Stelly Porsche all the way around at Tear Garden, I think that is, isn't it? Coming into. That's the seven Mercedes get no, speed. Before that, there was a, the Frigadelli number 30 gone round as well. Okay. So the 30 car uh, was being driven by Matt Campbell in 12th position, Raffaele Marcellos. And again, this is right at the end of the lap. It's just, there's so much standing water. Very lucky not to hit the end of the Nordschleifer pit lane, the old vintage pit lane, uh, if you like. There's still an old grandstand there as well. When you're doing manufacturing days, you're often billeted in that area. It is now tippy-toe stuff on so many parts of the circuit, Pete Snowden. It is, and just one of our early charges, by the way, John, the uh, Hancock Triple uh, F Racing uh, Lamborghini Huracan that was uh, pedalled so well by Mauro Mappielli uh, at the beginning has uh, been in the pits now some 25-plus minutes as well. So, uh, so just the standing water there at the end of, uh, uh, well, the top of Tear Garden there just caught out the... Uh, number 30 Fricadelli uh, Porsche and indeed uh, one of the AMG Mercs on the also number 34 going round as well uh, that's on the, that's on the GP circuit so it, it's just just standing water everywhere now cars just as you say tippy toe and another another spin for the uh, number 30 the other the other Fricadelli Porsche Both that's Frederick Frederica Machiavetti that's a uh, number 31 car swapping round and that's just coming off the GP circuit, trying to go on to the Nordschleife, and it's just, he's turned left to join the Nordschleife, and he kept going round and ended up facing back onto the GP circuit, which is a not ideal, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it is, a tippy-toe is not uh, not just a phrase, it, it is, it was well, just, it's horrible out there for these guys now, but um, it is it is all part of the Nordschleife, it's all part of the Nürburgring 24 hour, you've got to deal with it, and uh, Kevin Estrid is still uh, at the top. And still, a, or again, a Code 60 reapplied to Arenberg and to the top of the hill at Schwedenkreuz. In fact, there's one a little bit further back as well. So coming up to Schwedenkreuz at the top of the hill at Arenberg. And I haven't seen which car is still being attended to there. Marshall's Port's 45. I think he's still on the Grand Prix circuit, isn't it? They're calling that Jaguar. That's right at the end. Either at the end of the Grand Prix circuit or the start of the uh, Nordschleifer. I've never seen Jaguar written down before. I was thinking exactly the same. Glad yes. It's not, glad it's not just me then. I was thinking, hang on. on, on the we, we switch circuits? Yeah, on, the, uh, on the pitch channel. Coming up to five o'clock in Central Europe. Thanks for joining us. Quick rundown of what's going on. Kevin Estra leads for Mantai Racing. And the gap is four and a half seconds, depending on where they are around the track, of course, with so many zones of Code 60 at the moment. But it's Lucas Stoltz in second. So 911 from four. Mantai Porsche from Mercedes Team HRT. Martin Tomczyk in third for Rover Racing, his teammate Nicky Katzberg in third, and the top six made up by Gillian Andlau for Rootronic Racing and Josh Bird for KCMG. So Porsche 911, Mercedes 4, BMW's 98 and 1, uh, Andlauer in the 3 Porsche, then the 18 Porsche for KCMG, and uh, that is your top six for the moment. Peter Mackay will stay with you in the Global Broadcast Centre to be joined by Joe Bradley for the time being. Uh, Peter Snowden and I will take our leave, but we continue with more racing across the RSL network of sound and video channels. And Peter Mackay will start off this next racing hour right now.
So we look at our early update here at the Nürburgring 24, what has been an absolutely extraordinary start to this race, about 90 minutes in. We'll start with our ST9, the overall leader, Kevin Estra for Manti Racing in the number 911. In SPX at the moment, that class being led by the Space Drive Racing Mercedes AMG GT3, that's the car with the steer-by-wire technology racing up against the Glickenhaus in that class. In the Cup X class at the moment, that's the KTMs uh, in, those, uh, in those cars running 25th overall and top of the class is the number 75 uh, machine. In SP Pro at the moment, we have to look down the timing screens, of course. It's a bit of a dolly mixture on the timing screens at the moment here at the Nürburgring Nordschleifer. SP Pro, uh, the Black Falcon and the Porsche Cup 911 GT3 Cup MR. Now, that is the car that is um, out of, uh, well, out of the running. Um, of course, had a spin at Schweden Chorus and had quite significant damage. So, um, out of that one there. Uh, in sp 8 T class, we have uh, in that one, we have to uh, look all the way down. In fact, I don't know if we actually have anything running in sp 8 T at this moment in time. SP7, the Porsche Cup class uh, in that one there. That is... Um, that one is Christopher Mees in the Hooper Motorsport 911 Cup, the number 80 car in TCR at this moment in time. It's the Hyundai Elantra number 830 leading in that class. In the BMW 240s, it is the number 231 Adrenaline Motorsport car leading in there. In the Cup 3 class at this moment in time, we have the uh, number 309 Milner Motorsport Porsche Cayman 718. And finally, SP4T class at the moment, we have the number 718 Porsche 718 GTS. And we're getting word now that SP8T led by the Piana in 26 overall in the number 36 Mercedes. Thank you for that one, Bruce Jones. Uh, you're, you're welcome, Peter. Well done in the early jobs. Watch the race from the sidelines. And um, <laughs> boy, you've had some weather and a bit more, haven't you, Just? We certainly have. Yeah, we, uh, we've, it's been a bit. The one thing that has been interesting, though, Bruce, is that the potential for strategy calls of course we saw a few teams throwing the dice at the start of the race but when we got on to that five lap stint the rain actually came at just the perfect time for those sp9 teams being able to all put on the wet tire yes and as early as the well before the start of the race i, I uh, dialed in to check how it was all running and saw a few cars diving into the pits so they started from pit lane it didn't all work for them but again with a race like this where the field is potentially as close as it's going to be in the top class in sp9 class you've got to try something if there's half a chance that there's going to be a curveball coming your way with the weather indeed so and joe bradley welcome to the radio show limited broadcast center uh, your thoughts on the race so far Unbelievable! I don't, I don't the ring. You, you simply have to recalibrate your mind, and that's mainly to do with the longer lap. Of course, it's a, it's a completely unique track in, in so far as how you address strategy and skills. But forget all that. That's how, I've thrown all those sheets out the window for now. I'm just wondering whether the organisers going to be considering a red flag because we've got a lot of standing water that's getting towards the just tipping over the edge of, uh, of the need for a bit more thought about safety and, and the Well, I think one of the problems is uh, just picking up from Joe there is the fact that uh, if you're glancing at the screens for the very first time in this race, the cars that we're being shown are halfway around the lap and the track looks as close to bone dry as it can be. But then again, you've got a circuit that's uh, nearly 26 kilometres long 
and uh, we've had an awful lot of rain and those who've been watching over the past 24 hours not just the racing here but what's been going on at spa francorchamps about an hour and a half drive away we have had ridiculous amounts of rain and i can be sure that it's not as it, it's not the last we're going to see over the course of uh, this 24-hour race the 49th running of this fantastic tricky dicey race the weather's already played its hand back on the grand prix loop though the track is certainly Peter, far from dry, and you see car after car in the past 15, 20 minutes, even the very top drivers putting their cars into the gravel, sideways, forwards, backwards. It is real tiptoe driving. It certainly is, yeah, and it's just in a matter of kilometres. You know, you're going around Brunchen and onto Flansgarten, and it's, as you said, Bruce, absolutely bone dry. And then a couple of kilometres later, you're onto the Dottinger Hole, starts to get particularly bad. And we saw Raffaele Marciello a couple of moments ago going through a deluge of puddles just at the top of Tiergarten. So the, the drivers will be getting used to it now where the, the wet and dry parts are. But my goodness me, they're really having to work hard for it. And what's, what is nice to see, of course, last night in the wet qualifying session we saw a real flip in the form book and uh, we we saw that we saw the mercedes come to the fore there as well but it's been really nice to see mercedes get back up on the pace in the dry as well but here in the wet i think it's uh bruce it's coming down to the uh, the fleshy bit behind the wheel it's who's who's got the uh, the skill in these conditions and at the moment it's uh, quick kevin estro who's really impressing at the wheel of that man type porsche what he did in the opening couple of laps when uh, drivers were doing their utmost is they hit the wetter parts to try to hang on. He was outside the top ten, and then suddenly he wasn't outside there anymore. Then he was third, then he was second. And, uh, of course, when the visibility goes completely as you blast up the dotting of her, he always seems to, to hug the right-hand side of the track. Maybe he likes to see the barriers and know exactly where the edge is. And we've seen him overtake on the grass there just before we get to that final sequence up the hill through Tiergarten. He's super brave. The lead, though, is only just 4.2 seconds over Lucas Stoltz, who was so strong in that opening lap of the race. What was he, about seven seconds clear at the end of lap one? Fabulous start. He, he, it, re it really was. From third on the grid, he was just off like a shot. And actually, look, although Mercedes really came alive in the wet in the qualifying uh, last night, actually, Lucas Stoltz might have wished for it to stay dry because really in those opening stages he was just imperious at the wheel of that mercedes amg from how racing team so oh, it's uh, we're going to see this play out all the way across the race but even if the rain goes off the standing water in certain parts is going to be here for quite a while bruce yeah it really is a case where the team managers want their drivers not necessarily to shave tenths of a second off they just want them to keep it on the island in fact looking at marcello when he had that spin you know effectively the final corner of the lap after 25 kilometers and it cost him about two and a half minutes to get the car turned around because even there the track is so so super narrow he came very close to hitting the barriers in that left right flick uh, somehow avoided them but you just think of all the work you do to try and not lose any time one spin like that and it really really hits you hard as a consequence marcello's down in 15th place before that he was inside the top 10 it hurts So, wet, wet, I'm not going to say wet, 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 it's very, very wet, but uh, other parts of the circuit are still dry. Let's just uh, quickly refresh what's happening at the top of the charts. It's Kevin Estra leading the way in the 911 Manti Racing Porsche by just under four seconds now from Lucas Stoltz, at the best of the Mercedes from Team HRT. Then the two Rover Racing BMWs, another handful of seconds further back. Uh, Martin Tomczyk in 98, Nicky Katzberg in car number one, last year's winning BMW M6. Then two more Porsches completing the top six. In fifth place, Julian Andlauer, Rutronic Racing. He's 10 seconds back from the second of those BMWs. And the first car not on Michelin tires in the order here. Number 33, Falker Motorsports, Klaus Backler, the driver who's gonna be driving that car and the sister car. He's gonna get a lot of mileage on board in 33 and 44, and for now, He's up into sixth place, and that's a good return. Started down the order as the very wet weather last night did not help the Falcon Motorsport Porsches. So, great run from the Austrian there. So, hoping to hear from Joe Bradley, who's uh, watched the early stage of this race and is now joining the crew. Hard to pick out the cars. A, it's a 
a little dark out there, and B, all images are absolutely uh, full of spray in the face of the drivers. Of course, they've had a lot of running on Thursday, Friday. This morning, we had an hour of warm-up. Not everybody made good use of it, and um, sort of know what they're doing, but I don't think we've had two laps really with the same conditions once the rain has started to fall. Any onboard footage around the circuit, you could just sense how the drivers are tiptoeing, and then you get to the slow zones, and you look at them fleetingly and think, have the drivers got problems with their cars, but no, down to 60, they look to the side of the circuit, and they can see some of the screens pointing their way, as well as the flags, it's a purple backdrop with a white circle and a white horizontal, a diagonal cross, and a 60 in the middle, down to 60 kph. And the drivers have to realise that every lap they're probably going to find one in a different position. And uh, the race officials are very, very clear. Anybody transgresses the minimum speed they're allowed to run at and they will be picking up penalties. Meanwhile, biding the time, sitting in the garages, the other drivers feeling like spare parts, nothing they can do about it. Dries Van Tor, one of the stars of qualifying yesterday evening, as the rain was coming in, hadn't quite arrived, and he put in two super super quick laps in number 15 Phoenix Racing Audi but for now he's got to twiddle his thumbs and sit there and wait his car Robin Frank's at the wheel that's in 10th place overall and that was one of the spinners that saw uh, the Dutchman getting it wrong towards the end of the Grand Prix loop before they get out onto the really really fearsome bit of the track which obviously is uh, the Nord Schleifer part Slow, slow, slow zones. Raffaele Marcello still picking his way through. Lucas Stoltz in second place, but Kevin Estra waving the flag for Porsche, leading the way for Manti Racing. Very, very long, slow section here for the drivers as they wait to pick up the pace again. Let's just have a little look down the classes as well. SP9, as they should. FIA GT3 class cars filling the top 24 positions. Best of the rest, Cup X car. KTM Crossbow, really well driven, number 75. That's um, making great, great pace. Christian Menzel, run by True Racing. SP7 led by Alexander Mies, Huber Motorsport, Porsche. That's the Porsche Cup class car. But really, at the moment, it's all about two things. It's about the SP9 runners at the top of the field. It's also about keeping the car on the island. Island being pretty much the operative term. For the drivers who come out of the slow zone, typically that's on one of the wettest parts of the circuit and thereafter the track seems to dry out a bit and to me one of the most fearsome parts of the circuit is the run from Brunchen, Flansgarts and Schwalbenschwanz uh, towards the end of the lap and it dries out a bit there, it gives them more confidence but uh, still huge amounts of sitting water. Raffaele Marcello has just hit one of them, the tail of his, his Mercedes very nearly came round and clouted one of the BMW Cup class cars. And uh, so very, very tricky, tricky conditions. Car 890 leading the Cup 5 class. That's the class for the BMWs. And they look really, really good. The M2 CS racers, short, squat, and very, very purposeful indeed. And in many ways, it's not so much standing water on the Grand Prix loop, it's just very, very wet track. The standing water is at the apex of some of the corners where the curbing is higher out on the first third of the lap. We've seen cars going around uh, very much at hats and back, and that's one of the places where the water is sitting and almost inviting the drivers to uh, put their cars sideways by hooking a wheel into it. just give you an indication of the pace of the cars at the moment with the slow zones 12 minutes 4 seconds was the pace last time around of the race leading Manti Racing Porsche the the Grello car number 911 don't forget that we were getting close to 8 minute second 8 minute laps it's about 8 minutes uh, 10 we might have had had we had dry qualifying that's sort of the, the golden standard still in the hands of Lawrence Van Tor from some years ago now 
the rain, of course, in qualifying came down. And in fact, the final shootout for the, the 20 fastest qualifiers, uh, the, the lap pace was the wrong side of 10 minutes, but then it was super, super wet for them. So, Joe Bradley, it's wet, it's dry, but it's great fun. Great fun indeed. We'll hear from Joe soon. Just looking for any messages from the pits. It's always quite useful having a pit report so you can throw to them because, or they can pass up messages saying it might look dry on the track, but it's raining here. Still plenty of battling, but at the moment with the slow zones, it closes the battle up and then it opens it out all over again. It seems to become all very, very concertina like and how's the weather doing at the moment uh, clearly gray overcast and with the threat of more rain windscreen wipers on all around the circuit fred makovici is putting on he was one of the early spinners just outside just outside the top 10 looking to make up time, looking not to make mistakes at the moment. Kevin Estra not making mistakes out front. He's got that four second lead, his 9-11 Porsche ahead of Lucas Stoltz in the better place for the two HRT team Mercedes and that's the number four entry. Any long shots down the dotting of her and you can pick out the cars only by their headlights. So if you want to run down the marks, we had high hopes for Lamborghinis, but it's not been their race so far. Both of them showed great pace in the qualifying. Marco Mapelli's cast, the FFF Racing number 63, still in the pits. Axel Jeffries also injured on that opening lap, uh, way, way down the order. Outside the top 100, so it's going to have to be a comeback drive of some order to receive anything. On the start finish line, visibility has all but disappeared. Breaking into the first corner, snaking away. It's so difficult for the drivers on the Grand Prix loop. They get some traction when they're towards the end of the main lap on the Nordschleife, and it all goes when they rise up to. Tiergarten and then drops down into the first corner. Grand Prix loop super, super tricky. All the drives have been round it a fair few times now. Seven, eight laps on the, ten laps on the board now for the race leader. Only Estra and Stoltz have gone on to lap number 11. Martin Tomczyk should be the next to do so any second now. And in among all of this, the best of the Audis at the moment is Frank Stippler. Well, it would be Frank, all that experience. And he's just down at the bottom end of the top 10. Frank is in ninth position, the number 11 Phoenix Racing Audi. So it's Porsche, Mercedes, two BMWs, three Porsches, another BMW. That's the Schubert Motorsport car with Jens Klingman at the wheel. And then Frank Stippler, Phoenix Racing Audi. And the second Phoenix Racing Audi, Robin Frank's just, uh, well, some distance behind. He completes the top 10. Double checking what sort of tyres people are putting on their cars in any pit stops at the moment and uh, not surprisingly, <laughs> nobody's thinking about slicks, a fresh set of wets because uh, 10 laps around here for some of the drivers is uh, more than enough on their rubber. Wearing them out on the dry patches and not having enough depth in the tread for the other, other parts where the water is deeper. Any driver getting out of the car will have their eyes on stalks. And the visibility really does change from lap to lap with cars. Let's see, the pace has now improved. It was 12 minute laps a while ago with slow zones. Now 10 minutes 30 for the race lead the last time around, matched almost identically by Lucas Stoltz in second place overall.
and Kevin Estra, that mixture of caution plus pace. Still leading the gap only three and a half seconds. Great Meister, isn't he? He's, he's right up there. He's, he's not just a Nurburgring Meister, he's a wet Nurburgring Meister, and we really are seeing that. With fog coming in, we had a few minutes ago, Bruce, we had a report from Race Control that fog was a tear garden. Well, we can see that fog is now rolling towards tear garden, not too far away from the start finish straight in the pits, and we see that fog rolling in, and it's it's just how far that fog will, in, will extend. We've had this race red flag at various points, and there was there was one year, Bruce, which I seem to recall, that the race was stopped for about six or seven hours overnight for fog. And we've got so much weather in the Eiffel Renin region that you know pretty much anything can happen. I'm not expecting any hailstones to the extent we saw a few years ago, though. Uh, no, we've had all sorts of weather. You feel like uh, they often joke that certain parts of the UK get a, a, a year's worth of weather in one day, or four seasons in one day, I think was the, the lyric from a, a song back in the period. But here we're, we're having four seasons of rain in, in effectively 24 hours. It's a question of how it's spaced out. And obviously after last year, we're nine and a half hours from 11 o'clock at night to uh, no running because of unbelievable amounts of uh, standing water. Hopefully it won't become that bad, but right now certainly we're facing, they're facing a deluge. But how much is it actually raining and how much is the water just still hanging in there and it hasn't had a chance to dry? What do you reckon, Joe? Um, I, you know what, that, I was worried um, just before I came on air, I was looking at the track and I was thinking, you know, there's, there's a lot of standing water there and, and standing water creates spray, creates visibility and my, my big worry uh, even in great conditions, in great weather conditions, the speed difference with the classes here at the Nürburgring 24 hours are massive. And then when you add in a slippery track, aqua cleaning, and then a complete lack of, dis uh, of, of, of um, a complete lack of being able to see what's in front of you, then you know it's got to be. A or we start considering whether it's safe out there. I suppose one thing that's different this year is when we've had conditions like this is the fact that we had 121 starters in other years, in non-pandemic years, with often another 50 cars out there on the track, which does make it a little safer just by dint of having fewer cars that may spin around in front of it. Kevin Esther, but, though, you mentioned Kevin Esther, Bruce. Um, he's a Nürburgring Meister, he? he really is. And then, you know add in the wet conditions he, he knows this place like the back of his hand and it's it, you also know the wet line and you know what, what do i mean by wet line well uh, a track gets rubbered in and the, a, a racing line is created and the, the grip is not necessarily on that racing line it comes down to experience and i think also you look how many years kevin esch has been racing a porsche they, they, they can't surprise him in any way other drivers getting used to racing porsches might take a short while but uh, He's got that, and you look at his record here and his record at spa Francorchamps. you know, the two trickiest circuits they'll race on, and they're circuits on which he absolutely stands out, and I really think that sort of says it all. So, look, looking down the charts at the moment, and it's Kevin Estra leading the way, still by that margin. Um, in fact, it's down to... Still around the same margin, dotting between two and four seconds over Lucas Stoltz, and then 20 seconds is the gap back to the best of the Rover Racing BMWs in third, and the second, that's Martin Tomczyk, 98, and number one, Nicky Katzberg in the sister car, last year's uh, winning crew, reunited with the exception of Alexander Sims, who's moved to number the 20 Schubert Motorsport car, and number one shared by the American racer John Edwards. And it does seem already a long time since the start of this race when we had that fabulous charge down to the opening corner. But uh, all going absolutely fine now, but it is super, super tricky for all concerned. It's beginning to shape up though, isn't it? You can see the guys that are experienced in these changeable conditions and there is no, you know, there's no surprise that the, the cars and the teams at the front of this field, you know, you've got the Mansai 
Porsche leading the Mercedes from the EHRC team, Luke Stokes over there, uh, Tom Check in the Rover Racing BMW, Capsburg in the BMW. They're the first four cars, and there's a reason they're the first four cars. It's, it's down to experience, not just of racing cars, but racing cars on the Nürburgring. Because, uh, Bruce, you more than perhaps any of us have been coming here for so, so many years, we, you, you see the Nürburgring has always been renowned for changeable conditions. In fact, that was perhaps the, one of the primary deciding factors to stop the Grand Prix coming in the mid-70s. It was because one part of the track would be wet and the other part of the track would be uh, slick tyres. Uh, and, and it just created that sort of crazy anomaly that was just rendered not, not any good for Formula One. Not some, not that difficult in a GT3 car, but it all depends on, as Peter McCann said earlier, I've never heard of drivers being re referred to as the fleshy bits. Um, yes. But I'm going to use that from now on. I like that one, the fleshy bit. It's down to the fleshy bit now. Off you go, mate. Yeah. But of course, what gets obscured after the, everyone thinks that the Grand Prix World Championship stopped coming here to use the Nord Schweiz after 76 because of Nicky Lauda's accident. I think it was going to be the last year anyhow. There were lots of yeah. meetings between the drivers at that meeting in the morning, uh, you know, over the course of the, the whole weekend. And uh, Well, anyhow. Bruce, in, in that in that week's Autosport magazine, leading up to the, the 76 Grand Prix, Nicky Lauda had it. it there was an interview with Nicky Lauda where he was, uh, he was really being very uh, uh, judgmental and detrimental to the Nürburgring being used for Formula One. And he was saying that, you know, this year needs to be the last, the last time that that happens. And, and then, you know, just from, you know, grabbing Autosport on the, thir on the Thursday, on the Sunday, that happened, you know, and it was like prophetic. It was as if he saw what was going to happen in the future. Yeah. I mean, this isn't tongue-in-cheek, but it was, it was an element that uh, obviously Nicky survived all that happened to him, but there was a, a history with the magazine back in those days. If a driver got a rare interview, they often lived to, lived to read it. It was a, a dreadful run. But um, Nicky, I mean, what a loss for motorsport when, when he died last year, because he just had an opinion, an opinion that yeah. really carried weight in whatever element of the sport he was talking about. Yeah, he really was. and. Uh... You know, the, the, the sport, like you said, even when he stopped driving, Bruce, he was such an influential character on the sport and all levels of the sport as well, not just Formula One. He had an opinion on pretty much everything. Um, I, I, getting back to the weather, Bruce, um, I've, I've been checking the forecast since the race started, and every time I look, every half hour, I, I take a look, and, and it's changing. The weather seems to be changing direction, and we did have uh, another rainstorm due to pass across the Nürburgring area. Uh, however, that seems to have disappeared, so we might get some dry running soon. Yes, in the space of the last uh, 10, 10 minutes or so, the visibility, if you look back down the Dottinger Hurt to where the cars come out of Galgenkopf, well, you can see the end of the straight now. That is a massive, massive improvement. And so we've just had a place change. Lucas Stoltz is now behind Martin Tomczyk, the order to change, but of course, that's just before they come into the pit, so it matters for very little other than for pride for Tomczyk, moving up fleetingly into second place. So in they run into the pits. Nicky Katzberg coming in as well behind them, second and third, third and fourth into the pit lane there. Fresh timing screen. And actually, when they come to halt in the pit lane, the, the, the ground beneath them is dry. Mm. Again, that just uh, goes to emphasise how the weather is changing, changing, and Vinestra in as well. So the first four cars all into the pits with 11 laps on the board. And the gap between first and second lifted as 1.2 seconds. I've got my, I've got my uh, timing screen showing that the cars are still out on track, Bruce. Yeah, well, I tell you why, because I've just uh, unfortunately jumped jumped across the climbing street and I've just been talking about a highlight. I hope that's the last time I make that mistake in this race. I could yeah, not work out what track. I think it's important to stress the mistakes. Um, <laughs> no wonder it, it's not yet dry in the pit lane. That's what really threw me as well as the fact I flicked my timing screen and thought, why have they not got red on the screen? Apologies to all of them, all in present. And me, I'm, 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 it's not a high benchmark to confuse me. Yeah, but you certainly did there. We're just having a, a, a browse through the highlights there. Um, I can confirm that the front runners are still out there. The 911 numbered Porsche from Mantai. Kevin Estra still leads. Um, not much in it though. There's only 1.7 seconds last time across the line. Uh, another uh, just under 
30 seconds there before the third place Tom Chick Rover Racing BMW and then a further three seconds before the second of the Rover BMWs. This one did the cap still get away. That's the 98 and the number one is 34. Fourth place, of course, uh, sorry, second place, of course, is the number four of Lucas Stoltz. And uh, I've, I've always, I, I use this term a lot um, in endurance racing groups. Um, some endurance races, I feel, are a high-speed game of chess. And I think none more so than the Nürburgring 24 hours. It's kind of a, a game of chess. It's like a game of basketball where, you know, you, you can still you get baskets, but it's all about that final quarter. And it, it you know, like a typical 24-hour race, but even more so here at the Nürburgring, all about push without risk, stay out of trouble, which is a big ask in some circumstances, and, and be there at the end, be there at the end to fight. How many times have we seen down the recent years where this race has come down to the last 10 or 15 minutes of a 24 hour race, phenomenal. And I'm sure this one's going to be no different. Well, I think I think uh, I can safely say there's not going to be one team or one driver in this that does not have a slip up at some point. It's about minimizing those moments that can cost you time. So a little bit of built in caution. And don't forget, of course, this being a multi, multi class race. I mean, potentially could have had 25 classes in this race. Um, you do have cars of greatly differing speed, which always provide moments, in the words of commas, through the course of a race as the fast guys come through and hope that the drivers in the slower cars, in the production class cars, stay on their line and keep out of the way. What you never, ever want is a driver in front, something in front, changing angle once, once, angle then once. twice. Then So yeah, so just looking stops. at the classes, Bruce. Uh, Twenty classes in this year's uh, in this year's race. Uh, TCR class uh, down in 36th place overall is the Bassing Hyundai Motorsport entry. Uh, TCR class always is. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan for some reason of front wheel drive uh, touring car type racing, and uh, and the TCR class has, has always been. Uh, a bit of an attraction for me. Maybe it's just going back to my roots a little bit. Um, but certainly the uh, the Bassing car getting well ahead of the other car in TCR, both on the same lap. And again, recalibrate your mind. It's not just a couple of minutes lap time. It's a full uh, six and a half minutes, well, 10 minutes at the moment on a wet track. But uh, he's got uh, quite a gap. He's got about 45, oh, he's got nearly a minute. Uh, on the next of the TCR runners, as far as my maths can tell. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that as we will try and keep our uh, abreast of uh, what else is happening down through the 20 classes or so. To my eye, and it's easy for me to say it from a commentary booth, Joe, does appear to be drying out. Visibility mm. is picking up, but again, we've still got this, this dichotomy. But what we also have is a fantastic scrap at the head of the field. Kevin Estro has got Lucas Stoltz, the two yellow cars, the Porsche ahead of the Mercedes, almost nose to tail, under a second between them now. Who's going to be brave enough to push up to 100%? They've been driving at maybe 95%, but now there is almost a dry line starting to appear on the sections of the track that were that little bit drier. They weren't the full, full wet areas. And because of the troughs uh, and, and, and rises in the Nürburgring, around the Nürburgring track, we are getting clumps of fog that are settling in the uh, the lower areas of the track and and they're kind of drifting around. I, I think, you know, once again, variable conditions, a very wet track uh, towards the end of the lap, up towards uh, the Dottinger Hall and through the uh, through the uh, Schwarzenschwanz area of the track just before then the Franz Garten. Uh, we're still seeing uh, we're still seeing the tyres cutting through the water, and that for me is a is a big indicator of just uh, how damp the track is. And uh, we've still got that fog at the tear garden, uh, Bruce. We've still got that fog on the Dottinger Horn, one of the fastest parts of this track, uh, heading into the tear garden with poor visibility. So that's why I'm sat here behind the microphone there. Well, look, I suppose you could say if it's going to be anywhere on the lap, it's got to be there or thereabouts, because that's one of the rare, rare points in which they point straight for more than a handful of seconds and uh, gives them a chance. But obviously, when you have that little rotten left-hand kink and start rising up the hill to the final two sequences of corners, you do like to at least know where the turn in and the braking points are. Yeah, because it really is fast, isn't it? And you literally are 
threading a needle. There's so much time to be gained there, and um, you, you kind of get towards the end of the lap, and you think, oh, I'm nearly there. I've, I've nearly completed the lap, so I'll, I'll just back up. But then, you know, through the S bend at the tear garden, and then through that final left hander, and then onto the uh, start finish straight, you, you, you need to be carrying uh, a, a, a lot of speed and maximizing your entry onto the start finish straight. Um, still, still a wet Grand Prix track, I see, Bruce. Certainly is. We just had a change for the lead. Kevin Estra lost out to Lucas Stoltz and then thought, you know what, I don't really fancy that. So even before they got two corners onto the Grand Prix loop, the Porsche back in front of the Mercedes, but a great little dogfight here between the sort of custard yellow and blue Mercedes. That's uh, Lucas Stoltz and the sort of more acid green and acid yellow Porsche, who's about to be deposed again. Stoltz back into the lead. I thought Stoltz was, again, just, just mentioning coming out of the tear garden onto the start finish bit. I think it was the uh, the Mercedes who had a great run on the Porsche out of that corner and was able to get by under the heavy braking for turn one. And I, I, I was about to say, just before he retook the Porsche, uh, that he was kind of looking quite happy just to sit there behind the Porsche. However, he's proved me to be wrong. And the number four Mercedes has taken the lead of this race. Having watched Absolutely. a lot of racing. Yeah, exactly. And it's now starting to pull away. But what, what I've seen time and time again, the AMG Mercedes always seems to have really good punch out of the final corner and therefore overtaking into turn one is its favourite place. Then you get to the sort of sweeping sections of the circuit from, oh, notably Brunchen on. And the Porsche just looks so much better balanced. And uh, But that's what we want. You don't want them to have identical performance at each point on the circuit. You, you want them to have a difference that in turn they can exploit but at the moment the advantage going to Lucas Stoltz he's got another Mercedes up ahead that's the CP racing entry running in the Pro-Am class of SP9 and the driver on board that one stays well out of the way as they go down through hats and back so very well done indeed doesn't interrupt the overall battle well done Charles Espinel yeah very experienced driver in the CP racing Mercedes that's the, uh, the predominantly white with the red and blue livery getting in amongst the slow traffic as they get into the hats and back and head out onto the north slide for now and there's no doubt about it the Mercedes has pulled quite a gap they were pretty much nose to tail around the Grand Prix track and that's not the case and already just as they head down towards out of hats and back down towards the foot flats the Mercedes pulling out a, a gap pretty much every metre that gap increases just over the brow towards flood flats. Very, very fast part of the track there through sweeping right-hand curves. And the Porsche looking like he's using a slightly different line to the Mercedes. I noticed that on the Grand Prix striker. And uh, so, again, it's it's about finding out where the grip is. And uh, we'll try not to be startled when we see a car completely offline and, and maintaining its momentum because that's where the tyres finding the grip, not necessarily on the dry, rubbered line, but offline on the wet. And there's the Porsche just going through uh, the, um, the right hand with Arenberg, and he'll be heading down to the heading down the foxhole towards Adnar Forst, plunging downhill and then uphill. And now, great battle from these two, and I don't think it's over. I, what I think, Bruce is I think we're seeing a little bit of tyre performance coming into play here. And it, there's no doubt about it that the Mercedes is working in the better in these conditions. And it may be down to tyre life. I'm just going to check that whilst you talk amongst yourselves and just see where we are in the stint. Well, certainly when the track got wet last night for qualifying, suddenly the Mercedes came to life. They'd scarcely been in the top 10 after serious running and then suddenly they started to take half of the top 10 qualifying positions but then again there's wet track and there's very wet track we've had all versions of every, every degree of wet so far but it must said, be said Lucas Stoltz looks super super pole, poised in the number four HRT Mercedes leading now and uh, just starting to pull away Kevin Estra will be doing his absolute all uh, to stay out at the front of the field but uh, can he hang on to Stoltz and behind them they've got a margin of over half a minute now to Nicky Katzberg the two Rover Racing BMW second a third and fourth they're separated by only half a second but uh, they just don't have the pace of the front two runners Lucas Stoltz now in the lead as he was in the opening laps of the race and Kevin Estra back down into second place 
both on Michelin tyres, Bruce, both have into their stint by seven laps. So tyre life uh, should be the same. However, what we don't know is how those cars are set up and set up in a way to use the tyres. But there was certainly the Mercedes had the advantage there when it came to finding the grip and finding the performance all across the lap. And uh, that's what we're seeing there. We'll, we'll see what the gap is next time by. Uh, it's out to 2.4 seconds there as they've just clicked past. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what sector they're on, but it's out to 2.4 seconds uh, already. So I, I can see that increasing as we get around the start. They're getting towards X Muller. Bergwerk will be coming up next for them. So um, that is where they are around this mighty lap. 25.3 kilometres of uh, amazing fun. But uh, is it as much fun in the wet? You know what, Joe? When a driver has competed a stint here, their eyes are going to be out on stalks. But mm. when they've done it in conditions like this, I mean, they're going to be hanging around down by their knees, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely, Bruce. It's all about the concentration level. And you know what? The Nürburgring in, in perfect conditions... Uh, it just sucks every ounce of concentration from you. The, the, the track is so fast in sections and you have to be so, uh, you have to have so, so much finesse and accuracy in where you place the car. And you, you're kind of thinking two or three sections ahead, two or three corners ahead, and add in the, uh, the unknown quantity of a voyage of discovery every time you go onto the brake pedal or turn the wheel into a corner and see what the grip level is it's it's just it's a phenomenal skill that these young men and women are able to uh, to to drive these cars at the pace that they drive them and i'm not necessarily just talking about our professional drivers but our our pro-arms and amateurs as well they come here and they compete at this level and considering you know the the, the complexity uh of the conditions we're seeing everyone so far and i've, I've said it now so i'm touching wood bruce uh, everyone seemingly able to handle the pressure it looks like we've had uh, we, we've had plenty of ops crews but we've had no major incidents have we and it's just it's incredible to think that uh, that that we've achieved so far what we've achieved in the weather yes i think we've had that period of uh, even the greatest of the drivers out there finding aquaplaning particularly on the grand prix loop and then they were having to work out where standing water was out around the full nordschleife but right now it seems to have settled down so you're laughing if you're fans of the hound racing team just based just across the road in Moy's path and uh, Lucas Stoltz he's had a stormy first handful of runs of course they've had the pit stop and uh, now Lucas Stoltz leading, leading by two seconds from Kevin Estra but the replacement drivers getting lined up Connor De Filippi waiting to take over the number 98 uh, Rover Racing BMW and I'm sure last year's winning car the number one Rover Racing BMW will be handed over soon. Nicky Katzberg in third place at the moment. Haven't seen who's going to be next into that one, but Conor De Filippi getting ready to take over the fourth place car from Martin Tomczyk. And of course, his eyes will be within his skull at the moment, but he's aware that all is going to be very, very tricky as he dials himself in. I'm interested to see where the decision on what sort of tyres to run out there. It's got to be wet. It, we might be getting into the realms of intermediates. I can't see anybody uh, looking at the pictures, what we're seeing on the live stream. The teams are looking at the same pictures, looking at the conditions, looking and seeing what the cars are doing out there. They can see the track conditions, and it, it, it's just got to be a straightforward set of wets going on to these cars uh, that are about to pit. Uh, I, can't, I, I wouldn't be brave enough. There, there aren't any sections of this track that are even showing uh, a damp line, let alone a dry line. No, and uh, one of the glories uh, these days is when you, the visibility is good enough for that. The helicopter carrying one of the TV cameras to be up there, because again, when you get that uh, shot from above, Joe, it really shows the speed of the cars, plus the other element, just how narrow the circuit is around the Nordschleife, mm. the track, and then of course, just the, it's, it's not a grass verge, it's a grass fringe, isn't it? Effectively, then the barriers. Yeah. And the race leader in, Lucas Stoltz is coming in. I think it's Manuel Metzger due to take over for him next. He's also sharing with Mauro Engel and Adam Christodoulou, three of those four drivers winners here before. Just Lucas Second Stoltz, the driver, bring it in, who has not got a win to his name. And Estra in as well, the, uh, the two leaders following one another in, Bruce. So, uh, not exactly uh, showing their cards in their hand at this stage and everybody just going through the motions. Like I said, just a high-speed game of chess and it's just keeping 
to your strategy. We're not seeing anything different from the teams. And it's such a long lap that uh, I doubt we will. One of the BMWs is in. It's the 98. Tom Chick into the pits in the 98. First of the Rover cars to come through and take that pit. That is, the number one has stayed out, though. So Katzberg stays out for an extra lap. Yeah, just looking to see, we've got three of the first four have made those, their pit, uh, have come into the pits. Number four from the lead, Luke Stotts will hand over. Number nine, 11, Porsche, Kevin Estra will hand it over. And the 98 BMW. Next car in line, will it come into the pits? No, it doesn't. Josh Burton continues for one further lap. KCMG, Porsche goes up into second place overall. And for reference, Joe, 21 seconds between Katzberg in his uh, race-leading BMW and Burton in the KCMG Porsche on the start-finish line. Great run from that number 18, the KCMG team running a Porsche this year and in the second, and Lauer in the Retronic Racing Porsche. Uh, he stays out as well. Let's have a look and see where they are stint-wise. I think they're pretty much equal, yeah. So the three, they, they've extended that stint to eight laps. Um, I'm just going to see what the, uh, I'm just going to reference my chart, Bruce, and see what sort of la uh, pit stop time they're going to owe us. So with a seven lap stint, uh, they're going to owe us a 169 second pit stop. Uh, the eight lap stint is going to owe us 190 second pit stop. So that's uh, that's not complicated at all, is it? No, not at all. But yeah, well, I'm quite accustomed to that to a slightly different sliding scale with the uh, the Green Langstrecken series. And the later you make your final pit stop, the shorter time you have to put, shorter the time your minimum pit stop time. Uh, it sort of plays one way and then plays another. I got quite excited there, Joe. You said you'd get a consult your chart. I thought you were doing a manual, <laughs> note it down in pencil sort of pit start, uh, pit sure. chart, just like the old days. I've got a slate. Short on the slate? Yeah, I've got a, a slate, yes. Yes, I've got a slate with, with various different coloured chalks. Um, I did go to Crayon one year, but the Crayon just gets messy through. Doesn't work on hot weather, in hot weather. Now, yeah, doesn't. reports of fog. Marshall's post 189 to 201. That is Tiergarten, effectively. I think we worked out yesterday, John and I, it's 207 or 209 Marshall's posts around the 25 and a bit kilometres. But uh, frankly, we did see wisps of fog starting to come back down a, a lap or so ago. But anyhow, the officials have noted that down. Yeah, there was there was fog, Bruce, about, I'm trying to think of the, the time it was, it was quite a while ago. Uh, maybe 50 minutes ago that we report the fog. Leaders are out of the pit. That's their pit stops completed. And the Mercedes stays ahead of the Porsche. And, yeah, and it's... Uh, oh, and slides very, very deep into turn one. Estra, I believe, staying at the wing of the Porsche. I think he Christensen might have taken over, actually. No, Chris, uh, Chris Christensen has. Ah, oh, no, right. Christensen. But he, he, got, he halved the gap. It was about one and a half seconds before the pit stop, but it was about one and a half car lengths when they came back out and just completing the housework, uh, the Rover Racing BMW that uh, was brought in. In fact, I was wrong. I thought I saw... No, it, I was right. Connor de Filippi has taken yeah. that over, so he is rejoined, listed as eighth place. It will be lower than that. But it, the, the Porsche, the 911 Porsche, actually got running earlier. Its pit garage was about two car lengths up the road, closer to pit exit, uh, uh, further from pit exit. Uh, than the HRT Mercedes, but uh, he was up and running, but the yellow and blue Mercedes just pulled across into its path to resume in effectively, but of course that's got to wait for those that didn't come in to make a pit stop, which was about the top, about six drivers uh, carried on by when they've made their pit stop next time around, then we'll see the true order all over again. But these two cars, the number four Mercedes from HRT and the 911 Manti Racing Porsche, just remember, they had a lead of uh, the best part of 25 seconds over the Rover Racing BMWs. So expect them still to be in those positions. And they're effectively uh, our race leaders. There's everyone ahead of them, Bruce, going with a pit stop, um, as you've just mentioned. It, it's, it's, it's looking like a sprint race between the number four and the number 911, for sure. Um, they are nose to tail. Now, we did see the Mercedes having the performance advantage and I put that purely down to the grip that uh, Lucas Stoltz was finding. And it's, it's down to whether um, Metz, Metzger can find the same level of grip. Um, it's a voyage of discovery. They've just gone out on brand new wets. And albeit the, the wets were heated up in tyre blankets and in the ovens, 
the moment they rolled down the pit lane, Bruce, it's like when you pour water onto a hot plate, the heat dissipates out of the plate immediately. As soon as those cars were on the ground, that heat would have just been leaving those tyres, and now they're beginning to uh, to get the tyres up to uh, their, their optimum operating temperature, and the wet tyre does operate at its best at a much lower temperature than, a, say, a slick tyre does. Yes, it must be quite remarkable. You'd be quite easily convinced that the team hadn't bothered to, to warm the tyres at all, and the fact that Turn 1 is a very, very sharp right-hander and it's wet really doesn't help matters. But a few corners in, once they start going through the Nord Carer and then down through the twisters at Hats and Back, they should know the level of grips on their car. But of course, the drivers coming out of the pits, Joe, they don't know where the water's standing around the circuit. They might have looked at some of the onboard footage, but even so, they've still got to find what it's not like around this outlap. Quite uh, wide lines coming from our race leader, Manuel Metzka, their effective race leader. I have to put that in. Others haven't yet pitted, but uh, maybe pushing a little too hard too soon there. Well, yeah, but I did mention this uh, just a, a wee while ago. Don't be startled by what looks like drivers driving offline and getting into trouble. They're searching for the grip route. They're going off the rubber race, the conventional racing line, and finally, where, where with add, add water, that actual. Uh, conventional racing line is slippy and, and provides you with less grip than it, the line off the conventional racing line does and that's what we're seeing we're, we're having glimpses of that from both of these runners um, uh, Darren Wood is listening hello Darren um, he's, he's very sad not to be here it's, uh, it's an annual pilgrimage for Darren and uh, and his pals um, he, he's just reminded us that the Rover team may be splitting their pit strategy to avoid a double stack. We know how cramped this pit lane is, and that would be a very sensible approach to split the team cars down the middle and have one car pit earlier than the next. Now, now that they've managed that, that's gonna that's gonna pan out for the rest of this race. And, and just for your reference, the numbers are now limited to below, I think it's 170, but, but not so long ago, a decade ago, we had a record entry of 229 cars. Actually, that was 2007. First time I went, I reckon it was somewhere just south of 200, and I couldn't believe it when I walked into the pit of garage. Then had to walk sideways to go down between the cars and then say sorry to another mechanic I'd tripped over and worked to the front of the garage. Stacked from front to back in the garage, and um, it's... That was when the penny really dropped, just about how big a race this was. And that was back in the late 80s, and I kept coming for a handful more years. And then I've had a ridiculous hiatus. I've watched it, but I've always been working this same weekend. And it's great to be back. And even better, Joe, it's great to be back as the track is drying out, and I can now see much further whenever you're treated to a long shot of the circuit. Not fog anymore. Of course, there's still that question mark around the area at Tiergarten, but conditions for now are going the right way. Yeah, we are seeing that. And... For me, Bruce, I'd much rather have a, con a consistent track condition than these changeable ones. All right, we're in the entertainment business and um, the, the weather and wet tracks, etc., do throw up variables that we perhaps uh, have to react to and the teams have to react to and the drivers certainly have to react to. But we as commentators also have to do that. And this track proving to be uh, ever trickier. Uh, it's down to patience as well, Bruce. We've, we've just uh, Maro Engel just showing a little bit of I'm not going to say impatience because I think it was controlled patience there and just getting past a couple of cars is perhaps one of the trickiest parts of the track it was at the uh, the, the hats and back where you've got them the sequence of left right left right flowing corners and he had to get round two of the slower classes there and he did so but I tell you what it was very very close indeed and almost made contact with not just one but two cars those are the variables on the variables, I think we can say, but um, <laughs> it's the same for everybody out there. And just caution has to be thrown into the mix. But of course, with Maro Eng but sorry, with um, Manuel Metzger and Michael Christensen, mm, there's that balance. They're, they're fighting for the lead of the race, so maybe slightly less caution for the two of them. Yeah, into the pits has come one of our Porsche Caymans. Couldn't quite see the number there. Nicky Katzberg now pits in the second of the Rover Racing BMWs. We we mentioned there that uh, they've split the strategy, not the double stack in the pits, giving themselves room enough to service this car. So Nicky Katzberg will be getting out, car being refueled, and it's intermediates going on the Katzberg car. 
I was speculating as to what the tyre choice would be, but Katzberg reports back to the team that the track is ready for intermediates. You were right, Bruce. You, you called it just on what you could see from the live stream and what you could see from the, the way that the track was beginning to come back to us. Well, Nicky Katzberg certainly agrees with you. That's the advantage of doing one further lap. But again, you know, you yeah. think about it, just to stress people, that further lap gives you about 10 minutes of time to consider what is the best option to put in your car when the conditions are super tricky and dry conditions. It's uh, a much quicker lap time. In fact, we're now lapping at around 9 minutes 20, 9 minutes 25. But advantage to Nicky Katzberg in last year's winning car. He is now out of the car. He's helping his teammate uh, get fully strapped in. And then we're going to get get that out rolling very, very quickly indeed. Looks like I think John Edwards on board there. I'll confirm when he leaves the pit exit. But uh, don't, don't forget, this was a car that was running third overall. So it ought to be able to slot back into that relative position. And a nine lap spin for that number one. So we mentioned there, it's staying out a lap longer than the sister car, the number eight, 98. The sister Rover Racing BMW. Uh, that will start uh, rising to the top of the uh, timing screen for Philippines. Down, down in eighth place overall. Uh, two cars ahead of it, though, still owing us a pit stop, and that's in sixth place for number seven Mercedes, the Getsby Mercedes of March Yellow and the Yelma Berman 10Q Racing Team Mercedes. Cars 70 and 40 and 60 and 70 overall. They're going to disappear very quickly into the pits, I would have thought, Bruce and uh, that will allow the 98 back onto the tail of the number 911. Um, those three cars that had inherited the lead, the number one global racing car, the KCMG Porsche number 18, and the number three Retronic car, uh, they're now, they are, all three of them, those cars are now in the pits and uh, taking up time in the pit stop phase. Uh, that's going to allow the number four back into the lead. Let's get at the wheel of the uh, HRT Mercedes, the Biltstown liveried car of course bright yellow that's the Christodoulou car as well my our good friend Adam Christodoulou sharing that car eventually today well he's keen to add another win he won in 2016 the Barrow Engel Manuel Metzger and Bernd Schneider the great Bernd we do miss him he just seems such a staple for decades years decades here it seems and like let eternity the number one BMW yeah. sitting in a pit stop uh, no work being done on the car but waiting for the signal as to when he can get going. Nicky Katzberg well, that's a, out of the car. That's a 213 second pit stop, Bruce, because he stretched that stint out to nine laps. I mentioned seven, it was eight laps for the sister cars, which meant that their pit stop was 190 seconds. Uh, with the, by, Because it's done uh, nine laps, uh, that's a 213 second pit stop. So that's why it felt like an eternity it was that long. Again, it's, it's a mathematical equation and, and come the end of the race it sort of almost matters not unless you've really really pitted very very uh, late on but we'll see the order you know what you gain with one hand you potentially lose with another and the driver who's taken over the number one skittering around it is indeed John Edwards as I, I surmised it may be just trying to get a feel through that first tight right and the, the tight left that follows of just how much or indeed how little grip is available and for your reference also just reporting John Edwards taking over the number one. The uh, other driver just comes to the track. Josh Burden has handed over the KCMG Porsche to Alexandra Imperatori, the Swiss driver who's been based in China for about 15 years now, but uh, very quick in everything. No wonder he's always on the books at KCMG. Rest of the track beginning to come back to us, but um, it still looks very foggy down the bottom end of the Dottinger Hoare into Tiergarten, not as bad as it was and as the we're just getting uh, information that the fog is clearing at Tiergarten so that's like we said Bruce that looks like we're going the the weather's going to clear the time in Germany of course uh, coming up to 6 p.m. So we are going to, it is going to cool down, I would have thought, ever so slightly. And that might stop uh, more rain. We don't know, the, I, don't, I don't know what the satellite picture is showing, but the weather forecast I've got is for um, not much rain in the area for the next two hours. But then it all goes awry. I think the, uh, the forecasters are even uh, not willing to 
put a dollar on uh, on any bets and what the weather's going to do here because it can change can't it it's the, uh, the the territory isn't it the environment it just creates weather the weather fronts are created from the uh, the, the, the altitude of the Eiffel running and it does seem such a far cry from all the really hot runnings of the Nürburgring 24 hours that you've been at, that I've been at, Joe. It just feels like it's from another planet. Ooh, interesting message from Race Control. Unsafe release, car number four. We know that car, don't we? Of course, that was a car that Manuel Metzger yes. was released just in front of Michael Christensen. Remember I said that Christensen had taken over yes. the Banta racing car, got going sooner because his, his pit garage was closer to pit in, but uh, the, the yellow Mercedes pulled in front of the Grello. I thought it just squeaked it in. It's under investigation, so we'll, we'll check that one out. Keep an eye on that. That could have... These little things can really add up, Joe. They really can. Bruce, we're at the top of the hour, so it's our even-numbered classes. Uh, that their turn to find out what's happening in their classes. Uh, the overall lead, as we've mentioned uh, them already, the number four... Uh, Mercedes Team HRT of Metzger leads from the 911 numbered Christensen driven Manti Porsche. Conor de Filippi is in third in the number 98 Rover Racing BMW. And then in the SPX class, we've got the uh, Glickenhaus that's leading uh, 25th overall for car 704. And Thomas Much at the wheel of that car. Uh, the Cup X class has. Uh, the number 75, uh, Auto Moto, let me just give the, you this car's full title. Um, Auto Mundo on Sport, uh, that car is 26th overall, so just behind the Glickenhaus in the Cup X class, that's car 75. Uh, SP Pro, and just looking down the order for the first of our SP Pros, and I can't find it, Bruce, that's typical. Uh, I put it on the list and it's not on the... Oh, there it is. It's right down the bottom. Uh, 119 spot for car 350. That's the Black Falcon team. Um, that car looking like it's still running, but uh, we're down the order in 119 spot. SP8T and the SP8T class, I have to go up to 31st overall car 36 the uh, other black falcon car in 31st overall leading the uh, sp t sp7 is being led by huber motorsports porsche in 34th spot overall that's car number 80 and the tcr class mentioned them before it's the hyundai motorsport uh, car 831 in 42nd place as uh, overall and um, that's Engsler at the wheel of that car at the moment the one of my favorite classes the BMW 240i class I really love the look of these cars that well that's being led by uh, the number 231 that as a, a friend of the one of the collective David Drinkwater down to drive that car later on uh, and that car is currently 82nd overall in the order uh, only two classes to go Cup 3 is the next one on the list and I go back up the order to 36 overall for car 305. That's the G Tech competition uh, Porsche Cayman. And that car is 36th overall. And then the final class at the top of this hour is the SP4 team runners. And they are down in 81st overall. And it's uh, being led by the number 86, which is a Porsche 718 in my chart. Uh, that's the hourly update for our even class, uh, even numbered classes, but well, not even numbered, but even hours classes, let's call it that. Um, more of that on the, on the next hour where we'll have a look at the other classes in the order. Thanks a lot, Joe. And while all that was happening, of course, those that uh, hadn't come in for their second pit stops have now done so. And as predicted, number four, the out racing team Mercedes, the car that is invest under investigation, don't forget. Leading the race now by seven seconds from Michael Christensen. So Metzger's settled down very, very well indeed. And it's stretching clear. And then there's another 20 plus seconds back to Conor de Felipe. And Marcus Winkelhock at the wheel. Down in 17th overall for the Audi Sport Team car collection, Audi R8 LMS. Um, not used to seeing the number two running as far down the order there, Bruce, but uh, with just under 21 and a half hours, uh, don't be surprised if you see the number two rising up through the order with that uh, great driver lineup. 
uh, thing of hop at the wheel of the car, but he's uh, he's just look at the uh, just look at the driver line. Now Christopher Hauser, Nico Buller, and uh, Patrick Niederhauser are yet to have a turn in that car. I'm not sure who started it, but the number two running down in 17th, and we should see Nico Muller was the first driver. Was he? Right. You know, in a race this, this long, Bruce. Sorry. More pit stop action, looking very crowded down in the pits here at the Nürburgring. Four and five teams sharing one garage. That must be a nightmare. It does look as though they're just allowed to park in any angle they possibly can get into. So someone knows in, someone knows out, some, if they know no one's around them, they can park sort of in normal parallel parking fashion. But majority of them have to be swung around uh, to make sure there's space for others to fit in. It looks like Bedlam and at times it feels like Bedlam out around the circuit. But the good news for all the drivers going out is what was a very wet track in parts is getting drier by the minute. But don't forget, five past six in the evening we'll have a few more hours of uh, sunlight but certainly in terms of sunlight oh. or, or light but light that can dry the track is ebbing away by the minute so any more rain and it's going to stay around a whole lot longer once it stopped pouring but for now darren, it's dry joe that well i can tell you uh, bruce good news from darren wood our collective meteorologist uh, the weather is traveling this way so we should have some good dry running as soon as that track dries no rain behind the current band of weather, at least as far as Spa Frankfurt, which isn't that far away geographically speaking. But thanks for that, Darren. Keep the, uh, the weather forecast coming. I tell you um, what, after yesterday's downpour, I think Spa yeah. Frankfurt has probably moved a bit closer, to be honest. Slide down the hillside in the Ardennes. That was Incredible, unbelievable, wasn't it? wasn't it? Yeah, uh, absolutely unbelievable. I've never, I've certainly seen the access tunnel at Spa being blocked before, Bruce, while we've been there. and. You have to drive the, the long way out, but I've never seen it filled to the extent that we saw those videos being posted on social media. The, the, the tunnel was literally full to the brim. It was, it was level. The, 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 the little valley where the Eau Rouge runs through, where the, the corner takes its name from, that the, the amount of water that was running into that, which is basically a drainage stream, isn't it, for the surrounding hillsides. Well, it was certainly doing its job. Look, Joe, we've we've both been at a circuit that doesn't get very much rain at all, and the tunnel's been completely blocked. <laughs> yes. You buy Autodrome, don't forget. <laughs> yes, yeah. You can you can forgive them that, though, Bruce. Their the drainage system isn't really isn't really built with uh, deluges of the like uh, of what we saw. But uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any drainage system would could have coped with the amount of rain we saw, not just at Spa, but here as well, Bruce. It was. Uh, we were uh, speaking in, uh, to a lot of the drivers uh, that were out in this in the weather last night, um, which pretty much looked like the start of this race. It was getting towards, for me, I think it was getting towards a red flag, and the weather just turned, I think, in just in time. I think if it had continued to come down, we were seeing so much pooling and standing water, I think there was a consideration to whether or not we should stop things, but uh, we got away with it. Let's hope it stays. So absolutely so. I mean, I think it really was that close. You're quite right there. And um, again, as I said, one mitigating circumstance. We have 121 starters this year, necessarily the field down a little bit uh, because of the pandemic and people not being sure if they could travel. But uh, that gave a bit more scope, but it, it was very close to the edge. Talking of close to the edge, Manuel Metz is getting very, very close indeed as he continues to eke an advantage in the race lead. Number four HRT Mercedes, uh, four seconds to the good now over Michael Christensen, who in turn is another 21 seconds clear of Conor De Filippi. So again, Conor De Filippi third for overrating in the sister car with John Edwards. Fellow American is running another half minute plus in arrears in fourth overall. Best of the rest, Alexander Imperatori, KCMG Porsche in fifth. And the Brutronic Porsche crew in sixth place overall. That's number three, Tobias Muller. And if you're not that accustomed to Brutronic as, as a name, of course, the HCB Brutronic team, they won the ADAC GT Masters title a couple of years ago. So they're fighting their pedigree up against the team who are teams who are long, long established. And one of those, Joe, came here with uh, Fricadelli Racing, two cars. They were fastest in the qualifying six hours a few weekends ago. It hasn't been their race as yet. We saw great pace from them in practice, but at the moment they've got car number 31, Maxime Martin, in 
11th overall and in the pits, Earl Bamber in 14th. So they are going to have to really go some to try and make up the deficit they've been faced with after just two and a half hours. Yeah, and that, that's their third pit stop, Bruce. Let's have a look and, and see just what the car did on that stint. Um, sorry, what number are we talking about? I've just lost track of where I'm, what I'm looking for. 30 and 31, we were talking 30 about. 30 and 31, the yeah, the 30 has done, the 30, Bruce, had done eight laps. Uh, Matt Campbell at the wheel, uh, that was his second stint. First stint, he did five laps in the car. Um, so he's in after eight laps, so that'll be... Um, a regular stop so that that's kind of a regular stint they haven't stretched it at all and again the number 31 uh Frickinelli car that car has already been into the pits and has taken uh hits its pit stop first before the 30 and that car also did eight laps and it's being wheeled into the garage through the number 30 that's never a good sign it's a sign of a uh, consideration of further jobs required. Maybe at this point in the race, they've been looking at the weather map and they see what's coming. Can we wait five minutes? There could be rain and they're going to affect a change on the car. Maybe very early for any, any brake changing uh, pads. But uh, right now, you know, you do have to consider with this super long lap around the Nordschleife. Mm -hmm. But if you think the weather's about to change and you can't afford to head out on a dry a set of intermediates if a huge downpour is on its way, why not uh, maybe use this roll of the dice? and uh, make a change, buy yourself some, some time before you have to make the decision on tyres. That's what the sort of thing you do if you're not in the overall reckoning, which they're not really at the moment, are they? No, and the, uh, the weather is moving across the satellite, showing uh, that the team is using the sim a similar satellite system uh, to what our meteorologist Darren Wood is helping us with. Then the weather is moving away, and there's, there's no more weather between here and Spa. Um, some specks of rain just east of Spa that will eventually develop as it gets towards us, but that's that's at least two hours away yet. So um, I'm not sure whether that was a problem that's manifested itself on the number 30 Frickadelli Porsche, and they've brought the car in uh, onto the pit apron where it did its regular service for of pit stop and tyres, but then the car was uh, jacked up and swivelled round, and it's gone into the garage and a lot of work going on in that car the car on the hijacks to allow crew uh, members underneath the car so you never know bruce the car could have been clattered across some curbs uh, uh destroyed something underneath the car and majority from what i can see the majority of the attention is going on just behind the front axle which is pretty much where nothing is because the engine's in the rear of that car well, if someone could let the mechanics know that, but they've certainly removed the parts so they can see the parts that lie beneath. So a big problem there for Earl Bamba. I would suggest Matt Campbell did the, first, the five lap, the eight lap, then Earl did eight laps and then came into the pits. But, you know, so many times on a circuit like the Nordschleife, uh, a problem for someone else can become a, a problem for you if you're in the chasing car and perhaps going over the curbs in avoidance of a spinning car is what could have done the damage here for number 30 Frickadelli Racing point, Porsche. Yeah. Good point, Bruce. Yeah, taking avoiding action and uh, damaging the underneath of the car on the curbs. And yeah, there were some very high curbs here at the Nürburgring. Uh, but suspension damaging curbs uh, is what I would call them. And some of them, you just want to be nowhere near them, not anywhere, you know, not even clipping them when you, you know, just sort of uh, glancing, a glancing blow. They're almost like street curbs, some of them, they, you know. I haven't quite got a 90 degree face, but it's not far off. Oh, the number of times that I've seen cars um, get a little out of line, they hit the curb at the side of the circuit, they get the car then gets bounced, literally mm. into the middle of the track. So uh, it's, those, those are the steep ones. Others you can ride at your desire. But uh, alas, for the number 30 Fricka Deadly Racing team, and it's a team that's very close to the hearts of uh, people who love the Nordschleife. They've raced for years in what was the VLN, the uh, Langstrecht and now in the NLS, new name for the long distance series here and had increasing success. But of course, with the loss of uh, the heartbeat of the team, Sabine Schmitz earlier in the year, you know, hit the team and everybody in the pit lane here very hard indeed. And her name is on the roof of both 30 and 31 and also the 911 Porsche from Manti Racing. So she's got a, a three-way chance of victory. But right now it's all riding with the 911 crew. 
uh, because 30 and 31 from Frickadelli Racing down the order in 12th place for number 31 for Maxime Martin and falling down the order as it sits in the pit garage, number 30 down to 24th and falling. Have you ever tried a Frickadelli, Bruce? I've been eating Frickadellis as long as they've been invented, <laughs> as far as I recall. Lovely, yeah. lovely meatballs. And I tell you what, Joe, we've worked at a lot of long distance races. It gets into the small hours in the morning, you're in the pit lane, and then someone comes in with a tray of food. And if you just happen to have a Frickadelli coming past on a little cocktail stick, you don't say no. 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 And you can just see also what it means to all, the, all the, the crew members, just at low points when someone comes through, if it's a cold night in the pits with hot chocolate or anything, yeah. just to get the blood sugar back up. But a bit of protein, I think, is really what's required. And I think a Frickadelli is as good a thing as any out there. Well, certainly, being in Germany, you, you have to sample the Frickadelli and the, the absolutely endless uh, selection of sausage, not to mention the end, endless selection of beers. Uh, it's a great place to be. It's a great place to visit. And um, hopefully it won't be long. Uh, perhaps next year's Nürburgring 24 hours, we'll be able to see the spectators back because it, it's a festival of speed. The fans come out here and they camp out on the North Slifer and they, they camp for basically the whole week. And it is, an, it is an absolutely visceral experience to go out there and walk amongst the, the fans who have got these makeshift grandstands, these makeshift compounds blasting out German heavy metal. I'm not, I'm not really a massive fan of German heavy metal, but you can't, it's unavoidable. Uh, the 911 into the pits, Bruce, along with the four. Well, okay, now is this That's the time the cars, quickly, hasn't it? cars go on to slick? So we've got 16 laps on the board, but the Hyundai Lantra running in the TCR class has just fitted slicks. I've heard news from the pits. So uh, it's amazing how fast this track really has dried out. And don't forget, a while ago, parts of the track were nearly dry. Now it looks so a big enough percentage of the circuit is dry. Let's, uh, if we can, hopefully get a look at the tyres going onto the 911, the number four, the two cars that have been fighting for the lead of the race. Don't expect driver changes because Michael Christensen and Manuel Metzger not long ago came in to make their regular pit stops, but now I'm sure it's just fresh tyres, but what sort of tyres? The number four Mercedes already got underway, so it's gained an advantage in the pit stop. And the 911 that came in from just a few seconds behind seems to have squandered a bit of time in the pit. So Manti Racing will be a little bit frustrated there as the Bilstein sponsored Mercedes pulls away through the first couple of corners and seems to have a fair bit of uh, grip. Last time he came out of the pits, you commented, Joe, about how tyre blankets work for a second, but once hot tyres get on a cold, wet track, the temperature goes away just like that. Well, they must be on slicks, Bruce. They've only done two laps. Now, again, recalibrating your mind, two laps of the conventional track is a very, very short stint. The two laps of the Nürburgring at the Nürburgring 24, that's almost 20 minutes of driving. So they've had a lot of time, enough time to assess what is going to be the best way forward. And they've got, they've very quickly made that decision to get onto the right tyre for the prevailing conditions because, quite frankly, your wet tyres will just absolutely demolish themselves on a dry track and they'll not lap, they'll certainly not lap a, a whole lap of the Nordschleifer. So they've, they've, they've done literally two laps and you can see the wet tire just beginning to melt off those heavy treaded wet uh, tires, uh, the wet tires on the dry track. And so slick tires pretty much being the, the tire of choice or the tire of need, I would say at this point in this race. Yeah, and it's worth pointing out, just the two laps you commented there for our first two cars, the number four Mercedes, the 911 uh, Porsche. But uh, two laps here in old money, that's 31 and a bit miles. So it, it's like about 10 laps at a regular size Grand Prix type circuit. So the consequences of just being the wrong side on the arrival of rain, your timing of your pit stop, either for or against, it's really huge and it really swings the pendulum in a race. But right now, number four HRT Mercedes, the number 911 Manti Racing Porsche, they're covering each each other's actions as you'd imagine that they would so more and more cars choosing to head towards the pits and we're seeing the number 29 Audi just coming off the pits up of course they'll not just be changing tires they'll be topping the fuel up they've done a two lap stint let's just see what the uh, what that means in uh, so a two lap 
stint means that they have to do a minimum of 69 seconds so one minute and nine seconds uh, for the cars that have done two stints i'm not sure how many laps the 29 has that's currently down in 13th sport the audi steam audi sport team land car with van der linda at the wheel out of the pits now uh having gone on to slick tires so we'll we'll keep an eye on the lap times bruce but i'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to see them tumbling and getting towards at optimum time yeah we're well, just looking at the most recent lap times i mean a, a very quick quickest runners out there last time around were actually the huber motorsport porsche marco Seafried and Maxime Martin, Fricadelli number 31, they were lapping in nine minutes four, nine minutes five. So still potentially another 50 seconds to go down towards the qualifying pace. Don't expect that in race form, but let's call it 45 seconds uh, to be found as the track continues to dry, but more to the point as they get put onto slick rubber. Everybody else diving into the pits. The number two car collection, Audi, the latest one in, Marcus Finkelhock. And into the pits, BMW Junior Team, car number 77, tail end of the top 20 pair of them. They're coming in, wet tyres off, quite steaming as they're being removed, but certainly uh, slick tyres going on. Good to see. We like a bit of variety. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Rob Chalmers spotted something that I was about to mention as well, Bruce. Uh, the Frickadelli Porsche we saw there, the middle section of the, of the floor the underfloor area of the car came off and it was very wet on the inside. Now, whether that's due to the uh, related wetness of the track or coolant, I'm gonna, Rob, Rob Chalmers spotted this and I'm, I'm gonna have to err on the fact that, that I think that was probably coolant. Uh, the, there's two radiators at the front of those Porsches and the coolant would have flowed back. And, uh, and I've got to apologize to Mick Palmer of Motor, Motor Racing UK magazine. I've woke him up by saying I didn't like uh, uh, German metal. I knew that would wake me up. Well, I'm sorry, Mick. I know you do, but I don't. Sorry. See you here. Let's have a walk out <laughs> into the trees next year. What have you started? Beers. Yeah, let's have a few beers with the, uh, the German metal fans. He would love it. Well, I, I tell you what, any budding engineer or construction engineer would love walking around because what always used to stand out to me with the they weren't camps, these were edifices that were being erected out, particularly in that wonderful suite sweeping section of corners at the start of the lap down from hats and back and along these were castles being built and occupied and uh, done in that very germanic way with beautiful organization of their beer pits and their barbecue area and uh, camping extraordinaire but certainly it must be said as the race went on not everybody was keeping up with the action on track maybe they were ducking out from a little too much metal but it really is an atmosphere like nowhere else you think about the atmosphere on the infield at Daytona at Sebring at the Mont all totally different and you know long may that rain this circuit is nigh on a hundred years old and it's got history oozing from its every pore but the best thing about it you never have two experiences the same at the Nürburgring everything every day you go to the circuit you get something new more information coming through on the number 30 Frickadelli Porsche Bruce uh, thank you to Marcel Duke who, uh, who tells me steering issues on the Porsche should be back on track in 20 minutes. And that was sent four minutes ago. So thank you to Marcel for that information. Uh, so steering issues delaying the number 30 in the pits as we uh, were speculating whether it was coolant. That was, uh, I've been proved wrong. Uh, thankfully, I've been proved wrong. It was obviously just wet off the weather and it's steering that's brought that car in. Well, again, I, I honestly don't think that would be Earl Bamber who'd put it off. I think someone else would have done something in front of the super capable Kiwi, but uh, a rare setback for, for a driver who just has a habit of winning 24-hour races. But uh, anyhow, that will be fixed, I'm sure. But uh, tough luck for the number 30 Frickadelli racing team. And at this point, you're always just uh, very, very pleased uh, that the car's from a two-car team, not a one-car team. So their hopes still ride with the sister car at number 31 that's running in ninth place Maxime Martin at the wheel at the moment I'm just going to check where the number 30 has dropped down Bruce at this early stage of this race that's going to cost them daily and we're expecting that car to drop way down the field it has indeed it's dropping it's dropping 37th. like a stone 37 was 35th when I looked down it's now 37th and it's going to continue to drop isn't it 
Alas, it will. In fact, that may, may end up down to about 60th place or below, but I'm sure once the car's back on track, we'll have plenty of pace. But the field too competitive to have a setback like that, unless everyone else has some as well to sort of stay in the overall battle. And that's a, that's a feature since I started coming here long, long ago, is that uh, used to have cars winning by margins of laps. Five laps weren't even a rare thing. Volker Strychek still racing in the Opel Manta today, but 2003, he, his car, an Opel Astra V8 Coupe, rather faster, won by five laps, sharing with Manuel Reuter, Timo Scheider and Marcel Thiemann. Raced by t run by Team Phoenix and Team Phoenix on the track, or in fact, not on the track, because mm. suddenly Dries Van Tor's gone off. He slid over the grass verge and front three-quarter angle into the, the tyres on the outside of the circuit and uh, <laughs> the windscreen completely flooded with muddy water as it came back off the tyres. Head in the hands for Dries Van Thor there. Oh, my word. That was one of the favourites in the race, has taken a tumble. And that's Phoenix now with its Audis. Yeah, I th you know what? That was, that car just snapped away from him again. Uh, cars going out onto what is in, in place is still a very wet and done track. And they're on slicks. And, and when the slicks lose, when you lose control on a damp track on slicks, it's very, very hard to get it back. He was down in 16, Flantour, and he's... He's managed, has he managed to get that car going? I, I think he has. Yes. He's pulled it out of the barrier. It was a big hit. I'd be absolutely amazed if that car has, has not suffered any kind of suspension damage. It's got to have suffered suspension damage. That was a massive hit. And the front end of the car absolutely buried itself. Uh, well, he's got the, every uh, chance. He's got every what? chance of crashing again because the windscreen is covered in mud, the muddy water that came back. So he's got to go back, A, because there's possible damage on the car at reduced that pace, is. and B, very reduced visibility. Yeah, and he's, he's just at the part of the track, he's just at the right-hander before the, the steep rise towards the carousel, I think, uh, from my estimation. Yes, indeed, confirm that. He's got a long way to go yet. Um, he's got all of the, that sequence of corners out through Whitman and Grunchen to, uh, after, of course, he comes out of the, and it looks like the car is damaged. I would have been amazed if he, if he hadn't, Bruce. He's got to limp that car all the way back round probably two thirds, if not half of this Nordschleifer track. And we just, uh, can, we, you could see from the in car, uh, just how deep he went. And the car just snapped around on him and it, he caught the oversteer, but then it snapped back on him. And that, that to me, Bruce, was definitely down to slick tires on, a, on a, what is still a relatively wet and damp track. The track went wet, left, the car went left, but then it went right. And it had sort of two movements as it started to go away from him. The second one was just the fact suddenly it was on the grass and the grass was wet. And then the car whipped around when it went in front three quarter, front right corner into the tyre wall. And then left rear corner spun around at uh, another 90 degrees to that. So frustration and disappointment. And another spinner is car 100, but that's done it on the Grand Prix loop. So sitting sideways on the track, not having hit anything. So that at least is good news for the pro am entry from Walk and Horse Motorsport. But uh, so just as the track's getting dry, you're thinking, why are people spinning? But that's because, as Joe pointed out, they're out on slick tyres, whereas before they've had more grip, albeit going away from them. Oh, and the long shot, uh, the, there's no rear wing on Brees Van Tours, rather tattered and battered Audi as it comes home. The front corner is damaged, front right hand corner. Rear wing obviously came off on the second point of impact with the tyre ball. There may need to be. Uh, repairs also to the tyre wall because he pushed the the strapping on the banding on the front up and certainly that Audi is not running four square on the circuit, Joe. Re rear suspension damage by what I can see as well, Bruce. We've got the right rear wheel that seems to have a tour link that's become detached because it's absolutely flapping. It's kind of he's getting a lot of rear wheel steer from that right rear, and that's and he's he's keeping he's keeping up a considerable pace to return to the pits. Uh, Quite, quite a frantic place. He's got nothing to lose. The car is really extensively damaged. That's going to put him, that's going to just knock the number 15 Audi out of contention for an overall win because there are people who are going to get through this without too many, too much adversity. And that's just a, that's just an overwhelming amount of adversity there. That's hit the number 15. It really is. And that was a car that was, uh, you know, one of the likely, well, I thought one of the strongest quartets. Matthias, Drudy, Robin Freitz, Frank Stippler, who started it, and Dries Van Tor. And Dries was an absolute yeah. star in this car 
for, as he has been in any Audi he's driven for the past, uh, you know, five years or so. Still only 23 years old, but uh, I'm afraid that's a little bit of experience coming his way. What happens when you try slick tyres on a circuit that's still drying out? You know what, Bruce, there, there isn't a textbook on it. Um, you can't get the textbook out and say, what do I do when I go out on the... Because the track is different at various points and you can have as much concern, as much awareness as you, as, as you can have. And Dries van Tour is a no slouch. He's very experienced. He's very experienced in, in driving in Europe in all sorts of weather conditions as well. And you know what? You, you can't really apportion blame to him. It's, it's just pure bad luck that that car... Uh, just found a bit of damp track. Just as he, as he I, I presume, just as he went on the brakes, the car went out of balance, and you know, another part of the track, he might have gotten away with it. But he was just—you mentioned it earlier, Bruce. There is very little, if not almost zero, amount of runoff. You go off the track here, you're going to hit the barrier hard. So, conditions have been drying, the track had been drying, and Dries Van Tour's taken a tumble and uh, really stri strike that car from the record, but take it out of lead contention. Still a bit of mist, Joe, hanging out over the circuit, over the trees, but it's above tree height at the moment, which is definitely an improvement from earlier. But any chance uh, looking around the circuit to see a dry line, it is there, but it's only the width of a car and then there's the greasy bit beyond. And I think uh, Dries just traveled from the dryish part onto the slightly wetter part and simply there was no turning in in those fast sequence of corners just before they then start climbing the hill up towards, well, it's effectively, I think it was Klostertal he went in before they get to the section to take you up to the Caracciola uh, carousel. And Dries has made it back towards the pits. And uh, that's, it's not the drive of shame, but it's just, it is one of those things, but unfortunately it's a slow one. Oh, good news though, just heard from uh, Race Control, no further, good news if you're a fan of Team H, the Hout Racing Team, no further action being investigated. The number four Mercedes, the race leader for an unsafe release from its previous pit stop, but uh, no damage at yeah, all. But in I'm... fact, just no penalties coming their way. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that, Bruce. I would have hit. To, to see regulations and politics intervening in what's turning into a very uh, good race. Um, the current leader, you mentioned the number four leading. You are right, Bruce, uh, because the number one Rover Racing BMW does in fact also, also pit stop. Um, and the interval, the gap between first and second at the moment is only 31 seconds. And we're still waiting for Edwards to pit in the number one. Let me just uh, have a quick check on how far he's into the stint. He's not into the stint by, by very much. No, he isn't. But that, what? What time? Just remember that had a long. Thing. Sorry, Joe. That had a long pit stop, didn't it? The number one. Was it the sister yeah. car? Uh, no, that, no, that, that was the car. shorter one. Yes, it was the sister yeah, car that Felipe. had a long one. Yeah. So we just need to know what tyres. But the last lap was eight minutes fifty-four for for John Edwards in the number one Rover Racing. BMW, the fastest lap of the race so far was put in by another BMW, but that was Schubert Motorsport, Jesse Crone. And we were worried before the race that Dacia Logan, this inimitable little charger, wasn't going to qualify, but it was loud into the race. Slaps in qualifying with 12 minutes, whereas the fastest drivers were four minutes faster, but the driver racing under the pseudonym of Doom has had a little spin on the Grand Prix loop, but gets going all over again. But, uh, you know, it is a splash of colour, albeit not a very fast one, but it's very much past the 24 hours of Nürburgring. Running in 108th position. Let's get back to uh, just what we think might be on that number one car. I don't think, Bruce, that the number one, when it did pit, and it pitted, um, it, it pitted uh, three laps ago, um, that's how long it's been out on its current stint and i'm not sure whether he was able to go on to intermediates at the time that won't be as bad as being on wets that's kind of perhaps cer certainly the tie to have i'm sure um uh, um Dries van Tour <laughs> would have preferred to have been on intermediates at the point when he lost control of the audi 
um, but we're, we're not sure um, just what tyres the number one is. It's getting, it's it's mixed up now, Bruce. Uh, we've got the cars very early in their stints, their current stints, and we've got uh, the 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 lead the leader at the moment, the number one as ah, and as I say that, he's coming to the pits. <laughs> he has. So get he's those on the wrong tyres, isn't he? Yeah, yeah I was just trying. Track. I think we we're both trying to do the same thing there, work out, did he really preempt going on to slicks? But the answer was he hadn't done slow enough laps. And uh, though his previous pit stop was two, two laps before uh, number four and nine, nine eleven came in to make their pit stops, John Edwards clearly went out on intermediates. I think his intermediates were going off as the slicks were getting up to speed. But for the drivers on slicks, uh, Metzger and Christensen, who's come in from with the 911 Porsche. So Metzger stays out in the Hout Racing team. Mercedes, number four. We know that's on slicks. It's now got, uh, I can't remember how many laps, two laps under its belt on slicks. Christensen reports the pits in the 911. Or has he? No, it's now flashed up. He hasn't come into the pits. I beg your pardon. It was simply a screen changed and glitched. But he just put in a very quick lap indeed. Took nearly four and a half seconds out of the race leader, out of Metzger. Apologies for thinking he dived into the pits. He's come through in second place, but he's halved his disadvantage. It's down to three seconds flat between first, which is Metzger, and second, which is Christensen, giving chase in the 911 Grello Porsche. The, the cars light up in a dark red, don't they, Bruce, on the on the timing screen? Well, that one, that, that lit up in a kind of a, a, a pink cerise, a beautiful cerise pink, and that was because it just was the, the fastest lap of this race so far. Even at 35.5 is that, and the car behind it, the Schubert Motorsport BMW, Jesse Crone at the wheel, everybody putting in green lap times eight minutes and 37 so just two seconds off that fastest lap the number one who came in and i, I think that was intermediate tires that came off that number one that would explain why he's at the pit after only what i think would be now four laps in that in that stint i'm just going to check that actually to get rid of that just talk about i think it's two laps i think it was eight laps eight yeah. laps they've got 18 on the clock Right, I'm just going to check wrong. on that one. Yeah, no, it was four laps, Bruce. Four. So, yeah, he was on three laps, and as he came round, uh, just as we were talking about him, he dove into the pits, and uh, and that one was um, that was that was the fourth lap of that run. So, as the drivers and teams are trying to decide what are the best tyres to have at the moment, oh, another new fastest lap, by the way, Kelvin van der Linde. Audi Sport Team Lamp, car number 29. That is down the order, but don't forget that started from pit exit. I mean, change tyres before the start of the race itself. Kelvin van der Linde in 11th place now, but 8 minutes 32, and the times are really starting to come down for those who fitted slicks. And I'm going to keep an eye on the pace of Manuel Metzger, still leading the race. Can he rebalance and pull slightly away from Michael Christensen. Yes, he can. Christensen took four and a half seconds out of the race leader last time around, and this time around, Metzger's responding. Maybe he took a little bit longer to get confidence on those slick tyres. Yeah, it will do. It'll be, it will certainly be. I mean, this whole race has been a voyage of discovery. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, Bruce, that we've probably seen the retirement of the number 15, and I'm just going off the body language of the uh, crew around that number 15. They've inspected the car after that heavy hit. It was Greet Van Toria, remember, in the, uh, in the, in the Audi R8 of the Phoenix team. And uh, slapping of backs and, and, and uh, hands on shoulders and shaking of heads going on in the number 15 pit there. I'm not sure if that means, just reading their body language there, Bruce, that that is that car done and unrepairable. Well, Patrice Van Tor, who was a winner here two years ago, that's over and out. But Frank Stippler, he's entered in a couple of the cars, so he can move across to the number 11 Phoenix Racing car, when, which he shares with Nicky Team, Kim Lewis Schramm and Michele Beretta. But for, so a gutted Dries Van Tor. I'm sure you're, you're right about the analysis of the, the, the sort of resignation in the pit lane. But mm. uh, these things happen most notably on the Nordschweifer. Ooh! How's this for a fast lap? Sammy Matty Trogan last year, he was simply a sim racer who'd done a little bit of uh, circuit racing, a little bit of rallying. He just banged in an 8 minutes 28 second lap. He's down in 18th place, Walking Horse Motorsport number 102. But that is way quicker than the best of the rest. Three seconds clear. So the track is drying 
and the drivers are really starting to attack. Great lap from the flying fin. And it's going to get quicker and quicker until we start seeing uh, lap times beginning to plateau, Bruce. We're going to see green lap times uh, up on the timing screens every lap by, and we are going to see uh, purple lap times, which denote the fastest lap of the race, and that's just going to continue coming down. Uh, Grand Prix struck a part of this course, looking completely dry. Um, there are certain parts of the Nordschleife that are showing damp patches on crucial parts where you know you need to be breaking and turning in and uh, with it being a multi-class race as well that adds into the complexity of things and when you're getting offline you've got to get yourself onto the wet and damp part of the track on slick tyres to get by perhaps a slower class car that can prove to be a bit tricky yeah well there's going to be a slight hiatus on really fast lap times because there's code 60s at uh, Cannon Hearts and the corner preceding that Metzger's felt so um however fast they are in the other sectors this nine sector 25.378 kilometer lap that part necessarily halfway around the lap will be a slower part than planned but uh, incidents need to be cleaned up i still want to see if there's a barrier uh, repair where of course we saw dries van Torgo off about 10 minutes ago he hit it hard but largely it was the um the belting the sponsorship on it in front of the tire wall that got pushed up but would like to see another shot to work out if they're still having to repair the barriers there. I think they might have got away with it. Let's hope, hope they do, Bruce. Um, just looking at the weather, that the satellite hasn't changed. We're still in a period of dry. However, um, we've still got a possibility of fog being created because we've got a lot of damp and uh, and wet foliage around this area of the uh, Eiffel-Renin. And as we get towards the evening, that can produce a bit of fog. As we get even cooler into the night, with a bit of, what's it called, weather inversion? Is it called a heat inversion? That can create fog from the... Exactly, the cold air runs down the side yeah. of the valley to the bottom. The yes. warmer air above, and the warmer air is the bit that becomes fog. Yes, and we, we've, we've seen that so many times. So for now, though, Bruce, we can concentrate on a, a, a pretty consistent track and some good laps coming through. We've still got a uh, recovery going on uh, at various points, but uh, well, I, the front of the field has, has settled down, I think. Yeah, well, in answer to my own question, they are repairing the barrier section, maybe just the tire, putting the tyre stacks back into position where Dries Van Tor went off and did the damage that we think has taken his number 15 Team Phoenix Audi out of the race. That yeah, was a slow that, that, zone, that is being fixed. Yeah, that, that's out of Met Metzgefeld in towards, through the left-hander and towards Callenhard, the right-hander. Um, it's uh, through a left and then a right, and then you head downhill to uh, Callenhard and uh, the siphon. Um, that's where that uh, barrier repair is being uh, adopted there. They, they are repairing that bar barrier after that very heavy hit from the number 15. It did, uh, it did make quite a mess, so but that's going to be... Okay, and also... But also, Joe, just to, to clarify, at the time we were surmising it might have been further around the lap, more like Klostertal, but Metzgersfeld mm. is definitely the place that uh, the Belgian racer went off. A car we haven't talked about a huge amount, Joe, has been Schubert Motorsport with their lone BMW M6. Jesse Crone driving it at the moment in third place, putting in some very, very decent lap times. He's, he's almost a minute down on the race leader, but that team has worked its way bit by bit up the order. Yeah. White BMW M6 with uh, blue flashes at the front, black, black and yellow ones at the side. But importantly for them, they do have a, a race winner in their car. Alexander Sims was in the winning Rover Racing M6 last year, but he's jumped out of that. And he's sharing with Jens Klingman, Steph Dusseldorf, two drivers who know M6 is just so, so super well. Jesse Crone, that's a strong lineup, and they've, they've kept their nose clean, which is what you need to do in a race like this in conditions like we've had. You know what, Bruce, that is your primary objective when you go out there in a race like that. In fact, I think that's your primary objective uh, at the Nürburgring 24 hours. It, you know, whatever the weather is, it's about staying out of trouble and not creating adversity that you then have to react to. And, uh, and, and I think that's a prime example of what you've just described there, the Schubert Motorsport BMW moving up to third overall. Just under a minute, I think, off second by the looks of things, but things beginning to... Heat up now at the front of the field is the number four, 
goes right onto the tail of the, sorry, the number 911 goes right onto the tail of the number four uh, Mercedes. Uh, and battles being, uh, battles out there on the track developing all the time and battles for position, in fact. Well, it's what we want. There is still, you were talking about a little bit of mist coming down. It's uh, certainly looking the far end of the Dottinghoe or the, the near end if you're just starting the straight. It's still misty over towards Nurburg village, but uh, the track is dry and the drivers have decided they're going to have a, a three by three battle for fourth place. And let's just uh, take a look at the protagonists there. Of course, up front, we've got uh, Metzger from Christensen from Crow, but Marco Seafried, plenty of company. He's got Maxime Martin in the Fricadelli Porsche, the KCMG Porsches in that mix as well. And it's great to see as uh, the conditions become a little bit easier for the drivers. We've got some fierce, fierce racing. Dirk Werner in the chasing pack. He's eight. He's got Nicky Team just in front of him in seventh. Connor De Filippi just up the road. And as I say that, Dirk Werner pulls into the pits. So some people, were, some drivers are hanging on with uh, a set of tyres that are increasingly the wrong ones to have. And others are getting those slicks really, really to come to life. Just remember the fastest lap so far, 8 minutes, 28.1 seconds. Last time around, Sammy Matty Trogan for Walk and Horse Motorsport. He's clearly on the, the slick ones. So as Werner pulls into the pits, that battle uh, just ahead of him in Peritori was in the KCMG Porsche. And it was Nicky Team in the Phoenix Audi that went by uh, both of those cars and into seventh spot as they crossed the line there. And uh, it looked like he pulled a gap. I say it, pulled a gap. It was half a second across the line as the Audi led the Porsche. And these two were absolutely, well, three, weren't, weren't they, with the uh, the Werner Porsche involved as well. These three were north to tail and looking like a 10-lap sprint race uh, as they came across the line. But uh, Nicky Team looking, we'll, uh, we'll check the gap next time through the first sector. Uh, but uh, across the line, it was half a second. But to me, it looked like Team had the better of the two and was about to uh, start eating out a little bit of a cushion. Yeah, and the other battle that's excellent at the moment is uh, fourth, fifth and sixth. Marcus Seafried for Huber Motorsport in the uh, 23 blue and yellow 911 GT3R. The Fricadelli number 31 with Maxime Martin and Connor de Filippi. The three of them covered by, ooh, under a second. So that's fabulous, that battle for fourth place at the moment. Up front, though, as you pointed out, it's really close indeed. Under a second between Manuel Metzger leading the way, the number four HRT Mercedes, and 911 Michael Christensen to the Dane giving chase as you'd expect him to do in the Manti Racing Porsche. Yeah, that's that, that that's not over, is it? I, you know what, Bruce? I, I can kind of see that uh, Mercedes Porsche battle uh, being. We're, we're still going to be talking about this tomorrow afternoon. We've said it before at the Nurburgring 24 Hours. It, you kind of, you kind. Of, I'm reluctant to always say that at other places, but the Nurburgring 24 Hours, it's it's just a game of of nerves and a game of uh, it's a game of chess of just staying there and just keeping to a pace, albeit a very, very quick pace, but just keeping to the pace, keeping out of the way, and it seems that the teams at the front, the, uh, the HRT, Mercedes and the Manti team, uh, have maintained the lead of this race uh, from the very outset. And through various uh, periods of uh, a, a, a very important tyre choices, they seem to have made the right calls at the right time, and, and that's why they're still at the front. And the other thing you really have to try so, so super hard not to do is transgress pit lane speed limits. It is just, mm. it makes us weep time and time again when drivers have a really, really good run. 133 is the latest car to be pinned for that. That's the V6, that's the production class Porsche 981 of uh, Xavier Lamadrid and Madrid Senior, Max Girardo, you know, the, the sort of auctioneer of fabulous road cars and Nicholas Abril, 30 second penalty for transgression of pit lane speed limit. Oh, it's such a frustration. Great battle with Maxime Martin in fifth and the fourth place car 23 of uh, Seafree. It's through the motorsport it's, uh, against Fricadelli and they're coming upon the uh, barrier repair at Metzgefeld. They'll then get back on it when they clear that and their nose to tail. It's the blue colored Hoover Motorsport leading the red and white livery Fricadelli car. I do love red and white for uh, obvious reasons, Bruce, you've heard me. I'm not going to. Um, but they're, they're now chasing down towards uh, Vice of the Siphon. They'll go through the section, just getting past some back markers through the sweeping three apex 
turn of the siphon downhill towards that tight braking area through the left hander then they'll go on towards Exmoor where it's a very similar corner configuration sweeping right hander into the braking area for a double apex left and then when they come out of that they'll start going uphill now and it's the run down to Bergwerk where the cars are now it's still the Schubert car with Braun at the wheel uh, sorry the Hubert car with Siegfried uh, at the wheel of it from Maxime Martin in the Fricadelli absolutely nowhere to have a go into Bergwerk heavy braking down a couple of gears maintaining the speed because it's now flat out all the way through this section now and I'm, I'm presuming it's flat out Bruce because the, we've got a pretty dry track so it's absolutely flat out before we start uh, thinking about the tight right hander uh, just before the carousel through Costa Tal and again absolutely you've got to thread the needle here you've got to get your turn in absolutely spot on the car maximizing its speed they're heading towards the right hander now and still no change as we continue to monitor their progress on the track we've got another incident with the number 71 looking like it's come to a halt just before Schwalbens France Yes, so yellow, sure. yellow zone at Schwalben, France. You're spot on there, Joe. Yeah, the number 71, it is, Bruce. And and it's the Pro Sport Aston Martin. This is a big disappointment for the Aston Martin fans. That have been uh, running pretty well in the SP10 class. That's the GT4, FAA GT4 class cars. But again, it's a chance for the drivers to make sure they adhere to the rules when they go through. Now, the gap between first and second was 1.6 seconds at the start of the lap. Michael Christensen, or like the race leader, Manuel Metzger, had to slow down for those zones. But sometimes you can gain a tenth of a second here or there or lose it in uh, those moments. So it's up to both of these pro drivers to know exactly when to nail the throttle uh, coming out of a slow zone. Still that battle rages though. The Huber Motorsport Porsche leading the Fricadelli Porsche. It's blue and yellow that leads red and white at the moment and these cars have been absolutely glued to one another. They're just coming out of, I think, heading towards the Flansgarten area of the track, which is another section. Yep, they're into Flansgarten now, just sweeping to the left, through the left to the right, over the, the rise there. Cars going very light through the right-hander towards Schwalbens France and then on towards the mini carousel. Absolutely nothing in it. There they go. They've got to slow down though, because it's a, they're entering a yellow zone just at Schwalben Swans. That's where the 71 uh, car is being recovered. So it's kind of press the pause button on this battle. Well, one of the difficult things, Joe, I was talking about how you have to be right on it to, when you get out of a slow zone to accelerate away, but Maxime Martin all but overtook Marco Seafried there because the Huber, as they came up on a slow zone, it's the Aston Martin being towed back to the end of the lap, and he got he got the nose of the red and white Fricadelli Porsche halfway up the yeah. side yeah. of the Huber Porsche in front, so nearly a transgression there. So it's, it's in reacting to slow zones as you approach them and then when you leave them. He was caught out slightly, wasn't he? They're, they're into the sweeping right-hander. That's all important for the run down the uh, Dottinger Hall. And it, we will see some slipstreaming coming into effect. It's the 23 ahead of the 31. Down the Dottinger Hall they are at the moment. As we look at the leaders on the Grand Prix tracker, that's where they are on the tracker. And they are nose to tail also. So we, we really need our heads on a swivel here, Bruce. Uh, I'm just monitoring the track here to see where the track positions are for the two battles. I suppose the primary battle we need to check on is, of course, the leading Mercedes number four being chased down by the uh, the Manti Racing car 911, currently on the Grand Prix track, heading towards the Nordschleife as we speak. Three quarters of a second is the gap between the pair of them. Another flash of pink at the bottom of the timing screen. Slow zone, Schwalben's fans, that's the one we've seen. Sorry, I've got to keep... The yellow flag at 177, the Stefan Beloff S. So it's towards the end of the lap we're having the problems in the last handful of minutes. 
And let's hope that Aston Martin from Pro Sport can get fit. It's car number 71. Joe reported that at the side of the circuit. It's uh, Guido de Marais, Maxime de Marais, Alexander Borpa, and Michael Hess sharing that Aston Martin Vantage AMR GT4. Hopefully that can get fit. Being dragged back, towed back, not dragged back. It's more style than dragging. Yeah, we've got our uh, member, our Aston super fan, member of the collective, Sarah Rigby, who's uh, just catching up with uh, what's occurring here at the Nürburgring. And uh, the sad news for Sarah is our lone Aston Martin entry has encountered some problems and been recovered back with the pits, hopefully, like Bruce says, we'll be able to get that car back into this race. Uh, still doing the barrier repair, I can tell you, Bruce, that's the update on the Metzgerfeld slow zone. And as far as I can gather, there aren't any other slow zones out on the circuit at the moment. So just the one, and that's down in Metzgerfeld. And, and I would think, Bruce, that all of our competitors will be aware of that section of the track now and be very wary as they head down through Ardenau Forst and, and towards Metzgerfeld. Still actually a Code 60 zone at Schwalbenschwanz, just waiting. No, that's just now being cleared. Sorry, just being cleared. As you look at the tickers, <laughs> They move to a different colour and on. So just what I'd really love to see a lap where everyone can go for it without slow zones or interruptions because I want to see what sort of pace they can actually achieve without interruption or slow zones on these slick tyres. A few laps into the, their runs on slicks now. Some went out on intermediates and very quickly regretted it, including the number one BMW Rover Racing uh, M6. That's down in ninth position. Don't forget, before getting the tyre choice wrong, they were running in third position overall. So they were the ones that lost out by just guessing wrongly, let's say. Well, the fog continues to come. We still can't see the castle, Bruce, from the paddock. And uh, that, uh, by all intents, uh, Marcel do, uh, confirms as well. So thank you, Marcel. Um, that fog is coming. Not uncommon. Not an uncommon feature at the Nürburgring. In fact, Jackie Stewart's greatest Formula One win was uh, 1968 here in complete foggy, hard to see conditions, uh, visibility down to about 100 metres. And it was one of Jackie Stewart's finest Grand Prix wins. I think he still classes that as his greatest win here I at think, the Nürburgring. Joe, I think he also, well, I think he almost classes it as his one of his top three wins overall. Was, was he not racing with his right wrist in a cast? That seems to ring a bell for me. But the drive, it was rain and fog and everything. And he, he won that event by the best part of a lap. Think about that, a lap around here. Yeah. yeah. And that's when there wasn't as much runoff. I try imagining that. <laughs> There's hardly it, any it runoff was, now. I was going to say, they kind of produced it. <laughs> Yeah, they, 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 they certainly have. So 1968, let me just uh, quickly check the margin of victory for Jackie Stewart. The Grand Prix of Deutschland and Europa. Oh, he won by four minutes and 3.2 seconds over Graham Hill, Lotus 49B. And the lap, time was about, the lap time was about eight minutes, Bruce. Well, it would have been longer Fastest than that. lap of the race. Yeah, because it was wet and foggy. Yeah, Stuart, nine minutes thirty-six. Wow, incredible! Wow, I think incredible. some of the people who were watching are still drying out their camping gear. Yeah, I think so. And that, and that was the nineteen sixty-eight race. My memory, as yes, it well. was. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I say, the uh, the fog not quite as uh, nasty the conditions here as it was in nineteen sixty-eight, but uh, the fog becoming ever present as the actual track surface certainly beginning to evolve and becoming consistently dry fog doesn't usually create uh, many issues with regards to uh, creating a wet track bruce it just keeps everything cool now another thing absolutely so joe another thing you always have to look out for is cars that might have spun in front of you but at a certain point around the circuit some of the front running cars were confronted just a few moments ago by lots of debris scattered left and right across the track. And uh, though they managed to fit, nix their way past it, including Maxi Gertz and uh, Kelvin van der Linde running 10th and 11th, they had to snake their way through. Can't tell you who's dropped it or where precisely, but uh, getting some of that wedged under your car or the, or the debris maybe giving you a cut tire, you know, undoes all the good. Yeah, that can cause problems. And uh, so like we, uh, we've seen so many times 
it's sometimes very, very difficult to just change direction. So like you, so like when you drive to the shops and you see something in the road, you can just, it, the cars are absolutely committed to the line they're on. They're at full chat and absolutely committed. It's not just as easy as it as these boys and girls make it look by just changing direction. They're absolutely on the edge. Indeed they are, but for now they're registering the fact that they can see where they're going, they can feel the track through their tyres. And uh, now, as we approach the very end, it's just coming up to 8 o'clock Central European time. It's time for a handover for me, Bruce Jones and Joe Bradley. It's time to duck out and watch it without speaking for a while and hand over to John Hindhoff and Peter Snowden, uh, ready to take over. So that's it from us. Welcome the new crew. At uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, actually, Bruce, not eight o'clock. Oh, sorry, goodbye, uh, You've just uh, wished another hour away. I, I suspect that uh, for some people that would be the case. Another racing hour starts uh, right here, but not before we've done the hourly update. And as it's uh, the top of an odd hour, we'll start with the AT category. And. Uh, that is being led by the number 13 in 44th position, the Dodge Viper for alternative fuels. A few cars had a go at that Porsche Cup car, which is the biofuel cars. Haven't seen the uh, Mustang yet leading that category. SP10. SP10 is the Hoffa Racing by Bot Motorsport BMW M4 GT4, the number 70 is in 34th position. SP8 uh, is I've got to be careful here because there's an 8 and an 8T. Uh, and of course, I'm looking at the wrong one. Uh, Novell Racing with Toyota tyres. That's the Lexus RCF. Oh dear, what's happened to the GT tyres 53, uh, which was racing earlier on? I shall check that for you in a wee moment. The 54 car then in 55th position uh, and leading SP8. SP3T is the Andreas Gulden driven Max Kreuzer Racing VW Golf GTI TCR. It's number 10 car uh, in 37th, a creditable uh, 37th uh, position. SP4 is the next category, and that is one of the older BMWs, the 325i 390. That is the number 325 car running in 89th position. In V6, Team Mathol Racing Porsche Cayman S uh, is running 71st for the 132 car, in, and is in the lead. In V5, uh, that category is the Adrenaline Motorsport Porsche Cayman 981, uh, and that is the 141 car in 98th position. In V4, which way am I going here? I need to go down a little bit for that one. Uh, my apologies. Oh, no, there we are. E9325, the number 151 car is in 84th position. V2T. Uh, that I do need to go down another page for. There's the mouse gun. You prepared better hind off and scroll down at the bottom before you needed to. Uh, V2T. Seeing on my screen there. I'll come back to that one. Uh, yeah, that's not showing. Uh, and Cup S. Uh, I don't think we've got. Oh, a Cup 5, that is. Excuse me. That'd be my own writing. Uh, that is the 61st position car, just entered the pit actually, the 890 BMW uh, C, uh, CS, the M2. So now I'm going to be on a mission for the next hour or so to find out what's happened to V2T. Uh, next I will do the other half and at the sharp end of the field in SP9, of course, leading the race. It is the Bilstein B, uh, Bilstein AMG. I've said that so many times. Uh, still leading out uh, over the rest of the field. So just after seven o'clock in the evening. And Peter Snowden joins me uh, back in the Global Broadcast Centre. Uh, on a track that is looking uh, damn sight drier than it did when we left a couple of hours ago. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Is it the same? I'm race? not sure it's the same race at all. Actually, I, th I think I think uh, Bruce and Joe have been uh, talking about something totally different. Um, 
it has certainly changed, and uh, everything's changed at the top as well, uh, in some ways, apart from that uh, pesky. Um, we've got obviously cars in the pits now, but just for the Frigadella car quickly there. But the um, HRT Mercedes at the front now, Mantai Porsche in second, with Christensen uh, Metzger in reverse order there at the wheel. The Schubert Motorsport BMW M6 in third place with uh, De Filippi in the Rover racing car. That was the uh, defending champion and the pole sitter that was started by Nicky Katzberg. Uh, sorry, that, sorry, that car is down in seventh place. My apologies. That's the other Rover racing BMW that's up in, in full place, the 98 car, the number one car, uh, Jonathan Edwards at the wheel, that car now is down in seventh place. So all a bit of a change around the front, so Mercedes, Porsche, front two, then a, a brace of, of BMWs, uh, Audi, Porsche, and uh, uh, Lutronic uh, also a little bit further down there as well. Then we get a, a whole group together. We have, however, got 15th, 16th, and 17th places uh, in the pits. At the moment, that's the Huber Motorsport BM, uh, Porsche, my apologies, Fricadelli Porsche and the Valkenhorst BMW. I'm trying to do it in reverse order and got them, my mix mixed up there, my manufacturers. So, um, we've seen quite a lot um, going on in the first hour, hour or two, the, uh, the second bit there that uh, uh, Bruce and Joe had a little bit We've had some uh, uh, barrier damage all sorts but the track drying out um, consistently now but uh, I think Joe it was that was just mentioning our colleague Joe Bradley a few minutes ago that uh, the fog is now starting to appear now it doesn't dampen the track as Joe just said but it does of course affect visibility it sounds pretty obvious but uh, it depends on how much it comes down we are in the Eiffel Mountains and we uh, we were talking uh, yesterday well you guys were talking yesterday during the uh, qualifying sessions about uh, what was going on at Spa which uh, is only about sort of 60 kilometers away um, and it's often a, it's, it's maybe not an exact reference, but a little bit of a guide what's going on there. But the rain they've had at Spa, this uh, the entire meeting that's running there this weekend has been cancelled uh, to the point that uh, the track at La Source, the corner there, the track yeah. has been lifted by 50 centimetres. Five, five, exactly, five zero centimetres. I mean, you need parking centres for that. <laughs> well, you did it pretty hard if you reversed into it, wouldn't you? Yeah, wouldn't you just? Um, so uh, it, it can it can happen, and uh, we we said at the very beginning of this, I mean, jo, uh, John, at the top of the show, that uh, you, you can't you can't call a winner, you can't call it, but you can't even try. But the one thing that we know will have uh, the biggest winner of anything taking place in the North Life is always always the weather. And uh, Bruce and I comment on this when we cover this uh, for for Radio Show Limited when on the NLS event, and they're just a four hour race. And this is twenty four hour race, and so it has a, a, a greater greater effect as we said multi multi classes um that is another element of the 24-hour racing uh we saw some uh it's uh, images that we were able to talk about with um some of the faster cars coming through past the slower stuff and the, the speed differentials was absolutely phenomenal uh, and that's where you've got to hope for in, in a faster class car that the the driver in front stays where it is looking in his mirrors and it's a uh, we, we always say it quite easily that it's the uh, it's always the the faster car's responsibility to get around a slower car. It's a, it's an ethic of the track uh, of track driving, whether it be a simple track day, uh, a Grand Prix, Le Mans, 24 hour here at the Nurburgring. It's always the faster car's responsibility to get around the slower car. Um, but what you need then is you need some compliance. You need some consistency from that, and you need the compliance of the slower driver. Uh, being experienced enough or disciplined enough, more importantly, that when you do have, uh, let's just say in this case, an SB9 category car, i.e. a GT3 car, and you're in a, a TCR or a, a, an M240 BMW, whatever class it may be, a cup class car further down the field, you've got to stay where you are. You've got to stay online, do your own thing, and let the others get round you. And it's uh, it's quite quite daunting and, and tempting, I'm suggesting, to get out of the way. Talking of a TCR cars there, uh, uh, the 113 Golf, driven by uh, Wolf, the moment that's the Wolf Muller, Gurian and Garn uh, Golf 7 TCR car. That's got a, a lot of damage, front left and front right. So that's uh, that looks like it's been off and rattled against a barrier and tapped the front and tapped the back then. So the side slapped itself against a barrier somewhere there, I'm guessing. It's also got the front left tyre uh, disintegrating or delaminating quite excessively. Um, so I'm not sure which has been cause and effect there, but that's the 91 
Golf 7 from the TCR category. That's going to be a ah. slow, slow journey back to the pits. I would say that's been in the barrier left-hand side, yeah. mate. Well, as you say, whether the tyre put them there or a vice versa, because there's damage at the rear on the left-hand side as well. In fact, I think he's got a, a rear left puncture he has. <laughs> double, double whammy to get it back to the pits. Front right, uh, sorry, left, left front and left rear. Uh, look, the left front completely damaged. In fact, it's the outer side wall that's all that's remaining on that car. And the left rear is going down. Just looking at the bodywork damage there, so quite surprisingly, it looks like it's clouted the front left, then kicked the back or kissed the barrier uh, with the left and just taken some of the bodywork uh, off there. So that'll be a long, long trip back to the pits, that for the number 91 car. It will make its way back at the pace it's going. There's no smoke, no damage in terms of that's not creating any further damage. But of course, it's now another... Uh, hazard, if you like, for other cars approaching, and there will be obviously appropriate flags out there. Good to see the Opal Manta out there, the, the Foxtail car still out there, one of the fan favourites. Great to see that still out on track. But the uh, the TCR Golf will will proceed back with with as much caution as he can, as much pace as he can, uh, to get it back in one piece. Um, but of course, that is going to make life interesting for. Uh, other cars approaching and just not what you want a slow moving vehicle on the track but uh, it's it's part and parcel of the north life especially the 24 hour races around here so um not quite the order we were expecting at the front here still the uh, the, the defending champions uh the rover racing bmw that was started to save by nikki katzberg the number one car uh, proudly carrying that number one from winning the race uh, last year uh, Currently in seventh position. Uh, yep, as it stands at the moment. It's um, 58 seconds off. The leading gap is between uh, Metzger and Christiansen in the Mercedes uh, Team HRT Mercedes over Christiansen's Manti Porsche is 8.7 seconds. We've got some 20 hours and 18 minutes left to go, so we're almost, almost going to sort of four hours in. KTM Crossbow into the pits. That's the 110 car. That's coming for, I think, look for a regular pit stop there. That's Merle bringing, that's the Teichmann Racing uh, KTM Crossbow that's in the GT4 class. Uh, 19 laps completed, and that's uh, that's brought itself into the pits there, and just around it, that's, that's in uh, 61st place at the moment, but uh, the 60th and 62nd place cars there, so the uh, Novell Racing Lexus and the, that's the RCF Lexus. And the FX Performance BMW 330i, those three all coming into the pits together, so 60th, 61st, and 62nd uh, into the pits together. Uh, track now clear at uh, Arenberg and uh, Fuchshol. That's good to have that clear. Nine and a half seconds the gap's gone out. It was 8.7 on the last lap for our leaders. Uh, and our 10th place man, the uh, Maxi Gertz, brings the Get Speed Mercedes into the pits as well. 22 laps completed by the, I was going to say the top 10 cars. It's actually top nine cars and right on cue had uh, in fact well technically it has now because Muller's now but uh, uh, just because taking the lead in the pit lane to cross the line there sent the center across there so the top 10 cars have now completed 22 laps the Dacia Logan still continued around had a couple of uh, rotations as David Coulthard would say that is the number 110 car uh, with uh, with our, one of our favourite drivers at the wheel of that doom, and uh, if, if, ever, if ever there was, a ch I can't, we can't do the stereotypes. Come to, if ever there was a name to get uh, Peter Max saying, uh, that, that's got to be. I wasn't going to do it. See, I wasn't going to mimic it. I wasn't going to go that far. Well, I've got Scottish but, heritage. Yeah, yeah, you'll see exactly. You're lead. You're allowed to do that. So I, I just I just sort of gave you the intro and thought you might you might not pick up on it, but you did. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, that's still, that's still good. I had a couple of rotations, as we say, uh, in, on one lap, I think it was. It was all about sort of half an hour or so ago uh, in the damp conditions on the Grand Prix loop. But uh, it's still out there running. So um, a, a whole clutch into the pits at the moment. In fact, 10th, 11th, 10th through to 14th in the pit. So that's uh, uh, Gertz, Raginger, Baumann, Bastian, Gunon uh, in Mercedes, Porsche, and uh, in fact, all but uh, all Mercedes but one, actually. So that's the... 
Maximum and Gertz in the Get Speed Mercedes, followed by Raginger in the Falcon Motorsport Porsche, and then the uh, four Mercedes in a row, the 10Q racing cars and HRT and Get Speed of um, uh, Bauman, Bastian and Gunon. Uh, great to see the Viper still going out. It's one of the, one of the uh, older cars in the series, but it's also... Um, Is that your Peter arrived? <laughs> What happens when you turn, turn it back off on, on a, in a, a break and forgot to turn it back on again? My apologies. Uh, yes, the Dodge Viper out there, the GT3 Viper there, uh, uh, Charles at the wheel of that. It's one of the, the last Vipers, but uh, I, th I thought they'd stop racing those these days. But uh, it's great, great to see it out there in the 24 hour. Running on the alternate fuel class, uh, they have, over the years, um, messed around with various Vipers uh, and sometimes only run eight cylinders out of ten. Um, but um, they're back, I think, to the full tailed cylinder car there. So Kevin Estra leading by 4.3 seconds back to Eric Stoltz. So that at least has remained the same with Mark Tomczyk behind the wheel of the third place car. Now, uh, so they've swapped positions since we were uh, last talking to you. It is RSL underscore studio, hashtag RSLN24 if you want to get rid of us. Get rid of us? Uh, well, actually, you know, um, if you want to talk to us. Manuel Metzger and Michael Christensen driving the leading two cars. They've both been out for six laps. Jesse Cron uh, was out a lap longer. They had a very short run, actually. Just a two-lap run in that Schubert Motorsport car. Connor de Philippe, he'd been out uh, five since his last pit stop. Make your team fourth. That's how it stands. So our gap that we were talking about, there was nine seconds just, uh, sorry, is now down to 5.1 seconds. So. Uh, Christensen in the Manti Porsche uh, on a bit of a charge there, trying to uh, erode that gap down to the HRT uh, Mercedes in front, the number four car driven by Metzger. Uh, and Christian doing a fantastic job. I'd, I would still say that in the Manti, have, um, they've, got a, they've got a bit of a record, a bit of a history around this, this circuit, to say the least, and certainly in 24-hour races. So I would say that there's a, a good opportunity for that car uh, still there, 5.6 seconds it is. Uh, just going to have a look at the, the sector times, and it's uh, the fastest car on the circuit currently is uh, interesting. The number one car, Jonathan Edwards, back in the, in the Rover Racing M6 BMW, it's back up to sixth place, and uh, that's just set its fastest first sector and by some as well. A uh, good half second there, it's only one sector, I know, I see sector three, my apologies. Uh, but just keep an, we'll keep an eye on that one. I'm surprised that's uh, not back up in the and it was the pointy end of it, as it were. So the we've got one of the, uh, of course, one of the the Frickadella cars that was uh, in the uh, drop right down the order whilst it was uh, on John and sorry Joe and Bruce's watch. The 91 Golf has made it back to the pits, looking decidedly, decidedly second hand. I think is probably the best way of describing that Golf at the moment, but it's. Uh, uh, it's front left tyre, as I said, just the uh, the inner inner side wall and tread have gone completely, well, there are no tread, but the, where the tread would be, if it weren't a slick, if you know what I mean. Uh, that bit of contact patch has gone completely, the outer bit is there still, and the, the rear tyre done almost exactly the same, looking uh, uh, like a deflated kid's swimming pool. It was an intermediate tyre that was on the back there, so um, I might explain that. So driver out, and that car will be popped on its on its jacks, I'm sure, and popped into the into its box to have uh, some work done. That's got quite a bit of work required on that. There's a. It's actually not as bad as it looks. It's uh, uh, the front left. It's, it's a lot of it is just tire damage, I think, and it's it's, it's body work. Just looking at there's. I love a, your boyish enthusiasm. Well, it's, it's just 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 call me the, the happy optimist. Uh, but you know, in inner wings and all that sort of, they look, it's, it's body work that's come off it mostly. So as you say, I'm not, we're not sure, John. We speculated whether it was, we didn't speculate, we tried not to speculate as to what was cause and effect there in terms of the tyre. Uh, but I wonder if it's just had a, 
had a run a run off the track somewhere because of a tire deflating and then he's kissed the barrier that's taken the bits of bodywork off it but uh, uh, the bodywork isn't there for them to put it back on and have uh, good old tank tape put on it to get it through uh, so unless they've got spare panels for that car that's uh, possibly going to continue the end of the race that the headlamp was there but not operational uh, we need that uh, in the next few hours uh, the Grello car, the number 911 Manti Porsche with uh, pedaling by Christensen at the moment. Uh, the gap dropping down now, it's, uh, we're talking about 4.3 seconds uh, for the lead over the HRT Mercedes. So Manti got a, just, just a little bit of history at this circuit, say the least, especially in this, the 24 hour races. Uh, so they'll be keen to establish a uh, uh, I'm surprised they haven't sort of put it up at the front there already because that's where they, they like to get there really quite quickly and then kind of manage the race from there. Uh, but uh, their efforts to lead the race outright and consistently has been thwarted by uh, Team HRT with Metzger at the wheel currently in the GT3 car. And uh, the Schubert Motorsport M6 is now into the pits. This is the third place car. The number 20, that's now into the pits. 23 laps completed by our top three runners to say shooting baseball car just uh, tripping that uh, transponder as you like in the pit lane. And we also have, uh, yes, that's the chrome car, that's the number 20 car that's into, into the pits. Uh, and I think it's just been rotated. I'm not sure, making sure it wasn't been rotated into its box, but of course it's been rotated on its go jacks to its 45 degree angle for. Uh, refueling just coming up to eight minutes short of the 20 hours to go which just sounds uh, quite ridiculous it's uh, effectively uh, this is the one of the races that were the NLS races that Bruce and I cover for uh, radio show uh, it would be eight minutes off the end of a, of a race um, so four hour races for the rest of the season but it's a this is a 24 hour race and it's hard to get your head around it sometimes just Quite well, that is. Uh, your drivers get a rest, although you don't really get that much of a rest. Uh, you're always uh, on alert, or you get a little bit of kip, but it's not quite the same thing. It's a, it is a 24-hour marathon, but of course the car is the bit that goes through and does the whole 24 hours. Yes, it changes tyres and obviously gets refueled, but uh, the poor old car has to do the whole 24 hours. And it's uh, we were talking a bit earlier on about how 15, 20 years ago it was it was still a reliability. Uh, race where the the cars you know if, if you had a, an issue or attrition or whatever something broke down that was that it was just kind of accepted it's now completely reversed as, as john and i were talking about earlier that you, you you don't the cars don't break down it's almost always certainly i'd say well into the 90 percent of more probably Correct. of outside influence that causes a car uh, to retire i damage tire you know failure puncture thing like that whatever contact whatever it may be there's, there's a whole multitude of them but the cars are so reliable these days which is a testimony to engineering and 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 development of engineering and race cars which transpires down to road cars of course uh, through this uh, um this series of uh, racing racing is development that's exactly what it is but the cars are now just so reliable uh, we expect them to do a 24-hour race and in fact we're almost surprised when they don't if something breaks it's just it's just unheard of uh, which the, the other side of that, the net effect of that is, of course, that the racing um, has become not so much of an issue regarding looking after the vehicle. It used to be 15, 20 plus years ago, you had to look after the vehicle a lot more. Uh, these days, they've got so many systems on board, and I think it was uh, I think it was Thursday, actually, when John opened the show when we had an interview with uh, Klaus Backler. And he was just saying that it's, it's, it's a series of sprints now. That's exactly what it is. The cars are driven virtually flat out each of their stints. There's no looking after the car, being kind to the gearbox or doing this or that. I'm not suggesting they're the opposite and cruel, but uh, the, the, they're so reliable. They can just run right through to the end of that. And we're still surprised uh, when they, if anything happens. We've also got the uh, Vulcan horse BMW into the pits, I think. Uh, just looking at with uh, it's not up on my timing screen, but I think I'm sure I've just just seen that there. The Vulcan Horse car uh, into the pits. 
they must be well down. Uh, the Yes, it is. It's actually it's a 101 card. I'm, I'm, I'm ah, that right. was one that was that was the David Pittard car that was delayed earlier on, wasn't it? Yeah, with Ben, ben Tuck at the wheel, so the 30, 36. So we, yeah. Um, so yeah, they. I'm, hit I'm the, glad my eyes are not deceiving me. They, they hit the barrier um, in the first few laps, didn't they? That was the yeah. the issue there. Two laps down that car now on 21 laps, but uh, uh, as I said, we're in five minutes' time. We've still got 20 hours to go. So good to see our uh, KTM's out there, the 110 car that had a uh, few issues a little bit earlier on, but good to see that uh, that plugging away still. And uh, very soon we're going to start getting into uh, a change of, another change of condition for uh, the circuit. Not so much just the track conditions, but of course uh, the next big factor. We've had we've had the rain, we've had a nice, a nice dry start, we've had the damp, we've had the bit where we've gone from slicks to wets to intermediates and back to slicks again. Uh, and now, just to add in another layer, we're going to have fairly soon, or fairly short in the next uh, short while, a change of light, um, which adds just a yet another dimension. Um, uh, some drivers, uh, John was alluding to this yesterday when we were doing the, uh, the the top qualifying, the TQ and the shootout, that some because it was uh, we delayed for quite a while whilst it uh, uh, was uh, precipitated, shall we say. Um, uh, some drivers relish those conditions, yeah. and some you know, in the wet, uh, and some drivers relish the dark as well. There are a few um, weirdos, and I would say that because I classify myself as one of those, that enjoys the wet and the dark uh, in a racing car, and uh, I'm not quite sure why. I think it was uh, the wrong, the wrong ECU in a thing, or wrong genes. Uh, and now, now we've got uh, now we've got uh, a Viper right, going the, very the, very the slow. The AT Viper is We've got a car involved. across the track sideways. It looks like is it not? It's a Cayman. It's okay. the number 87, 87 Cayman, car it is, yeah. Uh, and that car is sideways on the track. This is up at the top. Again, we've seen so many incidents in the same part. Yeah, it's Branner in the 718, Porsche 718 Cayman. And uh, uh, John, there's some... Stefan Branner, that is yeah, the Munich-based driver. I think there's front-end damage to that car. I think that's been off and the barriers and come back again. And that's where it's resided, just a, a looking at some damage on the side of the track. And I just wonder... Uh, if that's what's happened, it's uh, now if this is where we had issues earlier it's on, wasn't it? End, it's coming yeah. to the end of the, of the lap, so coming off the Dottinger Hall through Teegarten, and he's but oh, and he's rolled, it's rolled. The car actually went over, it was over on driver's right. Great avoidance by the Viper, and straight on clips the curb, hits the wall one side and then the other, and it's been over at least once. So right at the end of Teegarten, and I think that might have rolled twice, Snowy, actually. Yeah, it did. Uh, the... It, it's, I don't uh, think... I don't think it, is it Teegarten? Uh, yeah, it's right at the uh, end of the lap, I think. Um, just coming out from underneath the bridge. That's where... Oh, oh is it the end of the foxhole? No, it's, it's the, the end, it, end it's of the foxhole, end of the foxhole, yeah. heading up to Adenauer yeah. Forest. Yeah, sorry, my apologies. Ah, uh, no. I was right the first time. It's Tegar. Uh, always go with your first instincts, I think. Um, no, it is Tegarten. The trees are looking uh, particularly well in leaf this year. Uh, the car has rolled off the circuit, but it has been up upside down. So a nasty moment there for that uh, Porsche. Stefan Branner sharing with Ernst Trien from Grün Grünwald and another Munich-based driver, Andrea Sch Schlafitzel. And this has caught up the leaders. Awful lot of Porsche bits on the road to drivers right at the end of the lap. That's going to take a bit of clearing up, but it's going to require a... Oh, it hit the bump just wrong, kicked it out. So coming up the hill to the braking area, the first left, you don't brake there, but there's a little ridge in the road, and that just kicked the back end out, which pushed him wide to the right-hand side. That clipped the curb. He's already sliding with the back end going out to the right, car turning to the left. That catapulted him into the inside wall on driver's left, flipped the car over, and in the... Whilst it was rolling, it rolled all the way back to the other side and clipped the other barrier. 
Well, it's back on the wheels, and let's, on it, let's hope, Rob, you say it's, just, it's gone over that bump, and it's just it's crazy, basically, snap over to you, hasn't it? Yes, it's, exactly so. So it just flipped Before the back out, breaked. then yeah. he's hit the curb, and it's just that, that double whammy, the two together. If he'd, if he'd caught Passage, it, yeah. that's it, but unfortunately, it's, it's flicked it onto the curb. Just a little pass, yeah. there's a little rise just before the first of the left handers coming into Teargarten, and that's pushed him wide. He's hit the curb on the right hand side, which has speared him across into the arm core and started the roll, which then pushes him into the right hand side. And then he's rolled a bit further and ended back up on his wheels, almost at the end of the arm core on the left hand side. John Edwards uh, immediately coming past one of the cars there where the green flag was. That is a big, big roll there. It just goes to say what we said before, isn't it, John, about the, the narrowness of this circuit, the, the, the lack of width and the lack of runoff as well. If it were a uh, Grand Prix part of the circuit there and that had happened, it had just caught it, it had just been a oh, moment and, uh, you know, a little bit of a pucker up and carry on with it. Unfortunately, the track's so narrow there, hasn't got away with it. And also, of course, it does mean uh, that they're going to have to put out the... Uh, put out the yellow flags quite a long way back. Stand by, we've come to the end of another racing hours, only 20 hours still to go. So let's take a look at how they stand at the top end of the field. It is still BMW that is leading. Uh, and they have uh, Done a really good job in the last few hours. So Connor de Filippi leading John Edwards from Sven Muller in the Rootronic Racing at number three Porsche. And then all coming into the pits, fourth through to eighth. Manuel Metzger for Mercedes. Michael Christensen for Manti Porsche 911. Nicky Team for Phoenix Racing GmbH. Audi, then Van der Linde for Audi Sport Team Land number 29, then Alex Imperatori. Uh, also, uh, no, Krohn hasn't come across the line yet in the Schubert Motorsport car, but I think he's just pitted if memory serves. So those guys who have just pitted were seven, six and eight laps in and so they were coming to the end of their pit stop anyway now you might ask yourself dear listener and viewer why would uh, why would those guys come in when they had another lap probably in the tank well the question is that's a slow zone at the end of the lap peter at the inordinately fast part of the circuit which isn't going away any longer so they might as well take the shorter pit stop now uh, do a driver change if that's what they're going to do. Get service and then basically come back out again and, and see where they are. I think that's uh, really sensible. The Porsche back on its wheels, by the way, the number 87, the nine, uh, the Cayman GTS. I think it actually landed on its wheels anyway, John. Probably but, uh, you might be right. Uh, it's you, quite you, foggy you, there. you just made a statement there, which I'm, I'm going to back up now, and you're, I'm going to I'm going to give you a warning here now. So ridiculous statement coming up now. <laughs> uh, you said there's the ridiculously fast parts of the Nord Cipher. Yes, there aren't many slow Sl parts of the Nord Cipher. Like, well a little bit on the Grand Prix here. I'm not trying to contradict you at all, John. I'm just saying it is. It, it is a, it's a roller coaster, quite literally at some parts. But never mind the altitude changes, uh, and that's uh, it's, it's caught out that uh, that 79 Porsche. It just goes uh, to sit, show though, Pete, what we were saying earlier on, doesn't it, about the um, yeah, we were talking about the, the the narrow margins that there are here, and we saw there. I don't really think, if I'm honest, that Stefan Branner did that much wrong at that point the car just took a nasty little hop and at that point i'm not sure there's very much you can do about no, it i was saying exactly the way it goes up there and i said had that been a few moments later on the grand prix circuit had that uh, change of tarmac and that surface there caused that little hop as it did and that's all it was he wasn't he wasn't offline or anything that particularly it's just a it's just caught it out uh, it's, it's, it's literally it's almost like a bunny hop uh, and it's, 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 it's exactly it, what it is giving it, the giving back it, end giving it a snap up. over steer and had the track just been wider, let alone run, and not that curb, where it, where it, it bunny hopped, 
jinked to the right and there was a curb there and it's just it's just kiss it and you say it's almost like it's almost like sort of skiing on moguls isn't it it's gone over one off another and it's it's an accumulative effect exponential and all of a sudden flip 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 and all of a sudden perfect storm and the next thing you know he's, he's going over and, and not once, once but twice and it's... once you get out of sequence with those moguls perfect piece of description by peter snowden there uh, then you're in trouble and at that point it's a pinball because uh, the car's sideways, it's into the wall, it starts to roll, uh, and of course, you're not in control. Nick or Bastion just coming through that area of the circuit now, now back onto the start finish line and carries on. Now, a moment or two ago, the Fricadelli car getting turned around by BMW number 331, and was that? connection with the wall that's yeah, it was on the inside it was sorry john yeah. i not mean to cut across you just you look at it just clipped it and it's just on the it's turned that fricadelli porsche around twice but the the end of that second rotation uh, it's gone into the barrier on the on the outside not particularly heavy but enough that it's going to make you wonder what's going to happen with another 20 hours of the race sorry six minutes less than 20 hours of the race to go now uh not what you need and certainly not what fricadelli were wanting uh uh, double winners the last two two rounds of NLS with us in the six hour. They've uh, you know, been right up at the front there. Great. Uh, just just didn't see it coming. We've talked about this time and time again, haven't we, John? And we will continue to talk about it. And I'm sure our colleagues will exactly the same. But uh, these uh, slower class cars, it's multi class racing. They've just got to hope they see you. And I think in that case, uh, it just it looked unfortunately like they just didn't quite see the Fricadelli car there. But all of a sudden it's there. And they've just ever so gently tagged it. Uh, and it's, I'd hate to say it, it's, it's a racing incident. It, it's not like somebody's gone for a gap or somebody's trying or whatever between two peer related classes. That happens. I just think that was just pure misfortune and it just got, just got tagged and round it went. It's a damp track and it's spinning twice and it's, it's connected with the barrier. So there'll be some damage on that, uh, on the meatball Porsche there, the Piccadilly one. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, not their race at the moment. No, but really. there's plenty of time to go. And nobody's saying, by the way, that uh, the driver of that Adrenaline Motorsport BMW, it's a G20 car, it's a 330 uh, I, uh, and a, it was Philip uh, Philip Lyson who is behind the wheel. Nobody's saying, as, uh, as Peter said that, it's this is not deliberate, but it's just not good. Oh, and the Manti car's That's just... That's Adreno car off. Manti car's just been off as well, pushing far too hard. Hats and back. Uh, with yellow yellow flags out and slippery surface flags coming out of the hats and back on the run down to Flugplatz. And Matteo Caroli has scraped the wall. There was a lot of dirt on the inside of the uh, of the corner there, and he just skated off on it. But there was slippery surface flags there. Which might give some credibility to the, the BMW that tagged the Fricadelli Porsche off. Just, just pod. Exactly, exactly the same part of the circuit. Maybe he's already having his moment. And he just can't do anything about it. And he's unfortunately gone and tagged one of the leading cars. And he will, I'm sure if that's what's happened, he will feel awful about that. But it, it's just its just a change of surface again. Uh, it's uh, uh, its the Nürburgring. It's what it does. You, you get a little bit of period of settling down and it just says, hang on, I've got something else in my armory here. I'm going to throw this at you now and just see what happens. And that's what this place does. And that's why it's such a challenge. And that's why drivers and teams and fans alike uh, just adore this circuit because it, it, it is a constant, constant challenge. And just when you think uh, it's almost like Jaws, isn't it? Back in the 70s, just when you thought it was safe, uh, it isn't. And something something else occurs. But uh, the Manti Porsche there, I have to say, that was, um, if it has got away with it, that was a, uh, I was going to say a lucky scrape. Well, it's exactly what it was a scrape with the barriers on the right hand side. But that could have been that could have gone at any different angle than a lot more damage do you know straight away peter on something like that when you're driving the car whether you've done a bit of the tour on either the front or the back i mean with a bit of luck you'd have had the front wheels nearly turned straight there and it, and, it, and it didn't look like that had caused them too much of a problem but you've got to worry about the camber on the rear wheels on that porsche as well and whether it's just not something out of true there because this is a place you don't want any induced rear wheel steering not really, no. Not any additional steering. Enough from the driver input. The first thing that happens is that there's an expletive that you can't repeat, uh, certainly over the air. That inside your helmet. Inside that that yeah. comes out. 
Uh, if you're brave, you might put that on the radio to the team, but probably not. The second thing, as you say, straight away is starting to feel what's happened. And often it's collateral damage. And so you might, if it slapped it completely sideways there and hits the rim on the end of the wheel, what can happen is it might not damage the rim, but it can send shock waves down that does something internally, suspension, arms, etc., etc. Rover racing uh, BMW into the pits. Ready for a driver change. That's uh, uh, that's uh, less these, these Philippi, isn't it? Into the pits in our number 98 car. Yeah, and that looked rather like Marco Wittmann, uh, for my money, about to get into that car as Connor de Filippi is already out. Connor helping bolt his teammate in as the team rather leisurely go to work. You, you won't see two second pit stops here. The situation is that uh, there's a set pit stop time and there's plenty of time really to do tyres, driver and get the fuel in. Oh, now there's a bit of shouting going on there in the background of the BMW team and they wanted to get the car turned around to 45 degrees and meantime the number 19 Conrad car is in and I thought for a moment that was going to get pushed into the garage but it's not she's turned around on the dollies I do notice by the way that the uh, the Falcon tyre logo that is on the BMW the Valkenhorst uh, sorry the uh, Rover racing car that's just come in they've put it on the it's a um, requirement it's there a, a sponsor of the whole event uh, they've put it on the louvres peter on top of the wheels and so it's there but it's almost completely uh, unreadable uh, for the car that's running on michelin tires funny that isn't it yeah who, who'd have thought eh? who'd have thunk it <laughs> uh, and the frigatelli car frigatelli has stopped yeah, stopped yes. the frigatelli car has stopped you know that's funny i was just watching the lap times i think there's fluid out of that car john yeah i think there is and who did we decide uh, that was was that the 31 car you should be able to check on the uh, the tracker and see if it's stopped there pete um pete uh, Cairoli is still running after tagging the wall but i, I wonder if there's been a secondary incident because there was a bmw there as well so maybe uh, that was a thir bigger shunt. 31 cars on the dotting of her at the moment so it, it must, must be the 30. 30. Uh, so there we are well, according to the tracker, that is moving, but very slowly, uh, having just come out of uh, the carousel, heading up to Hoa Act, which uh, the highest part of the circuit, which wouldn't make any sense to me, because we just seen it stationary on there. So unless the tracker's not quite up to date, uh, we'll just keep an, well, an, what eye, other, an eye on that. What other red and white Porsche? Well, that, that's my could, thinking. Could it have been? Because it was definitely a red and white Porsche, and my mind immediately went to one of the two Frigadellis, either the 30 or the 31 car. Now, uh, and it, it did look like an SP9 car, if I'm brutally honest. Well, it's exactly where I went with it, John, with your thinking. I'm just going to scroll through our images of uh, participants. I... I I, I'm, I'm at a loss to explain that. Let's uh, see if we can find out. As uh, Nico Bastian is coming to that area now. That, That's that, a frigatelli that car. Is a frigatelli That's a frigatelli car. car, most, most emphatically. Uh, that is the frig... I am positive, absolutely positive that that is the frigatelli, one of the two frigatelli cars. Um, the third, I, well, the 31 is on the pit straight. And that's just that's just gone gone past the pits. Well, the 30 with Pile at the wheel. That's running in uh, 11th at the moment. Uh, really? Well, let's see if we can work out what's going on with that. Uh, that's a very very odd one. 30 car. So it's the 30 car, and it's got. Uh, left rear puncture, but it is now moving. Right rear. Uh, sorry, right rear. Yes, thank you, Peter. <laughs> so it it was a frigadelli, and it's now moving again after that tag. 
That was the side. That wasn't the side that was tagged by the BMW. It was tagged on the left hand side. By no, the way, that was right because it went round, didn't it? Went round the BMW right, on okay. the left hand yes, side. No, tagged, you're tapped, absolutely right. Did, did, absolutely. did the right rear, tagged it, spun it, tapped the barrier. So it was, it was where it was tapped. So that's going slowly. And. So I think the tracker was virtually right because it was. It is moving slowly. So it's, it's a, that's that's the the number. Just to clarify, the 31 Piccadilly car, which is now up to ninth for Pile at the wheel, and it's the 30 car that is returning to the pits very slowly with a right rear puncture. We think as a, a result of the contact with the BMW at the beginning of Hats and Back uh, going out onto. On the Nord Slifer, so uh, that's going to be a little way back, but it's uh, it's got most of the circuit to most of the circuit to run yet, um, but it will it will find its way back. Yeah, that's a, that's an odd one. That that is an odd one, uh, unless it was stopped because of another incident. But it was definitely stationary for a while. That number thirty, if that indeed was the car, and working on information that we're gleaning from tickets it's Earl Bamba behind the wheel yeah did a 4 11 that's what I was looking for did a four minutes 11 in what is in fairness a long sector five but that's three times longer than it needs to be so that has been standing still for a little bit now John we've talked about fog and uh, we've just been looking down the, the pit straight nice and clear see the pits Almost at the pit exit is like a curtain, a wall of fog as it starts to go onto the GP circuit now. That's one thing. If it's that on the GP circuit, what's it going to be like on the Nordschleifer? Fog, visibility, reduced, and we're heading towards night time anyway. Why ever not? How many more things? Do you want a challenge? Do you want to just go around Silverson and just do a one and a half minute lap and just keep going around for 70 times? No, let's go to the Nord's life and do it properly. Let's go around for a day. Properly. Proper racing. We're biased though, aren't we? So, Robert Racing BMW, last year's uh, winners and therefore defending champions, naturally. Uh, John Edwards at the wheel of that, the number one car carries that number one proudly from winning last year. New code 60 at uh, Fuchshold again, and uh, leading up into uh, Adenauer Forest. And uh, that's uh, just going to try to see who that's for. That's for the 171 car, which I'll just tell you what that is in one second. He lied; it's slightly longer, but not much longer. Sorry, that's the Cooper, Cooper Leon competition yeah. car. That's the Bonk Motorsports car. Um, Always worthy of a name check. Peter Bonk is driving as well there this weekend, but I, I don't think he's in that car, uh, if I'm right in saying. Uh, yeah, he's in one of the SP3 cars, if memory serves. Uh, Matteo Caroli uh, is back up to speed. We've got a fire truck on the circuit, and he goes straight oh, by oh, that oh. golf pickup truck. He heads in the Caracciola Carousel. Got a blue Porsche uh, ahead of him which is flashing his lights well, that's not, already that's not for position that's a cup car right indicator on from that car trying out to the way out of the <laughs> way um, I've, I've got a feeling that uh, that that was the oh no it wasn't the one I thought it was might have been the 350 the Black Falcon team identical car but that car had its problems earlier like and I, I said that car was out of the, the yeah I thought problem. it was out but that was definitely a Porsche Cup car. But just John, slightly oddly there, he just, he, he, Matteo Crowley was, was, was flashing his lights at him, so he indicated right to get out of the way and then didn't get out of the way. It's just like, well, if you're going to do it, do it. You've signalled. I mean, you don't have to signal on the racetrack, but he did it. So I have to say, as the, as the faster driving approach and that, if somebody's kind enough and courteous enough to uh, say, after you, Claude, and indicate I'm going to out of the way, unless you just knocked the stalk, you then didn't do it. And that's, that's ah. exactly how incidents can happen because uh, it looked like he's going to, then doesn't. This is going to be a long uh, code 60 at the end of Tiergarten because they're doing barrier repairs. It's the 18 Mustang indicates right coming through the final part 
of the Nordschleife and John Edwards takes that to mean he's going to pit uh, and then goes round him and pits himself in the number one. Uh, 71 car, non-respect of code 60 and that is going to be a very big penalty indeed for the Pro Sport Racing GmbH Aston Martin. Well, that car's had problems anyway. That's the Guido de Marie, Maxime de, de Marie, Alexander uh, Valka uh, and uh, Walker, excuse me, and Michael Hess. Uh, that will be a 1 minute 32 second penalty the next time they are in the pit lane. Remember, you do not have to make a special visit down to the pit lane for penalties. Well, there's our number 87 Porsche. It is being brought back to the, the pits on the back of a, of a flatbed. Uh, hey, I tell you what. It, it'll take a bit more than polishing out, but it's it's repairable. Um, I tell you what, Peter, that cage has done its job, hasn't yep. it? Because there was a, a few dents in the roof, but the doors were still able to be opened. That's a cracking... I think it's fair to say they can reshell the cage. <laughs> yeah, possibly. <laughs> With a better description of the repair on that one. Uh, it, it didn't look nearly as bad as I've seen cars that have they've had lesser looking accidents. That was a spectacular accident and not in the right way. Earl Bams made it back to the pits in the 911 GT3 R for through beer and Klaus Abelin's Fricadelli team. Uh, a Rufel, I think it's fair to say. Kiwi, who was coming round, let's see if we can identify the Beamer, yeah, 331, it absolutely was the 331, tapped the rear of the car that spun Earl round, uh, one and a half times, well, let's call it two, one and three quarters, that's punctured the right rear Michelin on that car, and that was right at the end of the hacks and back before they head out onto the flat out run up the hill and so that's three quarters of the maybe even more than that actually eight tenths maybe of the Nordschleifer before they get the opportunity to come back to the pits what I can't tell you is why that car was stopped for such a long period Peter Parkway around that lap and that is still a mystery well, it was because the tracker, the, the tracker didn't uh, relate that, and convey that at all. It had it moving uh, a totally different part of the circuit, which uh, slightly worries me because we do rely on the tracker uh, <laughs> for a uh, slightly greater depth of information sometimes. But uh, uh, our former race leader that's in the pits now, the uh, we've got three BMWs in, uh, third, fourth and fifth at the moment. That's the Schubert M6 first and then the two Rover racing cars. That's now been interspersed because we've got there. So Yenley is now back in the number one car and we saw some stunning qualifying didn't we oh, yesterday from Nick Yelley where it was uh, but there are just sometimes isn't it John when you when you watch a lap and you just uh, we're commentators we're supposed to talk but there's sometimes when you're just watching going I'm not quite sure what I can add to this it was extraordinary uh, from Nick Yelley yesterday but he's now back out in the Rover Racing defending champion car the M6 and of course the M6 being on its uh, swan song really isn't it now uh, it's lot it's new M4 new M4 coming out it's uh, uh, competitively priced at nearly quite a bit more than its rivals, shall we say? Is that right? Is it? It's it's a little bit more. It's a good it's a good fifty thousand more euros more. Uh, and what are we talking about then for a GT3 car now? Forget about a spares pack. Four hundred thousand euros. There, I'll give or take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There it gets, yeah. Interesting, very interesting. I remember when we were first working on the Selena Seven R which was a GT1 car, of course, in those days, and people said we wouldn't sell it for £200,000. Uh, it was too expensive. Uh, extraordinary, isn't it, how times change so quickly. The low cloud or fog still over parts of the circuit, but it's patchy, and at ground level actually isn't affecting the visibility as much those of you with access to the internet, uh, wherever you are in the world, you can get the onboard cameras, uh, even if you, you can't get the cut pictures. 
and looking out the front of some of the cars as we've got to the ability to do here in fact as have the drivers as we saw the view that was the land car earlier on wasn't it checking the uh, what the the conditions were further round we've got a, another yeah, em empty flatbed going on the way to yeah. pick something else up so that suggests that there's uh, there's collateral john from a great uh, that other bit but then again hardly surprising on a circuit that's 20 25 26 k round it's not really surprising is it no not at all so trying to get into a rhythm is the job now for the next many hours we haven't done enough laps yet to be able to give you a, an idea of where we might be at the end the distance record is 159 that's the magic number as far as that is concerned and it's still that number four amg gt holding out i know i, I know i bang on about this and uh, sorry for repeating myself but there's a uh, there's a piece of the circuit that always always stuns me and it's the hats and back and i'll tell you why not just because it's the beginning of the nord slifer but it's the transition you've used a phrase quite a lot during the qualifying uh, John, of having to recalibrate, drive them to recalibrate your brain uh, when you're driving this circuit. You do a modern Grand Prix circuit. They held a Grand Prix here last year. A modern Grand Prix circuit has to have a certain amount of width, runoffs, etc., nice wide spaces. I think you could refer to them kindly earlier on as car parks at the side of the track. We used to have gravel traps. Mm. That's exactly what you've got on the Grand Prix circuit. You get to the end of that Grand Prix circuit and you don't turn right and restart the lap again. You turn left and go on to this Nord Cipher. And the first bit you encounter is a roller coaster of the hats and back. And it's, it's not even fast. it's not even a ribbon. It is fast. It's fast downhill. It's a ribbon of tarmac. It's a thread. It's a sinew of it down through that. And then you've got a bit of grass either side. And I think um, uh, Bruce used the phrase, uh, there's not there's not even a verge. It's a fringe of grass at the side. <laughs> and it's that sudden change of that. And if anything, anything exemplifies that, uh, or illustrates that recalibration required is you've just come off a modern, contemporary, fully spec FAA Grand Prix yeah. circuit. You turn left, and all of a sudden, it's never what? mind elbows in, it's breathe in, elbows out, it's breathe in, quite the opposite, the narrow bit. Don't get it on the grass because what's next to the grass? Arm mm, cool. Barriers. Yeah. And there actually isn't even a car's width of grass on the right hand side down there. It's that, you know, you come on, you do that almost hairpin on to the Nord Schleifer. And you go right out to the right hand side into the actually the old pit lane exit there where you put your right hand wheels over the white line and that first downhill left hand it's not very quick but it really sets the tone because the inside curve looks like a small garden wall uh, and you roll out the outside curb you don't really want to be anywhere near and then you're picking up speed so quickly down that first right that by the time you get to the second right you're in fifth gear at that point and it's just about on and off the throttle and, and watching that. It's really bumpy there, even though it's been resurfaced. I think you're spot on. I think it's a it's a real culture shock in that respect, coming off the wide open spaces. And think of another factor, John, also, is that the growth of cars, now the sheer physical size of a contemporary GT3 car. Um, you know, you've, you've only got to look at a Fiesta on the road. It's so much bigger than the original Fiesta. The road cars have grown bigger and bigger. Our parking space is in supermarket car box haven't grown with them you've only got to have a, a what we think is a medium-sized car now uh, and put it on a into a car park space on the road and you know how tight it is big sports cars ferraris porsches they've always been big cars now they're even bigger and bigger uh, and you all of a sudden you go to this narrow bit you literally you you you're threading it threading a needle down this it's trying, start trying to push a cow through a cat flap going onto the hats and back another non-respect of code 60 for another 1 minute 32 penalty this time it's going to go to the Milner Motorsport Porsche Cayman number 309 this is one of the 718 Cayman club sports that's a 982 in uh, Porsche type number uh, so next time that one's in will be sitting in the penalty box for 92 seconds. I think Yellowly trying to make a bit of progress at the moment as he comes down through Flugplatz, heads towards uh, 
Uh, they actually it's uh, just heading down towards uh, Brunchen, isn't it? Still some hardy spectators there. A few tents have been pitched as the photovoltaic illumination behind the number one on that car is beginning to become a, a little more visible. Now he is on the second part of the hats and back and blasting down through the super quick areas. The Cayman in trouble on the Grand Prix circuit, just ploughed straight on. Now, I remember that Tangerine one, we've talked about it before. That spin off, is, is that the beginning of this? Is that turn one? No, I think that's coming out. Oh, it might be turn one, yes. I think it's, it's the 311. To... Yeah, we've talked about this car. Now, that's what went off before, didn't it? And swapped ends and went in and yeah. bounced off the barrier and came back out again. So it's, it's FK obviously... Performance GBR. Uh, Jens Motorfink, Otto, uh, Nico Otto, it was, who went straight on at turn one, like the is. clappers when he was aquaplaning. I know what it is. What is it? He's done his Ringo, got his reserve parking space right there at turn one. They're using, using it up. I think that's what it is. <laughs> 311. Let's see. Hopefully, it's not Nico Otto again, is he, or he's going to uh, incur the wrath. It is turn one, John, but it's the second part, part of the gravel. Of there's, there's, yeah. yeah, it's the second part when you turn right. There's a obviously the track goes straight on there, so there's a gap. Effectively, it's closed at the moment for this configuration, but normally the gap's there. So there's a. It, it was the previous bit on the left it went through, and this time it's on the right hand side. So uh, uh, not lucky for for that Porsche. So let's hope it's not Ottoman at the wheel. I don't think it was, was it this time? Uh, new slow zone on the main straight, which I guess is possibly for a re as a result of that. It was Torsten Volta. The Berliner, actually, that's not right. A Berliner is a um, small donut. That's something um, totally. Yes, as in as in JFK, it could be nice Berliner. Yeah, yes. I am a small donut. I'm a small donut. <laughs> yes, and one of those immortal lines in history. <laughs> he is from Berlin. Cross the line for uh, the number nine eleven. That's uh, another lap completed for Mantai, and for Matteo Caroli, he's just under fifty seconds behind the leading team HRT and straight into the slow zone for that uh, stricken Cayman. Uh, it hasn't moved, it's dug right in and the snatch tractor is on its way to pick it out. It's on its, on its belly there, isn't it? So we've uh, just gone through another uh, hour. It's just after eight o'clock and it really is just after eight o'clock uh, here so time to look at the even hour updates manuel metzger leading in sp9 for mercedes team hrt it's front mayor behind the wheel of the spx leader that's the 704 at the glicken house uh, they're in 22nd position cup x true racing ktm crossport very famous name round here. It has a stuck behind the wheel. 25th position for the 114. SP Pro uh, is the Black Falcon uh, team car. 911 GT3 Cup MR. That's down in 119th place for the 350. That's the car that had all the problem earlier on. In SP8T, that's another Black Falcon car. This time the 36, that's doing much better in 29th position. SP7 is Huber Motorsport in a GT3 Cup car. It's number 80 and 30 seconds. GT3 Cup car, up in the top, you know, up nearly, not on the door, the top 30. Very it's impressive. A, it's a cost-effective way to do this race and, and do it very competitively. Remember, there were 32 GT3 cars. And you, you, you call me an optimist. Cost effective in motor racing in the same sentence. Come right. on, John. <laughs> yes, I'll move swiftly on. <laughs> TCR. All right, well, there's a TCR in 33rd, the hunt there. With Manuel Lauk in the Elantra in the 830. That's 33rd, the 830 car. Uh, in the BMW 240i class, which is the old class five cars, uh, that is Adrenaline Motorsport. And they're in 83rd with that car. Cup 3. They're up in the top 50, well inside the top 40. In fact, just inside the top 40. W and S Motorsport Porsche Cayman, the number 302. 
is in 39th position. And finally, for this rundown, SP4T is another Porsche 718 Cayman. Got about every version of that. That is the number 718. Uh, and that is in 65th position and leads its class. Paul Markart would be delighted to see all these 718, or oh, all these Caymans at least, leading their class. I can't remember if it's a 987, I think, that uh, Paul is driving now and enjoying every moment of it. Fine choice. Cayman S, I think it was, that uh, he and Travis managed to get their hands on and having lots of driving fun in that machine. Thomas Prining respecting the Code 60, coming up to the scene of that scary looking accident. Driver, by the way, was taken away. Um, seen walking from the car to the ambulance. Um, Best news of the race. Yeah, that's good. And that's long since gone, as is the car. So what's keeping that at code 60 at the moment is the barrier repairs. On which subject, I should say, by the way. Oh, and good news. Um, we've uh, got uh, Torsten Volta back into the race. Well, barrier you say, repair. You say, you say good news. He's now weaving around the track, throwing all the gravel yes. out of that car. So it's good news for him, but not everybody else on the track. No, indeed. I, I was going to say the, uh, the barrier repair is, is a subject on which... The authorities here are assiduous, um, and I think rightly so at this track. Three layer arm core at most of the places around the track, and any anything that could be caused it, uh, called even minorly substantial. If those two words can go together, and I know they probably can't. They can now. They're, they're, well, they have now, but it might not have been brilliant you heard in it here terms first. of English. Uh, but. Uh, if there's any kind of visible damage there, they're in there um, with the gear and the replacement barriers. They're checking the upright stairs and the bolts around it. Uh, they make no bones about the fact that they want to do that. Through the Schumacher S for priming. Sun beginning to fall down in the sky. Official sunset tonight uh, in, on the 5th is uh, still a ways away 21.38 so uh, 22 minutes before 10 so and then we would expect to see the sun in the morning fog permitting at 5 or some uh, 7 hours and 45 minutes of darkness one of our less dark races when we talked about 13 hours plus for Daytona 24 and Dubai 24 they vie for where we are in the uh, in the universe what time of the year it is and all that sort of stuff just a few days here and there can make a difference second ridiculous statement of the hour coming up there's different types of darkness as well. Oh, no, I can't completely, but I'm completely, but yeah, this is prop out the forest here is, is proper dark. Le Mans illuminated. It is now. It's like, it's exactly. It's like driving in Dubai. It's fine. No problem. Uh, Dubai, now, interestingly, Dubai isn't though. Dubai haven't no. got the, um, round the track, I know what you mean about driving in Dubai on their roads. It, that's what I meant. Sorry. But, yeah. round, but round the track at the Dubai Autodrome, yeah. there's, Maybe a couple of lights on one of the a light at the end of the, the middle, it's, but that's about all. Daytona fully lit, like a stadium. You were quite right to correct me there. I meant Dubai. No, no, I, no, I realised that. Exactly, yeah. I realised that. Obviously, ran out of money for lights at the Dubai, the Motor Drone, Motor City circuit. Don't but, have enough uh, electricity <laughs> there, apparently. <laughs> exactly. I didn't need some camels on a treadmill or something like that. Uh, let's not go there. But uh, Spa, for instance, the pits is illuminated. Then you come down to Eau Rouge. Pop out of Eau Rouge at the top at Radion, go into the in, basically into the woods, and it is pitch black, and that is that is quite extraordinary. And uh, oh, just seeing the uh, uh, Alessio Piccarelli there in the uh, Falcon Motorsports Porsche uh, at the correct speed, not breaking any rules, anything wrong. But there's a 
uh, an intervention vehicle and a, a, a flatbed on the right-hand side of the circuit and just sides his way by where I, I'm, I'm glad I'm not a track worker. Let's put it that way. Down to the bottom of the hill, the bridge at Adenau and now starts climbing back up again. Still that slow zone called 60. Uh, the foxhole issue has been cleared. Uh, it clears backwards normally from the incident. So Adenau Forest was where the issue is, but still at Teargarten, the issue persists. And this is an issue of track barrier repair. So remember, dear viewer and listener, some time ago now, uh, we were talking about drivers taking pit stops slightly before they needed to. Well, they've all come in again since then. It goes so very, very quickly, doesn't it? But they are getting eight laps out of the tank now, easily. Uh, not having to worry about saving any fuel. Get a few extra litres for the Nürburgring 24 per stint than they do for the NLS because the NLS of course uses a slightly shorter version Peter of the Grand Prix circuit it goes down to the first hairpin before coming back and you mentioned earlier John about uh, our listeners the world over and uh, we just mentioned about Dubai and we have uh, a man that races in uh, 24 hour races uh, quite a lot in his uh, 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 Citroen C1, uh, 24 hour race they had uh, only only last weekend, but uh, he's out, uh, works out in Dubai, Nick uh, Nick Payton, uh, and he's got a, a new team going uh, for this year for Isitron C1, which is, uh, I believe, is going to be called Team Tagnat. Uh, and uh, not quite sure where you go there, but he's, 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 he's a banker, uh, he knows what he's doing. Uh, he's out in Dubai and uh, uh, wishes he was out. He's done lots and lots of laps around the Nordschleife and is building up to getting into the uh, 24 hour race, apparently. Which is not something you can just turn up and do. We've had a number of tweets at RSL underscore studio using the hashtag RSL N24. Uh, I used this analogy the other day. I'll change it up a little bit now. Um, <laughs> if, clean it up for air. <laughs> if, no, no. I, I, I said if multiple world champion Lewis Hamilton wanted to come here. But if um, pick any great sports car driver, uh, Stefan Sarazan or... Uh, Alan McNish, I know he's, he has got a driver's li uh, race license now, but even in his pump, if Tom Christensen had wanted to come here, you can't just rock up here and say, oh, you know, I've got an international A or a super license from the FIA. I'll be doing the 24 hour race because the organizing body here, ADAC, uh, will be saying, uh, I think not actually, because we're going to put you through a rookie course. I'm sorry. A rookie course, yes. You have to do some classroom sessions, uh, and then you'll have to uh, be shuttled around the track. We're going to show you the track, and we're going to give you some uh, in information. Then you're going to do some slow laps in lead and follow, duck and drift, uh, and then you can go out and do a Nurburgring tracker. Uh, and you have to do and. Uh, I'll get this wrong, but I think it's 13 laps or maybe 14 laps of a of a NLS race in a car that is limited to a certain amount of power permit. And at that point, if you uh, you can go on to do what you want to do in the big race and do the GT3 cars. And that doesn't matter who you are. And God, I have not one iota of issue with that because of the nature of you, of this place. You wouldn't have had to do that when you were here. No, didn't, didn't have to do that at all. No, but, any rookie orientation? Uh, yes, had to do that, yeah, as a basis. But uh, uh, it was quite funny for me because I'd uh, uh, you had to sit down with a with a, an official and say, right, what have you done? What's the last race you did? So and so, and it was like, uh, it's Spa. What was it in? Uh, Group C car. Okay, right. So that, that's not an issue. So you're going to be right with a Mitsubishi Lancer, hopefully. But well, I love your description there of Lewis Hamilton rocking up here and just being presented that seven-time world champion and uh, you can't take part in this race. And you're like, 
you serious, man? Like, yeah, no, we're deadly serious, no, Lewis. Deadly. Yeah. You can sit in the classroom. I just love that sit concept. Next, sitting at the back. If ever there was a show made for TV, it's putting Lewis through that. Well, that would just be brilliant. Well, Martin Bruntle did it. Compulsive Martin viewing. Bruntle did it, uh, and then went and raced with his son Alex for Aston Martin. Finished second in class, actually, in a NLS race, not in the uh, not in the 24. Uh, in for, oh, in the 24. I think he did. I think he did. Yes, yeah, he, he did, did do the yeah. 24. I'm, I'm yeah. awfully sorry. Alex yes. won his class in 2019. Yeah, but uh, Martin did it as well. Yeah, very, very good fun. Uh, and if you can find that on video channels, it's uh, it says the it's called the Brooklyn's Take on the Nordschleifer. You can recognise some voices in there. It's Johnny Farmer's voice who was in that a bit as well. So the Frickadelli car that was brought back the pits by Earl Bamba with a right rear puncture and therefore had uh, and, and had in fact stopped on the circuit uh, I don't believe that car suffered any other damage that was a 3-0 car wasn't it and I think I've just seen that car back out again yes I have Nick Tandy the man from Bedfordshire he is in that car Tandy, who has a penchant for building RC remote control model cars, has just completed a rather stunning Mark II rally escort that he was uh, showing some video on. And the Corvette driver, of course, he's got a larger scale Corvette CAR, which uh, he took up to uh, a bit of private ground that has some old runways on it. And this RC car, which is about probably 18 inches long, beautiful model of a CAR, um, using some clever GPS bits and pieces, was timed at over 90 miles an hour. Not scale speed, actual speed, pushing on towards three figures, quite extraordinarily uh, from Tandy. Uh, so let's take a look at how things stand at the sharp end of the field. It's Team HRT by uh, a full minute now, four visits to the pit stop, and Manuel Metzger will be due in the pits in about another four laps time, uh, depending on the conditions and how many more slow zones we get. Matteo Caroli in second position for Manti Racing is 25, call it 26 seconds on Yessi Cron for the number 20 from Sherbert Motorsport in the first of two BMW M6s in the top six. Make that three, actually. Uh, it's Kuno, uh, it's not Kuno Whitmer at all. Uh, it's uh, the number 98 Rover racing car, and uh, that, at the moment, uh, is being driven by Marco Whitman. Get the and the Whitmers mixed up there. Nicky Team is in fifth in the number 11 at right in behind that though. The Crone Whitman team uh, all separated by a little under seven seconds. Then Nick, Nick Yellowly uh, for Rover Racing in the number one car. He is 32 seconds ahead of Renny Rast for Audi Sport Team Land which started from the Pitts Lane. 31 car is in eighth position for Flickatelli, the better placed of the two cars. And Behind that, it is KCMG quietly going about their business. All right, two and a half minutes down, Mark Moore holds them behind the wheel of their 911 GT3R number 20, uh, number 18. Uh, and they are nine seconds ahead of the 23. Mark was free in Hoover Motorsports 911 GT3R. That's your top 10. And uh, just outside the top 10, Roman Dumas for Rootronic Racing. That's another Porsche. Maxi Goetz for Team Get Speed in the 7 uh, AMG. Nico Bastian in 13th for HRT. Team Get Speed second car uh, with still only half a lap down, really, uh, that car at the moment. Uh, and that's got Gilles Goon on driving that car, which he shares with a really good lineup there. Dirk Muller, Fabian Schiller, Mathieu Vaxavier uh, as well. Beyond that, it's uh, the Falcon Motorsports number 44, which we've been seeing quite a lot of 
uh, out on the circuit because uh, it's been driven with some verve by uh, Alessio Piccariello. Uh, then it's Sammy Matty Trogan, just as good in full metal racing as he is uh, on the eSports in the 102 10Q Racing Team How Plus Mercedes. Excuse me, in the Falcon Horse Motorsport BMW, that 10Q Racing Team How Mercedes has Dominic Bauman behind them in the number 40 car. Then Thomas Prining, Falcon Motorsports number 33. BMW Junior team running a little further down than they might have liked. But still in with a shout and still very much on the lead lap with Dan Harper uh, from the Sheffield area, uh, sorry, from Northern Ireland, uh, the Northern Ireland Island Hillsborough. Uh, uh, he shares with Matt S. Neil Verhagen and Augusto Farfus. And behind that car to make up the top trend, 20 is the Phoenix Racing number five. That's how they stand in the top category uh, with still, uh, well, it's 20 past eight in the evening. We've got plenty to go. The story of the race so far has been one of changeable weather conditions and that dominated the first few hours of the race. Even as far as on the warm-up lap, the formation lap, race control saying they might require a red flag that if the weather gets got too bad it didn't uh, and the race start happened but the rain dropped fairly quickly after that and we saw at one stage absolute carnage up at Schwedenkreutz at the top of the hill there just before dropping down to Arenberg in the Foxhall there was at least half a dozen cars off there within a few seconds and super driving by the following uh, cars to miss them and turn it into an even worse situation. As pretty much as soon as the rain came, it did uh, stop raining and it just dried pretty quickly. And in the space of what 90 minutes or so, the track had dried up. One or two cars did take the gamble at the start of the uh, race to go out on wet weather tyres. That really didn't seem to have paid off, and they came in pretty early. Ultimately, everybody had to go on to full, and I would say probably whatever version of monsoon slicks they have. The competition on the circuit just as tight as in the pit lane with uh, Martin Tomchik and Kevin Estre uh, coming out of the pits close together. Uh, and uh, an immediate mistake by the number four Mercedes as it rejoined the circuit after its pit stop almost gave Kevin Estra the opportunity. They had a pretty good battle actually through there. They were swapping places. Dries Vanter was going great guns until he wasn't. A tiny little right rear drop uh, off the circuit as he was climbing up towards the hill before Callanhard. And he put the front of the Audi Sport team, Phoenix in hard to the right hand side. Again, no chance for Dries to be able to recover that. And that car did make it back to 15 having to undergo some severe uh, work on that car. Then the big incident down at Tiergarten, which has uh, got a still under a uh, Code 60 there, was the uh, one of the Caymans that actually rolled twice there. Even the best at the front of the field, Matteo Caroli, not exempt from making mistakes. A little bit of dirt on the track coming out of Hatson and, and back and he ran that car down the wall. Uh, some very sad looking cars including that number 87 came and glad to report that uh, Stefan Branner, the Munich based driver uh, did was taken away in an ambulance, standard operating procedure but uh, was seen under his own volition there. That full court of uh, that uh, good 60 there Pete is still going on because of barrier repairs but we have got another car BMW. stuck out on the circuit the distinctive I can say that the, angel the, eyes the corona, corona ring lights that you can see there that's yeah it, exactly that, that's identified first before I saw the number how sad is that uh, yes, I'll just get my BMW spotted guy out and uh, put that away again and uh, yeah I'll go back under the under the rock shall I uh, I think that that's the Schubert Motorsport Cup 5 leader in class BMW M2. Um, I'll see if we can get that confirmed. It's the number 890 if it is. They're running down in 63rd position. Hello to Lars Klaviter. 
to Chris Suku, Jonathan Main, Dave Monks, all tuned in. The Bon Cupra uh, also has had a problem as well, the 171. That car we were talking about a little bit earlier on, Peter, that had had a problem out on the track, and I think that's come back on a, a flatbed because it came in uh, eagle-eyed Jake Parrott watching that coming in. Um, not by the usual route. Yes, because the tracker, even if the the flatbed goes off the off the circuit and out onto the public roads, the tracker's still working. And quite often, you'll see a car going round the surface roads that uh, are the public roads around here. Much easier, by the way, for cars to get back to the pit when that happens, and it doesn't. Outside assistance doesn't end their race here. Um, it's very much encouraged to get the cars back running again. As Matteo Caroli shaves down the inside of an AMG, that was the CP racing car, Charles Putman et al. But a point that somebody was making earlier on, Peter, is it was a lot easier for teams to get around here. And if you do have a problem, instead of it taking sometimes hours to get back on the flatbed, they're you know, 15, 20 minutes once they're on the public road. With hours of the race to go. So that's, yeah. that's just brilliant. And it's, uh, again, it's, 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 I hate to say it, you know, not the stereotypical thing, but the German efficiency. Uh, it, it goes back to what you said, John, about the the, the licensing process, mm -hmm. how you have to go through it. Uh, you know, that Lewis Hamilton can't just turn up here seven times for the World Champion. No, you can't do it. Tom Christensen, seven times, uh, seven times, nine times the Mon winner, isn't it? Nine times? No. Yeah. Nine, nine. nine times, yeah. yeah. Uh, he can't just turn up and do that. He's got to go through the process. Such is the, is the scale of this place, and quite rightly so, but that efficiency filters down through all the levels, as you say, not just the driving on track and the processing and the licensing, uh, but the efficiency of the barrier repairs and, and everything else. Um, interesting, just uh, the, the time we were talking earlier, John, about the, um, the weather over at Spa, only uh, a few what 60 k's away but yesterday created a lift of the track at the source i.e the first corner of the circuit there uh, by 50 centimeters um belgian efficiency coming into play as well that track is being that bit of surface is being resurfaced already today really that's been done as we speak unbelievable lost revenue i guess uh, kind of the track not working so it's dutch cut supercars this weekend and they've had to cancel their event haven't they I guess we've got to let the tarmac settle, we've got to let it, let it cool down. But So we're just coming up to, uh, with three minutes off, 19 hours to go. <laughs> but I'm, you know I'm, what? I about you, but I'm worn out already with all this excitement. But, but, what, uh, it's, it's good. I like this. I know, uh, I, I know that we have a long way from being anywhere near the end of the race. And we've had quite a few incidents that have caused slow down zones and code 60s but this is still running at a pretty hectic pace particularly at the front of the field and uh, the best lap has been an 8.34 so still about 25 seconds or so and maybe a bit less than that 20 seconds let's say away from what we were expecting but we've not really had the uh, clean track that we wanted to um, so I'm still hopeful we might get somewhere near 159 laps somewhere near and uh, I'll keep an eye on the predictive oh big incident this is one of the Black Falcon it's the 306 Cayman and that is a lot of steam and smoke. That's been in both ends, I'm afraid, for that car. Uh, that is going to cause another slow zone. It's, sorry, that's the GTEC competition car, not the Black Falcon machine. That's the Jan Yap van Thrun, uh, Tom Coronel, Maxi Kurtz and Alex Kruger car. And uh, that has done itself some serious damage on the right-hand side. The leader was in that area. Has that happened right in front of the leader? Yes, yes it has. Right. Coming to France Garden 2. Just understeered off to the left-hand side. Great flag work 
absolutely brilliant flag work by the marshals and whoever was driving that 306 i don't know if they had much control of the car at all but they did absolutely the right thing to stop the car spinning right out in front of what would have been peter a completely hapless it was tom coronel i was just looking down to see if it was coronel not coronel, like him not like him to make the mistake but my goodness he avoided something worse there by keeping the car from spearing back on the the track and locking the middle pedal the that Matteo route. Caroli car was following on behind. The leader had just gone through, and Cairoli, if that car had come off the track there, Cairoli was an absolute flat out. Flansgarden is so quick. The distinctive bright yellow helmet of Tom Coronel out of the car as he ruefully walks away with barely, well, I was going to say barely a backward glance. I'm going to suggest something here. I know we don't like to speculate, John, but I'm going to, I am for a moment, you can just bear with me. I'm going to suggest almost a car failure or something there because that is so, yeah. so unlike Tommy Coronel. Um, I've had the pleasure of driving with him years ago. Well, I wouldn't say the pleasure. I can't tell you why it wasn't a pleasure, but I'll tell you off air and you decide whether we can mention it next time. Anything to do with the damp suit? Correct. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know. He yes. shoots. Yes. He scores. Yes. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not the message you want to hear from a, an outgoing driver as you do a driver swap and uh, sitting there thinking that uh, I'm I'm sitting in, yes, and it's and it's not mine. <laughs> exactly, yes, a Dutchman's. So, are not do you on reckon the, you reckon sense. that right rear was gone then? Well, I just don't know what's called. I'm not. I don't know. I want to go that far. It's just I'm. It's just looking at where How it is. Quick did the marshals get the double it's yellow? It's just attempt. not like Tommy Coronel. I'm not putting him on a pedestal. And if it, but I just I, I just it's just not like him. I'm just very, very surprised. Just on half past eight Central European time, we start another hour of the race with just under 19 to go and a slow zone in Flugplatz for Tom Coronel and the 306 Porsche Cayman. G-Tech competition in the black and blue colours, which is why I thought immediately a black, fal black Falcon car. So apologies for that if I panic anyone who's particularly following uh, those machines. Now, fog starting to uh, really descend at the end of the GP circuit onto uh, the Norwich Life of the Hudson back. And uh, uh, just watching uh, um, Carioli there in the Mant are uh, going out onto the North, uh, we've said already it's daunting enough coming off the GP circuit. That hairpin, as John described it quite rightly, uh, onto the North side there. But the narrowness of the track there, that recalibration of your brain every lap, every 10 minutes or so, or just under 10 minutes, uh, it should rejoin that. But the fog starting to hang into the trees there now as we're heading towards uh, sort of dusk and twilight uh, in this. And it's uh, it, the visibility is starting to be really effective. We're now starting to see. Uh, just tail lights of cars uh, as opposed to the silhouettes of cars uh, and I reckon the next hour or so it's going to be very very different fog bringing that in even sooner rather than just fading light yeah absolutely right hello to Richard Bradley hello Rich I hope you're well uh, hope Peter gets some sleep before next week racing in the Sterling Moss Trophy <laughs> at Thruxton, is that right? Correct, yes. What, you're in, Pete? Uh, it, it, what, the affectionately known as Maureen. Ah. You know what Maureen, you know who Maureen is? It's now officially over there. The 1952 Aston Martin DB2, Very which nice. as, far, as far as Rich is concerned, because he races a 1920s or a 1930s car, apparently I'm driving a modern GT Aston. Stop. Because it's 1950s. Ah, right. <laughs> Excellent. Compared to the man that jumps out of LMP cars and jumps into 1930s Astons and disappears and people just think hang on a minute there's, there's a reason he can do that he has a talent box yeah it's very simple yeah absolutely hello to dave monks as well dave's been listening Mr. on the Rolls podcast Royce. yes indeed uh Oscar. on the podcast uh since all 2 30 time this when he set off uh he's coming home to the u i mean back to uk should i say with a very nice bmw on a trailer uh, ask him, like ask him if he's found his keys turbo. yet for his Rolls Royce. He'll right. know what that means. He'll respond. Right. Okay. They've only been missing since Goodwood 20, 2017 Festival of Speed. 
Is that a two? Is that a sixteen or two or a two double or two turbo, Dave, on the back of that uh, on the back of that trailer? Very nice car, British registered, and uh, he's come through the tunnel. 1602. 1602, is it? Looks like it. Yeah, mm. the lights be different at the front of it, is it? Yeah, very good. Ti T double I two double O two tub turbo. Nice, like the like the blister arches on it though. Oh. Very good. Nice, Mr. Monks. Hope you're well. Welcome back to Blighty. Nikolai, with this interesting. Has the relatively no, low number of starters, yes, barely 125 rather than 170. Uh, this year made the drivers push harder. SP9 seem especially to be much closer to the edge. It doesn't feel like the drivers are using the same amount of caution we've been used to. I think uh, it may look like that, Nikolai, but I, I, I honestly think that the guys, uh, we, all the drivers we've, we've spoken to this week, and the same last year, to be honest, from the moment they're if they're in a GD3 car, and particularly if they are driving as a manufacturer representative, even that if it's not in a quote-unquote full works team, there are many works supported, works blessed teams here. But you're really on it, Pete, here. If you are in one of the front-running cars, um, representing, as I say, one of the major manufacturers, you're on it from when your thumb comes off the pit lane speed limit till eight lift laps later and it goes back on again aren't you absolutely just very quickly john while you've been talking about that we've just had uh, you've heard of synchronized swimming uh, we've had uh, synchronized pit stopping here from mercedes two different teams there though uh, the get speeds uh, sandwiching the hrt young Cadella and bastian and vassivier uh, in the three cars respectively all going out of the pits uh into 13th 14th and 15th uh, with driver changes to Junker Della staying in the Get Speed car, Haupt taking over the HRT, and Neufer taking over. My pull that's in the Hubert was Haupt in the HRT, and Junker Della staying in the Get Speed car, uh, and Vassivier staying in the other Get Speed. But uh, all three in there. Still got this uh, slow Code 60 or slow section past the stricken Porsche from uh, Tom Coronel, who's uh, standing. He, he, promised, he promised me a go of his TCR car. He said we would race it in... Uh, he said he would uh, race it in a Creventic race and give me a driver that. I think he's probably just sent me a text to say that's not happened now. <laughs> or a Twitter message. Well, it means he can, he can go to the bar sooner or later and, 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 and have his, do his party trick, which is to drink the beer and then eat the glass. You think I'm joking? But no, I don't. No. no. So it, it makes a damp seat just pales into insignificance. In all insignificance. Think how much worse it could have Okay. <laughs> John Calverne leads uh, in, excuse me, no, he doesn't. He's second in TCR in the Hyundai i30N. Yeah, it's the Elantra, the, I, the uh, 830 car that leads. Hyundai, another manufacturer here who have uh, for quite some time used this uh, race as well as the circuit itself as somewhat of a test bed, double wave yellows as he comes through the last part of the flans garden to where Tom Coronel is standing by the side of the road. I think somebody would stop and give him a lift back to the pits, wouldn't you? It's not that far from here. Well, no, because he's, he's obviously waiting for the car to recover to the pit so he can go and sit in it whilst they repair it. He'd be back out, yeah. yeah. Interestingly, after that huge accident, the headlights on the Cayman are still working. Uh, He's just somewhat unfortunate about the wheels on the right-hand side not pointing not, in the correct direction. But not anywhere near the right direction. Nasty accident, that. But Tom... At least you can see where it can't go. Yeah. Hoa acts from race control. Warning drivers of low cloud and fog there. Post 152. Thank you, Rene. Hoa acts being, of course, the highest part of the circuit, so just starting to descend there, yeah. We are about uh, an hour away from official sunset uh, this time of year 15 or 20 minutes after that before it gets very dark indeed although there were I, I, I dare say it'll depend on what state the sky's in because we had some beautiful last veg vestiges of of sunlight and spectacular sunset uh, on certainly Thursday evening at the end of or in the nighttime session Dear viewer and listener, you might be thinking to yourself that it is a remarkable feat 
of self-control that these drivers are immediately down to 60k when they have to be down to 60k when you see how many times yellow flags are if not abused then certainly uh, stretched in terms of speeds in other motorsport events peter mentioned the word respect earlier on and i think that's a very good one to apply to this situation as well it's respect for the guys out on the track we don't stop the race here for incidents we don't even put a safety car out anymore and pack the field up uh, it, ha it used to happen here we put safety cars out actually several of them remember matt neil telling me a great story about that when he was driving something bizarre i've been a viper actually said uh, first darkness did middle of the night fogs come down i'm tearing through the back part of the circuit coming down towards flansgard and in front of me there's a safety car with a yellow station with a yellow light on the roof so i slow straight down and drop in behind him you know how fast it is there and he said people are going by me and i'm thinking what's going on here get round onto the dottiger hall where the visibility is a bit better i realize it isn't a safety car it is in fact a vw estate car with a cage in and a taxi sign on the roof in full taxi livery from whatever so he said and i'd never seen that car all week i'm convinced they just got themselves into the race somehow and he admits to this he does <laughs> i remember when, when i did this there was a, a vw transporter a van yeah van with full cage, full cage. And, and i must admit i did exactly the same of just really because i just assumed it was an instant vehicle it wasn't until you realized on close inspection it was a bit more than that uh, and they did have safety cars in those days. Yeah. Uh, I say it was. I say it was all in it. It's uh, a long, long time ago, and uh, all sepia type photos. Uh, but in those days, we, we were encouraged by a uh, German teammate in a well, the same garage, shall we say, from a different rival team. That if there was a safety car section, then the idea was turn your lights off and go past two or three cars on the grass and join in front, then turn your lights back on again. That was a top tip from a local, shall we say. It was just like, seriously? Yeah. <laughs> what, a, what about transponders and things and whatever? It's just, oh, it's just be careful. It's just like, okay. And, uh, you yeah, know, the, the legendary German sense of humour that apparently is non-existent. We're at Battle for Second, actually, going on out on the track. I promise you, uh, out there, Matteo Caroli and the uh, in second place at the moment for Manti in the Porsche. And he's having a pretty decent battle through the interrupted lap as it now is with the number 98 Marco Wittmann driven Rover Racing BMW and they're carving their way through traffic again now in the early part of the Nordschleife on the hats and back in fact just cleared that heading up over the bridge to Platz and then up to Schwed, right to Swiss Cross where all the incidents were this morning up this hill really got to put as little steering as you can in the car you do not want to be scrubbing off any speed whatsoever fluke plats by the way named because not because the cars get off the ground and go flying not at all up on the hill on the left hand side there used to be a little airport there fluke plats uh, i still think the fly gliders out of there but in the early days of this race the great and the good from the big cities of Germany and particularly from Berlin used to fly down in chartered planes and land there to watch the race and that's why it's called Flug Plats. What are you shaking your head for? I don't make this stuff up, you know. I oh, know, it's just, it's just a fountain of knowledge, this thing that... It's not real. Oh, I found one year I found a website, somebody put me onto a website where every corner name was translated and uh, explained and uh, I went through that at various times due to 24 hours I just kept popping up trying to do it I thought if I can do one of these maybe once every hour hours, hours of endless fun on the winter hours. evenings of the hind hop they, house they just fly by uh, the GT53 uh, tyres car this is one of two in its class put the man among the driving strength here and uh, just very quickly John a quick yeah. driver change there the number 11 Phoenix racing Audi's popped into the pits Nicky team getting out of that car and Kim Louis Schramm uh, now just taking the wheel of that car uh, the GT team the 53 team uh, 
very much echoing the situation that we heard from Peretta Autosports at the Indy 500. And I'm, I'm going to say it more than a majority. I, I, I'm pretty certain that pretty much every active member of the team, from the driving staff to those changing the wheels and fueling the car, uh, are all female. Now, that makes not a jot of difference to me, uh, to be honest. Neither does it make a jot of difference to the car or the stopwatch. Um, but for some people, that will make a difference. And uh, ironically, not to Christina and her teammates, because they want to be seen as racing drivers and not female racing drivers. However, that said, the opportunities there when I say it doesn't make a jot of difference to me, I mean in terms of performance, but I mention it because of the opportunities that have been afforded there. It is a truth, of course, that there are no separate classes uh, based on gender uh, in racing. We don't have a men's race and a women's race, and it has been ever thus, and yet, it doesn't seem to work out like that, does it, when we look at the opportunities for drivers? The 101 Valkenhorst uh, Motorsport M6 has also just been pitted, John, by Ben Tuck. And that is now that was the car that was driven by David Pittard at the beginning. Uh, and that's now got uh, uh, Christian Kruns at the wheel, uh, had taken over from Ben Tuck. Let's see. Uh, the 306 Porsche that uh, had its uh, uh, indiscretion, shall we say, with Tommy Coronel uh, is been uh, facing, still facing the wrong way up the circuit, but they've got a, a flatbed alongside now, and that's going to be picked up and onto that and uh, returned to the pits and uh, uh, assessed. I think we can uh, possibly preempt the outcome of that assessment. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a lot of polishing going on for that car for a while. Um, but it, uh, it is more to the point from a continuation of the race that will be taken uh, out of the way and uh, we can get rid of that uh, slow zone past that at the moment. So, uh, meanwhile, at the front, though, the um, Manti Porsche coming under increasing pressure from the Rover Racing BMW immediately behind it of Wittmann. And just behind him is the, uh, the, the teammate's car, Nick Yelly, in the other uh, M6 from Rover Racing. So Mercedes, it is at the front, HRT with Metzger at the wheel, Carioli in the Manti Porsche in second place, and then a brace of BMWs for third and fourth. That gap's just closed out because they've just approached, they're just reaching that point there. Matteo Carioli, it is uh, at the wheel of the Manti Porsche, uh, just going past the stricken Tommy Coronel 304 Porsche, which is now up in the air, ready being moved onto its flatbed. And he's got to wait for the green flag, Matteo Carioli, and get on it. He's got Bittman right behind him now as they start to descend off through into the fog as well. He's haven't got enough on your plate. Clear track in front of him, though. Matteo Carioli it is that's got uh, Bittman's BMW coming up right behind him, jiggling where they're having a little look at the other side, just sort of letting you know, I'm here. Just filling the mirrors. I'm here. Get on with it. Now, our race leader... Umbo Hetzke is into the pits, the number four Team HRT Mercedes. And we'll keep an eye on who's going to be the driver change on that. It's uh, it's currently being pedalled uh, by uh, Manuel Metzger. And he's definitely out of it. I'm just trying to spot who that is that might be going into there. The car being retaken on its Gojax. Uh, it's 45 degrees, ready for its uh, refueling. Metzger out. Yeah, just throwing, uh, I think, well, I think we're throwing it into the garage out, which I guess was probably his, I was going to say he needs a seat pad, but uh, highly unlikely, because uh, he's, a, he's a fairly fairly tall chap, is Manuel Metzger. Just giving some instructions to the incoming driver. I think that's Adam Christodoulou that's getting in. I've got a feeling, yeah, the man from Wimbledon. Solly, second. Solly Hull originally. Well, yeah, okay, okay, well, Wimbledon sounds better. <laughs> well, not if you're from Solly Hill. No, no, no. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm waiting for I'm, my phone's going to light up now with Chris Hodgett saying, uh, What do you mean? Two cars in from yep. second at the same time. Mate, Matteo Caroli. And Wittmann, yeah. Yeah. Marco Wittmann as well. 
So that's going to promote the number one car back into the lead. Is it potentially Nicky Ellerly? Just seeing how far down it is. He should indeed. Yeah, he's, he's gone through already. Gone through. Yes, yeah, so he's I'm saying, promoted it back to the lead now. Yeah. Uh, so Nicky Ellerly, it is the the race winning car from last year, is now back at the top of the dungeon. Of course, still owes us a pit stop though. 32 laps it is completed by our top four cars, three of which, uh, two, three, and four, are in the pits, John. Just uh, check in with our next incoming driver swap ourselves. Do a little bit of a handover. Hello to Peter Mackay, who is rejoining us on a, a track that just keeps giving Peter uh, 10 minutes away, just getting all your kit together and sort of metaphorically making sure you've got your earplugs and your helmet, and your gloves and everything ready to go. This is heating up nicely, isn't it? Discipline. So three leaders in and at the moment. Oh, sorry, Peter. Make that it's sorry. It's the Rastad in as well. Sorry, Rastad. Yeah, as well. well. Okay. Uh, what amazes me, Peter Mack, is that even with all these slow zones, nobody has yet. Uh, nobody has yet uh, gone more than eight laps, even with all of these slow zones. Just underlines, P Mac, just uh, how long this track is and how much fuel you've got to save to risk that extra lap. Well, this is, uh, Nick Damon will, will appreciate this. This is why you need Scott Dixon in your car to, to make fuel. Uh, with some lifting and coasting but uh, if the rain comes they might be able to stretch to that ninth stint of course that's one of the advantages of the rain of any uh, is that the fuel does last a little bit longer but uh, eight laps at the moment at least everyone's on the same uh, the same playing field I suppose which is always nice to see and shows you how well the how good a job the organisers are doing in balancing what are very different cars you know a rear engine flat six Porsche without a turbo front engine twin turbo V8 in the BMW and the Mercedes big front engine V8 again it's uh, it's mighty impressive I have to say you were absolutely right John that the uh, driver change from Manuel Metzger in the number four Mercedes was Adam Christodoulou, which might say Wimbledon, and he is indeed from Solihull, as in course. Solihull. It's, as indeed, it's of course, it's Nicky Ellerly. Yeah, yeah. Motor racing hotbed, that is. <laughs> <laughs> Out goes. You heard it first here on Radio Show <laughs> Limited. <laughs> there you go, Peter Mack. You, you, you're surprised at that yourself, aren't you? Hot, 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 hotbed of fancy motor car racing dealership. Hotbed, Solihull. Yeah, well, that as well. Absolutely right. Lots Very of fancy, fancy car dealerships here. Mm. Uh, Fog's not going to make this any easier, P Mac. Um, out they go. Back to the racing. Nick Yallowley's gone through for over at racing. Uh, he's not a million miles away from uh, his next stop. He's just started his seventh of what we expect to be at eight lap lead. But we're starting to get, P Mac, just a little bit of divergence. They're not all coming in at the same time. It's not massive. It's a lap here, a couple of laps there. But we've got to try and keep across this for everybody watching and listening around the world because it's too early to start back counting. But what we can say, as the Glickenhaus, I think, has just had a spin, has it? No, that's a... Yes. It was? Yeah, Glickenhaus. Yeah, yeah. Believe your eyes, Hindo, uh, down at Turn 1. But it, it's but too early to start back counting. Yeah, Westy spinning. Write this yeah. down, down in your diary. Uh, I'll get back to the finish me thought. Well, thank you for that. No, I know. Well, he, but he doesn't know. He never, he never, he never spins. That's why I mean it's, it's an odd one. Um, it's too, it's too early, uh, Pwak, to, uh, to, to start back counting. But it's going to be worth keeping an eye on those gaps between the cars and whether they stay in a couple of laps or whether they start to go out the three laps because at that point they start to become more significant, Peter. Oh, indeed, yes. Uh, well, where the number 704 Glickenhaus, Richard Westbrook, is parked at the side of the circuit and Richard Westbrook is out of that car. So, John, you might be forgiven by Richard that his spin might well have been to do with some sort of mechanical yeah. failure on that beautiful Glickenhaus machine. He's giving it, he's looking it up and down and, uh, well, the... Uh, very dapper yeah. Glickenhaus team 
uh, they, they love this place and that will hurt a lot. Jim Clinton House talking to the engineers and obviously getting some news from the car. I don't think it's good news from Westies. Looking at the left-hand side of the 704 004C, they were very, very confident about the additional speed. Uh, P. Mac will let you continue your prep. Talk to you in about six minutes when you take over, mate. Copy that. Just, the just thinking there, John, that the, you, you said uh, you said right down Richard Westbrook's had a spin in the car there. Make a note of it as if it's slightly unlikely. Yeah. Highly unlikely. I think strike that out. I've, uh, I've got a feeling that there's something caused that first one and something caused that second bit there that uh, uh, that's just not... It's like Tommy Coronel. That's not uh, That's not normal. Just very, very quickly, the uh, the Manti Porsche, uh, John, when it pitted, um, whilst it did have its pit, it no change of driver. So uh, Matteo Carioli obviously got his eye in there and they've left him in the car. Yeah, and I, I, I kind of understand that in some ways. As Westy came down into turn one and the car literally swapped ends on him. It was like somebody had pulled, pulled on the hand, handbrake uh, and he's left facing the wrong direction. Well, I've done that plenty of time, but that's lack of talent. I'm going to say something, something's failed in the left rear on that. I don't know why. Or the gearbox. And the gearbox is... Because he hasn't got that much further round, has no, he? No. Very difficult with all the fog to actually identify. I think he's at the Ford chicane at Marshall's Post 19. Yes, he is. So he's still on the Grand Prix circuit. So he's barely got halfway around the GP track. So I think that's, is that just before or just after the Dunlop just hairpin? Just before. Yeah. Just, uh, he's just there before the hairpin. Yeah. It's good, actually good about where yeah. it's actually about where you break for that hairpin. There's an access road comes in from the left hand side that Which, you use. Your what it makes because it, it did that into turn one. I just want that's why if something's broken in the left rear, yeah. If every time it breaks, it's just giving it some massive toe out or something. Uh, again, we're speculating. We don't know, so perhaps it shouldn't. But it's just, it just just seems odd. So coming up to nine o'clock in the evening, the drama continues for top runners. Nick Yellowly, a lap or so away from his fifth pit stop. The best place car that has done its fifth pit stop is now Adam Christodoulou uh, behind the wheel, sitting, uh, scored in second place at the moment. Uh, let me just refresh my strategy screen and uh, make sure I'm reading the right things. He's just taken over from his teammate, hasn't he? Yeah. So, yeah, OK. So that is a very good turnaround for Mercedes AMG Team HRT, the number four car. He's five minutes down, but he's done the pit stop that Nick Yellowleaf will have to do in a little while. So, nine o'clock German time. That will be the AT SP10 SP8 update which uh, P-Mac and Bradders will bring you up to date with as Snowy and I head for some uh, some sausage and some vice beer. I didn't know I tell you that the Solihull comments would kick off straight yeah. away. I won't say who, but somebody very involved in Aston Martins and Aston Martins Club raced very many years. His son uh, has just sent a message just saying that he was born in Solihull and worked there. Um, just bearing in mind, it said, now I can see why your other half has ordered your headstone their company is Monumental Stonemasons. Very good. That's what you get for making one comment about Sonic There Hill. you go. Dear Bamford family, we apologise, or I apologise unreservedly. There you go. The, uh, the wrong has been righted. Uh, and please can we note, the Bamfords, that Hindoff here, the lad from the North East, was, was defending the honour of Sully Hill. Uh, so basically just piling more of it my way, aren't well, you? Well, absolutely, yeah. mate. I'm, di yeah. I'm disassociated what, what, what was it Mr Bradley came out with last year? There was even a meme for this during the 24-hour last year when I predicted the weather correctly in the race stoppage, and it was called hashtag blame snowy. Yeah, blame snowy. Yeah, yeah thank absolutely. you. So it's obviously been... It's taken a year. I thought we got away with that one, but it's come back around again. So I apologise. I shall go and take my penance very shortly, and uh, obviously no, no food, no, 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 no refresh, no R&R &R for me. Just go and sit on the naughty set for two hours. Just before... Our stint uh, comes to an end. We're doing very similar stints to the drivers because we've got a maximum stint length of three hours as well. 
after which you must have a two hour rest. Uh, but in the early part of the race, we're tending to do two, uh, two hour stints, double stints, if you will. Triples will come in the nighttime hours, um, which is always dangerous. A big thank you to everybody at uh, Nürburgring TV once again for not just this race, but also for our NLS coverage uh, this year. Always a pleasure uh, working with uh, Rene, who it is at the moment, Michael, Nico, and the myriad others who work so hard on, on a circuit that it's not exactly built to televise stuff easily, let's be honest. Uh, and also, big effort from our London uh, main control room staff, Hugh and Rob, and uh, I know that uh, Tim Gray's been uh, setting things up down there as well. Uh, and we had Kes Cobb in there today. Big double weekend with ELMS tomorrow still to come. MLMC today in qualifying for JP and uh, Gooders. That's on RS3 tomorrow. If you can tear yourself away from this, but of course the archive will all be there for you to take in later on. And our final act is to say that the Rootronic Porsche, the GT Silver Car, is in to the pit lane. Mathieu, uh, no, not Mathieu Faxvier at all brought that car in. I thought it was Dumas who was uh, who brought that car in. He's just fired his car. Yes, it was. He's up in uh, fifth position when he pitted, uh, and he's brought that in and handed over the Rootronic car to his teammate, which I think was Julian Andler that got into that car. It's not exactly a motorsport-related injury you expect to pick up at a, at a circuit in the pit lane, is it being uh, hit by a flying seat? A wheel, maybe, uh, and a car, uh, logically, sorry. but a seat? It was Lawrence Van to late addition to that car, not exactly slowing it down. Any just on 9 o'clock Central European time, our hourly update is the AT, SP10 and V classes. And that starts right now with Peter McCoy. Well, we are here into the thick end of this motor race. 18 hours and 28 minutes to go. So let's have a look at how some of the classes are running right now. In the SP8 class, it's the number 54 Lexus RCF. That's a Toyo tyre car leading ahead of uh, the GT Tire Audi, which uh, John mentioned a moment ago. That's the all-female crew with Christina Nielsen and Pippa Mann. Been a good battle all weekend long between those two cars. In SP10, it's the number 70 BMW M4 GT4 leading the way at the moment. In SP4, the number 325 BMW 325e90 leading the way in that class. Now, I know that uh, there'll be many of you listening and watching to see who is winning in our Dolly Mixture class, the SP3 class. Now, if you're thinking which class is that, that is the class with the Opal Manta, the Foxtail, and the Dacia Logan. And at the moment, it is the number 120 Toyota Team Thailand car, the Toyota Corolla Altis, that's actually beating its much more exotic cousin, the GT86. For fans of the Manta, that is third in class at the moment, so very much in the running. In Cup 5, it's the Hofer Racing by Bonk Motorsport, number 242, BMW M2 leading the way. In V6, it's the Team Mathol Porsche Cayman, number 132. In V5, it's another Porsche Cayman, Adrenaline Motorsport, number 141. And in V4, it's the number 151, Uber BMW. Now, do I have a Joe Bradley alongside me? I will certainly hope you do, Peter. Uh, I, I, am I connected? I can hear you. Yes, I can Excellent. hear you very well. Have you been watching the action while we've been off air? Yeah, yeah, I've got to say, uh, you know, during our, our rest periods, it's a bit like being a racing driver that you see get out of the car and then he spends his rest period staring at the timing screen, watching how his car does. Um, I've got to say, it's the Nürburgring 24 hours has, has always, for me, been a race which you just can't drag yourself away from because there's just always so, something going on, whether it's an incident, whether it's the weather, 
and I've got to say, Peter, um, you and I uh, are from the northern part of the British Isles, and I'm on the northeast coast, so, um, you know, fog is an ever-present thing in the summer uh, here in the northeast, or, or where I'm from. Um, I would imagine being from Scotland, you're not too shy of fog as well, and <laughs> that fog is coming down thicker than ever. It is. It's getting very close to the borderline now here at the Nürburgring. In Scotland, we would call it a har coming off the sea that would uh, cover the, the landscape. And yes, it is. interestingly, it's actually the worst of the fog is on the Grand Prix circuit mm. where the number 301 Porsche Cayman has just had a little bit of a twirl. And of course, on the... I suppose, Joe, if there's anywhere where they're going to have bad fog, the Grand Prix circuit is certainly the best place to have it as opposed to on the Nordschleife. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think there's something in the regulations about whether or not the marshal's post can see one another. And I think as long as visibility is, is such that the marshal's post can see the next, and I'm not sure if that's still the same, what with you know modern communications. Um, but yeah, I mean, bizarrely, um, the Grand Prix, part, Grand Prix struck a part of this, of this course seems to be suffering the worst of the fog and certainly the worst of visibility. But like you say, if we're going to have fog anywhere, that's perhaps the, the best of a bad deal because you've got proper runoff areas and the like and a bit of room to make a mistake and a bit of room to have things come blasting at you out of the fog. Well, I, th I always think the the two-wheeled cousin of the Nürburgring Nordschleife, the Isle of Man TT mountain circuit, all 37.7 miles of it, is very similar to here. And I believe there, it, they have that Marshall Post to Marshall Post rule. Um, and that just gives you an impression of just how many marshals are required to give up their own time for us to go motor racing at all. And uh, we, we can never say uh, enough about the job of the Orange Army. At the moment, it's the pole setter, Nick Yellowley, the man from Solly Hull, uh, in the number one car. Of course, there's roller racing BMW M6 won the 2020 Nürburgring 24-hour in the lead at the moment, but uh, was us a pit stop at the moment, Joe? Yeah, it's, um, for me, at this stage of any 24-hour race, it's a kind of a... I call it a high-speed game of chess. You're just waiting for someone to make a move, uh, albeit at a very high speed. And, and you know, the, these drivers out there are not posting it at all. They are absolutely pushing to, you know, push without risk, I think was Lena Gates' favourite saying, uh, <laughs> or, or usual saying. And, and I think it's uh, a lot to be said about that. Um, I see Adam Christodoulou now at the wheel of the number four Mercedes. And I had the... Uh, I'm, I'm going to. I was going to say pleasure. I'm going to say honour to do the iRacing Nurburgring 24 hours with Adam in our team. And um, when you're not in the car, you can have a chat to one another. And I was just seeing how ridiculous the uh, visibility is in the dark on iRacing at the Nurburgring. And he and he and he astounded me when he said, "Oh, it's much worse in real life." I was like, "What? It can It could possibly be. Oh, it's much worse in real life." Into the pits. Right on one cue. of the Rover BMWs is that it's the leader indeed it's the number one Peter and he's in for what looks like a regular stop I'm just going to take a check on um, where we are state wise um, that'll be eight laps in the bag so that's on schedule isn't it right on cue yeah absolutely and I think you know there's going to be a handful of cars that are going to have a flawless run through this race and that is all that will do but I guess it's going to come down to who is going to be the most flawless, who is going to win out of that pack of cars. And this number one Rover Racing BMW is right in the hunt at this time, 18 hours and 22 minutes to go. And I'll tell you what, Joe, for this Rover team, they are on the crest of a wave, of course, winning the Nürburgring 24-hour with their M6, but then going on and winning Spa with their Porsche, um, joining the DTM this year, putting it on pole again in the N24, it's, it's all going very well for this company. Yeah, but, um, a, a very well put together team, aren't they? They've got the right people. They've they've grown. They've, it's kind of they they they've kind of from what I've seen when the team first appeared at this level, um, you know, they they were always there or thereabouts, and they've kind of it appears that they've grown organically and learnt from just being part of these huge events, and then they've started to win. They've learned how to win. 
and they, they, they're struggling to lose, aren't they, sometimes? I mean, last year was a very successful year for them. Um, like you said, this race and the Spa 24 hours in completely different machinery. Usually teams tend to be experts and kind of uh, become the, the, the go-to uh, team for information on a particular mark and, and sort of climb at the bed, for want of a better term, and, and form a good business relationship with a particular mark. But uh, Rover, it seems, um, all the marks like them because, you know, winning at Spa with the Porsche, uh, what car? They're in. They're going into DTM with the BMW, aren't they? they, they they're actually going into the, B, uh, the DTM. By the way, let, don't get me started on the DTM being a GT3 sports car uh, kind of yeah. category. <laughs> Better I, we leave I'm that really one. I'm struggling uh, with that. In the game. Or but, um, I believe they're going in with BMW, aren't they? And BMW took some talking round uh, into getting reinvolved with DTM, um, and they, they are. I mean, it shows how much trust BMW have in this outfit to. Uh, to put their reputation in the DTM, it's very important for the German manufacturers that series, isn't it? It is. It's kind of like the sprint alternative to the Nurburgring 24 Hour, actually, in terms yeah, of good. precedence and corporate um, corporate swagger, shall we say? Uh, domestic corporate swagger would be the way I would uh, describe it. But <laughs> but yeah, I do agree with you. It's, it is a strange one. But do you know what? If it, if it keeps the DTM alive, because it really was under threat, and if it keeps it alive, all all good in my book, that's for sure. Um, at the moment, we've got Hubert Haupt on board the number six Mercedes. Now, this is quite a unique story because Hubert is actually the team owner of HB, HP, eh, sorry, HRT Racing, and it's an all, it's a pro car. It's not a pro am car. And Hubert, one of the older drivers in the pro class, at uh, 52 years old, man from Munich. But he has driven some very cool stuff in his time. He actually drove in the Indy Lights Championship against greats like Greg Moore and James Weaver and also drove in the very early days of the Porsche Super Cup, but makes his, uh, makes his living in property development. But brilliant to see uh, what we would maybe refer to as a gentleman driver competing at the very top level. Yeah, and you, 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 I certainly, you mentioned that uh, stat, that information, on his career in one of the qualifying sessions. And I, and of course, you know, then it comes to you and you think, of course, of course, yeah, the, you know, he started in single seaters. He was looking towards uh, a single seater career, veered off from Formula One to, towards Indy cars. And, uh, and, and you know, the, there's a lot of, I think that just epitomizes the, the route that a lot of these young drivers have taken into sports car and endurance racing and, and sort of veered away from the single-seater route that just outpriced itself. Uh, and that, I think, Peter, is the reason why we've got such a quality of field, not just in this race, but pretty much in the majority of endurance racing series. The, 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 the quality of drivers is so high. It's, uh, and you, it's easy to forget that the, these, you know, people like you but how did start off on that ladder. Exactly, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I think it, it's interesting. We see it in the single-seater world and actually, funnily enough, seeing it in touring cars as well, certainly here in the UK, that it's quite difficult actually for drivers to be proper professionals. And uh, I always think professional means that someone's paying you. Um, and at the moment in this field, we've got a band of drivers from Mercedes, Audi, BMW, Audi and Porsche as well, who are all being paid a salary to, to race the cars. Now, at the moment out on circuit, we have a number of code 60 zones. We have nine of them. Most of those are for the fog, which is rolling into the Nürburgring Nordschleife at the moment. But Joe, I think this is superb from the organizers that in the areas where it's bad, code 60 but when it's yeah. when it's clear they can go on and race i think that's superb yeah it is it's good planning actually the thing is peter it's going to get worse when we lose light and yeah. you know yourself when you're driving in fog on the road you go you, you know you can't use your full beam for sure which is what these guys are using pretty much as a as a default setting on their yeah. headlights it's full beam the full beam, the, the, the beams of light just bounce back off the fog and it, it actually blinds you. That's why you have very low down fog lights on your road car. I think we're going to get into the realms of a, a possible red flag if this fog does increase and get thicker. Um, Darren Wood, still our um, collective meteorologist, and he's telling me there's no rain on the way. His satellite 
uh, scan has showed that there's no rain on the way. However, we have got this uh, temperature inversion, this uh, thermal inversion, creating the fog here. There's so much moisture in the air. It's hardly surprising that, you know, we've still got the ambient temperature relatively high. It's not exactly cold. And that's going to create fog. Again, not something we haven't seen before at all times of the year here. No, no, not at all. It's uh, interesting there. Hubert Haupt, he might be one of the older drivers in the uh, in the class, but uh, he just left Eduardo Liberati in the Porsche, the KCMG Porsche, for dead, uh, coming out of one of those Code 60 zones. And uh, it's almost like a, every time they get to the end of a Code 60, it's almost like a, a traffic light dash uh, when, when the, uh, the green light shows again. It, it's, it always reminds me of driving on a motorway and you've got the the um, the intelligent motorway system that slows everybody down to 50 and then 40 and then you get the all clear and everybody just accelerates off and it's like I, I sit I'm sh in my head I'm pretty much on the motorway going green 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 uh, and and set it off again with the uh, with all the traffic around me um, up to the speed limit of course of course we've well, got it in this country. <laughs> Germany, course, Germany I on, the, find... on the hand. Well, I have been known to get... I'm probably the only one of our team that have got the speed ticket in Germany. I mean, of all the places, you know, you've got the unlimited uh, roads, the autobahns and stuff, and Bradley got, got a ticket last year. Or was it the year before? It been the year before. Last, last year didn't exist, did it? Oh, oh so you, your um, um, like police long service that. sticker and the windscreen doesn't carry no, any doesn't weight in Germany. Me. doesn't work, mate. Neither, no, neither should it, you know? <laughs> no, no, you're right. You're right. Straightforward collar. Can't argue with <laughs> my... it. You can't, you can't reason with a camera, can you? No, no, that's true. I remember my, my, my uh, uh, dear late grandfather was uh, chief superintendent of Fife Police. And long after he'd retired, he had a Nissan Note, which had a, a gadget on it. It was one of the first cars that you could fold the mirrors in on the go with a touch of a button. And he got all of a sudden got very paranoid about having his wing mirror clipped off. And he kept folding them in. And my, my uncle, who's a class one instructor, said, you know, Dad, you're going to get booked doing that. Don't do it. And one day he did get pulled over. And they just sort of spotted the sticker on the windscreen. They said, "Have you?" And he, and and my, my grandfather, bless him, didn't want to bring it up, but he was just like, "Oh well, yeah, yes, I wasn't before many years ago." And I'm like, oh, "Okay, <laughs> right." And they just let him away with it, and no more. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, the brotherhood. <laughs> uh, he would have also gotten another five to ten miles an hour top top end speed, folding his mirrors back, of course. <laughs> the aero, uh, active yeah. aero. <laughs> Especially this on road, the aerodynamics of a brick. <laughs> well, it was it had some surprising pick up and go, considering it's like you say it's uh, a suboptimal aerodynamic properties <laughs> yeah. uh, in yeah. Ron speak. Um, it's it is still well, we can at the moment the fog really coming in hard now, and it's. Uh, I can give you an idea, Peter, of where the uh, the, the code sixties are. Um, they, they, so we, we come out of Flansgarten uh, down towards Schwa Schwalbenschwanz and we've got code 60s appearing all the way it's, it's, in, the low, it's in the low ground actually as the, as the track rises through Schwalbenschwanz and into the mini carousel the code 60 disappears for a very short time and as the, as the track then comes onto the Dottinger Hall we've got slow zone pretty much all the way down the Dottinger Hall straight um, the Grand Prix tracker looks pretty clear, and then my little tracker keeps zooming in. Then we've got further code sixties out towards um, again down down the hill, uh, Schwedenkreuz, down towards Arenberg. Uh, we've got, in fact, it's a code sixty from Flugplatz, further back round, so out of the out of the Hatzenbach and up to the Flugplatz, uh, the Flugplatz down through Schwedenkreuz. To Arenberg, we've got code sixties there. Um, the track from uh, the Ardnau Force through Metzgerfeld, all the way up to Bergberg, Carousel, Horacht, the highest point, uh, is fine. And even down through Brunchen is fine until we get back round to the Flansgarten, and then you know what? It's it's pretty slow, slow going. That's where the fog is. It's kind of to the to the east of the track, I would think, from uh, from what I can see here. 
So roughly speaking, about half the circuit, maybe even it's slightly more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but maybe a third, the, maybe a third, Peter. I would say. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's that's interesting that it's. Uh, of course, uh, under a code 60, 60 kph, that's pretty slow. So even in really bad fog, the drivers will be absolutely fine there. And then in the clear spots, they can still keep. I think it's really important. I think given, of course, last year we had a long red flag stoppage. I, I wonder, Joe, if the organisers are really keen to try and keep the race green as, as long as they possibly can. I, I think they will. I, I think they will, Peter. But then it gets to a point where, you, you know, safety has to come first. And, yeah. you know, they'll want to avoid any kind of criticism. Uh, and rather than wait for the incident to happen, you know, cause or effect, um, you know, the, the, the stewards, the organisers are very experienced in dealing with weather here at the Nürburgring and there will be a there'll be a threshold and I would imagine the threshold is one of visibility and and how far you can see and and just looking at it we're, we're probably going to be all right but I'm, I'm not sure where we're going to find ourselves when the sun goes down and the sun it's 20 past nine I think we've got before the sun fully disappears we've probably got about 90 minutes the sun's not really going to disappear out of the sky until around towards 11 p.m. in in, in this part of Germany. So we, we we might be all right up until that we start losing the light, so to speak. Well, we will certainly keep you up to date on it all. We hope you're enjoying coverage in sound and vision here on RS1, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels, and of course on line on radioshowlimited.co.uk uh, and also on the 24 hours official youtube screen we really and thank you for watching well at the moment it's the number four mercedes which has really been the car that's had the edge on the field since really since the green flag Luca stoltz starting off that car really opening up a lot of pace and Joe, what amazed me about the Mercedes particularly is that they were really scratching their heads on Thursday night and even Friday morning, a couple of seconds off the pace of the rivals from BMW, Audi and Porsche, but they came alive in the rain last night and during the race today, it looks to be, that at least in the hands of the number four car, running very strong. Yeah, um, and I, I did hear you mention balance of performance, but there's nothing been... There's no kind of balance of performance advantage being given to Mercedes to affect that. And it wasn't Adam Christodoulou who, who said that the last thing he wanted was actually to have a wet race. He was wanting a dry track. Um, and the, the, the opposite of that happened. The car became very, very competitive uh, lap time-wise when the inclement weather arrived. And yeah. whether they've had any tweaks with regards to setup, um, I'm not sure the Mercedes teams actually share set of data because they're competing with other Mercedes teams as much as anyone else. So it, it can't be as simple as somebody's found a sweet spot with regard in, regards to how the tyres have gotten, how they've got the tyres to work, uh, because it seems to be all of the Mercedes have kind of stepped up, am I right? They, they have, yeah, they certainly stepped up in the, in the really bad rain last night in qualifying. They, all, all of a sudden, like really surged to the front, and yeah, that could well be a, a, a setup issue. But it was in warm up this morning, great to see a lot of the Mercedes cars finding three or four seconds from their previous dry pace. But I guess that just comes from, from track time because really, there's there really is just no substitute for mileage in this place. Yeah, and the, the thing is, Peter, that the majority of these teams will kind of know this place like the back of their hand, they've been through the mm -hmm. qualification races. That it's not their first M24, the Mercedes teams that we're talking about. So they've got a, they've got an absolute vault of data uh, to, to, to kind of look back at and, and analyse and, and pretty much taking into consideration any kind of uh, issue with regards to weather, ambient temperature. They'll have a massive database. Uh, one of our BMWs into the pits, it's the number 100, and that's down the order if I... Uh, if I'm right, Peter, so that car not exactly in contention. Uh, mm. In fact, it's way down. I'm still scrolling, and I'm yet to that's find the Pro-Am. That's the the car that Henry Walkenhorst himself, team owner of Walkenhorst Motorsport, 
is in the crew for that car running on Yokohama tyres, one of the few cars in the field on Yokohama's. Um, Henry Walkenhorst, Dr. Friedrich von Bohlen, Jörg Breuer and Andres Zeigler. But most importantly, the car is still running. There's a lot of cars parked up for the night and probably, well, of course, the number 30 uh, for Cadelli Porsche parked up, it seems, for the night. And they're uh, probably enjoying a nice cold through right now, I would imagine. Yeah, that car, I'm not sure why that car's lost as much time as it has. It's six laps off the lead lap and one lap down off the car in front, which is uh, a car not in the same class. Um, so that the, the number 100 Breuer has gotten out of the car. I'm not sure who climbed in, but that's a car that's just going through the motions there. So a car not in contention. In fact, that car's dropped so far down, it's 60 second overall, so well out of contention now. And that's a shame because Volkenhorst, you know, we, we're talking about the Mercedes teams, Volkenhorst running that BMW, another team that's got a wealth of experience and data and knowledge about how to get the best out of that car in this particular race. Uh, and so that's, a, you know what, it's a damage limitation. The pressure's off. The drivers in that car can just enjoy the experience and just see where they pop out tomorrow afternoon. You never know. They might be back into, uh, into some kind of class contention. I think if you're a, a fan of endurance racing, or a, either as a, a fan or, or a competitor, I think the, 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 it's amazing how the personal goals fluctuate over the course of a race, depending how well or how badly it's going. But the spirit of endurance racing is never give up. And Henry Workenhorst and his boys, I'm sure, well, and girls, will be, uh, will be pushing hard. They, can be, they do have a crumb of comfort, though. The number 102 car, the sister car run by Walkenhorst Motorsport, that's the one in the Alpecin anti-balding caffeine shampoo. They do have the fastest lap of the race right now, the 8 minute 28.183. So any of the uh, follically challenged, like me, will be uh, have a little bit of a soft spot for that particular car. Yeah, that's you've adopted that car as your fan, the fan favourite, the, uh, the hair restorer car. If I would just refer to that as the hair restorer car. Um, again, you know, that, that that's uh, kind of confirmed the point that I, I perhaps have just made. The, the Volton Horse team there with the 102, current holders of the race fastest lap with an A28, like you said. And, Again, you know, very experienced team, know this place, uh, literally like the back of their hand. And uh, and for me, Peter, you mentioned there what endurance racing means. And, and for me, the, the primary objective of any endurance race is to finish the race. Mm -hmm. The secondary uh, priority is to have a great race and to actually be able to compete. But firstly, you've got to finish. So it's no good having a driver that is four seconds a lap quicker but he, he crashes after 10 laps that's not going to get you anywhere in June Street. no definitely not and I, I will say that here at the number 24 hour I personally believe this is the hardest endurance race in the world mm. to win and and also the hardest endurance race to finish both on driver and on the machine as well but you've got to think from from a marketing perspective now Joe there's so many different ways that, that companies can spend their marketing dollar and through the digital world there's so many very accurate measurable ways that they can spend their money but for me there is just no substitute for companies like Porsche they sell the 911 the Audi with their R8 BMW the range of uh, fast kind of executive cars the Mercedes AMG and so on <laughs> To say that if people say, oh, I don't know if I could buy a flash car like that, will it let me down? Well, I know these race cars are different, but to the, to the, the passing viewer, to get these cars to run non-stop for 24 hours around a place like this, what a way to prove, prove concept and prove your technology. Uh, and the old adage is, of course, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Mm. And as well as that, I mean, this, uh, didn't this, this race start out as a, as a proving ground? all the manufacturers um, and it's a way of testing technology under very hostile and in a very hostile environment and in a, in a competitive environment I, I think this race is very important certainly to the German manufacturers and I'm sure mm. the Italian manufacturers want to interject and kind of take some of that glory so yeah I mean it, it's a it's a big event it's 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 unique in the sense that the racetrack that it's on is so unique there, there isn't i mean there isn't anywhere you know we compare tracks 
to one another, you know, brands actually like a bit like Oakton Park and etc. But there's no way you can't see anywhere it's like like the Nurburgring. I mean, I know some people have said Cadwell Park in the UK is a little bit like the Nurburgring, but it's a tiny little bit like the Nurburgring, like it's got a steep hill. And then after that, <laughs> that's pretty much it, isn't it? Really, you know. It, absolutely, there is a good reason why that not only do the car manufacturers take their race cars here to put them to the test, of course the road cars are lapping around here all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, Lars Kern, who is in the crew for the 911 Manti car, it's uh, a Tayo Cairoli at the wheel of that car in fifth position at the moment, but Lars Kern, he's spending large amounts of time lapping this circuit in Cayennes, in Macans, Panameras, even the electric uh, Taycan as well and uh, you know it just shows you that how you know how much data they can get and for the the tire manufacturers also if you're you know someone like El Henry Walkenhorst you know he's got three cars in this race and he's got a big chain of BMW dealerships and clearly has some sort of business relationship with Yokohama and when he's got people coming into his dealership you can say well we use Yokohama and got us the fastest lap of the race. Absolutely you know you're gonna go to the dealer well i am and I, I don't know if i'm a good example actually because i'm a bit of a billy and a bit of an anorak so it was like um in fact in fact Heidoff bought a jag which i then bought off him and it had a twr jaguar sticker in it from the dealership so it was actually bought from one of tom walkinshaw's dealerships and that that gave that car much more credibility than a one that had been bought from I don't know, another local dealer or, or a, even a national dealer. You know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, credibility um, as, you know, Horton Horse are a BMW dealer and he's going to be able to absolutely milk the marketing. And it's a red flag. We've got a full course red flag. So I'm not sure that, well, I, I was about to say something which sounded ridiculous, Peter. That's got to be for visibility. I think it will be, yeah. So, red flag here at the Nürburgring. That means the drivers will come back into pit lane. They will go into park Fermi conditions and wait until conditions improve. Now, uh, for those listening on RS1, it is, there's about a half to a third of the, or to two thirds of the circuit covered in quite bad fog some parts are okay for our viewers you're, if you're watching or you're just joining us you might be thinking hmm, there's, there's parts that look absolutely fine but joe it just seems like a there's probably too much of the circuit now covered in fog but also the organizers probably know something we don't about what's on the way possibly perhaps and it just you know we, we've just speculated uh, only a few minutes ago haven't we peter about what was the threshold what is going to be the decision threshold uh, from the organisers, how you know, how there's got to be a criteria, and we've just crossed that threshold. And the you know, the the, 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 the organisers have, have made for me, I think the organisers have made a good call. We the, the sun's dropping in the sky, we're going to have reduced light. That, if anything, exa exacerbates the fog visibility issue. And I think you know, not an uncommon occurrence at the Nurburgring 24 hours basically down to geography the track is where it is and it's prone to creating fog um, but I, I've got to say I agree with the organizers because we were getting very very twitchy with regards to the closing speeds uh, adding reduced visibility uh, and the closing speeds of these cars we couldn't have had a full course code 60 not at the Nürburgring that, that would have been ridiculous so instead of doing that they pulled out the red flag and I think that that would have been what they say, wasting fuel <laughs> going yes, around yeah, yeah. with a, yeah, a so Code yeah. 60. Yeah, absolutely. That's not competitive conditions, so you might as well be parked up. Well, that is uh, at the moment 9.30 p.m. local time in Germany at the Nürburgring as Matteo Cairoli gets out of the Manti Porsche. A little scrape with the wall for Matteo, and uh, he'll be very, very glad to see that that uh, did not cause any further problems. So, um, other than that, Peter, we, we, there's your answer. The teams now know that they've got at least till 6am to find out what they're going to do next. So, 
They'll be working through their job list right now, the cars having just come off the track. The drivers can go away, they can go and grab something to eat and then get, you know, at least four or five hours sleep. Some of them even more because you only really need uh, your, your first two drivers back. So at least the teams, and that's why the organisers have done this. It's to, in, it's to give the teams a, a plan of action. They know exactly what they're doing, just rather than saying there'll be more information in one hour, there'll be more information in one hour. The, the people who run this race are very familiar with the uh, the weather patterns in the area, and hence that's why they've they've called it. And the next uh, the next decision will be made at 6 a.m. The, at the Nurburgring. Well, I think uh, a very wise decision indeed. I have to echo those uh, sentiments. Well, it's going to create one heck of a sprint to. Uh, uh, to the finish between the guy, the Mercedes number four, the number one Rover Racing BMW, the Porsches will be back in there as well. And if we have a dry running from the the, the green flag to the checkered, Joe, it's throw throw the cards up in the air and see where they fall again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and a, a, again, it's you know you you can only do so much now at this time. And we, you know, we, we will come back. And, and I think I think we've just made the decision that we're going to do the same, Peter. Uh, so I'll let you wrap up and uh, inform everybody when the next decision time, the next decision time from the organisers will be. So we'll, uh, we'll hopefully be able to give you some idea at, uh, in, in the very early hours of Sunday morning. Yeah, so we're, we're getting word that the earliest restart of the race will be 7 a.m. Nürburgring time. That's 6 a.m. here in the UK. We will get the next information at 6 a.m. Nürburgring time, 5 a.m. in the UK to see if we will get to restart at that point. So join us back tomorrow and we'll see you in the morning. We are a minute and a half from getting things underway for what is going to amount to probably around three hours to the checkered flag coming up to 20 minutes before noon in the Eiffel Mountains still foggy what are the conditions like out on the Nordschleife it's another one of these drives into unknown territory as far as that is concerned we're live across the Radio Show Limited network of audio and visual channels rsl underscore studio hashtag rsl n24 one minute the engines have fired the revs are rising i suspect there might be a little flutter even on the heart rates of some of these seasoned professionals as they get ready to go expect to see a lot of weaving around on the formation lap it will be single file behind the safety car for the full lap of the grand prix circuit and the nurburgring nordschleife 63 lamborghini is in the pit lane remember we've not been under uh, park fermi conditions so that car may well have been worked on overnight and it looks like it's back in if not ship ship condition for Hancock Triple F Racing Team certainly enough to get it back into the race it's still cold the engines are still cold there's condensation as the cars are ready to roll and taking you through to the start and for the next hour or so after that here on the Radio Show Limited Network of Channels Joe Bradley but first here's Bruce Jones well, it's just thanks very much, John. It's just fantastic to have cars rolling again. And if you just happen to uh, be checking in now, you go, good grief, it's still foggy. It's been foggy since before nightfall last night. But at last, the cars have been underway. The drivers, the cars have been out on the grid with their teams for over an hour. They've been 
jumping up and down, they've been talking to each other, they've just had all that nervous tension running through them. But now, going around on this formation lap, the Mies will have a three and a half hour sprint to the finish, hopefully uninterrupted. But the race start, Joe Bradley will be behind the safety car, single file. Well, we talk about this race being the toughest race in the world. Um, that's unarguable, especially when you consider the weather that we've had to, the adversity that we've had to uh, 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 go up against this year, Bruce. And right now the car's just peeling off and it will be down to the drivers to get those cars where they need them to be with regards to operating temperature. It's a hugely long lap here. Recalibrate your mind from a conventional two to three minute lap time. We are lapping in and around the nine minute mark here in most of the field. So plenty of time to get the tyres, the brakes, uh, up to those optimum temperatures. And uh, that's not going to be a problem, Bruce, by the time they come back into our view on the start-finish straight and get this race back underway. 24-hour sprint, not anymore. We're at that point where we would normally be with three and a half hours or so to go, Bruce, where it really is now. Now's the time to pull out all the stops. It really is going to be the sprint race. We may even see some different driving tactics because there's nothing to lose now. Uh, absolutely so. And the teams that were still on the lead lap but uh, were effectively right at the back of it, so almost 25 kilometres down, they've been shunted up onto the tail of the car that was ahead of them on the lap chart, but not necessarily on the track. So everything warming up, but notably, notably the drivers as well. I don't think it does drivers a lot of good to be standing out on the grid just thinking about what may be coming, trying to visualise the track most notably. However, visualisation is going to have to be a very, very strong feature for a lot of them because the fog is still incredibly thick, at least on the Grand Prix part of the circuit. The, the field is running line astern, more than 100 cars coming out to play for the final three and a half hours. And uh, as they still go around behind the safety car, lights flashing on the roof of the Audi's safety car, visibility as they come up to the Vidal chicane is poor, poor, poor. Muscle memory, we've talked about this, Joe. Drivers need to rely on that at times of the fog. They, they can gauge it, but it's quite hard to do that when you're running behind a safety car because, of course, that's at reduced speed. So it, it's really not letting the brain get up to where it needs to be the next time around. Well, we'll see how, how, how many laps it's going to be behind the safety car because uh, it may just be this one, but uh, with conditions as poor as they are in terms of visibility, they could yet call another lap or so. We, we talk about drivers getting into a rhythm, don't we? And it, it really is that. It's all about timing. And it's uh, you get into a flow, and obviously behind the safety car, that we're nowhere near getting to that flow. Once we get underway and we get this race started, I think the drivers, their nerves will settle. If you're, not getting, if you're not nervous at this part of any motor race, then what's the point in doing it? There really isn't. It's got to give you a thrill. It's got to give you that that buzz. And there's no doubt about it in those cockpits. Uh, those drivers will be buzzing, just trying to calm themselves down and, and get on with the job. And certainly the pros standing around the grid, Bruce, they're, they're, they're well honed. Their protocols and the processes and the idiosyncrasies and the superstitions all come into play of, you know, putting on the left boot before the right or getting into the, the car with the, you know, the, the right leg or the left leg first or whatever it may be. All of that now is filtering away as we continue on this warm-up lap uh, and get ready to restart. And we, we get a bit of a, uh, a, a visible indication for ourselves as to just how tricky it's going to be out there for the drivers. And uh, once again, you know, the, the Nürburgring is such a challenge and it's been an even bigger challenge this year, I think, with the delay. Absolutely so. In fact, the way, the way I liken the drivers as they stand on the grid, they're like people, those of us remember the days standing outside the exam hall, outward sort of bonhomie and laughter, yeah. but inside thinking, what is lying ahead? Good news is actually out on the, away from the Grand Prix loop as the cars go out onto the rest of the circuit, in parts the visibility is better, famously with the start finish line being at one of the highest points in the track. That is where the fog is worse. But no sooner have I said that than as the cars are running around the early stages of the lap. They can't pass hats and back. The visibility then drops away again. It is not good. So any driver with many years of experience, and there's some here with decades of experience on the Nordschleife, they're going to have to call in all of that to keep their focus super, super sharp. But we've had many, many hours of delay because of the fog that fell just before nightfall last night. And then 
after an accident, uh, the problem of getting a, heli a medivac helicopter uh, became insurmountable. That's why we've had all these del delays, these hours of delay. But right now, the good news is the track is dry, if not warm, but visibility is still what you'd say at the poor end of the scale. Yeah, it's uh, some of the parts of the track that we can see, our camera positions are really high up, so it's we're, we're looking at the track through the fog, so it's not a real indication of what the drivers can see. Uh, what I can tell you, Bruce, we've got some information as to who our starting drivers are, so I'll give it a quick rundown of the top 10. Um, the number one car leading the field round behind the safety car, the Rover Racing BMW, now has Philip Eng installed in that. Uh, second place, the number four Mercedes, the HRT Mercedes, as uh, Maro Engel now taking over that car. Um, Steph Dusseldorf, uh, Dusseldorf is in the number 20 in third place, that's the Schubert BMW. And then Beretta is in the number 11 in fourth place in the Phoenix Racing Audi, that's car 11. In fifth place, uh, Tom Cech is now at the wheel of the second of our Rover BMWs. Uh, that's car 98 and then the Porsche of uh, the Manti 911 numbered car in sixth as uh, superstar Kevin Estre in the in the uh, taking the start or the restart I should say. McAvecki, Fred McAvecki in the Frickadelli car in uh, seventh place that's car 31. Eighth place the number 29 Audi from the Land team has uh, Christopher Meese at the wheel of that one. Ninth is the number seven Marciello at the wheel of the Mercedes from Get Speed car seven and they're running off the top ten at the restart is uh, car number eight with Schiller at the wheel of the second of the get speed mercs well it's like a who's who of the top gt drivers in the world it really and, is. Uh, for a lot of them joe this opening lap or when they get released and can really start racing is going to be their chance to gain a position or two so just look for the light the real charges in there the kevin estrus who did it yesterday worked his way from outside the top 10 up to the very sharp end of the field he's sure to be trying to make a move or two in the 911 grello liveried mantha manti racing porsche and also raffaele marcello starting three positions further back in one of the two uh, pink white and blue bwt liveried mercedes his from team gets the he's car number seven look out for those who in particular but the person with the biggest fun in his face ought to be mark it uh, ought to be uh, philip eng starting the number one bmw from pole position but maro engel will be asking those initial questions of him he's starting second the number four hrt mercedes and uh, it's going to be what they can do according to what they can see i feel I think all bets are off, Bruce, trying to pick a winner out of this lot uh, at any stage of the Nürburgring 24 hours. It's, for me, I'm, I'm not quite sure how we're going to see these drivers approach it. It's not like we're getting towards, you know, three hours to go in and we've run for a full 24 hours because by then the cars are tired, you, you've got little vibrations that are developing, you're hearing noises uh, coming from the car, you have hopefully kept off these uh, some of the curbs at the Nürburgring you just steer well away from um, we've got pretty fresh cars um, they've already done five and a half hours or so of racing before we uh, went to the red flag and so they're, they're pretty fresh to start with they've had a, a, a bit of a wipe down and a bit of a service as well so we really have got a hundred percent machinery under under our backsides out there on this track so it really is it's going to be it's I think we've got a three hour, 10 lapper ahead of us, if that makes sense. Yeah, I get what you're saying there, Joe. And I, I, th I think the simple point is the fact not only the car's fresh, I mean, the team's fresh is going, why did we bring so many tyres? Honestly, just haven't been getting through <laughs> them this year. But of course, the drivers are fresh and the most important, the drivers are nose to tail. So it's, it is effectively a restart of this race. Yes, we've got the order dictated by how they finished when the race was red flagged uh, last night, but uh, a chance for those to atone for either driver areas, work their way forward, or for the fact that they picked when the track was changing conditions, got the wrong sort of tyres, and we saw some crews going out doing as few as a couple of laps, then having to come back in and change to a different sort of rubber that was going to prove effective at the track at that time, but it was a changeable beast and it will ever, ever be so. Well, the field Bruce are already through Bergwerk, Bergwerk and already making their, their way through those flat out sweeps of Kesselschen uh, and on towards Kostetal, heading towards the, up towards the, uh, starting to climb up towards the Carousel and Horak, the highest point of this track. And I've got to say, visibility 
from the in-car cameras on the live stream showing uh, to be all you know pretty perfect almost no fog at all that might change as we ride an altitude on this track way to Keshelshin now just heading towards Kostatal this part of the track absolutely flat chat in a, in a well handling GT3 car and it's not until you go through that uh, tricky left hander where you maybe just feather off maybe even a downshift for some of the, the other classes through the left hander across the tile but it's one of those corners where it's so easy to lose time by just being a little bit too tentative you don't see that in the uh, the, the pro drivers in the GT3 field though they are absolutely on it all the way through there already beginning to rise though Bruce towards the carousel now heading down towards the uh, the right hand that leads to that uh, that curving hillside where we see the textbook racing line just going from left to the right hand side of the curb as the the entry to the carousel kind of twists and turns doesn't it yeah and it's no, no surprise that that massive bank just up beyond the right hand that turns the track up towards the uh, the carousel just the most fantastic vantage point it's one of the best places to see the cars really really working but what i noticed is the cars you talked about the visibility not being too bad through kesselsham but crossital starting to rise up the carousel you're suddenly going up into the sort of clouds that no doubt are still hanging around on the start finish trade but the lower parts of the circuits and the parts of the track that run with the trees close to the side necessarily have unfortunately have better visibility but it then starts to fall away again the visibility as they go towards her act again, her, there's a bit of a clue. High point on the circuit, uh, they'll drop away again and the visibility will improve, but it really is going to be changing uh, a corner to corner, but I don't think the weather's going to change anytime soon. It's had all these hours to do so, there's been no wind to blow it away, the temperature hasn't risen, so I think this fog will be with us at pretty much the duration. Three and a half, half hours of racing, hopefully uninterrupted. I think, somewhat come up may, Joe, I think the first lap is going to be absolute fireworks. Oh, Bruce, I'm, I'm, can, can we just clarify that the gaps between the cars have, will be zeroed as they cross the line? It's not going to be uh, the gaps. We're not going to carry those gaps that we uh, that remained at the red flag. Uh, I'm led to believe that it is as we see it. It's now basically a, a race for position as we go green when we come by. Um, so, yeah, fireworks indeed. I mean... Just look at those names, you know, uh, Maro Engel uh, with Kevin Estrich down in sixth, Maro Engel in seventh, second. You, you can't uh, you can't rule out any of those drivers in the top, what, top 20? Um, it's going to be phenomenal. And, I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone will be sensible. It's still an endurance race. It's still over three hours. So there's, you know, still anything can happen. And, uh, you know, sometimes discretion being the better part of valour, uh, dis I think the mindset has got to be disregard that it's a 24-hour race that's been reduced to this. This is now a three-hour motor race, and we're going to address it as that. And we're going to, it's a complete re refresh. It is entirely, and we heard just a, a recorded interview with Klaus Bachler. He, he was grilled by John Heindorf, and he said it is just a sprint. But this is even more so, this is a 24-hour sprint. It's almost a brand new race, three and a half hours to the flag. Some of the best practitioners of GT3 racing in the world. And don't forget, even through the pandemic, the Guinness Championship running worldwide. These drives have clocked up an awful lot of air miles and the very best new race pretty much every weekend. These cars aren't a mystery, but for now, what is a mystery is the track. Track is dry, visibility is still poor, but it's way, way better than it was. So the field, just if it's the first time watching or listening uh, to the Nurburgring 24, the, the cars will start in three groupings, and we still have more than 100 cars coming out to play, about 110 cars out to play this morning. But it's not play, this is cut and thrust motor racing. Yeah. I'm right on the balls of my feet already in the country box, just thinking about what lies ahead, and hopefully we'll see enough to call it, Joe. Field into the Schwalbenschwanz area, which is getting towards the latter stages of this uh, warm-up lap. Um, we've got uh, through Schwalbenschwanz towards the Kleiner Carousel, and then we'll be making our way onto the Dottinger Hall. Under control conditions still, though, Bruce, and we can see the fog increases as we uh, as the track rises in altitude we've <coughs> pardon me we've already gone through the highest point of this track at at Hoa Acht, and the fog was perhaps i thought at its very thickest from 
what I could tell from the onboards. Um, the field door, Bruce, out onto the, just about to come out onto the Dottinger Hoare now. And so we should be seeing them really starting to up the game. They've got the tyre temperatures up to where they want them. The brake temperatures are there. They, no doubt the engine temps gearbox oil temperature is where we need them to be. So we're about to go racing. We're not far away from that green flag, Bruce. Yeah, and one thing I keep looking for, Joe, is how easily can they see the marshals' posts, which don't forget are an extra set of eyes for them. Of course, marshals worldwide wear bright orange overalls because it helps them stand out. You can see them. Not quite so easy to see all of their flags. I was seeing a white flag being being waved, as you can understand, slow-moving vehicles. They're all slow-moving vehicles They're behind the safety car uh, for this restart that should start that, um, at the top to of be... the hour. The white flag does rather disappear in, in, the, in the gloom. It does, but from what I can gather, Bruce, the, the, the reason why we've got a flag wave is so that the, uh, the, the drivers can see and sight and, and get a location on where they need to be looking for the flag. So we, we do have flag waving on a, a warm-up lap like this uh, for that very reason. It's just a reminder, it's a bit of an aid memoir to the drivers. And as we are probably halfway down from my estimation halfway down the Dottinger Hall uh, routes will be starting the, the heart rates will be rising will be a little bit of a, a heart flutter with the adrenaline beginning to flow we're about to go racing and it'll be on to the Grand Prix Strecker for the first time at this restart very very soon and just to reiterate the point you made a short while ago the clocks have been zero the gaps have been zero between the cars they can be nose to tail and of course the first car to the start finish line has to be the rover racing number one bmw that's taking this restart from the front of the queue having been at the head of the queue uh, when it's the flag the red flag was uh, waved last night because of poor visibility no overtaking until well you can overtake within a meter the start finish line if you so choose but you have the car in second place the number four mercedes Mario engel has to keep his nose behind as does everybody else no overtaking before the start finish line so up and down the pit lane nervous tension the tapping of fingers in the garage for a lot of the drivers they've done a lot of the hard yards before the red flag last night they don't want it to be thrown away with the first lap fumble fumble but uh, that first corner turn one always inviting for an overtaking move joe and we've just had clarified a minimum of two laps during the race for drivers to be classified. So um, I'm pretty sure that that's going to be tricky with some of the four driver teams. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking that is for the this restart, a three hour section. So a minimum of, of two laps for the drivers to be signed. Um, and just some little thoughts, lovely little comment from Michael Hedrington on, on the Twitter feed at RSL N24. The Datsia is only 10 laps down, it could yet win this, but of course, <laughs> we laugh. It's the slowest car in the field, and 10 laps here equates to 250 kilometers, but it's still going, the spirit of the event. But right now, the Audi safety car, lights still flashing on the roof, turns left for the final time of this lap. Just waiting to see, accelerating down the start to the straight. The lights go out, the visibility is very poor indeed. But for Philip Eng, he's waiting for the start, waiting, waiting, waiting. Now he's for the throttle, won't be overtaken before the start finish line. Hugs the pit wall side because he can see that more easily. And in behind, we've got some possible overtaking, including the 98 sister car. Looks like Martin Tomczyk may be gaining position as they dive down. But it's so hard to see the drivers, but I tell you what, overtaking already, Joe. Yeah, I'm not sure whether the stewards will pounce on that, but already into turn one. And uh, it, it looked a little bit messy. It looks more. It looks much more frantic from our viewpoint than it ever does from uh, one of the driver's seats but it's Philip Eng who led across the line we've got uh, cars almost three wide into the left and right heading down towards the Dunlop curve now leader pulling away and the number 11 there of Beretta getting losing a little bit of time there as he went wide that's allowed Estra sorry not Estra Makaveki in the Riccadelli car has come alongside and get the line into Dunlop and he's made that place change. So the number 31 ahead of the 11 Audi now, the 31 Riccadelli Porsche that is. Yeah, and uh, hands up, this is the quiz. Who's made an overtaking manoeuvre? Kevin Estra, of course. He also went <laughs> past Michele Beretta. So, but Estra started in sixth, he's up to fifth. And for the Phoenix number 11 Audi losing ground. But up front, it was a real, real switch. Uh, where the track goes from turn one, immediately cuts left to turn two, and uh, 
maintain the lead. Philip Eng had to be right across the nose as he was challenged, but uh, resisted the efforts of Maro Engel. No sense. No, no, let's not talk about the weather. It seems a little brighter up above, so hopefully, just hopefully, the fog will go. But right now, these drivers are racing, not blind, but the next closest thing. Yeah, still got thick fog as we're already off the Grand Prix Strecker and onto the Nordschleife into the Hattenbach part of the Nordschleife, the first part of the Green Hell, as it's affectionately referred to. And it's very much the lead of the race, very much the property of Philip Eng in the Rover Racing BMW. Um, we, we talk about races not being won on the first lap, but you can do yourself a lot of favours in getting up as many places as you can. The cars are bunched together. You can make places before the field gets strung out. Then it becomes a real effort to overtake. And when the, you've got to make those moves, you've got to pounce, you've got to take advantage of drivers ahead of you who are perhaps a little bit more cautious than you can be. However, at this level, groups, nobody's that cautious. Everybody is absolutely on it. No, it's a special rule. Anyone with the first three letters of their surname starting ENG, they should pull clear of the opposition. <laughs> so, Philip Eng from pole position, Maro Engel doing just that. Steph Dusseldorf in third place, about a second back. He's got a bit of a gap. Then come Tomczyk, Estra, Machiavelli, Beretta, Marcello, Mies, and completing the top ten, Fabian Schiller in the second of the team gets speed Mercedes. And still, there is overtaken down the pack. Neil Verhagen making up a place or two for the BMW junior team. You're quite right. You've got to make those moves around the Grand Prix loop as soon as you turn left start heading towards hats and back then that's the point at which overtaking becomes oh so much harder but the good news is the track drops away down the incline the visibility is certainly getting better in the lower reaches of the circuit you know what bruce we talk about the nurburgring nordschleife has been a very tight and twisty track it might be tight it, it, it's relatively twisty but it's very high speed the twists are very high speed and there's very little speed variation in the corners it's not like you've got a massive uh, a braking area where you can kind of park the car and turn. All the corners flow to one another, and hence that's why it makes overtaking on the Nordschleife so much more difficult. Uh, second group across the line and restart there at Nürburgring 24 hours of sea. I, I like the way you say, I see. It's immensely hard to see, but we can hear them coming yeah. past. The lights are on, we can pick them out, and certainly some of the TCR Hyundai's for a pair of them right at the front, but uh, any swivel from the top of the pit building to look down to towards turn one, you lose the cars even before they get there. That's just an indication of how thick the fog is. Headlights fully ablaze, that quick flick, turn sharp right through turn one, then immediately cut left, not using all of the Mercedes arena, and then continue all the way down to the bottom of the hill to the Dunlop Kecher, the hairpin at the bottom, and then back up. And of course, when you go through the Vidal chicane, up a little bit further, then hard left, hard left again over that bridge and then down onto the Nordschleife and off you go. And Luca Engstler in the second position in the TCR class as far as my memory serves me. Just looking down the order, they were in and around the... In fact, I'm going to have to take a little while to find them. They were down the order, but that, that TCR battle, they're not too far apart. The two Hyundai battling it out. It's a team battle, inter-team battle there for TCR honours. And we've got a pit visitor straight off the back of the restart with a driver change uh, taking effect. Um, that, that's without completing a, a, a race lap there at the restart. Well, an unusual one, changing the, the mm. wheels, changing the tyres as well. Fantastic battle on track. It's for fifth and sixth places. It's Kevin Estra being carried very hard by the Frickadelli Porsche with uh, Fred Machiavelli. And in turn, Kevin Estra trying his utmost to hang on to the second of the Rover Racing BMW. Martin Tomczyk at the wheel of that. But the first three cars in third place, Steph Dusseldorf pulling clear. And pulling clear of all of them. Maro Engel in second. He's four tenths of a second down on the race leader in that number one Mercedes uh, BMW from Rover Racing. Philip Eng holding on the Austrian leading this race. And for those behind, just trying to hang on, get a toe. Raffaele Marcello now all over the tail of Michele Beretta. Beretta started fourth, is in seventh. That could become eighth before the end of this flying lap. They're already out of the carousel and heading towards the... It's the part of the track that arguably everybody says that's where the lap time lies. It's through Whipperman into Brunchen and then out of the Brunchen area. It's a sequence of corners that are really challenging. And it's, you, it's not just where you can make up time, but it's certainly where you can lose time. And it's all about keeping that momentum. So easy to lose. All you need to do, 
too wide on on a curb, get onto the slippery uh, slippery bits of grass, and the outer curbing uh, bears no grip whatsoever, and it's very very tricky, but uh, not that tricky where we got we have this very high standard of GT driver making short work. They're already into the Flansgarten. And Bruce, the sight of these cars just coming through the flans garden, through the fog, headlights ablaze. I'm hoping that these drivers haven't got the similar sort of visibility that we have. It's very hard to uh, to pick out the cars in these foggy conditions. Yeah, but I think you came up with a very good point, Joe, that um, the camera positions are up high, so there's a degree of fog we're looking through, some positions higher than others. But down at track level, as long as the driver's close to the car ahead, they can see them. What I did spot, you were talking about these top drivers making mistakes. I think Nico Muller in the number two car collection Audi slightly cut, clumped a curb. Car came back across the track and in behind Neil Verhagen, the BMW junior team racer, had to check his momentum. Otherwise, he might have flattered him up the back. So again, the mistake, not necessarily because of the fog, it was probably simply the cars were running so close and perhaps hit the curb on one side of the track and it can fire you the other way. But a good avoidance by Neil Verhagen yet. Bottom end of the top 20, down in 18th place, but uh, nearly collected someone else's problem, whichever has been an issue at the Nürburgring. Leading group onto the Dottinger and this is where the slipstream comes into play. We may see some movement in the order. I'm not seeing any at the moment, as it's line astern through the Merck, heading down the fastest part of the circuit towards the Tiergarten, and we'll be threading the needle as we go into Tiergarten. Verhagen, very, very racy indeed, right onto the till, pulling out before the kink. He's just behind the number two of the Audi Sport Team car collection, Audi R8. But he has to slot back in as they come into, it really is threading a needle, off the Dottinger Hoor, into the Tier Garden, through the sweeps of that section of track, and out onto the start finish screen. This is a good spot. One of the cars in that group into the pits will clarify who that is but this is a braking area into turn one you've got to follow the car through to your garden and then get yourself in a position where you can out -break. and it has indeed been the leaders who've done just that Bruce well in fact what we've got it's, it's still end from angle but in behind we've had a change Kevin Esch has gone past Martin Tomczyk has Tomczyk got it back no Tomczyk is now the meat in the sandwich is Estra in now in fourth place, Makovici in sixth, and between them is Tomczyk in his BMWs. So that was a, a move made down into turn one. And the car that came in was a KCMG Porsche. You could just about through the fog. It's going on to slick tyres. Didn't really see what everyone was starting on, but a decision, Josh Burden brought that in. He was uh, well placed at the restart, but uh, that's obviously going to drop him right down through the pack. Well, there's an indication of track conditions, Bruce. Their first lap out on the restart, and Philip Eng in the Rover Racing BMW, the leader, of course, being the first car across the line, has posted the fastest lap of this race so far. We're down to an 8 minute 20.2. Philip, uh, 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 Maro Engel wasn't that far behind with an 8 minute 20.7. So that's just shown me that track conditions are possibly the best we've seen since this race started yesterday. Let's just, let's just focus the mind. The fact that in, in qualifying, I know conditions were all quite mixed, but uh, any time under 8 minutes uh, 17 was considered a good lap. 8 minutes 15, super special, but 8 minutes 20 when you could see very, very little. That says a lot in all sorts of ways. <laughs> and so, let's to... have it. It's Eng from Engel. That's the number one BMW from the number four Mercedes, just as they... Uh, started this restart. Steph Dusseldorp in third, Kevin Estra up to fourth in the Manti Racing Porsche, Rover Racing, Martin Chopchik fifth, and Fred Machiavelli, Frickadelli Porsche in sixth place. Just noticed there the number 22, the, the Ferrari of the DWM, the WTM team. Uh, they're running with Phoenix Racing here this weekend. Uh, George Weiss, Indy Donchi, uh, Jochen Krumbach and Daniel Kelvitz at the uh, down to drive that car. That car in the pits and looking like it's sorting up a pit stop time. I mentioned, Bruce, that the pit stop times will be taking on uh, from yesterday's stint when we went to the red flag. It'll be classed as one long stint and it was taking on fuel there. Uh, the tyres had already gone on, so um, I, I, I would have thought under park firming condition, uh, without any park permit conditions, the cars could have been refueled for the restart. So I'm, I'm, 
I'm a little bit bemused why the 22 was taking on more fuel, unless it was just topping up. Yes, and also in the pits, Jan Erich Sluten finally out of the number five Phoenix racing Audi. Uh, worth pointing out, it often gets lost in this that SP9, the top class, which is FIA GT3 type cars, also has a Pro Am class. And um, Jan Erich Sluten running in that, you know, way short of experience compared to his own teammates, Max Hoffer, Vincent Cole, and Dennis Marshall. But um, climbing out, maybe. Maybe that was a preordained tactic, he would take the restart, but I'd have thought the least experienced driver probably didn't want to be doing the restart in all that mist. Anyhow, finally out of the number five Phoenix Racing Audi, so the best Phoenix Racing Audi in the race, just uh, looking across the teammates. Michele Beretta started in fourth, got monstered on the Grand Prix loop on the opening lap, he's down in seventh place. He's right under the rear wing of Fred Machiavici. We were right, Bruce, it's a three and a half hour, ten lapper. We're seeing the cars not taking out any kind of cushion so everybody in this whole field is pretty much on high alert hanging onto the car in front being aware of where your competitor is behind you just keeping an eye a wary eye in the mirrors but as long the thing about the Nordschleifer is as long as you can keep momentum it's very very hard to pass there's the there's very few heavy braking areas certainly on the uh, the 24 hour configuration one of the greatest passing places into turn one. It's a really heavy braking area and uh, it, it certainly rewards a bit of bravery. We saw Kevin Estra there just taking advantage of a of absolutely last of the late breakers there to, uh, to move ahead of the BMW. And as we continue on, it's going to be that kind of opportunity we're going to see this whole field looking for just again constantly looking at any cam cameras i can see camera angles again the, the visibility still far far better at the lower parts of the circuit but it does appear to be improving but the number drivers are still really making a few mistakes i've been talking about this neil verhagen battle number 77 bmw junior team uh, entry with the number two audi and nico muller when they got to Tiergarten on the last lap with out of line, he was on the left-hand side of the track kinked to the left beforehand. He clouted a curb and got, I would say, all four wheels off the ground before he came back down and still kept it in front for Hagen, but very, very spectacular. And I'm sure over the next few days, all sorts of onboard footage will be uh, landing, uh, you know, for you to be looking at. And some of the moments are just extraordinary. And it really, really focuses the mind as to just how good these drivers are. And I think the GT3 car, is the classic car for the circuit at the moment. I think their performance great. You've got all the manufacturer variety and with balanced performance, we've got a great mix of cars at the top end. We haven't debated whether the uh, these GT3 cars are too fast and indeed too wide for the Nordschleifer. We'll leave that. We haven't got time to even to, to even talk about that this year, Bruce. Um, thanks to the collective, Jake Parrott and, and Brody have just reminded me that the new regulation, of course, during the red flag, there was a limit of only 20 litres allowed to be added during that red flag period. Uh, we talk about um, the, there's no park permit, so we can pretty much do uh, anything we want to with regards to repairing the cars, but only 20 litres of fuel being allowed. So if you were down on fuel and you factored in uh, a very early pit stop at the restart, which a few cars we've seen done that, Bruce, um, the reason why they're putting fuel in is because they've already been able to replenish 20 litres during the, uh, the uh, delay. Okay, that's a good answer. Just um, the Dacia Logan has already been lapped and the speed differential as race leader Mauro, uh, sorry, Philip Eng and Mauro Engel flash by is astonishing. That in its own will be up as onboard footage for people to look at. The Dacia keeping out of the way as well as it possibly could, but um, <laughs> certainly very, very eye-opening as uh, Lachmeyer hangs on, corners us to the best of his ability in that little Dacia Logan, but uh, really quite scary as the cars flash past. And he he's, hasn't got one or two coming past, he's got 30 coming past in the space of a, literally about a dozen corners. No improvement I see, Bruce, with regards to the fog in the high places on the track um, up at four um, I'm, being, I'm being argued with as to what the highest part of the track is by uh, another good friend of the collective, Darren Wood, who reckons that the highest point of the track is where the Grand Prix Strecker goes out onto the Nordschleifer. The, it's, the whole rack is 617 metres above sea level and the left-hand turn onto the 
towards the North Schleife and towards the hat and back. I said 628 metres. Darren takes our nerd award for the weekend, I think, at that. So, um, but getting back to what I was saying, still quite foggy in the high on the high ground. Uh, a lot better visibility for our drivers, though, Bruce. And from drivers' level, I think enough visibility that we can have a very clean race. We're seeing some great racing here with some very... We've already seen and discussed how good the track condition is. Seeing the fastest laps we've seen so far since the race began yesterday afternoon. So perfect, really. And there's another fastest lap down to an 8 minutes 12 for Schubert Motorsports BMW car 20, currently third. An 8 minute 12 there, quickest lap we've seen all day. Um, uh, that pretty much puts it up the quickest all weekend. Yeah. So the drivers are getting into the swing. The track, as I said, though they can't see as much as they'd like, the track is dry, it's constant, and uh, that's a big, big help. Also for Steph Dusseldorf, he's running slightly on his own in third place, one and a half seconds down on those ahead. Ah, the Frickadelli number 31, the remaining Frickadelli car, the sister car, had all the problems yesterday, which accounted, unfortunately, for Earl Bamba, Matt Campbell, Mathieu Jaminet, and Nick Tandy. Tandy, the only one of those who's got a win in this event before. Won't be getting it this year because that was parked up last night. So his win from 2018 will have to stand. The number six, the very luridly liveried Palace-sponsored Mercedes from the Hout Racing team in the pit lane as well. So the front runners continue on their way, but quite a few of the others were porting into the pits. It was the 31, uh, Frickadelli Racing Porter, the number six Hout Racing Team, Mercedes, the Wolfen Horse BMW, that's Kuba Gimmasiak coming in, Neil Verhagen, who was so feisty, trying to overtake around the outside at uh, Schweden Kreutz to make it work, but uh, gets a medal for trying. And Yelma Berman, the number 40 10 key Racing Team Mercedes, also calling into the pit after that second la flying lap of the circuit. First and second, 1.8 seconds. Visibility still poor. Classic battle at the front. It's a great overtaking coming from the land Audi as it works its way up the order with uh, the smiling assassin Christopher Meese at the wheel. It's going to be a really tough one to call, Bruce, while we are in this, the first of our pit stop callers. Um, it's going to rely on us back counting uh, or counting back towards the end of this race with regards to how the pit stop phases flip flop between the runners very much at the front of this field, though. The Rover Racing BMW being chased by Maro Engel in the number four, out into the gloom, and then the other BMW M6 of Schubert, Dusseldorf at the wheel in third, Kevin Estra moving up the fourth. We thought he would make a move, and he has. He has indeed. And it's whether or not that number four, we spoke to Adam Christodoulou last night, and he was very confident that they have the pace to actually win this race, but a team that's going to try and stop that is of course the BMW that he's chasing down yeah and chasing down red. but actually it's sort of it's, it's ebbing and flowing a little a lap a short while ago the rover racing number one m6 was in 1.6 seconds clear now it's one second flat but traffic can start to have a little role to play in this and uh, certainly as they come across the slower production class cards the like of Raffaele Marcello are definitely looking uh, to see if they can gain places. Often that's the moment, as you said, so hard on the Nordschleife to overtake between similar cars, but uh, with one of the cars in the group losing momentum for maybe just not having guessed the right way to get around a back marker, that is the opportunity these top drives are looking for. And it's a great battle for those uh, sixth, seventh and eighth. Marcello chasing down the two Audis at Beretta and Mace just ahead of him as we head back to the pits and see that the number 31, the Frickadelli Porsche, just coming to the final stages of its pit stop. The tyres going on to that Porsche at the very last moment there, coming out of the blankets right at the very end of the pit stop. No need to have the car sitting on the jacks with the brand new tyres, uh, just losing that heat, watching the heat leave the, uh, the those tyres that have gone on the They'll not be up to optimum, but it's a better start having them just out of the blankets when you go back onto the track, for sure. Yeah, absolutely so, Joe. And you were commenting last night that if you do that on a wet track when it's not very warm, all the tyre blankets' best efforts get reduced into next to nothing within the space of no time at all. And certainly yesterday evening, the Grand Prix circuit was just so, so super wet. The rest of the track, not so bad, but boom, 
There goes your tyre temperature. And a lovely little tweet from Martin here. He says, I kind of want to buy a Dacia Logan and drive it in a tourist <laughs> tourist fart. Is this how marketing works? <laughs> All the money, a multi-million dollar budget, and then you can get someone driving a Dacia Logan. It pulls your heartstrings. Yeah, it, it is actually how marketing works. And, uh, you know, up at the front of the field, you know, BMW and Mercedes and Audi and everyone else showcasing their technology in their what is effectively their supercar range isn't it you know the Audi R8 the BMW M6 and the Mercedes AMG GT3 you don't see many of them on the road but uh, the ones you do the technology that's gone into these cars do uh, does cascade down over the whole range of Audi and Mercedes and Porsche and the BMW range so very much so but I'm, I'm still not tempted into getting involved in one of those K Dacia things I'm, I'm really not Bruce uh, it hasn't worked for me either there we go <laughs> wow near near contact the battle for sixth place Raffaele Marcello all over the tail of Michele Breccia and it has led to contact the rear body work of the Audi mm. got tagged there because the Audi had to back up going past I think it's a Toyota GT 86 the yellow car with the green red and blue stars on the side oh and Beretta all over the place yeah. probably got a puncture. puncture now he's been hit by Marcello because he slowed down went or he certainly went sideways and off so left rear puncture round it went really unfortunate neither driver to blame in that I would suggest yeah it's one of those things I'm surprised it took so long for an incident like that to happen and it's you know we're, we're driving absolutely on the limit with only you know matters of centimetres and uh, between the cars and it was just a little bit unfortunate there I, I was going to say that tyre is not going to last very long and it was I was proved to be uh, completely right on that one it didn't last any time at all the bodywork that was pushed onto the rear left tyre of that Audi pretty much scything its way through the tyre and causing a puncture um, we've got a slow zone out where that incident occurred and that's just after the carousel up towards Horact and I'm not sure if the Audi is into the barrier. It uh, was clipped by the Marcello Mercedes. And you know what, Bruce, the, 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 the runoff there is so tight. I'll be amazed if that Audi did not connect to the barrier. Code 60, no longer a slow zone. And the Audi, oh, everyone else behind. Don't forget, behind Marcello, there's another train of cars. They got through. The Audi of Beretta was already pitching sideways because that puncture at the point that was the tap from Marcello, I would think. But um, unfortunately, it's the Royal Autom Automotive Club San Beat, Toyota GT86. It's just ran out of anywhere to go and the others behind were so tight. Oh, one of the pointing the wrong way is one of the, it's the number 33 Thomas Prining driven Falcon Motorsport Porsche. That's got to get going again. The young Austrian shares that the Klaus Backler, Dirk Werner, Lance David Arnold. I think he was caught up just after going past the the spun Beretta Audi. But uh, again, it could have been another car going through the carousel. Of course, the carousel was the point at which the contact was made. Oh, no, sorry, he's slightly further around the lap. I beg your pardon. Just spun coming out of the corner all on his own. Oh, well. Was that the Kleiner carousel where that... It that, was the Kleiner yes, carousel. Yes, it was the Kleiner carousel. Car completely gets disturbed there. And if you just happen to be on the power at the wrong time so easy to do and that's what we saw Thomas Prinning doing exactly that um, other information coming through that a penalty has been given to the number 11 for uh, a, 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 tr a flag infringement and that's the number four Mercedes off track from second place so and he's pushed up the tyre barrier the, the was it all on his own under pressure well, lost it long before Ooh. the corner, cut across the grass with the Opal Manta, the Foxtail Manta, that then slid into it at the exit of the corner before getting out of the way. But uh, so suddenly in the space of half a lap, it's all happening. Yeah, that's unfortunate. And the Manta there that got involved somehow, I'm not quite sure how that car got involved, but uh, heavy impact on the left front corner of the Manta. I'll be amazed if the suspension of the uh, steering hasn't took a hit there on the uh, on the Manta. The Manta's already made its way to the track. I think that's occurred at the Tear Garden, uh, Bruce. Uh, uh, that's kind of confirmed by the speedy access to the pits that the Manta has been able to uh, to get onto. 
there's the we're just seeing a bit of a replay now just trying to try to clarify exactly what happened to the number four mercedes brutes now still uh it's still unfathomable what caused that mercedes to go off and hit that barrier so heavily he's uh he's hit the barrier uh with quite a whack but it, the, the incident started way back the car it was happened. already on the grass when he came into our view yeah what we couldn't tell was i mean that the banter sort of came into view first but traveling at far greater speed as you would imagine was Mauro engel and, and to me that was probably my favorite to win this race adam christopher Duke, Mauro engel manuel metzger and the odd one out lucas stoltz who's driven brilliantly he hasn't won this race but it goes to prove as good as the chase was as he pursued uh Philippe Eng, who was leading by a second, unfortunately just got caught, caught out. And for those behind Kevin Estra, Martin Tomczyk, Christopher Mies, they all move up. But it just goes to show when you get in among the back markers, you have to hope that everybody sticks to their line. And at certain points, you, you make a move maybe around the outside. And really, the word is ouch. I'm sure, driver will be fine. But uh, unfortunately for Team HRT, one of their two shots has now been fired. So no, no surprise. A code 60 zone at that final sequence of corners between Marshall Post 202 and 204. I've got to say, Bruce, doesn't come as any surprise that we're seeing this kind of incident with Pat Martins. There's such an urgency now. Time's running out. Time is running out to keep the pace up. You don't want to lose. Uh, you know, if we start 18 hours to go, there might have been a little bit of discretion or a little bit more discretion in overtaking that back marker. However, with just just over three, we're only two minutes uh, over the three out to go mark. Um, so, you know, there, there is a, a, a massive urgency uh, about the body language of these drivers as they make their way through the, the back markers and the other classes in this race. And in fact, Joe, um, message <laughs> always insult to injury department, non respect to flag signals, time penalty, one minute 32 to car number 11. That's Michele Beretta's now battered. Audi, the one that was clattered up the back, so race control had seen something they didn't like, so unfortunately for them, already held back by the, the damage to that car and uh, penalty to go with it, and that was certainly removed them from contention. But up front, suddenly Philippe Eng enjoying the race, instead of having just a one second advantage over Mara Engel, he's chased by another driver whose surname starts with E, Kevin Estra now, nine and a half seconds behind. So at last, Eng can concentrate as the visibility does begin to improve around the circuit. Let's not forget, though, Bruce, I'm just going to have a check on where they are with regards to their fuel stint. And Estra four laps into his. The number one Rover racing car. Not quite sure that that data is correct, so I'm going to bail out of that. But uh, we'll keep an eye on that gap. They've got nine and a half seconds between the leading BMW and Kevin Estra. And that is the, and that's the number four, Mauro Engel. Looking like he's gotten out of the number four Mercedes. Still off track, still into the barrier. He's chosen not to continue. And that is a big shame. I, I was hoping that number four Mercedes that we uh, spoke about earlier in that uh, in the incident the most recent incident was able to get back to the pits but uh, apparently not so a big enough hit for Maro Engel he's standing up he's walking to the medical team now so these cars may be fast Bruce but they're also built very robustly with driver safety being the primary aspect of the engineering of them I would think yeah, and he went in clean sideways in, into the tyre wall, having crossed the grass, effectively straight lined that, that final sequence of corners. So, out of the reckoning. Uh, with the cars scrambling in and out of the pits, the Schubert Mercedes, the Schubert BMW came in from what had been third place, left Dusseldorf. Uh, and uh, now we've had changes from both the Get Speed Mercedes as well. Danny Junkadella has taken over the number seven. Uh, from Raffaele Marcello and the sister car number eight also came in at the end of the last lap and has been handed over from Mathieu Vassivier to to young Fabian Schiller. Visibility is still dreadful. We've got three hours to go in the race, uh, but the driver is really starting to stretch their legs at the front of the field. It's pretty tight on the restart, but uh, supremely controlled under pressure from Mauro Engel, but Philippe Eng kept the nose of his BMW in front for Rover Racing and is now sitting on a 10.8 second advantage over the charging Kevin Estra. 
That for me, Bruce, is the battle of the race. Estra chasing down Philip Eng in the BMW. It's, a PM it's developed into a BMW Porsche battle now. We've lost the Mercedes, the number four Mercedes that was very much looking on target to be there at the very end. However, as can happen so very quickly at this track, in this multi-class race, which we love so much, it's, uh, it's never over until it's over. And we can continue to just monitor that gap. The gap is out to 10.8 seconds as we go through and getting towards the end of the Nordschleife, up towards and out of the Kleiner Carousel. We're getting towards that sweeping right-hander that brings us onto the whole rack. It'll be quick work for Philip Eng to get past the, the slow class cars ahead of him on the whole rack straight. And yeah, and I, I would expect, I've got one I want to throw into the mix for you, Joe. Look out for the Land Motorsport, Land, Audi Sport Team Land Audi. Christopher Meese on board. How's this for a lineup? All four of them winners. Christopher Meese, Rene Rath, Kelvin van der Linde, and Fred Verveeg. Meese driving at the moment. He's picked his way forward, forward, forward from eighth place. Yes, some of the drivers were pitted, but this is a car that was pitted at the end of the formation lap, at the start of the race yesterday afternoon. It gets wrongly on tyres, and it's fighting its way back, and it was outside the top 20, then outside the top 10. Now it's up in fourth place. Yes, the cars are all in a pitting sequence, you know what, you really want to do your pit stops now because with the slow zones at the final sequence of corners where number four Mercedes is still on terra firma, about to be uh, lifted onto a flatbed and taken away, this is the time you can maximise if you dive into the pits. I think we may still, I've got to double check, have a, a code 60 zone at the exit uh, just after the, no, it's cleared up, just after the carousel where Beretta's um, Audi went off after its puncture. Well, I'm believing, Bruce, that we are due a pit stop from the number one, the leading BMW, who didn't have that much fuel on board. We've lost one of the main protagonists in the form of the number four, and the fan favourite that was involved in that, the Opel Manta. March Yellow just receiving a penalty for that contact that caused the demise of the number 11 Audi. And we were speculating and Twitter certainly lit up with regards to whether or not Marcello should be getting a penalty. That's transpired in the race stewards and officials agreeing with pretty much everybody. A little bit unfortunate, I thought, on him, but it's one of the it's one of the parts of the game that you uh, you have to really be on top of your game to avoid contact with the car when you're running so closely. It can easily happen. Absolutely so, and I. I whether it was that contact or when the Beretta car already with that left rear puncture then was getting out of shape and there was further contact, but I suggest probably the former, because the latter, it was uh, the car wasn't really in his control anymore as he tried to turn right, but with the left rear puncture, the natural dynamics of your car take you on into the barriers. Still waiting with the flatbed at the final sequence of corners, waiting for Maro Engel stricken, number four, Bill Steen, Mercedes, one of the cars easy to pick out in the fall, bright custard yellow with the blue flashes on it. But the race leader in the, has been running very comfortably at the front field, Philip Eng, and he was the one that Engel was hunting down when that little slip up occurred. The Beretta car has made it back to the pit lane. It's having uh, well, just a fresh set of tyres, the bodywork pattered, but actually not too bad. I thought that was more of a thump it received. Yeah, just bodywork that was damaged, and they've removed that section of bodywork that was uh, impeding the tyre. They've just removed that new tyre on, and the number 11 Audi back into the fray. Um, also into the pits, you, you mentioned there, the 911 number Porsche 911 of Manti, Kevin Estra at the wheel into the pits, along with Tom Check and the 98 BMW into the pits. Um, I'm just wondering, Bruce, when the number one's going to pierce its dues, and we will see both the number one leading BMW along with that Land Audi that you mentioned, Christopher Meese, uh, getting towards pit stop time as well. And it's until we kind of phase out of this, this sequence of pit stops that we get a look at and see just who is back into contention. Pick a winner, not really, I'm not a betting man, and it's hard to pick a winner out of the top 12. 
if not the top 20. Oh, I think you, come on, Joe, top 12. But uh, don't forget, we've got other drivers coming back into contention, the like of Josh Burden, who was uh, one of the very early pit stoppers after the restart of this race. He's now back up into ninth place and climbing the KCMG Porsche. And uh, But what we have seen is the confidence for full slick tyre running. The visibility may be poor, but the track conditions are very good indeed. Except, of course, if you start running up onto the kerbs, which after you've had a lot of fog overnight, will still retain the damp that can make all the difference between carrying on and being carried off. So Gap that's between the egg and Nice. 18 seconds, Joe. So uh, Nice, yes, of course, has been gaining ground. Sorry, cut across your nose there. Yeah, sorry, Bruce. Just uh, about to mention that the Monte car about to uh, resume. I'm not, I didn't see whether we had a change of driver there. We'll not be able to check that one out until they click out onto the track from the pit stop. Kevin Estra still showing at the wheel of that car and nothing changing on my timing screen we'll see i'm not sure did you notice that we we, we went to that in the pit we went to that uh manti pit stop when the I don't driver think... had been tried it is it's christmas, christmas now with the wheel so that okay has... what i wanted to pick out was the fact that uh, one team that gained a lot of ground in that pit stop sequence was uh Rutronic racing and uh, the driver stayed on board that's Lawrence van tour on the silver porsche and he's got right on the tail of the Manti car, and yet he was some distance back beforehand. So uh, certainly the Rutronic crew uh, proving their worth. But actually, as they then proceed, and he's jumped the second of the Rover Racing BMWs. So he's uh, got his nose in front of uh, Shelton van der Linde in that. So that's good for Van Tour, not so good for van der Linde. But as soon as he got back on the track, Christensen has just taken off. He went down into turn one with the Rutronic Porsche all over his tail, and, and now Christensen has uh, rocketed clear. And I think he's got past one of the other BMWs as well, which, uh, no, hold on, maybe that's out of sync. It looked more like uh, the new Verhagen car, which should be behind him, but certainly S uh, Christensen doing exactly what Estra would have wanted him to do. Don't forget this car just seems always to be walked towards the front end of this field. And when Joe is deciding between the top 20, this is definitely one you can consider, Joe. No, no gambling there. Uh, absolutely, Bruce. And with that slow zone still out at the Tate Garden, while we clear up the number four Mercedes, that fastest lap of the race still stands. Steph Dusseldorf in the Schubert BMW still standing. That car down to 11th as we cycle through the pit stop phases, still at uh, 8 minutes 12. That's not going to, we're not going to see any improvement on that fastest lap of the race until we see a perfectly clear track. And, uh, progress report on that uh, car being recovered is that the car is now on the flatbed and uh, will very soon be uh, will very soon be seeing that slow zone removed I would have thought now one big problem if you're running in one of the slower classes is when you've got a, a group of cars coming out of the fog behind you and they can catch you out and the Bonk Motorsport TCR Cupra just had to shortcut the circuit as <laughs> The Rutronic Porsche and the second of the Rover Racing BMWs came through and almost collected them as he rejoined. So I've said it before, and again, it's worth reiterating moments. Small moments can become large ones, but fortunately, that didn't prove to be the case. Very early coming out of the hats and backs, but a good evasion there by the Bonk Motorsport uh, Cupra, but it could have been a whole lot worse. Well done, all involved. It, it could have been, and uh, Dries Van Tour in the Rutronic Porsche and Kelvin van der Linde in the Rover BMW there, they, they're very much in contention. That's a battle for fifth and sixth places. So that would have been a bit of a tragedy if they had gotten uh, uh, tripped over the uh, the Cupra running in the TCR class, but uh, if, uh, avoiding action, a bit extreme, almost put himself out of the race, Bruce, just stopped that car before it contacted the barrier on the outside. So well done him. Yes, but it could be one of those occasions when in trying to help out, you actually make things a whole lot worse. But well done to Alexander Prince, the 171 Bolt Motorsport driver there. He, he avoided a problem, although it nearly became a far, far bigger one. So let's just take a look at the times at the top. Still waiting for that, that pit stop from the number one Rover Racing BMW. But all those behind that have pitted are almost nose to tail. He's sitting on that advantage of nearly 19 seconds over Christopher Meese. Both of us at pit stop. Up into third place, the number 23 Porsche from Hoover Motorsport. But Michael Christensen leading the next train of cars, the ones that have made their pit stops. But plenty of action to enjoy. But Christensen, the Dane, really earning his keep at the moment. Running in fourth and charging. 
pit stop strategy coming into play, I would think, and we're already speculating, Bruce, that whether or not some of the teams are going to reduce their stint length to seven laps. And just to remind everybody that the stint length designates and gives you a minimum pit stop time. So a seven lap stint will give you a 169 second minimum pit stop. If you stretch the stint to eight laps, you've got to sit in the pits for 190 seconds and so on and so forth, nine laps, 213. So the question is for the pit wall strategists, staying out longer doesn't necessarily give you any advantage for stretching your fuel mileage because of that pit stop time that you have to, uh, that you're obligated to, to stay in the pits for. And, uh, and so it just, it just adds uh, exquisite complication to the strategy of this race. And talking to pit stops, the leader is into the pits, the number one BMW on pit road. Yeah, had to make that slow approach through the final sequence of corners. Still the number four Mercedes, the car that had been chasing Eng, having to be cleared. Let's try and take a look, Joe. Did it look as though the windscreen on Eng's car was cracked, or has he had just a huge piece of rubber whack its way up uh, just in front of the driver's face? Can't see from one particular angle, but riding on board, it certainly seemed to be a great glitch across the screen, but the mechanic cleaning it now, maybe it was just uh, some rubber that fired up and bounced off the screen. Not what you need in the fog. Not at all, and I'm not sure we're going to see a driver change there. Plenty of time, of course, and whether or not we're going to see a driver change for the number one BMW there. Didn't seem to be much activity in getting the driver out. In complete contrast, we've got the Land Audi into the pits now. And I'm just trying to see... Kelvin van der Linde climbing in. So Christopher Meese getting out. Sliding. Yeah, Who'd Van der Linde, the taller in? South African in. Of course, they reverse the roles. One straps the other one in. And uh, certainly this Land Motorsport car is looking very, very strong. Worked its way into contention. And uh, of course, the team won this event four years ago. Conor de Felipe, Christopher Meese, remember that name. Kelvin van der Linde, remember that name. And Marcus Finkel, hot, hot. Been there, seen it, done it. So just waiting for the last of the the crews to come in. The Huber Motorsport Porsche continues on its way though, so it's going for one further lap. They've obviously done their sums accordingly and uh, have worked out the different time, time intervals. Just had a place lost out at the back of the circuit. The two BWT Mercedes running nose to tail, caught the Dacia Logan, and for them, suddenly they were jumped by the number six Mercedes. So a uh, great run there from Patrick Assenheimer, splitting those two rivals. Yeah, Again, really you make your moment really took advantage of it so the six moves ahead of the seven and he's in between the seven and eight now he's in between the two pink bwt mercedes there seven and eight of the uh tim get speed he split them up and he's if anything assenheimer right now looking very racy indeed as klaus backler in the 44 gets involved as well so that's a four car battle for 12th 13th 14th and 15th now developing out there yeah, it's all good stuff. They will all shuffle up when those uh, those that haven't pitted do so. They move up about three more positions, I think, but super, super close between the Mercedes, but not one of the Mercedes running at the sharp end of the field. That's interesting. Suddenly came good in qualifying. And in fact, when the track got wet at various points through practice and qualifying, the Mercedes seemed to come back into the mix. But when the track's dry, they just don't seem to have the wheels under them particularly. So, Marco Seafried, veteran racer, leading the way, but he is out of kills, so his pit stop will come at the end of this lap. He's still got about 20 kilometres to do to the end of this lap, while all his drivers in the SP9 class have made their stops. He's on, necessarily a, before. he's on a six lap stint at the moment, Bruce, so this will be his seventh lap. Again, it depends on whether they're going to stretch it to eight laps, um, so we'll keep an eye on the number 23. I don't think it's going to make a difference to how the number one cycles back in, how the number one and the 29 indeed, the BMW and the Audi on pit lane at the same time, first and second place, is the, are the positions of those two cars when they came in to take the pit stop. That's allowed the Hoover Motorsport Porsche into the lead. However, that's going to change, isn't it? Uh, yes, in the most certainly, it certainly will. But of course, uh, coming in after the same number of laps, the Audi, the Land Motorsport Audi, and the number one Rover Racing BMW will have to serve a pit stop of a 
an identical time because of the number of hats. But the Dolly Jacks are going under the number one BMW. It's about to be pushed back into the garage. This could be a sudden tumble. Yes, the nose is being swung round, so maybe there is a windscreen that needs repair. As, as it happens, the number nine Audi gets underway and the BMW number one, the race leader since the restart, is going nowhere. Yeah, I thought, Bruce, that they were just sh shuffling the car around to a 45 degree angle to ease the access out of the out of the pit area. Um, he's dropping down the order massively, the number one, down to 11th already. And no sign of that car, from what I can gather from the timing screen, no sign of that car getting out onto the track at the moment. I'm just wondering if Eng had stayed on board because he knew there was a bit of a problem that he had been nursing even though he was leaving the race and he thought it was best that he would continue but until we get a camera down the pit lane we can't tell you what's happening but we can tell you according to the time screen the Oswald race leader is uh, now down in 15th place and falling so Rover Racing's help uh, hopes are in the hands of the sister car so what looks so good with them running first and fourth it's now in the hands of Shelton van der Linde in third overall. Right, the number one BMW back down on deck, off the Dolly Jacks. Engine on. Is it about to leave the pit lane? But it's fallen outside the top 20. Disaster now, is, for last year's this, winners. This is what Adam Christodoulou was telling us about, Bruce. This is the car that took on the, um, on the pit, that pitted just before the red flag. And I'm just going to get uh, Adam's information back up. Um, you, you, you basically, we expected this, it's going to, this is effectively a 16 lap stint for the number one, which means that it would have had to have taken, uh, soaked up 353 seconds. Ah, got and it. that's why we're seeing that car remaining static on the pit lane. It's to do with when it pitted just before the red flag. And now we're seeing the car being released back into the race. But I've got to say, Bruce, that car, has fallen way down the order as it resumes, down to 19th place, would you believe? Okay, so it was pain they knew was coming. Of course, I, I uh, conveniently glossed over where it was in the pit sequence last night, but they've got that one out of the way. But that car has shown good pace all weekend, but you don't fall to 19th and go charging back to the front of the field. Still waiting for Marco C3 to pit the number 23 Huber Motorsport Porsche from the lead and that should put Michael Christensen who was so quick the, the second he left the pit lane in the Manti Racing Porsche he will move into the lead of the race he's five seconds clear of Sheldon, Sheldon van der Linde so 98 BMW gives hope at least for the Rover Racing team after their previous leader the number one car gets underway around the Grand Prix loop but has fallen right down the order then Rootronic Racing in fourth place which will become third that's Lawrence Van Tour Josh Burden who was one of the very first top front runners to pits for KCMG in his Porsche, he will move from fifth to fourth. Race has been turned on its head, hasn't it, Bruce? We, we were talking and speculating about the battle between the number one uh, BMW and the number four Mercedes. We talked about Adam Christodoulou from the number four Mercedes. He's, he was the he was the one who I got that information from, and he was, he was beside himself thinking he'd been disadvantaged. This race is completely on its head because now we've got the number one dropping out of contention, dropping down almost out of the outside of the top 20, just inside in 19th as it resumed. The number four, a retirement. And now we're going to be talking about a battle between the 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 23 leads. The number 911 Manti Porsche is in second. Uh, the 98 BMW, the number three Retronic Porsche in fourth. And then we've got the KCMG Porsche 911 uh, car in in fifth so you know it, it it's still impossible to call where this is going i mean i think it's always always a feature of these variable length pit stops that are, are controlled and managed they can confuse a race the teams know there they've got one person they've got one person who looks after the weather and probably someone else who's in charge of just knowing exactly how many seconds your pit stop will be all right a little dive into the pit lane the Foxtel Manta, the one that's had the clash with the car that was running second with Mauro Engel, that final sequence of corners at Tiergarten. Front left uh, suspension being repaired. Bodywork in surprisingly good nick, so maybe well, clearly in that accident something went wrong. I saw that happen, but, uh, The fan favourite will be back. Yeah, I saw that happen, Bruce. The Manta slid into the, into the Mercedes and pretty much the only point of that Manta, that contact with the Mercedes, was that right 
uh, that, sorry, that left front wheel, it literally just hit there. It, the bodywork is perfect. So the contact has been directly onto that front wheel. And that's why I speculated that car is going to be very lucky not to get away with, without any kind of suspension issues. And sure enough, that's the, the team there still working on it. So it, it's been delayed, but it, it'll not stop them getting the car back out and taking the flag. We've seen that done so many times with that Opel Manor. It's great to see that car still going around here. In uh, Every year it, it comes out. The Foxdale Manor, a fan favourite. Firmly so, I was saying through the course of qualifying, uh, Joe, that I quite like a few other cars like Sierra Cosmos to come out and play in the, oh. uh, you know, a, 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 the period M3s that were so, so strong here, winning this event so many times you know, as, as we went uh, from the late 80s, from 1989, when Piro, Ravalia and Jihua won through. In fact, M3s run won all the way through until 1997. We've got the number 11 Audi in trouble all over again. Don't forget, this is one Michele Beretta was uh, clouted up the back when they caught the Turo to GT86 by Raffaele Marcello. Got the puncture, had the repairs, came back in, and Beretta has spun. Well, it looks so like he's on his own, but the car is now stationary in the middle of the track, waved yellow flags for everybody else uh, coming through, but it looks so like he hasn't got any drive in that at the moment. So uh, trouble all around for the Phoenix Audi team. Just coming out of the... Kleiner Carousel just up at the Schwalbenschwanz section of the track. I'm hoping he will get that car back underway. Uh, we've got some good news, though. We saw Mauro Engel uh, walk out uh, from the number four Mercedes and, and was uh, taken to the, center, the medical centre by the medical team. Good news. He's been checked and he's fine. He's been released. So that's uh, great news. No problems for Mario Engel there, other than that number four Mercedes being out of the race, of course. So the Huber Motorsports uh, Porsche, Marco Seyfried brought it in, the green, green blue helmet, marks that him out of the car, strapping in one of his teammates. I'll tell you who it is when they leave the pits, but it's the choice of Philip Neufer, Stefan Oist or Nico, sorry, Stefan Aust or Nico Mentor to take over the 23 Porsche. That's running the Pro-Am class at the best 9 so the race leader is Michael Christensen, the Manti Racing Porsche, blasting towards the end of another lap on his advantage over the chasing Sheldon van der Linde. Rover Racing number 98 BMW is five seconds. He's going to take that lead. No question in my mind about that. He's already into the kink on the dotting a horse straight into the slow zone, which remains there. Still repairing the barrier. That's where the number four Mercedes went off, of course. That car being recovered um, a while ago, but still barrier repairs going on there. It was a big hit from the Mercedes. You don't have a small hit at the Tear Garden, that's for sure. It's a very, very fast section of this track. And Michael Christensen just having to slow down to what feels like walking pace, having been flat out. And this is the battle for the lead that we're looking at right now. The number 23 remains on the pit lane. Just soaking up its pit stop time as Christensen comes by. Now he's released with a green flag out of that slow zone. And down across the line, he will pass the 23 Porsche that sits on the pit lane right now. Just to driver's right, Christensen taking the lead. And the Manti Racing strategy coming to the fore with that... 911 numbered Porsche now taking the lead. Worth pointing out, Joe, that at the, at the restart, the one by one restart line astern, uh, the 23 Hoover Porsche started 20th, so didn't expect it to be coming back out in the lead anyway, but they running a long, long pit stop by pitting later than the vast majority of their rivals. So it's just a case of sitting still, waiting till the stopwatch. Uh, ticks its way around to the appointed hour, literally, and then they can get going. Yeah, we're still waiting. Feels like an eternity there, sat there. He's dropping down the field. The, the 23 is dropping down the field like a stone. Of course, the cars all bunched together because uh, not, we wouldn't normally see the cars being so close to one another on the road with uh, this amount of time to go. Coming up to two and a half hours remaining in this race. And of course, that's because of the long delay and the restart we got this uh, massive bunch of cars and that's why we're seeing cars pit and then just literally plummeting down that timing screen like a stone and as the 23 Porsche 
resumes the Hoover Motorsport car already down to 10th place overall as it resumes and gets on with its race. In fact, that's dropping still down to 12th there, Bruce, as it uh, gets back on track. Yeah, but it's still been a good run. And don't forget, of course, that's going for Pro-Am honours. It's not going for outright victory. If that comes their way, they'll be more than happy and more than a little surprised. But really, the top guns showing why they are the top guns. Michael Christensen now 7.6 seconds to the good over Sheldon van der Linde. So it's Porsche from BMW, another Porsche. Hello, we've heard this name before, Vantor, and it's the, the Lawrence variety. And he's really, really going very well indeed for Brutronic in third place. He's just 2.3 seconds down on Sheldon van der Linde's BMW. And there's another Porsche in fourth place, Josh Burden. He's another, well, he's 11 seconds further back. But he's got company from Neil Verhagen, who didn't get out of the pit, uh, the driver change. There was no driver change for the BMW junior team. And he's been one of the real stars of this restarted race. And Verhagen in fifth and catching all the time. Number two, Audi there, showing smoke coming from one of the wheel archers. Um, that car currently in sixth place. So very much in contention, the Audi Sport Team car collection with, uh, I think it's Nico Muller at the wheel. I'm not sure whether that car has had it coming together. As we stay with the Audi story, this time it's the number 11 though. And the number 11 Audi that we saw just spinning out of the Kleiner carousel has made its way back to the pits and the team go to work. It's into the pit garage, it's off the apron and more work going on on that left rear. Um, it was the, sorry, the right rear is where the work is going on. It was the left rear that the problem with the bodywork cutting the tyre. Um, in fact, you know what, Bruce, that's, that's a tension pretty much across the whole of the rear of that car. Uh, engine cover off, mid-engine car, remember, and we've got crew members, mechanics on the left rear, on the right rear, rear, and across the engine bay. So I'm not sure whether that is, a, you know what, considering that was a spin, that might be a gearbox issue. Well, you know what, I was impressed with how fast they turned it around at the first pit stop after, after the puncture and the contact with the barriers there. As you said, they removed the rear bodywork but perhaps not enough checking or they just didn't guess and maybe some of the initial damage then reared its head because I didn't really see, we didn't see the incident, we saw the Beretta had spun, but uh, whether it was an assist or was it a technical failure, we cannot tell. Right, just looking at the order and uh, just looking for other people, we've talked about that number two Audi, don't forget that was a car that was um, jumping over the curves under pressure from Neil Verhagen, the young American, Nico Muller at the wheel of the car collection, most sport car. And again, damage doesn't always reveal itself immediately. There could have been damage um, incurred in those incidents that was then built upon points of weakness being established. But uh, suddenly for the Audi teams, it's, it's going the wrong way, with the exception, I would suggest, of Kelvin van der Linde. Two van der Linders in the race, both on the track at the same time. The Land Motorsport car is uh, getting Closer and closer to the tail of Nico Muller. Muller sick for Audi Sport Team car collection, but the Audi Sport Team land entry with uh, Kelvin van der Linde will soon be in the top six, I'm sure of that. So it really is heating up, isn't it, Bruce? It's, uh, we thought it was going to be a three and a half hour thriller, and it's certainly shaping up to be just that. Um, like I said, though, race turned on its head. The two early protagonists now seemingly out of contention one of them indeed uh, retire and now it's all about Manti racing and the other rover racing bmw was the number one last year's winning team that was very much in command of this race the sister car now has taken up the gauntlet and is only just under eight seconds behind the leading porsche of Manti car 911 well, the clock has a habit of ticking on, and it's certainly not the friend of that number one entry. Down in 19th place with uh, just two and a half hours remaining in the race. And the person really struggling, as I just mentioned a while ago, is, is um, Nico Muller, the number two Audi, has now been passed by Kelvin van der Linde and dropped in the next one going onto the tail as Muller limps around the circuit with the Schubert Motorsport BMW, Steph Dusseldorf. He's the one doing the catching now for Muller. It's a real odyssey of pain in so many ways. It's a car just isn't performing beneath him, clearly something wrong. So one Audi going forwards, that's uh, Kelvin van der Linde up into sixth place. Nico Muller is going horribly wrong for him. Thank you, Bruce. We're at the top of the hour and it's an odd hour update uh, for us. So that means we 
are going to have a look at some of the class leaders. Um, we start with the alternative fuels class, and that is car 320. It's in 51st place overall, and it's the four motors by your concept Porsche that leads the alternative fuels, the AT class. SP10 is the next of the classes on my list. That's car 70, the Hofer Racing by Bonk Motorsport BMW M4 GT4 leading SP10. They're currently 29th overall. SP8 is uh, the class leader there, is the G GT Tire Motorsport Audi R8. They're in 56th place overall. That's car 53. Uh, the SP3T class as sees the Max Cruise Racing Volkswagen Golf, uh, the Golf GTI TCR to be exact, that's car 10, and that car is in 40th place overall. Uh, the V6 class is the Team Matto Racing Porsche Cayman, that's car 132, and that is in 68th spot overall. V5, V5, where are you on my list? It's way down the order, 107th place for the number 142 uh, rent to drive familiar racing Porsche Cayman and that car is in 107th like I said the V2T class is further up the order in fact I have to scroll down a bit to find the V2T and V2T is the FK Performance BMW 330i they're 58th overall good run for the V2T class category car 159 is who we're talking about and then the final uh, class in our odd hour update is the cup five runners and cup five is in the first of the cup five runners is in 69th spot overall and that's car number 242 the adrenaline motorsport bmw m2 and that rounds up our class our odd numbered uh or sorry, odd hour class rundown we'll be going to other classes just to give you an idea of who's who's leading overall at the top of the hour it's car 991 the manti racing porsche 911 with christensen at the way leading in second place with a gap of just under eight seconds right on eight seconds let's uh, not be pedantic is the uh, rover racing bmw car 98 and in third place uh, all these cars sb9 of course and the overall third place car number three the electronic racing porsche and it's uh, Lauren Van Tour uh, at the wheel of that car currently in third place. So as we continue, um, I'd like to welcome back Peter Mackay. Peter, and I know you haven't been able to drag yourself away from this race, but your thoughts, having just witnessed the restart after that long delay, it's, uh, in my view, I I'm not gonna, it's impossible to call but who's, gonna, who's gonna be there at the end. Well, thank you, Joe. It's 1 p.m. Uh, local time at the Nürburgring. We've got two hours and 26 minutes to go, just under the distance of a normal IMSA sprint race. And yes, I don't think we're a great deal clearer. I mean, what has amazed me, I, I, I really echo your sentiment um, from commentary earlier on about the frantic nature of the drivers. The drivers know in traffic they can't afford to even give a tenth of a second away, and that's caught a few drivers out. You know, it's it's frantic when a driver of Maro Engel's experience gets caught in a big incident um, at the Tiergarten. So a lot of surprises. You have to say um, you've got to be gutted for the number one row with BMW crew because it seems something relatively trivial that's taken them right out of the contention. Yeah, it was. It really was. And uh, we see a challenge there uh, just a couple of uh, a lap or so ago or a few minutes ago, the the number 77 having a go that's the bmw junior team bmw verhagen again trying to get down the inside of van der linde at uh, what i think peter is the the only real passing spot where you can kind of just throw caution to the wind and have a go on the brakes and that's into turn one after that uh, fabulous run down the dottinger hall through the tier garden it kind of breaks it up and then just carrying the momentum through the tier garden and we're seeing that lap after lap aren't we that's that's where if you're going to pass GT3 cars tend to be so close performance-wise. They produce, um, whether it be the rear-engine Porsche 911 or the mid-engine Audi, the front-engine cars of the Mercedes, uh, they, they kind of produce the same lap time, but in very different ways. 
They really do, yeah. And you've got, you've, like you say, they've got the engine mounted in different places, and it's a spin for the KCMG Porsche. Josh Burton, I think, on board that car into the barriers at, I think that's the Hatzenbach, uh, Joe. Yeah, it is. Hatzenbach catching out Burden there and just spinning. He did contact the barrier, and it remains to be seen just how hard he contact with the barrier. There's nothing visible. A little bit of uh, bodywork damage, but through the hats and back. Again, we talked about the need to keep the pace up and not give away even a tenth of a second. And he was being pressured massively by van der Linde in the 29 Audi, who had only a few moments ago been was being pressured by the BMW, the BMW junior team. Um, but uh, the, the KCMG car now falling down the order. It's resumed. Contact the barrier. A little bit of rear bodywork damage. I'm not sure whether the bodywork has been pressed onto the rear tyres, but he's managed to get that car restarted and away he goes back into the race, but he's dropped down the order now. With such a short amount of race time left, Peter, it, it's you, you said it. You can't afford to give away tenths. He's given away more than tenths there. Yeah, these guys are all on qualifying speed and qualifying pushing at the moment. And that was just at the bottom of the hats and back at Hocheiken before going on to the Quiddlebacker hole. What's amazing is you can see just how well these cars are built for endurance racing, particularly the Porsches. We saw the Falcon Porsche going into the wall as well, and it's amazing how well they bounce. I don't know if a road version would bounce <laughs> as well as that. And unfortunately for fans of the defending uh, Nürburgring 24-hour champions, the number one roller racing BMW M6 still in pit lane. And I tell you what, Joe, Philip Eng's stint from the restart was absolutely m majestic. And actually, Philip looks like he's going to be getting out the car. That's... That's a really sad end to what's been a hard charge by that crew, the pole sitter as well. Yeah, I am not liking seeing that at any time. But when you've seen uh, where that car was very much in contention for a consecutive win, it's, I believe, uh, a consecutive win at the Nürburgring 24 hours has not been done in the GT3 era. And so that car was very much on target to do that I've, I've not got any information peter as to what the problem is that's retired that car um so we remain to be saying there's, there's nothing visible so it's it's obviously a mechanical fault with regard to the drivetrain mm. or the engine or something but uh, it's not like he's been off or anything but uh such a shame there they uh, they were a little bit disadvantaged somewhat by that long pit stop of something like 353 seconds minimum um, uh, when they, their first stop after the restart, but uh, you couldn't, st you still couldn't discount them. And uh, I was looking forward to seeing that number one BMW just making its way back up. It's had the pace pretty much all week, hasn't it? Oh, it's it's been right there. And I tell you what, Nick Uloli's qualifying lap in sodden conditions on Friday night was for pole position was absolutely majestic. Um, and that crew will be gutted. Nicky Katzberg, John Edwards. Uh, Philip Eng and Nick Yaluli, you know, all big names in endurance racing. Of course, John Edwards and Nicky Katzberg, winners of the GTLM category in the Rolex 24 hour over the last two years, uh, one with BMW, one with Corvette. Um, so uh, they'll be gutted. However, Roa, of course, winning the Spa and Nürburgring 24 hour last year and their number 98 sister car in the right in the hunt. But they're going to have their work cut out, Joe, to stop the might of this 911 Manti Porsche, currently driven by Michael Christensen. And one thing I, I'm loving seeing is seeing Kevin Estra and Michael Christensen back together. They were such a strong pairing, world champions together, and they've just taken off where they left off. Yeah, absolutely. What a driver pairing. And uh, of course, you, you can't discount the other drivers that are in that car as well. I mean, just look at the strength of that team peter it's uh it's a hard one to to really discount you know lars kern and matteo caroli sharing with those two world champions um however you know you, you, you still can't discount the rover racing bmw they know how to win this race they know how to uh win uh three hour races as well as 24 hour races and this is certainly what it's turned into uh the nurburgring 24 hours uh 2021 
very similar to what happened last year, of course, um, with a weather delay in 2020 also. Um, but the 2021 race will be known for its uh, three and a half hour sprint race to the end. And what a spectacle um, to, to, you know, we've been very unlucky with the fog, but do you know what? This is what a consolation prize this is <laughs> to have a three and a half hour sprint with the best drivers in the world and the best GT cars in the world. And uh, Michael Christensen on board the 911, but his teammate Kevin Estra watching the timing screens intently. That gap is coming down a little bit. There's quite a lot of traffic for the Manti Porsche coming around uh, s back and into Brinken. And uh, Van der Linde in the row with BMW now only three and a half seconds the gap uh, at the front. And we can't write off the Retronic Racing Porsche with Lawrence Vantor on board. And he is flying the Belgian driver. And uh, well, whatever that keto diet is, uh, Joe, it appears to be working. Maybe <laughs> we should try it after all. You know what? I might look into that. Yeah, I, I might look into that. He's probably a third <laughs> of my age, but hey, who knows? I tell you what I was going to mention. I was going to mention that um, it was becoming quite difficult to see the the top teams uh, in, uh, across the spread of the of say the top 15. We had a we had a difference of uh, pit strategies. However, making our job a little bit easier, we've got the cars in first, second, and third place now on pretty much the same pit strategy um, with um, all of the uh, the top three runners three laps into their stint. They're on their fourth lap of their stint and that. Pete was going to make things a little bit uh, easier for certainly me, for my little brain to work out as to as to who's going to and pick me. and when. We just whether they're going to vary that with a dip with an extra lap, etc. But that should balance itself out. Well, I do have my sliding scale at the ready because, of course, here one of the unique factors of racing here at the Nurburgring is the minimum pit stop times. Of course, we do see that in uh, SRO racing. Uh, at Spa and things like that, but it's a little bit more complex uh, in uh, the Nurburgring and we'll keep you up to date with that folks as we get closer to the end of the race. It all depends on stint times, how long they've got to the end of the race and uh, there's a minimum amount of time that the cars have to sit in pit lane and uh, while they get filled up with the uh, Tesco club car fuel pump, that we, <laughs> it just still gives me a chuckle every time you see a half a million pound GT3 car getting filled up <laughs> with a supermarket petrol pump. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did like your um, your comparison there and uh, your example there, and that that's that is exactly the only way to describe it for the listeners. I mean, we you know we, we're used to seeing fast fill systems on sports car racing, and it's all about getting in and out of the pits as quickly as possible. Well, in this pro am style of racing, it's not necessarily about that. There's an element of safety, and the way that we can maintain that safety is you know forget about the fast fuel fueling and the issues of refueling on pit lane are ever present uh, even with a with a service station type uh, um, delivery system it, it's still having inflammable liquids anywhere is, is a little bit tricky but uh, we, we, we seem to be able to get by and, and taking away the urgency for pit stops gets around potential accidents and that's what it's all about it's all about these races being fought for on the track rather than necessarily being in the pit lane. That's not taking away any of the pit strategy because I've always been an advocate of endurance races, Peter, are one on the pit wall and I still, I'm still uh, going to stick to that. I, I would agree. I think actually it makes the, stra the strategists uh, you know, work even harder actually because you've got to be so ahead of the game and know the rules inside out, which of course is the guys on the pit wall, uh, guys and girls, they're absolutely just the smartest minds in motorsport. And also knowing different situations require different driver personalities. Most of the pro teams have four drivers to draw upon. And one, you know, one situation that might require a Maro Engel, the other might require a Michael Christensen. You know, it's that's who you're going to put in the car for a certain time. I mean, it's no surprise the 911 Manti team put Kevin Estra in 
for the heavy bunch start because he's so good in close combat. Likewise, the 31 Fricadelli team putting in Fred Makaveki. But tell you what, the gap is coming down. Um, Sheldon Van der Linde, the South African driver in the roller racing BMW, now down to less than three seconds, the gap up to the leader, Michael Christensen. And what I found interesting, Joe, about that number 98 roller car is that a lot of the drivers in that car have had a lot of success. Conor De Filippi, Martin Tomczyk, and Sheldon Van der Linde have all had big wins. Uh, but they've all had their big career wins with another German manufacturer in Audi. So I'm sure um, the BMW board will be hoping that they uh, eclipse that with a win here for uh, for their mark. Well, it's probably not a concern of theirs, whatever car they're in. A great battle for seventh place here with the uh, Lance David Arnold given. Portland Motorsports Porsche being chased down and under immense pressure. Um, it's, uh, it's the number eight Mercedes, the Schiller driven Mercedes number eight, is right on the nose, uh, sorry, on the tail of the Porsche ahead of him. And Lance David Arnold just trying to keep his composure and driving a really strong race, but putting being put under a massive, massive amount of pressure. It's the number seven Porsche behind, uh, sorry, the number seven Junkadella Mercedes, Junkadella Mercedes, trying to get in on the app as well. He's got the number six ahead of him, the Assenheimer Mercedes. Both the pink Mercedes involved there. There's a Ferrari interjecting there, Peter, but it's not involved. That's out of contention. It's not a race for position with that Ferrari. Keep an eye on the Porsche and the Mercedes, though. The, uh, the Fulton car with Lance David Arnold and the Schiller driven Mercedes. The team gets speed Mercedes there, right on its tail. Well, it's getting really frantic in the traffic now. Michael Christensen having to barge past one of the KTM Cup X cars there. It was at Brightshite on the run up to X Muller. And Lance David Arnold absolutely flying on board the Falcon Porsche. Uh, Lance David Arnold, of course, a lot of experience with Fricadelli Racing, another Nurburgring specialist team. And uh, I, I noticed Steph from his Instagram page the other day, Joe, that he's actually a Harley Davidson rider with the uh, open face helmet and all the gear. He's got to relax somehow. I mean, uh, yeah, not, not more relaxing motorcycle. I'm not. I'm not really a motorcyclist. You have to get uh, hind off engaged in this. I'm not sure he's. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's into his comfortable motorcycles as well. Uh, he drives, or rides, I should say, a, a sort of a, a laid-back BMW, big, huge thing that really the engine laid should be in the car, not a bike. Um, back with a 180 horsepower and a straight six engine with. Uh, I six fell asleep on it. Seats. I fell asleep on that. Bike. That's because I'm a good rider. It'll, it'll still outdrag and outhandle most badly ridden sports bikes, in fairness, and I can still back it into corners. Sometimes. Yes, without even realising it. Speaking of that's badly written... <laughs> that's another story speaking altogether. Speaking of badly written sports bikes, that yeah. was me. Yeah. Oh, really? like Valentino Rossi replica helmet, Danies leather, yeah. getting overtaken by guys of John's vintage on BMW touring Get in, back of the net. Uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I've just felt I had to interject there because I heard my name mentioned to, to get back to that battle for 10th. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just before brunch in the 53 GT tyres uh, GT4 car, which was fighting its way back up after problems, has just had a wee spin right in front of the leader, Peter. Indeed, yeah, that's the number 53 GT tyre, um, predominantly female crew and all female driver lineup. Uh, Christina Nielsen and Pippa Mann in this car have been running very, very strong. Now they're in the SP8. Class and looking to see who is leading that class at the moment. They are, yes, they are. The number 53 car leading in class, beating the uh, Toyo Tire Lexus RCF. So, um, good stuff uh, there. I tell you what, Joe, um, Neil Verhagen, all of the guys in this number 77 BMW Junior team, they've impressed me all weekend long. Yeah, you know what? I, I... Try, try to put a finger on the most impressive driver pairings or, or driver lineup, and, and it's hard to judge. This race, um, the, the, the cork in the bottle is very much the Lance David Arnold Fulton Porsche. Um, he, he's definitely the cork in the bottle because he's causing some delay. And there's a move for position 
with the um, the number nine Mercedes, um, who's not in race position there. So that car, the number nine down the order, just moving out the way and letting these people get onto it. Um, I've just got to remind everybody that uh, info, not remind, just inform, um, info from race control, there's going to be no further stop and go penalties because of the amount of race time we have left. Just coming up to, we're already nine minutes away but from the final two hours of this race. So no further stop and go penalties uh, being um, given out. But um, we'll get some information with regards to any further penalties that's going to be dished out by the stewards getting confirmation that it's the number one row of BMW that's now retired. It was an electrical issue that has thwarted the charge of that car. And uh, just a little gremlin like that can creep in on any car. We saw it nearly steal, the, funnily enough, the row of Porsche team at Spa 24 hours last year, uh, an oil, well, ironically, an oil, an oil leak nearly, nearly taking that car out of action but they did get it over the line just but that is the the agony and ecstasy of endurance racing still a slow zone at the top of Tiergarten a lot of um, very important barrier repair going on there the team here at the Nürburgring absolutely world class in getting um, when we've had barrier repairs required done them in such a quick and efficient manner and tell you what Joe at the speed that that Mercedes um, of Maro Engel went into the barrier it's amazing that A Maro's okay B yeah. the car didn't even look that damaged and see how quick they're getting it back up and running yeah it, it was indeed and it was great to see uh, that information that uh, everything was fine uh, the, the cork has been taken from the bottle and Lance David Arnold has brought the number 33 Porsche into the pits for a pit stop uh, according to my screen. Also into the pits has come the number 77 BMW of Verhagen and also in has come the number 5 from 15th spot, the Phoenix Racing Audi uh, into the pits also. But the uh, the biggest um, uh, news there is that the Lance David Arnold Porsche, who was the, the cork in the bottle, what I mean by that is he was, he was no doubt about it, holding up um, a few cars that were behind him uh, the number eight Mercedes of Schiller and the team mate of the Schiller car, the number seven, Junkadella. Uh, those two Mercedes now being released and can get back underway. They've got about a six, well, they've got about a 30 second gap before the car in fifth. And that happens to be the Audi Sport team car collection, uh, car number two. They, they are now chasing them down. Assenheimer, uh, forgot to mention Assenheimer, he's in the eighth. And uh, it's a three-way Mercedes battle now for six, seven, and eight. So that's car eight, car seven, and car six. And they've been they've been running on this track pretty much for the whole of this restart. So for for over an hour now, nearly an hour and a half, they've been like that on track. So Dave, Lance David Arnold serving a pass, long stop uh, stop and hold penalty in pit lane, the number thirty-three. Falcon Tire Porsche. Um, that's really going to, well, in with only two hours and six minutes to go, that kills their chances of a run at the podium or indeed the outright win. But still, it is the Manti Porsche marching ahead. And just while we've been having a chat about motorcycles, etc., Michael Christensen's been hard at work and he has doubled the advantage back to Sheldon van der Linde in the number 98 roller racing BMW. Six. 0.6 seconds the gap now Michael Christensen the great Dane very quiet man but my goodness me can he pedal absolutely it's uh, it's a, it's developing into a great race and it's you know what this race always delivers a very exciting finish we've had some last lap changes for lead etc and, and this one with such a short restart time of three and a half hours it's always going to be it's, it's kind of always going to have delivered this kind of finish to this race and, and, and even more so the fact that the top three are now on a similar strategy. Oh, that's not right. There's something wrong with that uh, Lamborghini Ooh. 63, Peter, with a rear wing that's all awry. It's uh, still travelling at some speed, but he'll certainly not have any kind of uh, downforce coming from that, that rear wing. It's the 63 Lamborghini. And that car down the field somewhat. So that's the 
Hankook FFF racing team. I'll see where that car yeah, is Merkel in Bur the field. Is it Mapelli at the way? It's way though? down. The, yeah, it is. They're really, really, uh, they were, well, it's been one of the fastest cars over one lap. Merkel Bertolotti put in arguably the lap of the weekend on Thursday night under cover, the complete cover of darkness, just blitz the entire field. Um, and we were looking really strong, but hit problems early on yesterday. And I, I think they, that, that team is not done. I think their day here at the Nürburgring will come in the next couple of years. Um, I'm, I'm convinced of it, actually. They've been really, really impressive. Now, so uh, we've got two hours and four minutes to go. Interestingly, Kevin Estra on the pit wall there, dancing up and down. Of course, Kevin, neither Kevin Estra nor Michael Christensen have won this race outright. And I'm sure that's one of the only ticks left in their very impressive CV. And of course, the thing is, uh, Joe, is that Kevin and Michael have, you know, they've won Spa together, they've won Le Mans together, they've won the World Championship, but it's split up basically in the World Championship at the end of last season. So I can imagine Kevin is fully aware of the significance of what they're what they're leading at the moment. Yeah, but it's still too early to call, isn't it? It's still two hours yeah, and anything could happen. I mean, you know, we, we were talking about how strong the number four Mercedes was looking and uh, and that's now out of the race, the number one BMW. Uh, we, we, you know, factor in all of the elements. All we can do is get very excited about this battle that we've got. Um, and it's not just the lead battle that we're talking about, Peter. It's this beautifully looking Mercedes battle for six, seven, and eight. They're circulating around this track and just watching them uh, watching them drive absolutely on the edge, just listening to their throttle applications, absolutely getting back on the throttle at the apex of turns. Clearly, all of these drivers know this place like the back of their hand. I'm not going to hex your question about Christensen and um, Kevin Esper. Um, I'm just going to continue talking about what's in front of us because I don't want to say I'd love to see them win this race. I'm sure they want to win this race more than anything else because it is a box that is unticked on the CV. One of very few, and with the uh, the lovely Caroline Estra, uh, Kevin's wife, and their their young son Tommy, in the Manti hospitality, watching on uh, in intently, watching uh, watching Dad at work. So, you're absolutely right, Joe. This is still impossible to call, and the traffic for the leading SP9 cars is such a challenge because yes, the SP9 cars are going for the outright lead, but. There's cars up and down the field who are all in their own class battle, which has got just as much significance to them. Absolutely, and into the pits has come the Lamborghini. We talked about the 63 Lamborghini, the Hankook FFF entry way down the field. Um, that's had a, a rear wing repaired. Um, and it just shows, you know, Peter, that the, uh, the, the problem with calling the winner of this race with still two hours to go has just been emphasized by some onboard footage from Michael Christensen and how he gets round. It's how you get round the bat markers. That's gonna be the the, the, the the element of this race that's gonna bear fruit. And what I mean by bearing fruit, you can gain a lot of time by getting past bat markers better than the car that's chasing you down. And you mentioned there the, the gap, six and a half seconds. Well, it's 5.4 seconds now. So it's, it's ebbing and flowing, depending on how Christensen gets through the traffic in comparison to van der Linde in the BMW. And that's going to be a constant. That's going to be right to the flag. Peter Mackay and Joe Bradley taking you through the last moments of the 2021 ADAC Total, 24 hours of Nürburgring. We're about to start the penultimate racing hour here at this wonderful race circuit, the Nürburgring Nordschleife. At the moment, it's the number 911 Manti Racing Porsche of Michael Christensen leading the way by five seconds from Sheldon van der Linde for Roa Racing BMW. We hope you're enjoying this absolute thriller of a sprint race. We're gonna take a quick run through the top 10. There's a number of cars coming into pit lane. In fact, the number 98 Rover BMW coming into pit lane as is 
the Rutronic Porsche, Joe. Yeah, we've got uh, two of the top four into the pits. The 98 van der Linde Rover Racing car into the pits, along with the number three, the Vantor Rutronic Racing Porsche. They will drop down the order, so it's kind of, I was just, we were just about to give you a, a top ten rundown. Uh, so we'll give you that as we see it on the timing screen. It's going to be a little bit different because we're now into a pit stop phase. Uh, showing, uh, leading this car is Christensen in the Manti Racing Porsche 911. That's car number 911. Car number 911 leads. The 29 Van der Linde Audi Sport Team Land Audi is now up into second. The 98 BMW of Rover Racing drops down to third because uh, it's in the pits as has the Retronic Racing Porsche, car number three, down to fourth. In fifth spot and into the pits has come the Audi Sport Team car collection Audi of Nico Muller, now in the number two, that car running in fifth. And then we've got that grid battle, the Mercedes battle, three cars in it, sixth, seventh and eighth. That's car eight of Schiller, seven of Junkadella, both from the Get Speed Mercedes team, that's the pink BWT livery cars. And then we've got the Patrick Assenheimer Mercedes in eighth place. Ninth is the number 44, Klaus Backler, Falkland Motorsports Porsche. And then rounding off the top 10 is the Huber Motorsports Porsche, car 23. So we've got a good day for the Van der Linde family. We have Kelvin Van der Linde in the Audi, uh, the 24-year-old, and younger brother Sheldon, 22-year-old, in the BMW. Both cars right in the hunt for this victory with two hours to go number of cars that could be in for this victory it's going to go right down to the wire also the aha the alpacin anti-balding shampoo walking horse bmw the number 102 car in for service as well as the number 98 row of bmw back on the move again now we saw lawrence bantor get out of the number three retronic porsche who has he handed over to we will find out in just a moment as the retronic porsche heads out of pit lane over the, the timing beam and we will find out who is in that car now, they've got quite a choice in that retronic porsche i mentioned peter that week we're going to have to wait and see wait and see how it plays out with regards to stint length in and how mm. that plays out with regards to pit stop time the 98 bmw has done a six lap stint there before it came into the pits the number two the number two has done seven laps let me just confirm that the number two did seven laps before it, it pitted so we're seeing a variation on attitude and opinion on how to take this race to the very end we're going to be back timing now we're underneath two hours now so we're going to be back timing now and a little bit of variation in how we address the pit stops is what we're seeing now and that's we've now got the 90th dropping to wait ignore that because it's going to climb back up when the car's ahead of it choose to take their pit stop so roughly roughly with uh, two hours to go or just under two hours to go for the gt3 cars joe would we expect just one more pit stop for these cars that have popped off now we're, 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 well we're, we're getting there i'm not yeah definitely one more pit stop mm. we're inside two hours they can't certainly can't do uh, two hours um around here it's usually i think the maximum we've seen is a nine lap stint but again peter what varies that um perhaps less so at the north side but because of su that's such a long lap um eking out and, and fuel saving to get you a lap of fuel is impossible at the Nordschleifer. Um, it's a an eight lap stint is is um, is over an hour. I've seen a nine lap stint, but then I don't know how many slow zones we had come into effect where you can fuel save. So the maximum I would think at this stage is a, a, a an eight lap stint, which is going to be around about yeah. I've just been confirmed there uh, is about an hour. So, yeah, we've potentially got at least another, potentially one more full stop, and then potentially a splash and dash towards the end of this race. Oh, and that's when it starts getting, that's when it starts getting dicey. Of course, we do have a sliding scale 
of um, pit stop times, which we will update when the teams come in for their last stop. That sliding scale starts with 69 minutes to the flag, so still a little bit to go. Now, uh, update on the Rutronic Porsche. The young superstar Julian Andler, also from uh, Lyon, like uh, young uh, Mr. Estre. And uh, Julian, one of the youngest Le Mans winners ever, won Le Mans in the GTE AM class at just 18 years old. And a very, very impressive driver. And uh, let's see what uh, the young Frenchman can do. Strangely, Joe, I haven't seen Roman Dumas out much in that car. I would have thought they would have been uh, stretching uh, Roman for all they could get. But uh, maybe he's a bit tired after all his Pikes Peak testing. <laughs> yeah, you just don't know what's going on behind the scenes, do you? I'm, I'm not sure yeah. uh, without trawling back through the data at how many laps he has done. Again, it's, you know, it's, it's knocked the teams off balance somewhat with such a long delay, hasn't it? It knocks us off balance with such a long delay, but even more so for the uh, for the teams. Um, we're, we're still, let me just check on what lap of a stint the leader is on. He's only seven flat, so potentially he could come in this lap, but then again, unless you are part of the Manti Racing team, you're not going to get any insight as to what their plan is and there's certainly you know if i was in the pit lane and i asked that question of them i'm not it's not necessarily i'm not necessarily going to get the right answer am i no no that that's very true you can you know if you're getting a diplomatic uh, a diplomatic line sometimes we've had a, honest, a very good question uh, here from jake parrott uh, about lars kern of course lars the uh, one of the real stars of the road car laps here at the Nürburgring and very, very quick in a GT3 race car as well. He is registered in, he's entered in the 911 Porsche Manti, the leading car. However, he hasn't been out on track in that car yet. So I would assume, Joe, that maybe now that might be that Lars is, is not actually going to take the wheel in that car. Yeah, well, we are getting down to that point where we're running out of time to, if you haven't cycled the driver into this race, uh, uh, we're basically running out of time with only what we estimate, a, you know, maximum of uh, two stops, at least another stop for the GT runners who have just pitted. Um, we'll, we'll keep an eye. Uh, we've got information coming through that we've got rain at Post 188. I'm not sure where Post 188 is. I'm thinking that is up at the potentially at the start of the dotting of hole. Yeah. 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 Just as I say that, get that information through. So we'll uh, we'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, windscreen wipe is going on some of the cars, and we have got track conditions beginning to change at that arguably highest point of the track so if the rain was going to come that's where the cloud is at its densest it's most dense I don't think densest is actually a name uh, it's most dense so uh, that's probably why we're seeing a bit of rain coming down there could be and this is where this is a critical snap decision that the 911 crew and indeed the 29 Audi and the two BWT Mercedes as well in third and fourth need to make that if the rain comes down hard they've got the opportunity to to fit either a cut slick or even a full wet at the pit stop if they deem that to be necessary but of course there's large parts of this 20 huge parts of this 25.3 kilometer circuit that are completely bone dry and will remain so for a while so oh i would not want to be on the uh the pit wall right now and making that decision as the number 29 audi Van der Linde coming in for service at the pit lane now, Joe. So the two Mercedes into the pits. Christensen at the wheel, and sorry, at the wheel, at the wheel of the leading Manti, uh, leading Porsche. He's on his eighth lap. So that's what we speculated might just happen. Um, penalty for the 77, which is in 10th. That's the Augusta Farfas BMW Junior team. BMW, that's for an incident with the number two, and he's been given a two minutes and seven second penalty. Um, I'm thinking the longer he can go, the better, because then he stretches, I'm talking about Christensen here again, uh, the longer he can go, the better, because that stretches that fuel window towards the finish. It's 
it's eating that and stretching that window out towards the finish. I'm, I'm still, he's still going to us. He's all right. He's going to come in after this lap. I would have thought after having completed eight laps, but he's and he's still going to just us potentially just one more pit stop after this, and then it might not be a complete uh, amount of fuel that he needs to give us. Well, it's going to play out as the uh, Mercedes team, um, the uh, BWT water sponsored cars, um, Daniel Yonkadela in the number seven, Matteo Vaxifier in the number eight machine. Of course, it was the number seven that ended up in contact with uh, the Audi of uh, Michele Beretta earlier on. Uh, so, as we can see, Kevin Estrin now putting on his balaclava, preparing to put on his specially painted uh, Grello Manti helmet. So, that means then that he'll be taking over the wheel, I presume, for the last hour and 45 minutes or so from yeah. Michael Christensen. So, that answers our question about Lars Kerndio. Yeah, that's... Uh, you know what? Who would you, who would you put in? I mean, no disrespect to Mario Caroli and Lars Kern, who are exceptionally very, very quick drivers. But Kevin Estra is just something else, isn't he? He's, he's like that Exocet missile. He's like the, uh, he's like your, your superstar striker that, you know, you, you put on in the last 15 minutes and he will get the goal. Um, pulling off to driver's left, not quite sure where that is, but that's going to cause a slow zone is the number 311. And that's a Porsche that's smoking heavily that is the, I think it was 311. It's the F uh, the FK Performance Porsche Cayman GT4 just going out of our sight there. And a problem there. I'll just try and find out. I think that's towards Whipperman. So it's out of our act, out of the right hander at our at act and towards Whipperman where we're going to see a slow zone be deployed. Okay, so that, I think, it, yes, it lo looks like that's where that is going on. So we'll keep an, an eye out on that. Hopefully it'll only be a small uh, stoppage. Interestingly, just as, uh, as uh, Augusto Farfus has been given the, uh, he's maybe angry, he's been given notification of the penalty. He's just set his uh, personal best uh, an 8 minute 23.1 uh, at the wheel of that car. So, do we know any more, Joe? I wonder what, obviously, some sort of contact between number 77 and number two Audi. And that's a real pity for the 77 BMW because they've been charging so hard. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what. It was an, it, it, it's come to me as an incident with the number 22. Um, the number 22, so that's the 77, sorry, not the 22, the number two. Um, so that's the 77 Farfus BMW car having some sort of incident, I know not what, uh, with the Haasa Audi uh, currently running in 8th and 10th, respectively. Um, more information on that uh, Porsche that's caused this slow zone. Deranged rear suspension. That, that's a bit of a clue uh, to me, Peter. That looks like he's been off the track and made contact with either another car or maybe a barrier body work looking relatively yeah it looks like it's at the right rear off. now this is not good news in the at class for the dodge viper the alternatively fueled dodge viper the number 13 car in the pit lane being looked at very closely the enormous v10 engine in the front of that dodge viper a whole stream of mechanics looking in there and that will allow um, the uh, Porsche in that class 911 to escape at the front. We've got a problem for the 240 BMW as well of Vasquez. Front right looking looking like a puncture there, Joe, it seems. No, that's more than a puncture, it looks like, Peter. It looks like the right rear wheel is about to uh, come off. It looks like oh. the suspend, the, maybe the, the steering arm has uh, broken. The, the, the tyre looks inflated. So a broken tow link connecting the steering on that car, limping back to the pits. And the Adrenaline BMW just doing a great job of keeping that car in a straight line. It's, it's every time he, time he inputs the steering, that's going to be, that's going to wear, be where it becomes tricky. Because if he gets that right-hand wheel out of sync with the trajectory of the car, the caster angle on the 
front wheel to be keeping that car, a bit like a supermarket trolley. When you push the supermarket trolley forwards, all the wheels get into line, and that's pretty much the caster that's doing that. But when he turns the corner, he'll only be using the left-hand wheel to change direction. It's funny you mentioned the supermarket trolley. How do you know that you're a petrol head? Is when you get your supermarket trolley constantly an oversteer going around the supermarket. Just, just me? Oh, okay, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I was no, no, I, I, do you, take, you I do take the racing line through the cold meat and into the fruit always, and veg. Always. Got to, yeah, you gain and a lot do, of time there. Yeah, and if, there's a, and if there's been a spillage, I get the cans of beer right at the back of the trolley, 9-11 style, that bit of extra <laughs> traction off the corner. <laughs> yeah. We should, hey, shouldn't I be allowed out what, on the road, honestly. It's all about the weight balance, mate. It gives you a good, you know, a good handling trolley. You know what, you're, talk, you're talking well. about that, we're, jo we're joking about that, but we talk about a balanced car, and we're talking about the um, of, of, of the weight distribution on a car. In a mid-engined car, like for instance the Ferrari, the Lamborghini, or the Audi R8, you'll try your best to get a 50-50 split between the front and the rear. A front-engined car, completely different, because there's a lot of weight over the front axle. I know they've got heavy gearboxes in the in the rear end but it's very very difficult to achieve a 50 50 split but that's exactly what you're describing there it's the same engineering principles and concepts that you're applying to get your supermarket trolley fast through the cold meat and into the fruit and veg that you're seeing here at the Nürburgring with these race cars exactly the same thing Joe, I don't know how you're who you're feeling that you're going into the fruit and veg aisle. I was straight for the <laughs> straight for the crisps and the beer for me. Well, you, I thought we were on a beet, I, I thought we were on a keto diet. Keto, uh, yeah, next week. Next week. All right, okay. We'll put that <laughs> on next week after the excitement. <laughs> I'll put that on well, the delay. Well, we should we, we we should have the 911 Porsche coming into pit lane very soon. We have the number 44 Falcon Tire Porsche of Klaus Backler uh, up to second now. And just as we say that, 911 Mantai Porsche in pit lane, Joe. Yeah, Mantai in. He's uh, he's completed eight laps. I think he's tripped the timing beam. Um, he's got eight laps on that stint there. And we, you mentioned earlier, Peter, that it was Kevin Estra who was uh, getting suited and booted to take over the driving duties on that car it's, uh, that car is in from the lead and that's going to hand the lead of this race, oh it hasn't because the 40, I was just about to say the, the 44 Fulton Porsche of course that car also is going to be towards um, that's on a, I think that car's completed uh, again, another 8 lap stint for that car so that Backler driven Porsche into the pits also so the two leading Porsches now into the pits, that's leaving the 23 uh, of Huber Motorsport. That car's only on a five lap stint at the moment, so that'll be coming around to complete six laps of its stint. So I'm, I'm suspecting or expecting the 23 will take over the lead of this, of this race. So not too much hurry in the Mantai Racing Porsche garage. The mechanics studying around brake discs and pads while the wheels are off. They're not in a hurry. They have a minimum pit stop time they have to serve. So just making sure that everything is absolutely as it should be before sending Kevin Estra back out onto the Never Bring North Slide. But as, as you mentioned, Joe, the number 23 Cooper Racing Porsche hits the front of the field. And this is going to, so at the moment, it's a Porsche 123, but we have a lot, oh, as we have a lot of, a lot of stuff to shake out. And we've got a Mercedes hard into the wall at Klosterkow on the run up to the Caracciola carousel. Yes, yeah, that I was, think it might be the Hope Racing car. car. Yeah. yeah, I'm not, I didn't get the identity of that Mercedes. I'm just trying to find out um, if we've got, it's the 54. So the 54 Mercedes is into the barrier. It looked a very heavy impact as well. Oh no, it's it's not the 54. The my track is my Hub track has let me down. It's the six. It's the oh, Hubert out well, Hubert out at the wheel of the uh, of the HRT car, car number six. They're having no luck this weekend, are they? None at all. Well, the, the only crumb of comfort there is that Hubert Hout 
um, is the owner of this team. Of course, they carried it, picked up the mantle from the Black Falcon team that have had so much success here at the Nürburgring. And Hubert Haupt, one of the oldest drivers in the all pro class and the team owner. And well, that's, um, you know, if you're going to crash the car, at least it's you paying the bill. Uh, uh, poor old Hubert, of course, he had an incredible history. Drove in the DTM uh, in the early 90s and in 2001. Do you remember the Opel Astra Coupe in DTM? He drove yes. in one of those. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's yeah. Going back and of course, work. one here too. That's what the DTM should be. It's a touring car. It's a touring car, Charlie. I've started anyway, to let's not get into the GT3 DTM thing. Um, what, My what fault we, uh, for throwing the bait on that one. What, what, yeah, it's a, if you know that was for the middle of the night thing, wasn't it? For you? Um, <laughs> we, we're, we're calculating here with the help of the rest of the RSL team, who were probably sitting back in their uh, in their reclining chairs, being fed tea and biscuits. Um, so they're working this out. So if the 911 uh, Manti car does another eight laps, that will leave about 34 minutes to go when he pits for his last stop. And we speculate further, you and I, Peter, that that may be when we see Lars Kern take some driver's duty. So no pressure on him if that, uh, if that uh, pans out and uh, becomes the case. Well, interestingly, the number 911 crew bought that, brought that car in within the last two hours. And of course, the drivers have a maximum two hour stint time. Um, so they, they could keep Kevin Efra in the car to the finish if they so wish. Um, will they do that? Well, that, that, that's what makes this, that makes this type of racing so exciting. Who will be in that car next? Will they stretch Kevin Estra? He's done a lot of driving time, so um, um, incredible athlete, but um, this is a place that takes it out of even the very best. Number three, Rutronic Cor start that again. The number three, Rutronic Porsche still carries on. Now, I don't like the look of that, Joe. Mm, that is a yeah. cut slick being prepared in pit lane. Down in the pits, we are having some of the teams cutting grooves and creating intermediates from a set of slick tires. Now, from my the um, meteorologist in the collective, Darren Wood, has messaged me only a few minutes ago showing me the satellite view of the weather fronts in the area and that's showing no rain but of course we have still got dense fog on the higher ground here and whether that dense fog sort of manifests and becomes a little bit too dense and becomes rain that might be what they are you know what let's not look too much into this what we're seeing there is a team that's prepare, preparing for every eventuality. And when we remind ourselves, we're at the Nürburgring, and you know, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes is the saying, isn't it? It is. Told it's raining at the carousel, Peter. Yes, I was just gonna pick up on that. Cooper Hope might well have done the other SP9 runners a big favor by you know, crashing on on just it's just started raining at the bottom of the run up to the carousel just at the top of the Kesselchen straight uh oof, that's uh well of course all the teams will have that information now they will relay that to the driver saying be careful at the uh on the run up to the carousel and i would imagine that well at the moment there's no slow zone and no coach 60 so Hubert Hout got that car going, so they, they will go through there at full racing speed, but will need to approach with uh, with caution there. That is for sure. But oh, if it's only just at that one localised area, you've kind of got to tip tiptoe through on slicks, I suppose, Joe. Yeah. Again, the problem with the Nurburgring, if you you know you you, you can't really go on wet if there's just a small amount of racetrack that's wet, because by the time you get back round to it, you bump the wets off and the treads, you know, just chunking and disappearing. So intermediates is probably the, uh, the, 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 I mean, that's what the intermediates are for, aren't they? But I think also it depends on the amount of rain as well. If, we, if we're just dampening the track, then you can pretty much survive the short area of track. If it's, if it's let's say, from the carousel around to um, the uh, start of Whitherman, then you can probably survive on slicks by just tiptoeing your way through. If it gets very heavy and you've got standing water, 
that's when the slicks become dangerous and that's when the apple turning comes in and you see cars skidding off the track and uh, as if they're on ice which effectively they are they're on a they're basically you know traveling over a layer of water a cracking battle for the last spot in the top 10 at the moment between the number 44 Falcon Tire Porsche of Klaus Backler, who we heard from earlier on. Thanks to Klaus and to Falcon Tire for um, giving us that interview earlier on in the week. Daniel Yonkadela, though, in the Get Team Get Speed Mercedes, the BWT pink car, pressuring Backler hard here. Of course, Yonkadela, 2011 Macau Grand Prix winner, and uh, this, is, this is just like Macau with trees here at the North <laughs> We haven't got a hairpin where you've got to kind of stop and lift the car around though, quite. Um, <laughs> mind you, turn one is not far off, is it? it? That would be, yeah, that would be the, is it Lisboa, the hairpin? I can't yes, remember. Yes, it is, yeah. The constant yeah, uh, no, that would count. Overtaken. That would count. And uh, Klaus Backler going up the Kessel Chin there, just into, uh, up towards the carousel where the rain is falling and actually having to put two wheels on the grass to go past a slower car up towards the carousel and Yunkadella taking similar caution and Ooh. oh and it's Ooh. Kevin Estra has gone off the road at Adana would I didn't know at um, X back I think Joe it's put the rain I think cold. that's heavy rain that's caused that issue now I'm not sure if that's rain that I can see on the windscreen of that car, but he's certainly got well offline. He couldn't change direction at all. And it's the plans garden, we're being told, that that car, we saw a car off. Um, no, it's not plans garden. We're just, it's we're not, just coming no, into it's, it's, now. Um, Whipperman. So it's Whipperman, yeah, it, it is Whipperman, which is where we saw the car go off earlier. Um, so it's the Whipperman's that section of track just before we get into that very technical area of Brunchen. Um, we'll sit. We did have a car off though, Peter. I saw a car off, and it was kind of. It was again heads up driving from uh, from Kevin Estra, who I think if he continued to try and take the line, he would have been unable to. It's the Land Audi. Stay on the track. It was the Land Audi. I think it might been... be the Land Audi, Joe. The twenty nine. So the twenty nine spun. The number two took avoiding action. And then along came Kevin Estra, who again took avoiding action. I think this is because of, of rain. I think the rain, the rain has come. The 29 Audi Sport Team Land R8 of Kelvin van der Linde was the car that caused that consternation. We've now got the number three Retronic Racing Porsche of Julian Andlauer, who's come to a halt. Suspension. Do we think that was, the suspension was crapping? Must have, yeah, because the Julian Andler tried to get the car going over the grass and over the curb and crabbing all over the place. So that, oh, agony for, with an hour and 32 minutes to go, that looks like the number three Retronic Porsche will mm. be out of the running. We'll see if Julian Andler can get the car going and limp it back to the pit lane. But, oh, that is, well, what close call for the number 911 Manti Porsche. It seemed, Joe, that Kevin knew what was coming there and actually just straightened the wheel up and, and went, we're going over the grass here and, and let's just go for the gap in the middle. Amazing instinct there. Yeah, I think so. And it, you certainly saw Estra in the 911 numbered Porsche, the the car, he just conti if he continued on the lock that he was on, he would. I just think he had the feeling in the car that he was not going to make the corner. So he straightened it off and went between the number 29 Land Audi, which was pointing in the wrong direction, pretty much facing him. And he went through the gap between the Land Audi, which was off the track, and the barrier on what would have been his driver's right. And he just literally, he just, uh, he just put, he threaded the needle quite literally and went onto the grass and had to be very, very delicate on the pedals and on the steering not to put himself into a spin. And he's uh, he certainly, it's not delayed him to any great extent. And he continues round up into fourth place now as he came across the line that time. Well, uh, as we catch our breath after 
quite a dramatic couple of minutes here at the Nürburgring Nordschleife but as we are at the top of the hour 1400 hours local time at the Nürburgring Nordschleife 90 minutes to go in this motor race let's have a look down the order of some of the classes so in SP9 at the moment the Hoover Motorsport Porsche, the number 23 leads, but will that will shake out over the next 10 or 20 minutes or so as the pit stops continue to go on for the SP9 runners. In SPX, it's the Space Drive Racing Mercedes, driven at the moment by Darren Turner, the Le Mans legend Darren Turner in the 25 car. That is the experimental steer-by-wire machine, developing that technology for uh, drivers with limited um, uh, with with uh, disabilities or, or what have you, um, amazing technology. So the Glickenhaus that's also in that car has in that class hasn't been able to catch up to the Mercedes at this time. In Cup X with the KTM's, it's a very well known name here at the the Nurburgring. Stuck Junior uh, leading in the number one one four KTM in S. He pro and um, only one car in that class to start with that's classified as the 350 black falcon porsche cup mr but it had a crash at um at schweden cars last night in the sp8 t class at the moment we have a uh, posavac in the schnitzelalm racing mercedes amg gt4 that's the number 37 car leading that class at the moment in sp7 for the porsche cup cars it's the huber motorsport so double delight for huber motorsport at the moment the number 80 huber car leading that class at the moment in tcr a very closely contested category at the moment it is the hyundai i30n leading in tcr so um looking good and of course that is the car with jean carl bernay and um, and Mr. E um, Mr. Engsler as well, who had a little bit of an incident yesterday in the TCR race. So that might well bridge the gap there. BMW 240i class, the Adrenaline Motorsport Team Alsner car, the number 231 leads that class. Cup three uh, at the moment. Looking up and down my timing screen, that's the GTEC competition. Porsche came in 718 GT4, the 305 car leads. And finally, in SP4, we have the Porsche 718 Cayman S number 86 leads that class. So Peter Mackay here on RS1 for the next hour and joining me is John Hindoff. John, you, uh, we, we heard from you briefly there when we were uh, mentioning your motorcycling habits, but uh, you've not been able to draw yourself away from this. Dissing my bike, the mighty 1600 GT. No, old man's bike. I'll wait I say Bradley. Next to there's a story about him in a GSX 750 um, and uh, how well he did on that when he was turning it around. Looks like the Monoplast Audi team are commiserating with each other. Did the car not go back out? Uh, I see that, well, or do they feel they've done what they need to do uh, sorry to come on and bring bad news but uh, in the motorsport world hearing uh, that uh, the, the very sad news of the death of Mansour Oje a key figure in the history of McLaren for the last 40 years or so has died age 68 uh, relatively low profile persona but certainly was instrumental in McLaren's successes over quite a long time now he was on the board of both McLaren Racing and the company's group as well uh, sorry he's he was replaced by uh, Sultan Manche his, his son uh, on the McLaren Racing and McLaren group board but you have to remember that Mansour's career at McLaren saw them win 10 F1 drivers titles with Nicky Lauda Alan Prost at the centre Mika Hacken and Lewis Hamilton nine constructors championships and through engine partnerships that included Porsche Honda and Mercedes back in 2013 he had a double lung transplant but uh, did recover and played a key role in uh, ousting Ron Dennis uh, from uh, the company they'd fallen out a few years before of a, what's described as a personal matter Zach Brown McLaren Racing Chief 
Uh, executive officer has been quoted as saying Mansoor was a true racer in every sense, ultra competitive, determined, passionate, and above all, perhaps his defining characteristic, sporting. No matter the intensity of the battle, Mansoor, uh, Mansoor always put sport first. Uh, Domenico uh, Stefano Domenicali, F1 president, said he was someone with incredible talent, passion, and energy. He was a giant of our sport. We'll miss him greatly, and so will the F1 community as a whole we send condolences to family friends and the mclaren team of course on the news of the death today of manso oj at 68 so uh, just after two o'clock here peter uh, weather is still trying to play a hand here we've had splashes of rain we've had people shaving off what looked to be very lightly cut slicks straw intermediate and now just coming through the Kleiner Carousel to Galgenkopf, the Gallows Hill and onto the run back is the battle for second position between BMW Rover Racing number 98 and Schubert Motorsport BMW number 20 evenly matched cars on the long straight. Yeah, some real, uh, some real heavy hitters here, Sheldon van der Linde and uh, Jesse Krohn. Of course, Jesse Krohn, the winner of the 2020 Rolex 24 Daytona. I remember sitting there with uh, himself, John Edwards, um, Augusto Farfas, and uh, none other than Chaz Moster as well. And I'll never forget John Edwards couldn't help himself but get his Rolex, his new Rolex watch, winner's watch, out of the box, and he's got it on, and it, it was about twice the size too big for him. I said, you need to take a couple of links out of that, John. And uh, of course, Yessi, ever the crew, the, the cool Finn, he's uh, he's just sitting there, just the the, the ice man as, as always. And uh, well, he'll need to be the ice man here because this battle between the Rover car and the Schubert car, they need to be careful for BMW's sake. They don't knock time out of each other um, uh, in this context. I don't know if that'll be crossing their mind right now. Well, it's now the battle for the lead because yeah. in the pit lane is the Huber Motorsport Porsche after an eight lap stint. So they're going to go very deep into the race. If they do another eight laps, that's somewhere near 68 laps. Take that off 83 minutes. Uh, and you can see they're going to be down to the last 20 minutes or so. That means a super quick pit step stop at the end, splashing for just enough fuel. So in athletic terms here, Peter, the stagger has not yet unwound. We are going to have to wait until everybody's done their last pit stops to see where people come out. It's going to be, I think, the number 911 of Kevin Estra who will do his last pit stop first. That doesn't necessarily help you. Normally, in the, a rule of thumb is get your last pit stop done first in case you get caught behind a safety car. You'll get safety cars here. You do get slow zones. But even at that situation, the longer you can go into the race because you stop back you stop timing the pit stops on high how many um, how many laps you've done and you start the mandatory pit stop time from 69 minutes onwards 70 minutes onwards how many minutes there are to go so you get inside the last 25 minutes that's down to 84 seconds if you're still at let's call it 50 minutes, you're at 143 seconds minimum. So it is going to make a difference. Rule of thumb at the end here is always, 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 as I'm reminded by Paul Truswell, go as long as you can on your fuel. There was a couple of odd six and five uh, lap stints earlier on, relatively soon after the restart. I think that was more tyre dependent uh, than anything else because there was no I could see no fuel re uh, maybe I suppose if you've done two laps and you only get 20 more 20 more litres maybe um, could have perhaps gone on too soft a tyre and that pulled them in but they've since gone back to the eight lap stint we've got a completely cr clear track now Peter as that number 23 Porsche of Huber Motorsport with Nico Menzel behind the wheel rejoins and has dropped down to 11th position 
and is something over two minutes behind the leader. How much of that can they pull back on strategy? We'll find out in about an hour's time. Well, exactly, and that just gives you an impression of just how close this race is because they came into the pits in the lead and then 11, you know, come out in, in 11. What is interesting to me is the number 77 BMW junior team car driven by Augusto Farfus. You're thinking he's not necessarily a BMW junior, but he's uh, there to help out the juniors, I think, more than anything, as we've got an incident for the number 153 BMW 3 Hats Series. Uh, hats and back right in the middle of the road but does appear to have drive getting the car off the road great work uh, although a little bit of body work maybe they might need a slow zone to recover some of that body work sitting on the middle of the circuit as a very sad looking number three retronic racing porsche being dragged off the circuit and john you got to think that uh, julian andler he will be absolutely distraught at the moment yeah, D damage on the rear of that car. Also, a right front puncture on the GT Golf number 166. This is the GT Time Motorsport by WS Racing. This is the Axel Jan, Sven Freisecker, Wayne Moore, and Niels Borum. Good to see Wayne has managed to make it back to Europe. And that was a coming together between that car and the V4 BMW that Pete was talking about a moment ago, the uh, Thomas Muskins entered uh, machine, the 325i for uh, Moritz and Werner Gusenbauer and Philip and Richard Gressen. And so both of those cars losing out. And Dennis Olsen now having a cracking mm. battle with the BMW junior team as they head down to the bridge at Adna. This is curious, this is what I was going to say before we, we saw those accidents, John. The number 77 BMW, driven by Augusto Farfus, they have a two-minute penalty hanging over them for an incident with the number two Audi. Yeah. The number 31 Piccadilly Porsche does not have a, a penalty hanging over them. And Augusto Farfus making Dennis Olsen's life in the number 31 Piccadilly Porsche absolutely, well, really a nightmare. Um, to be honest, it appears that Olsen has plenty of pace but just cannot get past the big BMW of, uh, of Barford, and you can just see there opening up that twin turbocharged powerhouse of the BMW up the Kesselton, the, pulling away from uh, Olsen, even with Olsen in the draft, that only when they're reaching top gear is Olsen in the little Porsche able to catch up. Porsches have been very good in the slipstream, mm. particularly down the mm. Dr. Hope, when they're following other cars and even following uh, another Porsche. Free mood curve and up towards the base of the hill that climbs towards the Caracciola Carousel. And they're a lap apart on fuel. Olsen uh, has completed six laps since he came out the pit. Farfus five. They're still very much in the fight, though, with uh, just around about 30, 35 seconds between them and the leading cars. So they'll be coming in in a couple or three laps time and then that's going to take them to let's see my goodness they're going to be only needing a very small splash of fuel at the end they could be inside 20 minutes they will be inside 20 minutes their last stops are going to be super quick what they won't do i think will put new tires on them they will literally just splash enough fuel to get them to the end and send them and again this is that that stagger unwinding at the end of the running race when everybody started in the uh, think of the uh, four by 400 meters relay and everybody starts in lanes and then it's only after 600 meters the stagger unwinds for the last couple of uh, laps it's this that sort of idea we're not sure how they stand in terms of where they lie with the cars like the leader at the moment uh, and the von der Linde driven BMW M6 GT3 uh, of the number 98 Rover racing team. Well, looking at the sliding scale for the ST9 cars and their minimum pit stop time, if the drivers did have to come in at, say, 20 minutes to go, that's a 73 second minimum pit stop, which is not long at all. So you could be absolutely right there, John, that there's not going to be time to put tyres on. Uh, it's just a quick uh, fill up at the pumps and... Uh, and off you go uh, again. Of course, these Michelin tyres uh, designed for the job. Most of the 
top runners, yeah, the the actually the first non Michelin runner is of course the Falcon Porsche in sixth at the moment in the number forty four machine. But this is just too close to call. The only thing that could be the deciding factor, John, is if the Manti Porsche number nine eleven it might be the only car that only needs one trip to pit lane from now, quite possibly. Uh yeah, that, they'll be in first. For That's their, a trust whale, that one. <laughs> yeah, they'll be in first for their last stop. The 166, the GT Tyres Motorsport by WS Racing. That car is moving slowly down the Dr. Hall. The, the white flags being shown for a slow-moving car. Um, that car... Where are we? Manti. Uh, Estra's been out for a couple of laps in that since he took over. I think it's a bit more than that, actually. Let me just do a quick piece of uh, calculation. Yeah, a couple of laps. Uh, next in from the leaders will be second. Uh, that's the Jesse Kron driven Schubert Motorsport number 20 BMW M6 GT3 on his seventh lap at the moment. So potentially one more after this. The lead car which is the number 98 that we were talking about at the moment, the BMW, uh, at the moment uh, driven uh, by, I was going to say, Conor de Filippi for no apparent reason at all, it's Sheldon von der Linder, I absolutely know that, because I just mentioned his name a couple of moments ago. Somehow I feel more fatigued, having only done 12 hours of the 24, than the full 24. I don't know how that works out. I think it's it was being around and watching a lot of fog drifting across the field actually actually tied me out more than if we'd had racing cars going around so uh, von der Linde uh, is a couple of laps better off on fuel as I said they're going to go really really deep uh, into this race uh, for that before they need their last pit stop so I don't uh, Frickadelli they're going to struggle because Dennis Olsen he's going to come in at the end of this lap Will he be able to get to the end? Yeah, I think he might, actually. Yeah, he might. Mm. Depends on when the white flag comes out. It's, it'll be I tight. Think. It will it'll be tight. It'll be unbelievably tight, yeah. Um, but who knows? Um, you, if, well, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, how that one's going to play out over the course. Incredible Nürburgring 24-hour. Yes, we've been shortchanged a bit with the weather, with a short amount of running. But this sprint to the flag, John, has been absolutely fascinating it's been like a it's almost been like a really really exciting uh IMSA sprint race actually well it, it's it's just i mean it was just a bit shorter wasn't it than a than an ln N, normal nls race three and a half yeah. hours rather than four and, and peter snowden and i were discussing this um whilst you and joe were on uh, commentary and you know the drivers have got a car that's pretty much brand new all the service items, the brakes and all that will have been done. Um, and they've got the chance, albeit with a restart that put everybody back together again, notwithstanding the, the weird rule about stint lengths where the red flag um, carries through it, uh, which Joe was explaining earlier, nicely done. Uh, but really, everybody's close together. So the battles that we've had at this stage of the race have been really close. And I think some of the drivers will be very happy to have had extra rest because the concentration levels here are always required to be optimum. As, uh, and it's even worse in these conditions. Hyundai coming in with a bonnet up and has managed to get in the pit lane. It's the number 89, not like the BMW a couple of years ago that drove into the end of the pit lane. That's the Carlson Peninsula by Tomcat I-30 in driving team Marcus Lowe from uh, Nürburg, uh, Dan Burkholt and uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Engelman from uh, uh, Florida actually has made it across uh, and I don't think race tape's going to hold that down if I'm very honest. Oh, never underestimate the power of gaffer tape. That's uh, amazing uh, um, adhesive properties. Uh, if you put enough of it on uh, oh, the bigger problem is going to be the windscreen. The windscreen smashed to bits on that Audi i30N Fastback. It's the uh, same model they've been using in the British Touring Car Championship. And Tom Ingram campaigning that car very well in the opening round at Ruxton. But that's 
that this car is definitely going to need a replacement windscreen. Um, and that's uh, come from the bonnet flicking up onto yeah. the screen, isn't it? Yeah, uh, that's probably the last thing you want to happen when you're careering along along the Nordschleife and your bonnet pops up and smashes the windscreen. That that must have given the driver the fright of their life. The bonnet catches are broken. There's been damage there earlier on, and I wonder if that is the failure of a bit of bodge or whether he's had another incident because there is damage to the grille, to the front balance on the right front in particular, but the bonnet catches have failed completely and they're trying to tie it down with tie wraps. Meantime, Daniel Junkadea in the number seven AMG for the BWT sponsored Mercedes team is still right on the tailpipes of the Falcon Motorsport and Klaus Backler. Now, earlier on when this battle was going on, Klaus uh, was on his outlap and the back end of that car was moving around. Richard Adenauer now was moving around mightily. He was doing well to hang on to that. And these two, this battle is actually dragging them up the field, Peter. Absolutely. This, these guys here, Klaus Backler, in the number 33 Falcon, sorry, number 44 Falcon Tire Porsche uh, with Daniel Junkadella in the pink Get Speed Mercedes, of course, a team based here at the Nürburgring. Uh, 8.20 for uh, Backler, 8.21 for Junkadella. For context, Kevin Extra, 8.23.1, Jesse Crohn, 8.25. So gives you an idea just how hard these guys are pushing. And of course, Remember, um, Klaus Backler, the top, uh, the number 44 Falcon Tire Porsche, the top non-Michelin runner. In fact, both of the Falcon Tire Porsches, the in the in the top 10, the only cars without Michelin tires in the top 10. Once again, Falcon um, really showing what they're capable of. Into another area of incident, uh, and this again. Is at the bottom of the hill. Ah, uh, barrier works where Hubert Haupt went in in the HRT Mercedes. But the showers that were happening there earlier, and actually slightly heavier than showers, it was slightly more prolonged uh, episodes of rain. They have stopped there, and that track's dried up again. So, I mean, it's just roll the dice, Peter. If you're trying to call strategy here, you've almost got to leave that to the driver. Indeed, yeah, I um, mentioned uh, Timo Bernhard a number of times over the over the weekend, and uh, he said you can be coming down the Dottinger Hole and you're still 50-50, whether you put on wets or dry, or depending on what's going on in, on the circuit. And he says sometimes you can literally be pulling into your box and then you make an instinct decision there and then, um, because your soul, your mind, your, your brain capacity is at 100%. You know, when your computer gets too hot, well, that's the time for driving around in other Northwest North Life are using up every, even somebody uh, like Timo or, or like Kevin Estra or Jesse Kroner or Augusto Farfus, they're using every last fibre of their talent and ability to push these cars to the lap times that they are. Um, and to make those strategical calls at the same time, incredible. Of course, this started all the way back in, in the early 70s when uh, 1973 Daytona 24 Hours, which Brumos eventually won, but Penske were, had Mark Donoghue in the car calling strategy back and forth with Roger Penske and even the Penske mechanics in those days thought they'd thinking, how is he able to do this? And then of course it, it became a bit more common, but of course Penske and Donoghue, what a surprise, the uh, trail, tra blazing a trail, shall we say. Unfair advantage and all of that yep. sort mm -hmm. of thing. I uh, was privileged to work with uh, David Sundmark when he was running in Vipers in uh, ALMS competition down through the years and a proper chip off the old block he was uh, we're coming down then towards the last hour here Peter and uh, I, I get the sense but we had a, a clear lap or two and the lap times came down we've now got two uh, slow zones one at Klostertal and one at Steilstrecke uh, with that code 60 at Steilstrecke so relatively clear track there's the Manti Porsche driven by Estra. Kevin Estra goes through once more. Now, who came into the pits last time? I think that should have been Schubert. It was Schubert and yes, mm -hmm. and That's at the end of his eighth lap. So if they can do another eight laps, 
at, let's say, for sake of argument, around about eight and a half minutes, eight eight to sixty four, eight half minutes or another four, that's an, an hour and eight minutes. We've only got an hour and five minutes to go. They're going to be knocking on the door of going to the end of the race with that car. So keep an eye on the pace of the Schubert Motorsport BMW. They might, might have got this absolutely spot on. Porsche pit stop as well there, Peter, right alongside it for Frickadelic. Indeed, the number 31, Frickadelic, Dennis Olsen. What a job that young man has done. Took over from Frederick Markovecki a couple of hours ago. And yeah, what, a, what an amazing driver that young Norwegian is. And Frickadelic, well, still in the hunt. They've not given up. They lost the 30 car, the sister car. Uh, last in, in 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 the night last night and uh, well they're still in the hunt they will not give up and I can assure you folks that team owned by Klaus Abelin who of course um, late husband of the late great Sabina Schmitz and I can assure you there will not be a dry eye around the circuit or indeed in this commentary box oh. if Riccadelli were to spring a surprise win here um, they've never won the Nürburgring 24 it used to be a brilliant annual outing for, for Klaus and for Sabine behind the wheel. This is the first year, actually, Joe, where Klaus hasn't been driving. Yeah, the, the Porsche have really thrown all of their big guns at that. Two NLS wins already for the Frickatelli Abilin team. And it is, this is the place of fairy tales and stories, isn't it? Uh, it, it could happen. And. You know, we saw Yana Scheid driving the car that Sabina took to victory, overall victory here, the BMW, uh, earlier in the weekend. And the marshals came out on the side of the track. They even had special banners made, lauding Sabina as the queen of the Nordschleife. And uh, a, a well-respected and much-loved individual in her home country where she was well known through her exploits in racing and on automotive channels and of course in the English speaking world because of her association with Top Gear and the global phenomenon that that came and that's how I got to know her working on Top Gear Live we co-presented the motorsport side of, of Top Gear Live with Tiffany Dell and uh, that wasn't any fun at all Sabine Schmitz, Tiffany Dell, <laughs> oh God. and me um, on, I can't remember how many live shows we did at two different venues up in Birmingham and then down at the Docklands Arena. So, massive chore that was to do that job. And I say that with a big smile on my face uh, as I Did remember that make the you the responsible adult? Uh, pro do you know what? <laughs> <laughs> you, you might well... You might well be right, because neither of the three big three amigos um, would, would have counted uh, as responsible. So perhaps it was indeed me who was left. And that's a scary thought in itself, isn't it? Uh, I'll let you get back to the battle for fourth position. We'll move along for that, because I'm sure we've got solicitors on standby uh, at the moment. Battle for fourth position. It is still the Falcon portion of the 44 uh, and the pink and blue number seven AMG. Team get speed, Backlet versus Junkadea. And the pace still absolutely electric between this pair. Klaus Backler, the Austrian long standing Nurburgring driver, long standing Falcon driver, and driving his socks off, which I'm sure are blue and turquoise uh, his socks. If not, they should be. They get him some Falcon socks. But Daniel Junkadela, very impressive single seater driver, of course, won at Macau in 2011 and beat some very very high-profile names in F3 as well, including none other than Ferrari F1 driver, Carlos Sainz Jr. So that gives you, if you're an F1 fan, watching endurance racing for the first time gives you a bit of an impression of the calibre of the drivers at the front of this pack here in the Nürburgring 24 hours. We're just about to reach the top of the final, approaching the final hour of racing here at the 2021 24 hours of Nürburgring. Still impossible to call. Will it be the 98 Rover BMW? Will it be the 911 Porsche? Will it be, will there be any other surprises? Will it be the 20 Hubert? 
BMW. Absolutely impossible to call. And uh, John, I'm certainly no clearer on it. Any from on your side, any particular car pointing out to you at the moment? Start watching the split times of Jesse Kron and see if he's pacing himself and saving fuel or whether he's going for it. Klaus Backler is driving the rear Falcon tyres off that, that number 44, uh, excuse me, uh, yes, 44 Porsche, uh, as he is climbing up now towards Kesselschen and those ever-tightening left-handers and now up the edge of the ravine to the right-hand side. But the back end of that car is bouncing out all over this place. Meantime, Chris Hazer has had two wheels on the grass in his Audi Sport team car collection number two R8 sitting in 14th position and didn't even lift now this battle for fourth is back into the slow zone for the barrier repair and the leader is down at Brunchen and the final hour of the 2021 total ADAC Nürburgring 24 hour is upon us So John Hindoff and Peter Mackay here to take you through the final hour of this incredible motor race. Impossible to call at the moment. Sheldon van der Linde throwing everything at it at the wheel of the number 98 Roa BMW, the sister car, the number one, the pole sitter, the defending champion, unfortunately out from the lead with an electrical issue. Absolutely gutting for those guys, but for the team, if their 98 car was able to make it to the flag in the lead, that would certainly put that one uh, as a distant memory, you would imagine. But they've got to get past a whole raft of opposition from a variety of rival German manufacturers. What's interesting me, John, is that we're still waiting on Augusto Farfus to come to pit lane in the 77 car. This time. Still not served that two-minute penalty. Yeah, he's uh, on his eighth lap at the moment, so you'd expect him in at uh, this time that's going to put him that'll be his last stop um he can go to the end there with fewer than 59 minutes remaining it'll be fewer than 58 by the time he gets in the ones we've got to keep an eye on for me schubert motorsport uh jesse cron on his first lap out of the pits as is uh dennis olsen steer in the 31 fricatelli uh porsche uh, no he put patrick Pele in Ooh. uh so pele taking that car to the end and they are going to be very very close indeed to be able to go to the end of the race without another stop audi gt4 and audi gt3 getting rather too close for comfort as christopher Hazer uh, makes friends with the drivers uh, of the driver of the what was earlier the class leading number 53 gt tires uh, still is. Number four. It still is, right? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. That wouldn't have gone down very well if those two had come together and cost a class win there for the GT4. Pit my man, Christina Nielsen, on the driving strength there. Christina, no uh, stranger to winning races and titles. Double IMSA champion, of course, in GT Daytona. And has driven a myriad of cars down through the years fits into a team immediately cut her teeth in Porsche Carrera Cup Middle East I remember doing the commentary on her Marcus in right as we expected then Peter eh yeah yeah well good. you're uh, I'm glad you're on top of it I'm uh, I'm only doing it by eye <laughs> uh, now uh, that's interesting goes straight past the penalty box does Augusto Farfas so here's a question can he they serve that penalty in the pit in their pit box i would have thought they would have to sit in the pit lane in in the penalty box yeah two two things here mm. without going to have a look at the regs um new set of tires by the way for that car um i i reckon that they could still come in at the end of the race and just sit there uh -huh. and then cruise across the line so long as uh they don't get lapped of course or is there an option to add it onto their race time at the end? And are they going to try and just stay out there? Um, or that was B. Or C, are they still arguing the case? And Could therefore, be. they're saying to the drivers, stay out there. Interesting. Uh, number 
12 has just picked up a penalty whilst we're on the um, subject of penalties there, Peter. Let's just tick this one off the list as well. Uh, this is the line speed by Car Collection Motorsport. Neither of the line speed cars have had particularly trouble-free runs, but the SP9, number 12, that's uh, the uh, Jean-Louis Hartenstein, Klaus Koch, Fida Lieb, and Johannes Stengel car picking up non-respect of uh, us pit lane speeding. Repla what they're calling a replacement penalty, a minute and five. So, um, with so little time left before the end, and some people having perhaps already made their final stops, that could be added to race time. Meantime, the battle for what is now third position, Peter, on the Grand Prix circuit. These guys are have. I, I bet you there is massive grins inside the helmet of Daniel Yonkadela and Klaus Backler. Do you know what? These guys, they've, they're both professional racing drivers, I'm sure, have been at the wheel of go-karts since they were in nappies, and this is what they live for on the best circuit in the world in proper factory race cars, Porsche 911 GT3 R, Mercedes AMG GT, racing wheel to wheel. This is what they come for and this is what we come for as fans as well. Brilliant, brilliant stuff uh, to watch. Coming back to the number 77 BMW Junior Team uh, penalty or potential penalty, it's certainly been handed out, but hasn't been served yet. That's interesting, they could be debating it. But also, I, I have to say, John, I am not a fan of tagging on time at the end of the I race. If it, it can be served in the, oh, if it can be served in the race, it should be. Um, I, I remember, what was it, Sebring 2012, and the two races going on at once in the, that didn't work. No, I, I, so, yeah. I hate that because the whole, the, whole, you know, you get across the line, in the the excitement of it, you forget who's got the minute and twenty second penalty, and then you read it down the results and you realise the results have changed. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that penalty. Um, it, it, thankfully, timing screens nowadays tend to operate very, update very, very quickly at the end of, 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 the, of the race. Third position battle then, under the Yokohama Bridge, down into the foxhole. Um, whatever happens, we will make history today as the shortest oh. uh, Nürburgring 24 hours on record. I, think the I wasn't going to bring that up. Um, well, I, I, I think it's. I think we've had a 64 lap race before. Um, we'll be the shortest in time. Whether we'll be the shortest in great flag time. We'll be the shortest in the race itself. I suppose we will do because what we're on now, lap 52, with 52 minutes to go. Uh, yeah, it's going to be the shortest in distance as well by some margin but over 12 hours overnight that was lost due to weather fog mainly uh, both in terms of the issues for visibility for the drivers and i think then more tellingly in the early morning hours it was quite clear out on the north Schleifer, but the fog was hanging around at the pit straight area which meant the many heli uh, was unable to operate and at that point of course you have to keep extending but I thought the ADAC and the organisers did a cracking job got the cars out onto the track so they could do what's called a quick start procedure and although the original formation that time was extended by uh, 80 minutes when we thought they were going to roll out it meant at least as soon the very moment that the sun started to break through burn off a bit of the fog and in fact actually the wind got up a wee bit as well and that allowed us to get started again right heading up from Bergberg as well this battle for third position Peter and still barely three or four cars length between Daniel Juncker there and a bit of clear track ahead of the man he's chasing Klaus Backler and they're coming back up to that slow zone whilst the leader a little bit further round the track is heading down to down to Brunchen. Indeed, yes, it's uh, <laughs> those guys in the the 44 Falcon Porsche of Klaus Backler and the number seven 
Mercedes of uh, Daniel Young Cadella. It's coming, you know, we've got a Falcon tire Porsche, flat six, naturally aspirated engine in the back, and you've got the Mercedes 6.2 liter V8 in the front on Michelin tires, and both absolutely inseparable. Now, thanks to the folks at Falcon Tire Europe who have tweeted us, John, with a picture of Klaus Backler's socks, or at least, well, maybe not Klaus Backler's socks right now, but a clean pair of Box Fresh uh, Falcon Tire themed socks. Uh, wait, so that that's very cool. I, I like that. But this number nine. Well, I, I need to know why we haven't got them for uh, for uh, the commentary booth. Yeah. Uh, you stand. If you're standing in them all day, yeah. They need to be strong. The uh, now, of course, the ninety-eight BMW here will need to pit once more, as will. Kevin Extra at some point. It's just how deep into the race they go, I suppose. Go as deep as they possibly can. Uh, everybody goes as deep as they can now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, you've got to think for uh, the guys who are certainly stopping a game, which is uh, all those guys that you've mentioned. You want to keep the pace up. You want to get the laps ticking over. Um, and... The reason I say that is you want to not make it easy for the likes of the Schubert number 20 BMW and the Fricadelli 31 Porsche. They've got it, they took on eight laps worth of fuel when they last stopped. And it, it's pretty tight on that. You get a few litres extra from a, uh, each stint from a NLS race because of the slightly longer lap on the Grand Prix circuit. But they're certainly at full speed. There's not line laps in the car. No way. So you are Rover pushing M. really hard. As the is that that's the second Indeed. place car now. The Rover Racing coming into the pit lane for what will be its last stop, Peter. So with 48 minutes remaining, it has a minimum pit stop time of 138 seconds. Two minutes and 18 seconds for that car. This could be critical because the Manti Racing Porsche of Kevin Esther, which now heads into the lead, the Manti Racing back leading the 24 hours of Nürburgring with 48 minutes to go. They've still got a, a good couple of laps left and therefore their minimum pit stop time will be shorter. So the closer you get to the end of the race, your last pit stop time, you have a smaller minimum pit stop time. And John, I actually think that's going to be the very much the deciding factor of this motor race. So the first car that we think potentially has made its last pit stop is currently in seventh and is a minute and 37 seconds away from the leader. And if Estra can go, where is he in his fuel stint? Uh, he's starting his seventh, so one more after that. So 47, 40, uh, we're gonna be down to somewhere around about 32 minutes. Maybe 33, 34 minutes is what I said before, and I'm sort of sticking with that. What's what's his time? <laughs> minimum time stop when he comes in. Let's see the circuit of 32. 32. Uh, 100 seconds. Uh, That's so, spot on. The, uh, the, uh, yeah. the, the 97 seconds behind at the moment in in that oh number my. 20 car. But what what we need to know is how how many laps will be left and they don't know how many laps are left they know they've got eight laps of fuel in that car and they can't do anything but push on 44 and the 7 the Porsche uh, side by side with the AMG Mercedes on the Grand Prix circuit going down to the Dunlop hairpin and for a moment Daniel Juncadella was rally crossing Peter uh, that was a uh, involuntary rally crossing there Klaus Backler shutting the door hard, saying, if you think you're going round there, you're going to have to do it on the paint, my friend. Wow. Uh, the, that, the court, well, the uh, the grenade pin has been pulled in that particular battle, and who's going to blink first between those two warriors, the 44 of Bachler and the number 7 of Junkadella. The number 98 row of BMW back on the move uh, in fifth position, so they're good to the end of the race, but that minimum pit time could really hurt them compared to their rivals. I would suspect then, John, that the Falcon Porsche and the BWT Mercedes, the number seven, uh, are going to have to pit at the end of this lap. They've got to be near the end of their stint. For the Mercedes, uh, yes, the team gets speed car, but I think the Falcon Porsche can go one lap further. 
It's coming out of turn one. Yeah. The old over and under move by Junker Dele got right up under the door panel of Klaus Backler on his right-hand side as they went over under the pedestrian bridge there on the Grand Prix circuit. Down to that tricky downhill left-hander, they were still side-by-side. Side. Uh, um, the faulty car on the grass, and there was a bit of contact through the right-hander as they headed Ooh. down the hill, and that was very firm driving indeed uh, from Klaus Backler Defend he'll say defending his position did he leave a car switch on the outside a... no is the answer to that I was going to say it's a debate but it's not um, he was giving the Dacia Logan racing room uh, that's what he was doing of the course the Dacia Logan was the bogey in that oh you're very thing. good you need to be a team manager that's very good indeed uh, over Fluke Platz and heading up the hill for that battle uh, in uh, which is uh, for the moment for second and third but that'll be broken up at the end of this lap when I reckon Junka Della will come into the, the pit lane so the key point about that uh, is that the Rover, Rover Racing van der Linde driven 98 now did they get out ahead of Jesse Cron I think they did but I can't tell you by how much at the moment until we get to the end of the lap uh, because that was the car that we felt was up until that point that that pit stop of the 98 the car that was highest place um, of the cars that had done the pit stop so Rover Racing BMW GT3 uh, the M6 in fifth position ahead of Jesse Kron and we reckon those two in fifth and sixth on your timing screens at the moment are the cars that are best placed to go to the end at the moment. There's no doubt in my mind the 98 can go. I think it's much tighter for Yessi and therefore for the 31 as well, which is two places further back. When did uh, Mark was Yessi's, stop? Yessi's got 40 seconds to make up on the 98 BMW as okay. well uh, in the 20 car. So the 20 car is it's going to need... I think it may, they, they really have a few things to fall in their favour, likewise the 31 Riccadilly Porsche. But this is the thing, is that it, we've seen it can just, anything can happen in an instant. I mean, Kevin Estre, when the, uh, when the rain fell, went straight on at Whipperman and very nearly ended up in a race winning, a race ending accident. Yep. So yep. it can just, just in a click of a finger, it can be gone. And there is, there's not just one car to pick up the pieces, there's, there's eight of them. Um, it, it's, it, this is what I know it's been a sprint race of about three and a half hours from the from the uh, restart this morning but this is I don't think really would have been in a greatly different position if we'd been racing all through the night as well well you'd hope you would hope that yeah uh, more incident out on the circuit for what is now the leading car to go by this is more barrier work uh, heading uh, up to oh, is the 29 that, Audi barrier yeah that, that's right 29 <laughs> Audi barrier yeah so that's the uh, run down into uh, first part of the Flans Garden I think uh, or is it the run into Brunchen it's the run into Brunchen my apologies Brunchen, yeah. uh, no I'm wrong S, S back that barrier is that yeah yeah first part of the, the Flans Garden uh, no, I was. Sorry, I'm, I'm going back to where I was. Uh, first, I, I'm Ace back yeah. or Whipperman where the yeah. barrier was. Correct. Yeah, because that was the same back. That was the car that Estra had to go and had the to go round. Correct. Split. Well, no, he split between the 29 Audi and the the wall. I mean, if this 911 Manti Porsche, the Grello machine, wins, they will look back at that. That replay will get. <laughs> that will be giving them nightmares <laughs> for uh, for the next little while. Um, it's one of those near misses, possibly, that could be definitive in this motor race. But it's far, far from done with 41 and a half minutes to go here at the Nürburgring. We expect that this is the penultimate lap of Kevin Estra's stint. And I know that they there might be... Well, there's a question, John. If Manti wanted to train, change driver, which I don't know if they would, um, I don't think there'd be time to make the, the driver change with the minimum pit stop time. Uh, that is a good point as well. Uh, it'll just be fuel, I think, for that. 
Hello to Randy Sherwood at RSL underscore studio, listening in in San Diego to Burgess Norodal. I hope I've said that right, uh, Burgess. Uh, doing a great job fueling my urge to get something a little bit more fun and exciting than my mm -hmm. own 1.6 litre daily driver. RSL underscore studio, hashtag uh, RSL N24. Uh, penalty served. No penalty served the pit lane in the last three hours of the race. The time added afterwards is what Ian McCarthy uh, is saying. He's been flicking through the book. Here's the 911 coming through to the end of the lap. And let me just check what you were seeing. He'll complete seven laps of a stint here. So he should have one more lap in the front of that car, which is where the fuel yep. tank is. And indeed, he does stay out, Peter. He does indeed, and Kevin Estra goes over the line in the lead, blasting past the Hyundai i20N, a completely stock standard road car with a roll cage in it, and of course that car will be launched to the public uh, very soon here in the UK, and I guess in the rest of Europe as well, and uh, although they haven't had the 24 hours of running that they would have liked, that little i20, it's, uh, I've heard very good things about that little car, and uh, you, you can't put it in through a tougher test than here at the Nordschleife. I, I think Estra, as if he needed it, has been told to push. Um, his last lap was an 8.38 with two slow zones and three code 60s, so he's not hanging about. No. Uh, there are people who were quicker than him last time around. It just depends when you catch that. Uh, Klaus Backler in the middle of that phenomenal battle with... Uh, Junker Dellas had to come into the pit lane and so has Jules Gunon. So it's last pit stops then for the two team get speed cars, Peter Mackay, coming in together. Well, this is um, the uh, the get speed team, of course, based here at the Nürburgring. This is their Super Bowl. This is the one they all want to win. And certainly the most distinctive looking cars out there with the pink and blue sponsorship from BWT water both cars in now this was 38 minutes to go on the clock their minimum pit stop time is 115 seconds so that that so is in about eight minutes time we'll see kevin Esther come in for his final pit stop he will only have to stop for 96 seconds so that sliding scale is yeah. absolutely critical yeah absolutely right all of that time they've been fighting for on the racetrack and they make up that number of seconds by going one lap further on the yep. fuel remember that kicked in at 70 70 minutes to go uh, we had mark bessing in the pit lane a moment ago in the tcr number 830 hyundai he got out manuel lauk is going to take that car to the end now i know i do like a bit of drama peter and the more you work with me you'll realize that but um, am I just adding a bit of extra in to say there are parts of the circuit where it's starting to look a little more overcast and a little more threatening weather-wise? Well, I must be a fellow Doom merchant because I, that was exactly what was crossing my mind. And I, I didn't want to stoke drama where it's not there, but there's definitely the certain camera angles where I'm thinking, Kevin Astro needs his lights on there. Hmm. Uh, just coming through the Grand Prix circuit particularly and thinking, hmm, well, I, I really hope not. Let's have, let's have a straight fight, I think, uh, for, for 37 minutes. I think I don't think I could take any more drama, quite honestly. Um, oh, no, 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 no. Drama. We'll take as much drama. We'll take drama. Okay. okay. Well, and again, you see, that, that will help anybody who's got a late stop to make. Because what you want now, if you are um, at the front of the field and you've still got your last stop, you're thinking, right, if it's going to rain, rain really heaven's hardest as i'm coming the last third around the, the lap but rain on the first third and the second third of the lap please so that i can come in and put a set of wets on for the last four or five laps oh big move down the outside on the dot to get hurt patrick peel it giving best there to augusto farfus Frickadelli versus BMW Junior Team and the BMW goes back ahead. They've been swapping places on this lap for ninth and 10th position overall. Nico Muller 
uh, in behind the number 23, Mark or Seafried, Huber Motorsport Porsche. Same part of the track drags through. Uh, no, Porsche comes back. We've said how quick the Porsche has been in a straight line under the Bilstein Bridge. They're nearly side by side there. And they'll come side by side in the breaking area up the hill for the Tiergarten. Did they both get through? We may never know. As we wait to see how they come back across the start-finish line, Kevin Estra is at Bergberg and starts another climb up the hill. Peter Mackay. Using all of those 500 horsepower or so from that four-liter flat six in the back of the GTCR. This is a car Kevin Escher knows inside out now, and as do his Manti Racing team. They have more wins at this Nurburgring 24-hour than any other team with six wins, and the previous team owner Olaf Manti more VLN wins than any other driver a lot of people forget that Mr Manti was a very very special driver in his own right will this be an unprecedented seventh victory for Manti Porsche are these looming clouds that are they really are looking quite menacing now with 34 minutes to go this is I, I think the um I don't know what the anti-rain dance is, but they, they, they certainly will be dancing it in the Manti Racing Garage. Now, I want to raise a point about um, thir number 31 Frickadelli car, uh, John, because you've, if you're Klaus Ablin, the owner of Frickadelli, you've got to be pretty angry with the... Seven There's nothing the 77 BMW is doing that's out with of the rules, but with a two-minute penalty to be served after the race, they've, that, they've had a lot of on-track battles that have really... Kind of hampered the pace of that 31 car but all fair in love and war as they say uh yes and everybody's mm. battling for position uh, as the fricatelli gets the upper hand the fricatelli porsche gets the upper hand for the moment uh, with uh, the it's a phoenix porsche a phoenix porsche is that one of the phoenix uh, audis that's in there uh, as well yeah. but i think that car's out of position peter is the up to the top of Arenberg and drop down the Fox Hall again. Not big Phoenix that's the day, either. No, that's the 11 car that had Michele Beretta, Frank Stifler, uh, Kim Louis Schramm and Nicky Team. And uh, for those of you who follow Nicky Team on social media, you'll get a very clear impression of his opinion of the incident with uh, Raffaele Marciello in the BWT Mercedes, the number seven car, which has got them, um, we say, evidence of that uh, accident on one of the front headlights. Mayhem and excitement to come, perhaps, mm. in the last hour, last uh, half hour, should I say. A couple of three minutes away from our finally, final uh, hourly update, uh, which will take in the odd classes uh, slightly further down the field. Very difficult to try and keep up with that, such as being the pace at the front, uh, and to give it the time that it probably deserves for all those classes. So we will give the roundup in a couple or three minutes. We'll bring everybody back in as well for the last half an hour. Manta using every bit of technology they can to track Kevin Estra, who I reckon is in at the end of this lap as he's coming through to the end of it now. And by the time he gets in, oh, oh my goodness, Piccadilly and the 77 coming together. They've been threatening to do that, Peter Mackay, for quite some time. High-speed incident on the far side of the Nordschleifer. Oh, my word. That is a huge incident. The number 77 BMW is now ground to a halt at Versailles and was going very, very slow. There, there isn't... I don't think there was a slow zone that Patrick... Certainly someone of Patrick Peely's experience wouldn't have noticed. So the BMW going incredibly slow for an SP9 car, maybe dealing with... An, a, a mechanical issue. Patrick Peely has got completely caught by surprise, plows into the back of the BMW. We've seen the BMW come to a halt, and it might well bring the 31 Frickadelli car to a halt as well. Massive incident, and that, that actually could have been a lot more nasty than it already was, and front right puncture for the Frickadelli as well. And more than that, the steering arm has broken oh. as Kevin Estra does indeed come into the pitch. That's on the run down from Callenhart to Versiphon. Ah. It's downhill, it's fast, you're picking up speed, and you were spot on 
there there was some kind of issue far for Sony a lap or so out of the pits so it's not a fuel issue but something went wrong, wrong with that BMW junior team he is the uh, if you will the experience in that team a bit like having the senior player in your under 21 squad you were always allowed one or two weren't you back in in the day well that's the farthest roll this weekend but both of those cars have been taken out of competition final pit stop then peter how long will the 911 have to stay in with 30 minutes on the clock it will be 98 seconds minimum pit stop time for the manti porsche so they'll be trying to get this as close as possible some michelin new tires going on i can't quite see yet if they're going to put all four on doesn't look like it. But Backless in from second. Backless in okay. from second as well. So Number the top two are in. Open. So yeah. it's Fonda Linda in 98 Rover BMW uh, coming down the Jottiger Hur now. They must get the right amount of fuel in. They're already getting on towards 50, five zero litres for the Porsche. We'll I need did a fuel tank. Yeah, need I need about I, 60 litres roughly. I was a bit less than that. I think that's just over 50. And they're waiting, and now they're rolling. This is going to be tight, but they might get out in the lead. This could be the race right here with the number 98 Fonda Linda driven Rover Racing BMW M6 coming onto the Grand Prix circuit now. And the Porsche's gone. Manti Racing is out in the lead, and the crowd, the knowledgeable crowd, there's not a lot of them here, but they have burst into spontaneous applause down at the Mercedes Arena. And obviously, they know what they're watching there. They're watching the 911 go out without losing the lead with 29 and a half minutes to go. Extraordinary stuff wow. at the Nürburgring. Michael. Kevin's teammate uh, Michael Christmas and the, those pair they have won uh, they've won pretty much everything together uh, they've won the world championship they've won Le Mans they've won Spa they've, neither of them have ever won the Nürburgring and to do it together in the 911 Grello car I think for Michael Christensen particularly if Kevin Esther is able to hang on to this lead for Michael Christensen particularly remember he lost his drive in the world championship uh, in the WEC, and this is uh, this is a big, big statement for the uh, Danish driver to prove that he is still absolutely at the top table of GT racing. Full attack mode for uh, it is not Klaus Backler. He's been replaced, so they have done a driver change in that car, and they put in Sven Müller uh, into the 44 Falcon, and it will be full attack. He was warming the Falcon tyres up at the back with excessive amounts of wheel spin coming through turns one and two he's going to have to find around about 15 16 seconds maybe more on von der linda for second but he's out in third position let's do our final update for you on some of the other classes the as we have a moment before it all gets even more exciting we said the stagger would have to unwind at Four Motors Bio concept car, Porsche, uh, being led, uh, leading that category. And the number 320 car is in 46th position. In SP10, it's the Schnitzenarm Racing GmbH Mercedes GT4 in 25th position. As the cleanup goes on for Augusto Farfus and the BMW Junior team. And meantime, the Fricadelli car that was involved in that scary incident, the number 31 for Patrick Pelier has ripped the front right wheel off its mountings. Certainly of the steering rack, the steering arm is broken and the wheel sitting at about 45 degrees. It's got a puncture, it's got suspension damage. He'll get it back to the pits, I'm sure he will. But any chance of a decent result gone for that car in SP8, uh, not SP8, SP8. It's the GT Tire Motorsport Audi RA LMS, the number 53 car. They have uh, got a stranglehold, had a stranglehold on that category for some time. SP3T uh, is uh, the Andre it's Andreas Gilden driving that car. It always has been when I've been talking about the Max Kreuzer Racing Golf TCI. 36th position for that number 10 car. SP4 currently being led by the BMW E25, uh, E90 325, the number 325 in 86 position 
in V6 is Team Mathol's Cayman, the 123, 60th position. V5 is the Rent to Drive Familia Racing Porsche Cayman. Now, I've not mentioned their name before, so they've fought their way to the front. 142 is their number, 106 is their position. And the V4 leader is somewhere off the bottom of my screen. Peter, can you see the V4? 151 BMW E90 driven by Quanta. Ah, yes. One. That's the E9325. They're in 78th position. Thank you. Uh, V2T, now that's normally been um, handy, hasn't it? And it's on it. Part of its own. Ah, right. Okay, good. So it's still the Hyundai. Uh, and Cup 5, which is the new Cup class for BMW C SM2s, is Adrenaline Motorsport, the 242 car, in 68th position. Well done to all of the classes, over 20 of them in this year's race. Peter Mackay, stand by. Joe Bradley, Bruce Jones, also standing by as we welcome back to the Global Broadcast Centre, Peter Snowy Snowden for uh, the last 25 minutes or so of this race, probably a little bit more. Far for Sunder Tour, looked like a mechanical issue for that car that just stalled him in the middle of the track with that battle that had been raging back and forth between he and Patrick Peele in the uh, in the Frigatelli car, in, in, in their Frigatelli car, 31, yeah. Yeah, John, how many times have we said during this race and others have like this and qualifying this whole weekend of how something, a moment, can just change the whole face of the race there. And Augustus Farfus and the M6 Junior, BMW Junior team car there, just having some kind of issue where he just slowed down unexpectedly, certainly for him, but so much more for Patrick Pillay. And you could just tell, he just didn't see it happening. No. He just didn't get a chance, no disrespect to Patrick Pillay. And he didn't he didn't just tap it, he whacked oh, it he whacked the back. It and broke the front right suspension on that Frickadelli car. But we've got the name right this time as well, we've got the right team. How, how many times could that have happened? Because these cars have been driving at 160, 170, 180 miles an hour, millimetres apart, not even inches apart, and one small technical issue, um, we could have seen that a hundred times in this race, even, even this shortened race. You've used the phrase many a time over this, of course, these four days of recalibrating and one of the things that you, you don't allow for is you, you sit there you're driving around with another car it's a peer group so you're you're working with them you're waiting for other class cars to slow down be in the way yes but you go together you work as a pair you help one another you look for the advantages what you don't expect is that peer group car to suddenly slow down and that's what caught patrick pilly out and it was a that was a rugby drop kick there i think bruce would have been proud of that one bruce jones we've seen once again the tactical genius that is the mustachioed one, Olaf Mantai. He's pulled it out again right now, got in and out for that last pit stop without losing the lead. And Kevin Estra is 15 seconds to the good with 23 minutes to go. Well, you don't, you don't um, fall into victory in this race. No one gets there by mistake. Mantai Racing's done it before. It's doing it all over again with Olaf. He often has a... a a smile behind his moustache, but it will be in front of it within uh, 25 minutes because uh, this has been a really, really hard race. In many ways, it just uh, was in cap it was squeezed down to three and a half hour sprint today after that long, long fog delay. But uh, Olaf, he understands the rules. He works the pit stop super, super well. And his driving crew, well, particularly Esther and Kristen, so they have delivered the goods. Joe Bradley has been watching and listening since the end of this that substantive shift as we bring all five voices together in the Radio Show Limited Global Broadcast Centre. Thanks, big thanks, by the way, to Tim Gray's team up in London, Hugh and Rob, who've been on duty for the whole 24 hours, as have our colleagues at Nürburgring at TV, because they had to stay around during the night just in case something happened. Bradders. Uh, oh, hang on a second, I'll get you in a, se in a second, Joe. <laughs> Teichman Racing, the number 110. What a shame for the KTM Crossbow. It's come to a halt, fifth in its class, 70th overall for the Spielkind Racing Car, right at the start of the Nordschleife for Peter Snowden. 
Yeah, just very quickly there as well, John. Uh, just said that not it makes much difference, but Patrick Pile in the number 31, I nearly said it then, Fricadelli Porsche. Um, he hasn't made it back. He was going to live a little bit, but he's pulled off at the beginning of the dotting of Hoe. It's pulled out just so it gone by on a bit of uh, it behind a barrier there. So that's not made it back. Not that it would have made a great deal of difference, but at least it's out of the way now. Fair point, yes. Uh, Joe, what I was going to say to you is there's a slight air of frustration and disappointment from everybody, I'm sure, but it appears that all that sitting around watching Fog early this morning has been worth it when we get to a kind of finish that we've seen. And that's a proper endurance finish with strategy as much as speed playing out here. You know what, there's something about this race that it, it doesn't matter how, how long the delay is, we always have this finish. We always have, I mean, how many times over the last few years have we seen this race come down to the final lap? And you know what, There's, there is no way that you can go into a long distance race thinking about winning. You've just got to think about the first stint, then the next stint, and just let it come to you. And if anything, the Manti team, they're, you know, they've, they've won this race six times. They know how to go about their business. Add in the complexity of just starting with three and a half hours of racing this morning, starting with effectively a clean sheet, forget about what happened yesterday, that just that just didn't exist. It was all about the final three hours, and they've they've played the driver strategy. They've they've not used Lars Kern at all, and only used three of their drivers. Um, and that was a big that was a big ask. That's a big ask to leave someone out, and they've done that, and and it's bearing fruit at the moment. But I'm still not going to say anything, John, because there's still 19 minutes remaining. Well, and, and you make a very very valid point there, Mr. Bradley, because we have seen. You can't take anything for granted. Look at what happened to Augusto Farfus. He's made up a position. He's trying to drive away from Pele. No drive, no traction, or whatever it was, Peter. And his race, effectively, over. Raffaele Marchiello's almost been involved in, in incident and, and all that sort of stuff as well. And he's now battling for third place with the car ahead of him, which is the number 44, Sven Muller, uh, driven for the motorsport car. So the last step on the podium, far from sorted here. Absolutely. I think uh, Bruce just made a, a great point there as well, that, uh, or great phrase you just used, that you don't fall into winning this race. And Manti, you don't fall into winning this race, not once, but six times. I think that is, that's probably the, the most, uh, most thought-provoking comment. Uh, you think about this, where that car is at the moment, right at the front. Kevin Estra at the wheel of that car. He has been a, a bit of a superstar on that car. He has tried uh, a few of those, what uh, I think Peter Mack coined the phrase as well, of the uh, pass on the grass. Uh, he's, he's had a... He's, he's shaved it, hasn't he? He hasn't quite necessarily got it on the grass, but he's certainly got a... He's got fairly close, closer than I would have wanted to in some of those circumstances. And it's made me take an intake of breath before you commented on it. Of course, the team now run by the team from Moist Path, run by Nicholas Martin Roeder. Um, Olaf handed over the reins a few years ago. Doesn't have a formal role with the team. Porsche owning a big chunk of the team as well, of course. And have used the Mantai operation to run, run the uh, works cars in GTE, GT Le Mans at Le Mans, and continue, have uh, continued to do that with the WEC uh, operations, Porsche GT team as it's called. Now, that was uh, core racing in the States and Mantai here in Europe, although all coming under that same banner. I have no doubt that Olaf will be here. I have no doubt it'll be somewhere near to the garage, but best of wishes passing on to him and to Nicholas and Martin for doing such a, a great job. It looks like we're getting close to having a four-car battle. Check that three-car battle for third position. Sven Muller leading a train at the moment to the end of the box hole and up to Adenauer Forest. With behind him, the BMW team gets speed number seven, which is not been without incident and is showing a few battle scars on that. And then Jesse Cron closing in on them. He's only a second and a half further back in the Schubert Motorsport number 20, BMW M6 GT3. And I'm just going to make sure that all of those guys 
yes, he's going to be... He's on his sixth lap at the moment. Not sure, yes, he can make it to the end here without another splash of fuel. But everybody ahead of him can. Uh, we've got Gilles Gounon next up in the number eight Mercedes-Benz for Team Get Speed. He's fine to the end as well. Then it's Marcus Seyfried in the 23. He'll be coming in at the end of this lap. In fact, did I just see that light up for him to come into the pits of the 23 machine? Yes, I think I did. So then it's uh, Fining. Yeah, he should be all right. And Dominic Bauman should be okay as well in the 10Q Racing Team AMG. So that's how they stand in terms of their final pit stops. Sven Muller holding on to the third step of the podium. It's not a win, it's not second, but you're on the podium. And at the end of this race, that is still an achievement. Even at the end of a race that has not been the usual 24-hour challenge. Challenges in different ways. Certainly still fighting the Nürburgring and the Nordschleife of Peter Snowden. The weather, of course, but also a very different feel to this. And I, I wonder how difficult it was for some of the drivers just to switch gears. Although at the sharp end of the field, as we heard Klaus Backer saying earlier on, it's 100% a sprint race anyway. So all that's happened to these guys is they've had equipment that's in somewhat better condition than perhaps it might have been. But it, it's proven what the, the, the Norse life has proven again what it always does. We can shorten it now to the shortest race on, on in record, we think, don't we? Think it's yep. going to be. And yet it and still time has and distance, yes. all the drama. We've had we've had everything. We've had fire in the first half hour. We've had race stoppage. We've had fog. We've had rain. Everything is all thrown in there. And it's just yet again, the Norse life, it giveth and it taketh away. It never, never ceases to amaze me. Confirmation from Porsche Motorsport at Porsche Races, if you don't follow them. Fricadelli, number 31, damaged by a collision with what they're calling a slow car on track and had to retire. It was definitely slow. Well, I'm sure Patrick Pillay would agree with that, that description. I, I, I wonder um, how uh, Augusto Farfus feels about that. Dear me. Nick Parker submits at RSL underscore studio. I think this has been the worst N24 for a while. Actual racing at the front has been poor and unexciting. Crashes don't make for a good race. Uh, OK, one man's view at RSL underscore studio. Hashtag RSL N24. So your thoughts on that with the threat of fog and possibly even rain still hanging over us in the last 15 minutes uh, Kevin Estra his gap still just around about 15 seconds getting up to speed after his pit stop he'll come down to complete his first flying lap out, out of the pits in just a moment or two's time he has to pick his way through course vehicles and one of the unimogs with the arm course sections on as he came through the tier guard and now onto the start finish straight 12 minutes to go so what do you reckon then bruce 12 minutes to go this one and one more i reckon at the end of this is it not uh yes my maths goes along with that john and i wouldn't want this race to be pulled up short they've had few enough uh, racing laps as it is but i think for those obviously at the front of the queue they'd, they'd like it to end ASAP, but I, I just want to say uh, it's well worth uh, what you did uh, highlighting the work of Martin Reader and uh, Nicholas Reader. Of course, a lot of the credit always goes to Olaf Manti. He built the team. He sort of oversees, but they do the day-to-day -day running, and they're the ones that really do need the accolade if their car goes on to win this. And you're quite right, this lap and the next one. Who knows? We could have another change in the weather. Might even see the sun, but I, I feel it's a little late for that. I love your boyish enthusiasm, Mr. <laughs> Jones. Fantastic stuff. I think Mark will see Freed's charge. is going to come to an end then in that number 23 car. I reckon he's in at the end of this for Huber Motorsport. Going to come up a couple of laps short in their roll of the dice. Uh, how they played their strategy or at least how uh, they 
found themselves in the last couple of three hours of this race. The number 23, Huber Porsche, sitting in eighth at the moment, is going to lose a handful of positions. Uh, that said, what have we got? I think we've still got a sharp end of... Let me see. 16 cars? 17 cars, maybe, on the lead lap. Maybe 18 cars, actually. I, w I think the SPX leader, Space Drive, are still on the lead lap with that unconventionally steered Mercedes AMG, the steer by wire car, in 18th position. I think they're just ahead of the leaders. Let's see when they come through. So the battle for third is the one that we're concentrating on at the moment. With the threatening clouds slightly, slightly abating to the far side of the circuit over the paddock area. Manti, Garage, trying to look cool, calm and collected. Uh, if one thing that the pandemic has given us, Joe Bradley, it's the ability for people to look stoic much easier because you can't see all of their facial expressions behind the masks. Yeah, very difficult to interview when they're wearing a mask, can't they? See uh -huh. what their face is doing, you know? Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. And it's just it, all those tells. But um, I think at this point of any race, you, you, if you're in contention, and while I'm on the subject of contention, I, I just can't drag myself away from feeling really sorry for the number four Mercedes. And it's not just because our good friend Adam Christodoulou is in that car. Um, the, that, that car pulled a seven second lead on the current leader at the restart. Seven seconds in a, in a blink of an eye. Um, and my heart goes out also to the 98 uh, BMW uh, and the, uh, the number, sorry, the number one BMW, I should say, um, who was also very, very strong uh, going into this restart. All right, there was a little bit of a, a hiccup with the carrying forward the pit stop uh, from the re into the restart. But uh, John, back with the track. This looks like it's a, yeah. a real battle. It's a pass for third. Position. Battle for third. Rafael Marcello goes round the outside, heading up through Fluke Plast, the side by side. Porsche to the inside as they come to Schwed. Kreuz, that puts the Mercedes on the inside of Armbrug, the right hander. Gets up on the curb just a little bit and goes through. The battle for third has changed with eight and a half minutes to go down through the foxhole. What has Sven Muller got to fight with? Muller not to appeal him, my apologies. Muller, who is fighting back as he charges down the hill of the foxhole. He's not letting that BWT-sponsored car get away. That started Snowy way back, coming through Flugplatz and the double left then right. 100% John and I would say that uh, Sven Muller is not done yet and don't forget what we've seen throughout this race the few hours we've had of it those Porsches have got the most incredible drag mm. off other cars down the Dottingahoa so I'd be, let's have a look at that when he catches up uh, or sits behind the Mercedes down the Dottingahoa and I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's a, a rechange of that position uh, and this is for third place remember yeah it's not even for race lead. Why shouldn't we be back into third place, though? Quite rightly. Uh, well, we've seen it here in the past. Uh, going on to the last lap, we've had things changing. The Ford Motors Bio Concept car, which is leading AT, which is Thomas von Lewis of Menar, Schmudo, the rock star, Thomas Kiefer and Charles Kaufman, has been hit with a 68-second penalty. Check that, a 134-second penalty, whilst it is the number 13 that's been given the 68 second penalty. The number 13 being the uh, Dodge Viper in the same class. So the AT cars getting, we might yet see the, the uh, a win for the Mustang there. I'll let Peter look to, I'll let p -Mac have a have a, a look at that. Kevin Estra out in front, 911. And the number 911 as well through the Caracciola Carousel dealing with traffic. Six, call it seven minutes to go. He'll have another lap to do at the end of this one. Peter Mackay, this has been your first experience of watching the Nürburgring uh, ADAC total 24 hours in full metal and being a part of the team. Um, they say sometimes, you know, don't 
necessarily meet your heroes, the Nürburgring Nordschleife hero circuit for most people. Has this one lived up to its billing? Uh, it has in spades. Um, really has. Okay, well, we've missed out the uh, the hours through the night and the uh, associated waffle that I'm sure we would have got involved in. But uh, it, this is just motor racing at its absolute best, and it is an honour and a privilege to be part of the broadcast team to describe and uh, explain these these pictures and this incredible sport that we're we're seeing. Uh, I don't know how you couldn't be entertained by this. I mean, that side by side there between the Falcon car, the 44 of Sven Muller and the 7 of Raffaele Marciello. Absolutely incredible motor racing. Um, just, to, just to touch on the AT class, that's the uh, Porsche Cayman of Four Motors bioconcept car that has been brought in ah. for penalty as, or sorry, it'd be applied with a penalty yes. and as will the Viper. The car that Smudo the Rockstar is in uh, is in leading that class at the moment and quite convincingly so. Right, okay, thank you. Well, we've had a couple of three passes around the outside at Schwedenkreuz, one of the most four formidable uh, corners anywhere in the world. Super quick going up to it, you're a, a, a head up to it over the top of a brow and even at this late stage still getting contact with the 58 was that yes it was that was bill cameron yeah. peter bonk and arno classen oh my goodness sp7 uh, car yeah sp7 smallish class this year uh, unceremoniously moved out of the way at the end of Tiergarten. So with five minutes to go on the clock across the RSL uh, across the RSL network of audio and visio, video channels, Kevin Estra is a couple of corners away from heading on to the last lap of the heavily weather interrupted 2021 total. ADAC Nürburgring 24 hours. There'll be about 14 minutes and 10 seconds or so on the clock. And now he starts his last lap. Huge amount of penalties coming through that I'll let the guys check through to make sure there's nobody uh, involved in one of the big fights. The gap then going on to the last lap, 18 point one seconds pit stop times lots of pit stop time penalties right through the field and uh, they will be applied at the end of the race a smattering of applause as Estra went through the Mercedes-Benz arena for his final night final time and Peter Mackay uh, Eddie major penalties at the sharp end of the field there that have just come through in that tranche? No, none from SP9 class fighting for the overall win, so much of them in the other classes. If there's any more, I will keep you posted, but hopefully as we head on to this last lap, it would be really a pity to see anything like that uh, taking away from all these guys at the front. What a show they have given us. And we've got cars from all manufacturers, and Peter, Mercedes, Porsche, BMW. And we've still got the battle for third, Peter, coming through. Yeah. Traffic number two, Audi in there is a lap down in seventh position, but the BWT AMG on the uh, on the Grand Prix circuit at the moment, uh, and that is the Rover Racing M6. But right in the uh, wheel tracks, this battle for third, it's the uh, number seven, uh, and that is Marciello and Muller fighting it out again, as they have been for such a long time in the last couple of hours. So Raffaele Marciello battling with the number 44. It's the best, better placed of the two Falcon cars. Sven Muller, highly thought of a Porsche and Nico Muller it is for Audi Sport team. Car collection in seventh position who's behind them uh, on the road and getting a grandstand view of that battle. Time will expire in two minutes time, but of course we finish the lap that everybody is on and the one-eyed BWT team get speed Raffaele Marcello driven car goes on to the Nordschleifer for the final time in third position yeah and that predicted or as I predicted the uh, the, the Porsche there Muller not getting that drag on the 
uh, get speed Mercedes. I thought he might just glean on the Dottinger so it looks like that's uh, settled for the moment. It's got one last chance to do say Final lap, Kevin Estra, it is its leading uh, at, uh, in the Manti Porsche. The Rover Racing van der Linde driven M6. Uh, so one wouldn't have swan song to the M6 out there at the moment, it is in second place. Marcello in the get speed Mercedes with the uh, with the Muller right behind in the Falcon Motorsports uh, Porsche 911. Uh, they're still putting it out. We said the number two car, there's a lap down. The uh, other Muller Audi Sport car collection car is a lap out. Yeah, just uh, in seventh position, as you say. So I was wrong when I thought there was that many cars on the lead lap. My apologies. Fastest lap of the race in SP9, 812.804. And I think, Bruce Jones, that's the fastest lap we saw all week that was put in by the Schubert Motorsport M6. Faster even than the shootout. Although, in fairness, the second part, uh, top qualified TQ2, was running very wet conditions. Yeah, no, fabulous, fabulous lap. And the fact that these laps uh, this morning were put in in the fog just, uh, again, just proves how drivers are cut from different cloth to the average person in the street. But the track was dry. Yes, visibility wasn't brilliant, but don't forget, when they were doing that uh, this morning after, I've forgotten what time we actually got going in, about uh, 11 o'clock, was the fact that um, they were running nose to tail. And, you know, very easy to make a mistake while in that company, but to set really quick lap times, that Schubert car, in fact, it enjoyed a tiny bit of clear air. And that's really, really how they pulled it out. But, uh, yeah, fabulous pace in the early hours of the morning. I, th I think we waited for the restart for... Sorry, uh, Bruce, we waited for the restart there for you to return from the dog walk, didn't we? Yeah. That was what that was what was uh, was driving it, Bruce. It's nice to have friends in high places. It's like God in, in Bruce's case, who can control the weather at the front of the field. Mercifully, I'm sure for Kevin Estra and possibly even more for his teammates at Manti Racing, Matteo Caroli, Michael Christensen. At last, Kern hasn't been in the car for the mandatory two laps, so. Uh, he won't qualify uh, as as being a winner, but a clear track in front of Esther at the moment. I, I just love John that with uh, with an 18, sorry, 16.7 second deficit, and anything can happen still for the second place man, Sheldon van der Linde, from Kevin Estra. He's still putting in the fastest sector times he can. He's still driving the wheels off that Rover Racing BMW M6 because uh, he's only got 15 seconds to catch up. But hey, something might happen. Why, Why not? Five, but, car, five cars in the top 20 put their fastest lap of the race in last time around. Uh, if, you, if you put on your race uh, team manager's hat, Joe Bradley, would you be going mad at that everybody's finding pace right now? Or would you just be saying, well, you know, cruise to the finish? It, it, it is where it is. I'm, I'm sure these guys aren't cruising and you wouldn't be telling your driver to cruise because anything can happen and you've got to keep pushing and pushing right until you see that checkered flag because the gaps aren't that great are they all it takes is a slip up you've got to still be you know uh, positive and decisive through the traffic because if you can slip up uh, this, this track is so narrow it's we've seen cars having to drive on the grass and there's only been two cars wide and you've just got to be very careful but you can't you just can't lose that concentration. You can't lose that flow. You've got to keep pushing, pushing, and pushing. When you see the checkered flag, that's when you can relax. Corey Marvin saying on RSL underscore studio, uh, it may have been the shortest Nürburgring 24 hours in history, but it's been tremendously entertaining. Cup three, by the way, he's nose to tail for the win. So we'll keep a, uh, a look on that. The uh, 309 machine in that category has just set its best lap of the race one of those cars that are pushing on that's the moon the motorsports came in and they are absolutely together so keep an eye for those Olaf Manti as predicted is in the area of the Manti racing pit wall as Kevin Estre has turned now for home and is into the Kleiner carousel by no means can he kick out the clutch and cruise to home at the moment. But the marshals know what they're watching. Blue flags waving as they have been for such a long time. Kevin's wife and uh, young 
child in one of the pit boxes I noticed earlier on. It was all a bit much for Estra Junior. Sound asleep. The sound of racing cars can be such a wonderful thing for youngsters, as Peter Snowden alongside me knows very well from taking um, a very small baby some 15 years ago to uh, Le Mans and her getting her best sleep ever. But first, five months old on her first proper sleep, but I think it was 10 hours at Le Mans. Brilliant. White noise, as she describes it now, at 15. Son Tommy in the gallery watching Kevin Estra bring the Porsche 911 GT3R of Manti racing through. Well, it's been an odd one. It's been historic for being the shortest number of laps and shortest time under green at the total. ADAC, Nürburgring, 24 hours for 2021. Estra, Caroli, Christensen, Manti and Porsche. What a formidable team that is. And it's the win for the local team from Moist Path. They'll be able to drive that car back down the highway and put it away after it's gone through post-race tech tonight. And you think they won't do that? I guarantee you that car is going back down the highway. Coming through to second position, Rover Racing, the number 98, the defending champion car. Didn't get the look today, did they? Particularly at the restart. But the number 98, Conor de Felipe, the North American, Martin Tomczyk. Sheldon von der Linde brings it home with Marco Fittman, the fourth driver in that car. And Mercedes AMG Team Get Speed coming through in third position by just four seconds at the end, holding on. Raffaele Marciello making the move late in the race to confirm third position for the AMG GT3 number seven that he shares with Maxi Goods, Daniel Junkadea, and Fabian Schiller. Let the celebrations begin. Olaf Mantai in the middle of immediate scrum and whilst he may not have Bruce Jones a formal role with the team anymore it's still his name across the door and there's still a lot of experience down through the years that's come from the man with the moustache from Moist Bath. Exactly the moustache may have been hidden as was the smile behind his mask of course in these days but that's a seventh win in the Nürburgring 24 hour for the Mansai racing team. The Nicholas and Martin Raider they will get all the applause in the pit garage for making that happen. And that, believe it or not, was the 13th Porsche win, not the most successful mark across the 49 runnings of the Nürburgring 24 hour. That's still BMW with 20, but they're notching them back up. Great win there, as you said, eight seconds at the end. Uh, getting news of a penalty that will affect the front of the field, the Falcon Motorsport number 33, getting a 92 second red flag related penalty and oh my goodness how close were they that's going to that's going to drop them i think a position wait for that to be confirmed uh, on the timing screen now the beautiful tradition of the cars coming round the shortcut uh, into park fermi at the back and they are all sitting there and by the time we've derigged the Global Broadcast Centre, they're all just sitting there. Paul Truswell always liked to nip down and just have a look at them and see what they were seeing, see what the scars were seeing and what stories they were telling. Look down on them from the mezzanine level that we work out of at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. Amazing victory. Peter Mackay, there's some names in that car and there's some names who are taking their first victory here. Indeed, yeah. But would you believe that that's Kevin Estra's first win at the Nürburgring 24 hour? Um, only four VLN wins, but he is regarded already as one of the true greats of this circuit and of global GT racing uh, for good measure. I've had the immense privilege of interviewing both Kevin Estra and Michael Christensen, and they're both absolute gentlemen. They're a, a credit to the manufacturer they work for and themselves as well and I um, couldn't be happier for them and for the Manti team who continue to add to their unprecedented tally of Nürburgring 24 hour wins and what I want to do is give a big shout to Lars Kern because although he, his, his name won't go on the trophy because he didn't drive believe me he's a huge part of the success of that car and of Manti racing in all that they do in the automotive world.
Bruce Jones, uh, we say that it's never over till it's over here. There was a last lap change of position uh, in the top six. There was, and I actually thought it was going to be um, Jesse Crone getting past the 44 Falcon Motorsport Porsche. But the 44 Falcon car held on to place, and in fact, Crone was passed by another Muller. It was Nico Muller, car number two. Audi Sport Team car collection had its problems earlier in the race, but came back through, and uh, it was so super close. It was a tenth of a, two tenths of a second between uh, the 44 Falcon car that took fourth and the number two Audi that took fifth, and then uh, just a second on the nose back to Crone in sixth place, and Jules Gugnon less than a second down in seventh. So it really did concertina that battle, and Marcello did well to get to the front of it and pull away. Very. Uh, well rehearsed and, and well organised uh, ceremony at the end. The Rover Racing BMW already in the victory circle or in the top three part Fermi area. Kelvin von der Linde out and being congratulated by his teammates. Uh, while we've got a moment or two, Joe Bradley, the cars are, are coming across the line and I think we've just about got everybody finished. Can you quickly run down some of the class winners, please? Because I always feel bad if we've got to cut away and we never get to do that. Letzte Warnung raus. Sonst gibt's hier gar keine Bilder. Ich sagen, sonst ist aus. Uh, just lost Joe Bradley there for a moment. Gives us a chance to see the emotion and talk about the emotion from Kevin Estra, who has leapt from the top of the Manti Porsche. His first victory in this German and global classic. As... His teammates climb the fences to get to him. They'll be on the podium in a moment or two's time. Uh, let's go to some of the class results then. Joe Bradley, uh, didn't hear you before, but uh, I think you've got the class results up now. Let's try again, John. Let's spread the love. Yeah, we, we tend to ignore the classes. Uh, uh, understandably so, after such a, a great battle at the front of the field. So um, SBX was the next class down. They were in 16th spot overall, and that was the Space Drive Racing Mercedes car 25. Uh, 21st overall was car number 114. That's the Cup X class winner. That was the True Racing KTM Crossbow. 27th overall was our SP10 class winner. That's the Schnitzelarm Racing Mercedes GT4 car 34, 27th, 28th just behind them was the SPAT winner, the Black Falkland Mercedes GT4. Uh, 34th overall was the number 10, that's the SP3T class winner, the Max Cruise Racing Golf GTI TCR. The TCR class winner was uh, just behind them in 35th spot overall, and that was the number 830, the Hyundai Motorsport uh, Elantra. Uh, Cup 3 was the next one, that's 37th overall, car 305, and that's the GTEC competition Porsche Cayman. 39th overall was car 80. That's the SP7 class winner. And that was the Huber Motorsport Porsche GT3 Cup. Um, SP8 is 48th overall, car 53. That's the GT Tired, uh, GT Tire Motorsport Audi R8. Uh, V2T was the, uh, saw the 159 taking that class win. 53rd overall for the FK Performance BMW. V6 was in 57th overall, car 132. That's the Team Matto Porsche Cayman. 60th overall was SP4 T class winner. That's the Porsche Cayman uh, in 60th. Did I say that? 66th overall, car 242. That's the Cup 5 winner. And that's the Adrenaline Motorsport BMW M2. Uh, not many classes left. V4, 75th overall, car 151. That's the BMW E90. BMW M24i class was won by Adrenaline Motorsport and our very own David Drinkwater from the UK in that car, 76th overall. 
78th overall car 120 winner in the sp3 class the toyota gazoo toyota corolla v3 t class was in 87th overall with car 168 that's the team Mattel porsche 718 cayman sp4 was a bmw 325 car 325 aptly numbered in 89th overall and then sp6 was 91st overall car 81 that's the Hofer racing bmw m3 sp2t was the hyundai motorsport i i20 in uh, 97th spot overall that's car 165 105th overall saw the v5 class winner that's car 142 the rent to drive familiar porsche cayman and the final class winner down in 120th spot overall at uh, car 350 that's the black falcon team porsche gt3 cup joe bradley with that run down 8.8 seconds the margin of victory at the end with kevin estra just uh, lifting off a little bit i think uh, towards the end to bring that car home uh, assured uh, on that final lap uh, before we get to the podium ceremonies a couple of people to say thank you to our colleagues at Nürburgring TV. I've done a brilliant job again this week with everything that the Eiffel can throw at them uh, in terms of the weather, particularly from Thursday onwards. Michael, Nico, Rene, the whole team uh, have been brilliant and particular thanks to our camera operators here at the Nürburgring who have been out in all that weather as well and but up throughout the night, we were still getting pictures just in case there was a change of heart from what was going on. Magnificent stuff uh, from all of those on the technical side. And up in London, at our main control room, under Tim Gray, uh, we had Hugh and Rob. Curry was pitching in for the ELMS over the weekend as well. And again, had to be up and covering the whole 24 hours, regardless of what was going on uh, on the track. They are the unsung heroes behind the microphone and plugging things in to make sure that we get to the world. Also, like I said, particular thanks, of course, to our responsible adult, Eve Hewitt, who put all this together. And to yourselves, watching, listening, contributing via the hashtag and RSL underscore studio. It makes it a shared experience, which is what endurance racing is all about. A different Nürburgring 24 hours for 2021 but a, a Nürburgring 24 hours for the 49th running that was absolutely deserving of the kind of challenge that people say that it is but we're going to be back to do it again next year in the, under rather different circumstances and maybe it's time to get a full racing again in 2022. So, Peter, we're waiting for the victors to be uh, to be awarded the spoils. You've raced here. You know what the feeling's like at the, the end of, of one of these races. Uh, for some, it'll be despair. For some, it will be absolute unbridled joy, particularly for the guys that have won it. But somewhere in the middle, for some of those teams that we've mentioned there, all the class winners will be absolutely delighted. Character building, John. That's probably the best phrase for this, this circuit. It's uh, we've, we've seen everything in the, albeit the shortened version uh, this time, uh, but it's uh, we've seen everything. I think perhaps what, what characterises it for me, perhaps, is the very last lap there by uh, Sheldon van der Linde in the Rover Racing BMW M6 for second place. He set the fastest lap of the race for that car on his last lap. Yes, you're quite right. Kevin Estra did slow down from a, an 8.24 was his last lap. So that reduced the gap down from 16 to 8 odd seconds. But Sheldon van der Linde there. Uh, tenacity right through to the end, as I think our colleague uh, Peter Max said. I think that was the phrase he used for us. But just that never say die, never going to give up. And uh, it's fastest lap of the race just, just at the end there. Quite extraordinary, John. The Estra family out with uh, young son Thomas there and Kevin going to see his family. Uh, getting that high five from the wee man with the number 911 hat on the youngster. Great emotion from everybody down on the Manti side of things marvellous stuff 
from them. And it, I still can't quite believe, Bruce Jones, that this is Kevin Estra. In everything that he's done, this is Kevin Estra's first win at this race. It made me double check my notes, frankly, because <laughs> you, you just think back, you cameo roles come to mind. He's always overtaking someone here. He was mighty in the last couple of years, and yet this is it. This is his first. But you know what? I don't think he's going to be the last. No, certainly looking I agree. At his caliber. Ab absolutely, he's got plenty. Sorry, sorry, sorry John. What he really proved in the early stages of the race was when everyone else was running nose to tail, he was doing that, but he was overtaking them, and that is a very special skill on the Nordschleifer. Good for the team, good for track position, but just for the psyche as well. I love the fact that in a few moments' time, there'll be champagne sprayed on the podium. The mechanics of Mantai have already got the beer out uh, and are drinking and spraying in equal measure. Uh, a local brew, actually, Bitburger, from uh, just down the road uh, from the Nürburgring. There's a few good breweries uh, and brewery towns around the Eiffel region. Uh, Bitter ein Bit is the slogan for those guys. Please may I have a bit burger. Uh, a bit different from where I came from, where it was Phil Fauer Feds. Only Bradley, amongst anybody listening, will know uh, what well, I'm, I'm talking over about. Over my head there, completely yeah. over my head there. That one. Over my head That's as well. Jo Joe's, jo Joe's laughing. <laughs> it it means... I... Go on, Joe. I have no idea. Did... What did you say? Phil Fauer Feds. It, 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 it roughly translated, it means, uh, Barkeep, would you mind providing me with four of your very best pints of Federation Ale, if it's not too much trouble? Phil Fauer Feds. Yeah, you're a lot older than me, though, Heindorf. Remember that. <laughs> I'm a lot younger than you. A lot younger than you. You know that to be true. Boys, boys, stop. Come on. Oh, fantastic. Anyway, Kevin Estra, John, can you remember... I don't know how many years ago it was, but didn't he put a McLaren on pole here? Yeah. Was that 2014 or something? Yeah, that was and that he, was around an 8-10 in, the, he, uh, in he, the shootout. He completely blew us away with that lap. And it was, uh, I mean, we, we knew of Kevin Estra, but I don't think we realised just how good he was. And you know what, next year, we're, we're not going to have a talking piece to talk about next year because... Usually we talk about how unfair this race has been to Kevin Estra and, he, you know, how, how ridiculous it is he hasn't won it. Well, he's going to spoil that one now, hasn't he? He's going to won it. I tell you what, there's some happy people on that podium. You know, sometimes you see a podium where someone feels like they've been robbed, but the third place crew are taking their selfies, they're smiling. Patrick Assenheimer, Nico, uh, excuse me, um, Maxi Goetz, Daniel Juncadella, Raphael Marciello and Fabian Schiller. They're having a good time already. Uh, three different German manufacturers in the top three, with Audi uh, missing out there. Porsche, BMW, and Mercedes. Audi in fifth, though. Chris Harzo and the rest of the Audi Sport Team car collection. And they're in fifth position. I'm saying there, John, that uh, Kevin Estra, pole position here for Manta in 2018 and 2019. Mm. How's it taken until now to win it? Yeah. Just no, no, no. Just shows what the circuit can do, doesn't it? Don't. It's, you know, a uh, little note for Daniel Kalvitz, uh, Bruce, and the, the rest of the WTM powered by Phoenix. First non uh, German car in 13th position. And I think just off the lead lap for those guys. But for the early part of the race, they were, they were putting decent speed up in that Ferrari 488. GT3, as in, uh, in fairness, was uh, the, uh, the the other car, the other Ferrari, uh, as well out there. Yeah, two of the two of the two of the three Ferraris really were going well. We've seen them show great pace in the rounds of the Nürburgring Langstrecken series, but um, so many of the race stories almost got lost in the fog because uh, people were getting Literally. getting their tire choices wrong last night, losing a lot of ground, trying to make it up again. Then we had the stoppage, but one day, don't forget, we did have a Ferrari finishing second. As, um, not that long ago here, but it does seem a very long way off from victory. It just seems German property year in, year out. But when you've got Porsche, you've got Audi, you've got BMW up there duking it out at the front with Mercedes, it's almost always going to be one of their cars, unless someone blink brings a real, real blinder to this. Yeah. Looks like we're ready for the podium ceremonies. Top three cars separated by 55 zero seconds. 
And for Mercedes Team Get Speed, it in third position then. The number seven crew, Maxi Goats, Daniel Juncadella, Raffaele Marcello, Fabian Schiller in second place representing BMW for the number 98 crew, Rover Racing, Conor De Filippi, Martin Tomczyk, Sheldon von der Linde and Marco Fitman. And the winners again, Manti and the 911. What a record that team has got here. Whoever is running the show, they still rule the roost at the Nürburgring. Matteo Caroli, Michael Christensen, Kevin Estra, Lars Kern, 59 laps completed, 100 away from a distance record, and actually setting the fewest laps ever and the fewest amount of green flag minutes. But they win, there's no asterisk. They are the winners of the 2021 Total ATAC Nürburgring 24 hours. Well, you know what? There's very few people up and down that pit lane uh, who will have take any issue at all with that victory. The most local of local teams to the Nürburgring, Manti Racing, literally from down the road. That's a very popular victory. The trophies are held aloft for the Get Speed Mercedes team in third position the photographers get their shots that you'll see on the internet in a few moments time and in the weeklies to come rover racing winners last year and their 98 car having to make do with second position here but make no mistake when you come to the nurburgring if you've got the letters m and r on your porsche you know that it's been engineered within an inch of its life to respect the unique characteristics of the world's toughest racing challenge. And MR, Mantai Racing, with their Porsche 911 GT3R, win the 2021 edition. Brilliant stuff by all of the teams they will be partying late into the night i remember how hard bmw partied last year uh, and ran well into the darkness hour it will be no different tonight and there'll be celebrations within that paddock yes there's work to be done there's packing up to be done there's trucks to be loaded but for winners in class and those for whom perhaps it was just enough to get to the end there's something being achieved here very special this weekend at the Nürburgring and there'll be emotion right throughout this part of the Eiffel Mountains this evening it's been a pleasure being a part of it thanks to all of you and our technical staff for Joe Bradley, Bruce Jones, Peter Mackay, Peter Snowden for Hugh, Rob, Tim and Kerry in London and of course the Nürburgring TV crew without whom we cannot do our job. Responsible adult, Eve Hewitt, I'm John Hindorf. 
that was the 49th running of the Nürburgring. Thanks for being with us. Bye-bye.